Gerald Massey's Lectures By Gerald Massey The Historical Jesus and Mythical Christ All necessary references to the original authorities may be found in the author's Natural Genesis. In presenting my readers with some of the data which show that much of the Christian history was pre-extant as Egyptian mythology. I have to ask you to bear in mind that the facts, like other foundations, have been buried out of sight for thousands of years in a hieroglyphical language that was never really read by Greek or Roman, and could not be read until the lost clue was discovered by Champollion, almost the other day. In this way the original sources of our mythology and Christology remained as hidden as those of the Nile, until the century in which we live. The mystical matter enshrouded in this language was sacredly entrusted to the keeping of the buried dead, who have faithfully preserved it as their book of life, which was placed beneath their pillows, or clasped to their bosoms, in their coffins and their tombs. Secondly, although I am able to read the hieroglyphics, nothing offered to you is based on my translation. I work too warily for that. The transcription and literal rendering of the hieroglyphic texts herein employed are by scholars of indisputable authority. There is no loophole of escape that way. I lectured upon the subject of Jesus many years ago. At that time I did not know how we had been misled, or that the Christian scheme, as it is aptly called, in the New Testament is a fraud, founded on a fable in the Old. I then accepted the canonical Gospels as containing a veritable human history, and assumed, as others do, that the history proved itself. Finding that Jesus, or Jehoshua ben Pandira, was an historical character, known to the Talmud, I made the common mistake of supposing that this proved the personal existence of the Jesus found portrayed in the canonical Gospels. But after you have heard my story, and weighed the evidence now for the first time collected and presented to the public, you will not wonder that I should have changed my views, or that I should be impelled to tell the truth to others. As it now appears to myself. Although I am only able to summarize here, in the briefest manner possible, a few of the facts that I have dealt with exhaustively elsewhere. The personal existence of Jesus as Jehoshua ben Pandira can be established beyond a doubt. One account affirms that, according to a genuine Jewish tradition, that man, who is not to be named, was a disciple of Jehoshua ben Perechia. It also says, he was born in the fourth year of the reign of the Jewish king Alexander Janius, notwithstanding the assertions of his followers that he was born in the reign of Herod. That would be more than a century earlier than the date of birth assigned to the Jesus of the Gospels. But it can be further shown that Jehoshua ben Pandira may have been born considerably earlier even than the year 102 BC. Although the point is not of much consequence here. Jehoshua, son of Perechia, was a president of the Sanhedrin V, reckoning from Ezra as the first, one of those who in the line of descent received and transmitted the oral law, as it was said, direct from Sinai. There could not be two of that name. This Ben Perechia had begun to teach as a rabbi in the year 154 BC. We may therefore reckon that he was not born later than 180 to 170 BC, and that it could hardly be later than 100 BC. When he went down into Egypt with his pupil. For it is related that he fled there in consequence of a persecution of the rabbis, feasibly conjectured to refer to the civil war in which the Pharisees revolted against King Alexander Janius, and consequently about 105 BC. If we put the age of his pupil, Jehoshua ben Pandira, at fifteen years, that will give us an approximate date, extracted without pressure, which shows that Jehoshua ben Pandira may have been born about the year 120 BC. But twenty years are a matter of little moment here. According to the Babylonian Gemara to the Mishnah of Tract, Shabbath, this Jehoshua, the son of Pandira and Stada, was stoned to death as a wizard, in the city of Lud, or Lydda, and afterwards crucified by being hanged on a tree. On the eve of the Passover. This is the manner of death assigned to Jesus in the book of Acts. The Gemara says there exists a tradition that on the rest day before the Sabbath they crucified Jehoshua, on the rest day of the Passa, the day before the Passover. The year of his death, however, is not given in that account, but there are reasons for thinking it could not have been much earlier or later than BC 70, because this Jewish king Janius reigned from the year 106 to 79 BC. 
He was succeeded in the government by his widow Salome, whom the Greeks called Alexandra, and who reigned for some nine years. Now the traditions, especially of the first, told off Jehoshua, relate that the queen of Janias, and the mother of Hyrcanus, who must therefore be Salome, in spite of her being called by another name, showed favor to Jehoshua and his teaching. That she was a witness of his wonderful works and powers of healing, and tried to save him from the hands of his sacerdotal enemies, because he was related to her, but that during her reign, which ended in the year 71 BC, he was put to death. The Jewish writers and rabbis with whom I have talked always deny the identity of the Talmudic Jehoshua and the Jesus of the Gospels. This, observes Rabbi Jechiels, which has been related to Jehoshua ben Parachia and his pupil, contains no reference whatever to him whom the Christians honor as God. Another rabbi, Salman Zivi, produced ten reasons for concluding that the Jehoshua of the Talmud was not he who was afterwards called Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, and of the canonical Gospels, was unknown to Justice, to the Jew of Celsus, and to Josephus, the supposed reference to him by the latter being an undoubted forgery. The blasphemous writings of the Jews about Jesus, as Justin Martyr calls them, always refer to Jehoshua ben Pandira, and not to the Jesus of the Gospels. It is ben Pandira they mean when they say they have another and a truer account of the birth and life, the wonder-working and death of Jehoshua or Jesus. This repudiation is perfectly honest and soundly based. The only Jesus known to the Jews was Jehoshua ben Pandira, who had learnt the arts of magic in Egypt, and who was put to death by them as a sorcerer. This was likewise the only Jesus known to Celsus, the writer of the True Logos, a work which the Christians managed to get rid of bodily, with so many other of the anti-Christian evidences. Celsus observes that he was not a pure word, not a true Logos, but a man who had learned the arts of sorcery in Egypt. So, in the Clementines, it is in the character of Ben Pandira that Jesus is said to rise again as the magician. But here is the conclusive fact, the Jews know nothing of Jesus, the Christ of the Gospels, as an historical character. And when the Christians of the fourth century trace his pedigree, by the hand of Epiphanius, they are forced to derive their Jesus from Pandira. Epiphanius gives the genealogy of the canonical Jesus in this wise, Jacob, called Pandira, Mary equals Joseph Cleopas, Jesus. This proves that in the fourth century the pedigree of Jesus was traced to Pandira, the father of that Jehoshua who was the pupil of ben Parachia, and who becomes one of the magicians in Egypt and who was crucified as a magician on the eve of the Passover by the Jews, in the time of Queen Alexandra, who had ceased to reign in the year 70 B. C. The Jesus, therefore, who lived and died more than a century too soon. Thus, the Jews do not identify Jehoshua ben Pandira with the Gospel Jesus, of whom they, his supposed contemporaries, know nothing, but protest against the assumption as an impossibility. Whereas the Christians do identify their Jesus as the descendant of Pandira. It was he or nobody, yet he was neither the son of Joseph nor the Virgin Mary, nor was he crucified at Jerusalem. It is not the Jews, then, but the Christians, who fuse two supposed historic characters into one. There being but one history acknowledged or known on either side, it follows that the Jesus of the Gospels is the Jehoshua of the Talmud, or is not at all, as a person. This shifts the historic basis altogether. It antedates the human history by more than a hundred years, and it at once destroys the historic character of the Gospels, together with that of any other personal Jesus than Ben Pandira. In short, the Jewish history of the matter will be found to corroborate the mythical. As Epiphanius knew of no other historical Jesus than the descendant of Pandira, it is possible that this is the Jesus whose tradition is reported by Irenaeus. Irenaeus was born in the early part of the 2nd century, between 120 and 140 AD. He was Bishop of Lyons, France, and a personal acquaintance of Polycarp. And he repeats a tradition testified to by the elders, which he alleges was directly derived from John, the disciple of the Lord, to the effect that Jesus was not crucified at 33 years of age, but that he passed through every age. And lived on to be an oldish man. Now, in accordance with the dates given, Jehoshua ben Pandira may have been between 50 and 60 years of age when put to death, 
and his tradition alone furnishes a clue to the nihilistic statement of Irenaeus. When the true tradition of Ben Pandira is recovered, it shows that he was the sole historical Jesus who was hung on a tree by the Jews, not crucified in the Roman fashion. And authenticates the claim now to be made on behalf of the astronomical allegory to the dispensational Jesus, the Cronian Christ, the mythical Messiah of the canonical Gospels, and the Jesus of Paul, who was not the carnalist Christ. For I hold that the Jesus of the other Gospel, according to the Apostles Cephas and James, who was utterly repudiated by Paul, was none other than Ben Pandira, the Nazarene, of whom James was a follower. According to a comment on him found in the book Abba Azura. Anyway, there are two Jesuses, or Jesus and the Christ, one of whom is repudiated by Paul. But Jehoshua, the son of Pandira, can never be converted into Jesus Christ, the son of a virgin mother, as an historic character. Nor can the dates given ever be reconciled with contemporary history. The historical Herod, who sought to slay the young child Jesus, is known to have died four years before the date of the Christian era, assigned for the birth of Jesus. So much for the historic Jesus. And now for the mythical Christ. Here we can tread on firmer ground. The mythical Messiah was always born of a virgin mother a factor unknown in natural phenomena, and one that cannot be historical, one that can only be explained by means of the mythos. And those conditions of primitive sociology which are mirrored in mythology and preserved in theology. The Virgin Mother has been represented in Egypt by the Maiden Queen, Mademue, the future mother of Amenhep III. Some sixteen centuries BC, who impersonated the Eternal Virgin that produced the Eternal Child. For consecutive scenes reproduced in my book are found portrayed upon the innermost walls of the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Luxor, which was built by Amenhep III a pharaoh of the 17th dynasty. The first scene on the left hand shows the god Tot, the lunar Mercury, the annunciator of the gods, in the act of hailing the virgin queen, and announcing to her that she is to give birth to the coming sun. In the next scene the god Neph, in conjunction with Hathor, gives the new life. This is the holy ghost or spirit that causes the immaculate conception, Neph being the spirit by name in Egyptian. The natural effects are made apparent in the virgin's swelling form. Next the mother is seated on the midwife's stool, and the newborn child is supported in the hands of one of the nurses. The fourth scene is that of the adoration. Here the child is enthroned, receiving homage from the gods and gifts from men. Behind the deity Neph, on the right, three spirits the three magi, or kings of the legend, are kneeling and offering presents with their right hand, and life with their left. The child thus announced, incarnated, born, and worshipped, was the pharaonic representative of the Aten son in Egypt, the god Adon of Syria, and Hebrew Adonai, the child Christ of the Aten cult. The miraculous conception of the ever-virgin mother, persona ted by Matemue, as mother of the only one, and representative of the divine mother of the youthful sun god. These scenes, which were mythical in Egypt, have been copied or reproduced as historical in the canonical Gospels, where they stand like four cornerstones to the historic structure, and prove that the foundations are mythical. Jesus was not only born of the mythical motherhood, his descent on the maternal side is traced in accordance with this origin of the mythical Christ. The Virgin was also called the harlot, because she represented the pre-monogamic stage of intercourse. And Jesus descends from four forms of the harlot Thamar, Rahab, Ruth and Bathsheba each of whom is a form of the stranger in Israel, and is not a Hebrew woman. Such history, however, does not show that illicit intercourse was the natural mode of the divine descent, nor does it imply unparalleled human profligacy. It only proves the mythos. In human sociology the son of the mother preceded the father, as son of the woman who was a mother, but not a wife. This character is likewise claimed for Jesus, who is made to declare that he was earlier than Abraham, who was the typical great father of the Jews, whether considered to be mythical or historical. Jesus states emphatically that he existed before Abraham was. This is only possible to the mythical Christ, who preceded the father as son of the virgin mother, and we shall find it so throughout. All that is non-natural and impossible as human history, is possible, natural and explicable as mythos. 
it can be explained by the mythos, because it originated in that which alone accounts for it. For it comes to this at last, the more hidden the meaning in the gospel history, the more satisfactorily is it explained by the mythos, and the more mystical the Christian doctrine, the more easily can it be proved to be mythical. The birth of Christ is astronomical. The birthday is determined by the full moon of Easter. This can only occur once every nineteen years, as we have it illustrated by the epact or golden number of the prayer book. Understand me. Jesus, the Christ, can only have a birthday, or resurrection, once in nineteen years, in accordance with the metonic cycle, because his parents are the sun and moon, and those appear in the earliest known representation of the man upon the cross. This proves the astronomical and non-human nature of the birth itself, which is identical with that of the full moon of Easter in Egypt. Cassini, the French astronomer, has demonstrated the fact that the date assigned for the birth of the Christ is an astronomical epoch in which the middle conjunction of the moon with the sun happened on the March 24. At half past one o'clock in the morning, at the meridian of Jerusalem, the very day of the middle equinox. The following day, the 25th, was the day of the Incarnation, according to Augustine, but the date of the birth, according to Clement Alexander. For two birth days are assigned to Jesus by the Christian fathers, one at the winter solstice, the other at the vernal equinox. These, which cannot both be historical, are based on the two birthdays of the double Horus in Egypt. Plutarch tells us that Isis was delivered of Horus, the child, about the time of the winter solstice, and that the festival of the second where adult Horus followed the vernal equinox. Hence, the solstice and spring equinox were both assigned to the one birth of Jesus by the crystallators. And again, that which is impossible as human history is the natural fact in relation to the two Horuses, the dual form of the solar god in Egypt. And here, in passing, we may point out the astronomical nature of the crucifixion. The Gospel according to John brings on a tradition so different from that of the synoptics as to invalidate the human history of both. The synoptics say that Jesus was crucified on the 15th of the month Nisan. John affirms that it was on the 14th of the month. This serious rift runs through the very foundation. As human history it cannot be explained. But there is an explanation possible, which, if accepted, proves the mythos. The crucifixion, or crossing, was, and still is, determined by the full moon of Easter. This, in the lunar reckoning, would be on the fourteenth in the month of twenty-eight days, in the solar month of thirty days it was reckoned to occur on the fifteenth of the month. Both unite, and the rift closes in proving the crucifixion to have been astronomical, just as it was in Egypt, where the two dates can be identified. Plutarch also tells us how the Mithraic cult had been particularly established in Rome about the year 70 BC. And Mithras was fabled as having been born in a cave. Wherever Mithras was worshipped the cave was consecrated as his birthplace. The cave can be identified, and the birth of the Messiah in that cave, no matter under what name he was born, can be definitely dated. The cave of Mithras was the birthplace of the sun in the winter solstice, when this occurred on the 25th of December in the sign of the seagoat, with the vernal equinox in the sign of the ram. Now the Akkadian name of the tenth month, that of the seagoat, which answers roughly to our December, the tenth by name, is Abba Adu, that is, the Cave of Light. The Cave of Rebirth for the Sun in the lowest depth at the solstice, figured as the Cave of Light. This cave was continued as the birthplace of the Christ. You will find it in all the Gospels of the Infancy, and Justin Martyr says, Christ was born in the stable, and afterwards took refuge in the cave. He likewise vouches for the fact that Christ was born on the same day that the Son was reborn in Stabulo Augi, or, in the stable of Augeas. Now the cleansing of this stable was the sixth labor of Heracles, his first being in the sign of the lion. And Justin was right, the stable and cave are both figured in the same celestial sign. But mark this. The cave was the birthplace of the solar messiah from the year 2410 to the year 255 BC at which latter date the solstice passed out of the sea-goat into the sign of the archer. And no messiah, whether called Mithras, Adon, Tammuz, Horus or Christ, 
could have been born in the cave of Abba Adu or the stable of Augeas on the 25th of December after the year 255 BC. Therefore, Justin had nothing but the Mithraic tradition of the bygone birthday to prove the birth of the historical Christ 255 years later. In their mysteries the Saraceni celebrated the birth of the babe in the cave or subterranean sanctuary, from which the priest issued, and cried, The virgin has brought forth, the light is about to begin to grow again. On the mother night of the year. And the Saraceni were not supporters of historic Christianity. The birthplace of the Egyptian Messiah at the vernal equinox was figured in Apt, or Apta, the corner. But Apta is also the name of the crib and the manger, hence the child born in Apta, was said to be born in a manger, and this Apta as crib or manger is the hieroglyphic sign of the solar birthplace. Hence the Egyptians exhibited the babe in the crib or manger in the streets of Alexandria. The birthplace was indicated by the color of the equinox, as it passed from sign to sign. It was also pointed out by the star in the east. When the birthplace was in the sign of the bull, Orion was the star that rose in the east to tell where the young sun god was reborn. Hence it is called the Star of Horus. That was then the star of the Three Kings who greeted the babe. For the Three Kings is still a name of the three stars in Orion's belt. Here we learn that the legend of the Three Kings is at least 6,000 years old. In the course of precession, about 255 BC, the vernal birthplace passed into the sign of the fishes, and the Messiah who had been represented for 2,155 years by the ram or lamb, and previously for other 2,155 years by the apis bull, was now imaged as the fish, or the fishman. Called Ichthys in Greek. The original fishman the An of Egypt, and the own of Chaldea probably dates from the previous cycle of precession, or 26,000 years earlier, and about 255 BC. The Messiah, as the fishman, was to come up once more as the manifester from the celestial waters. The coming Messiah is called Dag, the fish, in the Talmud. And the Jews at one time connected his coming with some conjunction, or occurrence, in the sign of the fishes. This shows the Jews were not only in possession of the astronomical allegory, but also of the tradition by which it could be interpreted. It was the mythical and Cronian Messiah alone who was, or could be, the subject of prophecy that might be fulfilled prophecy that was fulfilled as it is in the book of Revelation when the equinox entered, the cross was re-erected. And the foundations of a new heaven were laid in the sign of the ram, 2410b. C. And, again, when the equinox entered the sign of the fishes, 255 BC. Prophecy that will be again fulfilled when the equinox enters the sign of the waterman about the end of this century, to which the Samaritans are still looking forward for the coming of their Messiah, who has not yet arrived for them. The Christians alone ate the oyster, the Jews and Samaritans only got an equal share of the empty shells. The uninstructed Jews, the Idiotai, at one time thought the prophecy which was astronomical, and solely related to the cycles of time, was to have its fulfillment in human history. But they found out their error, and bequeathed it unexplained to the still more ignorant Christians. The same tradition of the coming one is extant amongst the millenarians and Adventists, as amongst the Moslems. It is the tradition of El Mahdi, the prophet who is to come in the last days of the world to conquer all the world, and who was lately descending the Sudan with the old announcement that Day of the Lord is at hand. Which shows that the astronomical allegory has left some relics of the true tradition among the Arabs, who were at one time learned in astronomical lore. The Messiah, as the fishman, is foreseen by Esdras ascending out of the sea as the same whom God the Highest hath kept a great season, which by his own self shall deliver the creature. The ancient fishman only came up out of the sea to converse with men and teach them in the daytime. When the sun set, says Barosus, it was the custom of this being to plunge again into the sea, and abide all night in the deep. So the man foreseen by Esdras is only visible by day. As it is said, E'en so can no man upon earth see my son, or those that be with him, but in the daytime. This is parroted or fulfilled in the account of Ichthys, the fish, the Christ who instructs men by day, but retires to the lake of Galilee, where he demonstrates his solar nature by walking the waters at night, or at the dawn of day. 
We are told that his disciples being on board a ship, when even was come, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking upon the sea. Now the fourth watch began at three o'clock, and ended at six o'clock. Therefore, this was about the proper time for a solar god to appear walking upon the waters, or coming up out of them as the Oans. Oans is said to have taken no food whilst he was with men, in the daytime he used to converse with men, but took no food at that season. So Jesus, when his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat, said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. This is the perfect likeness of the character of Oans, who took no food, but whose time was wholly spent in teaching men. Moreover, the mythical fish man is made to identify himself. When the Pharisees sought a sign from heaven, Jesus said, There shall no sign be given but the sign of Jonas. For as Jonas became a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The sign of Jonas is that of the own, or fish man of Nineveh, whether we take it direct from the monuments, or from the Hebrew history of Jonah, or from the zodiac. The voice of the secret wisdom here says truly that those who are looking for signs, can have no other than that of the returning fish man, Ichthys, Oans, or Jonah, and assuredly, there was no other sign or date than those of Ichthys. The fish who was reborn of the fish goddess, Adargatis, in the sign of the fishes, 255b. C after whom the primitive Christians were called little fishes, or pisciculi. This date of 255 BC was the true day of birth, or rather of rebirth for the celestial Christ, and there was no valid reason for changing the time of the world. The Gospels contain a confused and confusing record of early Christian belief, things most truly believed, Luke, concerning certain mythical matters, which were ignorantly mistaken for human and historical. The Jesus of our Gospels is but little of a human reality, in spite of all attempts to naturalize the mythical Christ, and make the story look rational. The Christian religion was not founded on a man, but on a divinity. That is, a mythical character. So far from being derived from the model man, the typical Christ was made up from the features of various gods, after a fashion somewhat like those, pictorial averages, portrayed by Mr. Galton, in which the traits of several persons are photographed and fused in a portrait of a dozen different persons, merged into one that is not anybody. And as fast as the composite Christ falls to pieces, each feature is claimed, each character is gathered up by the original owner, as with the grasp of gravitation. It is not I that deny the divinity of Jesus the Christ, I assert it. He never was, and never could be, any other than a divinity, that is, a character non-human, and entirely mythical, who had been the pagan divinity of various pagan myths, that had been pagan during thousands of years before our era. Nothing is more certain, according to honest evidence, than that the Christian scheme of redemption is founded on a fable misinterpreted. That the prophecy of fulfillment was solely astronomical, and the coming one as the Christ who came in the end of an age, or of the world, was but a metaphorical figure, a type of time, from the first which never could take form in historic personality, any more than time in person could come out of a clock case when the hour strikes. That no Jesus could become a Nazarene by being born at, or taken to, Nazareth, and that the history in our Gospels is from beginning to end the identifiable story of the Son God, and the Gnostic Christ who never could be made flesh. When we did not know the one it was possible to believe the other, but when once we truly know, then the false belief is no longer possible. The mythical Messiah was Horus in the Osirian mythos, Harkudi in the Suttyphonian. Kunsu in that of Amenare, Iu in the cult of Adamare, and the Christ of the Gospels is an amalgam of all these characters. The Christ is the Good Shepherd. So was Horus. Christ is the Lamb of God. So was Horus. Christ is the Bread of Life. So was Horus. Christ is the Truth and the Life. So was Horus. Christ is the fanbearer. So was Horus. Christ is the Lord. So was Horus. Christ is the way and the door of life. Horus was the path by which they traveled out of the sepulcher. He is the God whose name is written with the hieroglyphic sign of the road or way. 
Jesus is he that should come, and Iu, the root of the name in Egyptian, means, to come. Iuem Hept, as the Su, the son of Adam, or of Ta, was the ever-coming one, who is always portrayed as the marching youngster, in the act and attitude of coming. Horus included both sexes. The child, or the soul, is of either sex, and potentially, of both. Hence the hermaphrodital deity, and Jesus, in Revelation, is the young man who has the female paps. Iuem Hept signifies he who comes with peace. This is the character in which Jesus is announced by the angels. And when Jesus comes to his disciples after the resurrection it is as the bringer of peace. Learn of me and ye shall find rest, says the Christ. Kun Suneferhept is the good rest, peace in person. The Egyptian Jesus, Iuem Hept, was the second Adam, Paul's Jesus is the second Adam. In one rendition of John's Gospel, instead of the only begotten Son of God, a variant reading gives the only begotten God, which has been declared an impossible rendering. But the only begotten God was an especial type in Egyptian mythology, and the phrase re identifies the divinity whose emblem is the beetle. Hor Apollo says, to denote the only begotten or a father, the Egyptians delineate a scarabaeus. By this they symbolize an only begotten, because the creature is self produced, being unconceived by a female. Now the youthful manifester of the beetle god was this Yom Hept, the Egyptian Jesus. The very phraseology of John is common to the inscriptions, which tell of him who was the beginner of becoming from the first, and who made all things, but who himself was not made. I quote verbatim. And not only was the beetle god continued in the only begotten god, the beetle type was also brought on as a symbol of the Christ. Ambrose and Augustine, amongst the Christian fathers, identified Jesus with, and as, the good Scarabaeus, which further identifies the Jesus of John's Gospel with the Jesus of Egypt, who was the ever-coming one, and the bringer of peace. Whom I have elsewhere shown to be the Jesus to whom the book of Ecclesiasticus is inscribed, and ascribed in the Apocrypha. In accordance with this continuation of the Chemite symbols, it was also maintained by some sectaries that Jesus was a potter, and not a carpenter. And the fact is that this only begotten beetle god, who is portrayed sitting at the potter's wheel forming the egg, or shaping the vase symbol of creation, was the potter personified, as well as the only begotten god in Egypt. The character and teachings of the canonical Christ are composed of contradictions which cannot be harmonized as those of a human being, whereas they are always true to the mythos. He is the Prince of Peace, and yet he asserts that he came not to bring peace, I came not to send peace, but a sword, and not only is Iuem Hept the bringer of peace by name in one character, he is the sword personified in the other. In this he says, I am the living image of Adam, proceeding from him as a sword. Both characters belong to the mythical Messiah in the ritual, who also calls himself the Great Disturber, and the Great Tranquilizer, the God Contention, and the God Peace. The Christ of the canonical Gospels has several prototypes, and sometimes the copy is derived or the trade is caught from one original, and sometimes from the other. The Christ of Luke's Gospel has a character entirely distinct from that of John's Gospel. Here he is the great exorciser, and caster out of demons. John's Gospel contains no case of possession or obsession, no certain man who had devils this long time, no child possessed with a devil, no blind and dumb man possessed with a devil. Other miracles are performed by the Christ of John, but not these, because John's is a different type of the Christ. And the original of the great healer in Luke's Gospel may be found in the god Kunsu, who was the divine healer, the supreme one amongst all the other healers and saviors, especially as the caster out of demons. And the expeller of possessing spirits. He is called in the texts the great God, the driver away of possession. In the steel of the possessed princess, this God in his effigy is sent for by the chief of Bakhtin, that he may come and cast out a possessing spirit from the king's daughter, who has an evil movement in her limbs. The demon recognizes the divinity just as the devil recognizes Jesus, the expeller of evil spirits. Also the god Kunsu is lord over the pig A type of Sat. He is portrayed in the disc of the full moon of Easter, in the act of offering the pig as a sacrifice. Moreover, 
In the judgment scenes, when the wicked spirits are condemned and sent back into the abyss, their mode of return to the lake of primordial matter is by entering the bodies of swine. Says Horus to the gods, speaking of the condemned one, when I sent him to his place he went, and he has been transformed into a black pig. So when the exorcist in Luke's gospel casts out legion, the devils ask permission of the lord of the pig to be allowed to enter the swine, and he gives them leave. This, and much more that might be adduced, tends to differentiate the Christ of Luke, and to identify him with Kunsu, rather than with Iuem Hept, the Egyptian Jesus, who is reproduced in the Gospel according to John. In this way it can be proved that the history of Christ in the Gospels is one long and complete catalogue of likenesses to the mythical Messiah, the solar or lunisolar God. The Litany of R.A., for example, is addressed to the Sun God in a variety of characters, many of which are assigned to the Christ of the Gospels. R.A. is the supreme power, the beetle that rests in the Empyrean, who is born as his own son. This, as already said, is the God in John's Gospel, who says, I and the Father are one, and who is the Father born as his own son, for he says, In knowing and seeing the Son, from henceforth ye know him and have seen him, i.e., the Father. R.A. is designated the soul that speaks. Christ is the Word. R.A. is the destroyer of venom. Jesus says, In my name they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them. In one character R.A. is the outcast. So Jesus had not where to lay his head. R.A. is the timid one who sheds tears in the form of the afflicted. He is called Remy, the weeper. This weeping god passes through Remrem, the place of weeping, and there conquers on behalf of his followers. In the ritual the god says, I have desolated the place of Remrem. This character is sustained by Jesus in the morning over Jerusalem that was to be desolated. The words of John, Jesus wept, are like a carven statue of the afflicted one, as Remy, the weeper. R.A. is also the god who makes the mummy come forth. Jesus makes the mummy come forth in the shape of Lazarus, and in the Roman catacombs the risen Lazarus is not only represented as a mummy, but as an Egyptian mummy which has been eviscerated and swathed for the eternal abode. R.A. says to the mummy, Come forth, and Jesus cries, Lazarus, come forth. R.A. manifests as, the burning one, he who sends destruction, or, sends his fire into the place of destruction. He sends fire upon the rebels, his form is that of the God of the furnace. Christ also comes in the person of this burning one, the sender of destruction by fire. He is proclaimed by Matthew to be the baptizer with fire. He says, I am come to send fire on the earth. He is portrayed as God of the furnace, which shall burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He is to cast the rebellious into a furnace of fire and send the condemned ones into everlasting fire. All this was natural when applied to the solar god, and it is supposed to become supernatural when misapplied to a supposed human being to whom it never could apply. The solar fire was the primary African fount of theological hellfire and hell. The litany of R.A. collects the manifold characters that make up the total god, termed Tebtemt, and the Gospels have gathered up the mythical remains, thus the result is in each case identical, or entirely similar. From beginning to end the canonical Gospels contain the drama of the mysteries of the lunisolar God, narrated as a human history. The scene on the Mount of Transfiguration is obviously derived from the ascent of Osiris into the Mount of Transfiguration in the Moon. The sixth day was celebrated as that of the change and transformation of the solar God in the lunar orb, which he re-entered on that day as the regenerator of its light. With this we may compare the statement made by Matthew, that, after six days Jesus went up into a high mountain apart, and he was transfigured, and his face did shine as the sun, of course, and his garments became white as the light. In Egypt the year began soon after the summer solstice, when the sun descended from its midsummer height, lost its force, and lessened in its size. This represented Osiris, who was born of the Virgin Mother as the child Horus, the diminished infantile son of Autumn, the suffering, wounded, bleeding Messiah, as he was represented. He descended into Hell, or Hades, where he was transformed into the virile Horus, and rose again as the son of the Resurrection at Easter. 
In these two characters of Horus on the two horizons, Osiris furnished the dual type for the canonical Christ, which shows very satisfactorily how the mythical prescribes the boundaries beyond which the historical does not, dare not, go. The first was the child Horus, who always remained a child. In Egypt the boy or girl wore the Horus lock of childhood until twelve years of age. Thus childhood ended about the twelfth year. But although adultship was then entered upon by the youth, and the transformation of the boy into manhood began, the full adultship was not attained until thirty years of age. The man of thirty years was the typical adult. The age of adultship was thirty years, as it was in Rome under Lex Papia. The um fate is the man whose years are triad by tens, and who is kempt. As with the man, so it is with the god. And the second Horus, the same god in his second character, is the kempt or chem Horus, the typical adult of thirty years. The god up to twelve years was Horus, the child of Isis, the mother's child, the weakling. The virile Horus, the son in its vernal strength, the adult of thirty years, was representative of the fatherhood, and this Horus is the anointed son of Osiris. These two characters of Horus the child, and Horus the adult of thirty years, are reproduced in the only two phases of the life of Jesus in the Gospels. John furnishes no historic data for the time when the Word was incarnated and became flesh. Nor for the childhood of Jesus, nor for the transformation into the Messiah. But Luke tells us that the child of twelve years was the wonderful youth, and that he increased in wisdom and stature. This is the length of years assigned to Horus the child. And this phase of the child Christ's life is followed by the baptism and anointing, the descent of the pubescent spirit with the consecration of the Messiah in Jordan, when Jesus began to be about thirty years of age. The earliest anointing was the consecration of puberty, and here at the full age of the typical adult, the Christ, who was previously a child, the child of the Virgin Mother, is suddenly made into the Messiah, as the Lord's anointed. And just as the second Horus was regenerated, and this time begotten of the Father, so in the transformation scene of the baptism in Jordan, the Father authenticates the change into full adultship. With the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The spirit of pubescence, or the Ruach, being represented by the descending dove, called the Spirit of God. Thus from the time when the child Christ was about twelve years of age, until that of the typical um fate of Egypt, which was the age assigned to Horus when he became the adult god, there is no history. This is in exact accordance with the Camite allegory of the double Horus. And the mythos alone will account for the chasm which is wide and deep enough to engulf a supposed history of eighteen years. Childhood cannot be carried beyond the twelfth year, and the child Horus always remained a child, just as the child Christ does in Italy, and in German folk tales. The mythical record founded on nature went no further, and there the history consequently halts within the prescribed limits, to rebegin with the anointed and regenerated Christ at the age of Chem Horus, the adult of thirty years. And these two characters of Horus necessitated a double form of the mother, who divides into the two divine sisters, Isis and Nephthys. Jesus also was by mother, or dual mothered. And the two sisters reappear in the Gospels as the two Marys, both of whom are the mothers of Jesus. This again, which is impossible as human history, is perfect according to the mythos that explains it. As the child Horus, Osiris comes down to earth, he enters matter, and becomes mortal. He is born like the Logos, or, as a word. His father is Seb, the earth, whose consort is Nu, the heaven, one of whose names is Mary, the Lady of Heaven. And these two are the prototypes of Joseph and Mary. He is said to cross the earth a substitute, and to suffer vicariously as the Saviour, Redeemer, and Justifier of men. In these two characters there was constant conflict between Osiris and Typhon, the evil power, or Horus and Sut, the Egyptian Satan. At the autumn equinox, the devil of darkness began to dominate. This was the Egyptian Judas, who betrayed Osiris to his death at the Last Supper. On the day of the great battle at the vernal equinox, Osiris conquered as the ascending God, the Lord of the growing light. Both these struggles are portrayed in the Gospels. 
In the one Jesus is betrayed to his death by Judas, in the other he rises superior to Satan. The latter conflict followed immediately after the baptism. In this way when the sun was halfway round, from the lion sign, it crossed the river of the waterman, the Egyptian Iritana, Hebrew Jordan, Greek Eridanus. In this water the baptism occurred, and the transformation of the child Horus into the virile adult, the conqueror of the evil power, took place. Horus becomes hawk-headed, just where the dove ascended and abode on Jesus. Both birds represented the virile soul that constituted the anointed one at puberty. By this added power Horus vanquished Sut, and Jesus overcame Satan. Both the baptism and the contest are referred to in the ritual. I am washed with the same water in which the good opener, Unnefer, washes when he disputes with Satan, that justification should be made to Unnefer, the word made truth, or the word that is law. The scene between the Christ and the woman at the well may likewise be found in the ritual. Here the woman is the lady with the long hair, that is new, the consort of Seb and the five husbands can be paralleled by her five star gods born of Seb. Osiris drinks out of the well, to take away his thirst. He also says, I am creating the water. I make way in the valley, in the pool of the great one. Make road, or roadmaker, expresses what I am. I am the path by which they traverse out of the sepulchre of Osiris. So the Messiah reveals himself as the source of living water, that springeth up unto everlasting life. Later on he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am creating the water, discriminating the seed, says Horus. Jesus says, The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Jesus claims that this well of life was given to him by the Father. In the ritual it says, He is thine, O Osiris. A well, or flow, comes out of thy mouth to him. Also, the paternal source is acknowledged in another text. I am the Father, inundating when there is thirst, guarding the water. Behold me at it. Moreover, in another chapter the well of living water becomes the pool of peace. The speaker says, The well has come through me. I wash in the pool of peace. In Hebrew, the pool of peace is the pool of Salem, or Siloam. And here, not only is the pool described at which the Osirified are made pure and healed, not only does the angel or God descend to the waters that, certain times, are actually dated. The gods of the pure waters are there on the fourth hour of the night, and the eighth hour of the day, saying, Pass away hence, to him who has been cured. An epitome of a considerable portion of John's Gospel may be found in another chapter of the ritual, Ye gods come to be my servants, I am the Son of your Lord. Ye are mine through my Father, who gave you to me. I have been among the servants of Hathor or Mary. I have been washed by thee, O attendant. Compare the washing of Jesus' feet by Mary. The Osiris exclaims, I have welcomed the chief spirits in the service of the Lord of things. I am the Lord of the fields when they are white, i.e., for the reapers and the harvest. So the Christ now says to the disciples, Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that are white already unto the harvest. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest that he send forth laborers into his harvest. And he called unto him his twelve disciples. Now, if we turn to the Egyptian, Book of Hades, the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, and the reapers of the harvest are all portrayed, the twelve are also there. In one scene they are preceded by a god leaning on a staff, who is designated the master of joy a surname of the Messiah Horus when assimilated to the Soli Lunar Kunsu, the twelve are, they who labor at the harvest in the plains of Nedarkar. A bearer of a sickle shows the inscription, These are the reapers. The twelve are divided into two groups of five and seven the original seven of the Ahenru, these seven are the reapers. The other five are bending towards an enormous ear of corn, the image of the harvest, ripe and ready for the sickles of the seven. The total twelve are called the happy ones, the bearers of food. Another title of the twelve is that of the just ones. The God says to the reapers, Take your sickles. 
reap your grain. Honor to you, reapers. Offerings are made to them on earth, as bearers of sickles in the fields of Hades. On the other hand, the tares or the wicked are to be cast out and destroyed forever. These twelve are the apostles in their Egyptian phase. In the chapters on Celestial Diet, in the ritual, Osiris eats under the sycamore tree of Hathor. He says, Let him come from the earth. Thou hast brought these seven loaves for me to live by, bringing the bread that Horus, the Christ, makes. Thou hast placed, thou hast eaten rations. Let him call to the gods for them, or the gods come with them to him. This is reproduced as miracle in the Gospels, performed when the multitude were fed upon seven loaves. The seven loaves are found here, together with the calling upon the gods, or working the miracle of multiplying the bread. In the next chapter there is a scene of eating and drinking. The speaker, who impersonates the Lord, says, I am the Lord of bread in Anu. My bread at the heaven was that of Are, my bread on earth was that of Seb. The seven loaves represent the bread of Are. Elsewhere the number prescribed to be set on one table, as an offering, is five loaves. These are also carried on the heads of five different persons in the scenes of the underworld. Five loaves are the bread of Seb. Thus five loaves represent the bread of earth, and seven the bread of heaven. Both five and seven are sacred regulation numbers in the Egyptian ritual. And in the Gospel of Matthew the miracles are wrought with five loaves in the one case, and seven in the other, when the multitudes are fed on celestial diet. This will explain the two different numbers in one and the same Gospel miracle. In the canonical narrative there is a lad with five barley loaves and two fishes. In the next chapter of the ritual we possibly meet with the lad himself, as the miracle worker says, I have given breath to the said youth. The Gnostics asserted truly that celestial persons and celestial scenes had been transferred to earth in our Gospels, and it is only within the Pleroma, the Heaven, or in the Zodiac that we can at times identify the originals of both. And it is there we must look for the two fishes. As the latest form of the Manifestor was in the Heaven of the Twelve Signs, that probably determined the number of twelve baskets full of food remaining when the multitude had all been fed. They that ate the loaves were five thousand men, and five thousand was the exact number of the celestials or gods in the Assyrian paradise, before the revolt and fall from heaven. The scene of the miracle of the loaves and fishes is followed by an attempt to take Jesus by force, but he withdraws himself, and this is succeeded by the miracle of his walking on the waters, and conquering the wind and waves. So is it in the ritual. Chapter 57 is that of the breath prevailing over the water in Hades. The speaker, having to cross over, says, O oh happy! Let the Osiris prevail over the waters, like as the Osiris prevailed against the taking by stealth, the night of the great struggle. The solar god was betrayed to his death by the Egyptian Judas, on the night of the taking by stealth, which was the night of the Last Supper. The god is waylaid by the conspirators, who have watched very much. They are said to smell him out by the eating of his bread. So the Christ is waylaid by Judas, who knew the place, for Jesus often resorted thither, and by the Jews who had long watched to take him. The smelling of Osiris by the eating of his bread is remarkably rendered by John at the eating of the Last Supper. The ritual has it, they smell Osiris by the eating of his bread, transporting the evil of Osiris. And when he had dipped the sop he gave it to Judas Iscariot, and after the sop Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus to him into whom the evil or devil had been transported, that thou doest, do quickly. Osiris was the same, beseeching burial. Here it is demonstrable that the non-historical Herod is a form of the Apophis serpent, called the enemy of the sun. In Syriac, Herod is a red dragon. Herod, in Hebrew, signifies a terror. Haru, e.g., is to terrify, and Herut, e.g., is the snake, the typical reptile. The blood of the divine victim that is poured forth by the Apophis serpent at the sixth hour, on, the night of smiting the profane, is literally shed by Herod, as the Herut or Typhonian serpent. The speaker, in the ritual asks, who art thou then, Lord of the silent body? I have come to see him who is in the serpent, eye to eye, 
and face to face. Lord of the Silent Body, is a title of the Osiris. Who art thou then, Lord of the Silent Body, is asked and left unanswered. This character is also assigned to the Christ. The high priest said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? But Jesus held his peace. Herod questioned him in many words, but he answered him nothing. He acts the prescribed character of, Lord of the Silent Body. The transaction in the sixth hour of the night of the crucifixion is expressly inexplicable. In the Gospel we read, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. The sixth hour being midnight, that shows the solar nature of the mystery, which has been transferred to the sixth hour of the day in the Gospel. It is in the seventh hour the mortal struggle takes place between the Osiris and the deadly Apophis, or the great serpent, Haber, 450 cubits long, that fills the whole heaven with its vast enveloping folds. The name of this seventh hour is, That Which Wounds the Serpent Haber. In this conflict with the evil power thus portrayed the sun god is designated the conqueror of the grave, and is said to make his advance through the influence of Isis, who aids him in repelling the serpent or devil of darkness. In the Gospel, Christ is likewise set forth in the supreme struggle as conqueror of the grave, for the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and Mary represents Isis, the mother, at the cross. It is said of the great serpent, there are those on earth who do not drink of the waters of this serpent, Haber, which may be paralleled with the refusal of the Christ to drink of the vinegar mingled with gall. When the God has overcome the Apophis serpent, his old knightly, annual, and eternal enemy, he exclaims, I come. I have made my way. I have come like the sun, through the gate of the one who likes to deceive and destroy, otherwise called the viper. I have made my way. I have bruised the serpent, I have passed. But the more express representation in the mysteries was that of the annual sun as the elder Horus, or Adam. As Julius Firmicus says, in the solemn celebration of the mysteries, all things in order had to be done which the youth either did or suffered in his death. Diodorus Siculus rightly identified the whole fable of the underworld, that was dramatized in Greece, as having been copied from the ceremonies of the Egyptian funerals, and so brought on from Egypt into Greece and Rome. One part of this mystery was the portrayal of the suffering sun god in a feminine phase. When the suffering sun was ailing and ill, he became female, such being a primitive mode of expression. Luke describes the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane as being in a great agony, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. This experience the Gnostics identified with the suffering of their own hemorrhoidal Sophia, whose passion is the original of that which is celebrated during Passion Week, the Week of Weeping in Abtu, and which constitutes the fundamental mystery of the Rosy Cross and the Rose of Silence. In this agony and bloody sweat the Christ simply fulfills the character of Osiris Tesh Tesh, the Red Sun, the Sun God that suffers his agony and bloody sweat in Smen, whence Gethsemen, or Gethsemane. Tesh means the bleeding, red, gory, separate, cut, and wounded, Tesh Tesh is the inert form of the God whose suffering, like that of Adonis, was represented as feminine, which alone reaches a natural origin for the type. He was also called Ansra, or the sun bound up in linen. So natural were the primitive mysteries. My attention has just been called to a passage in Lycophron, who lived under Ptolemy Philadelphus between 310 and 246 BC. In this Heracles is referred to as that three-night lion, whom of old Triton's fierce dog with furious jaw devoured, within whose bowels, tearing of his liver, he rolled, burning with heat, though without fire. His head with drops of sweat bedewed all o'er. This describes the god suffering his agony in sweat, which is called the bloody flux of Osiris. Here the nights are three in number. So the Son of Man was to be three nights as well as three days in the heart of the earth. In the Gospels this prophecy is not fulfilled, but if we include the night of the bloody sweat, we have the necessary three nights, and the mythos becomes perfect. In this phase the suffering sun was the red sun, whence the typical red lion. As Adam, 
The red sun is described as setting from the land of life in all the colors of crimson, or pant, the red pool. This clothing of colors is represented as a gorgeous robe by Luke, a purple robe by Mark, and a robe of scarlet by Matthew. As he goes down at the autumn equinox, he is the crucified. His mother, knew, or Mary, the heaven, seeing her son, the Lord of terror, greatest of the terrible, setting from the land of life, with his hands drooping, she becomes obscure, and there is great darkness over all the land. As at the crucifixion described by Matthew, in which the passing of the Lord of terror is rendered by the terrible or loud cry of the synoptic version. The sun god causes the dead, or those in the earth, to live as he passes down into the underworld, because, as he entered the earth, the tombs were opened, i.e., figuratively. But it is reproduced literally by Matthew. The death of Osiris, in the ritual, is followed by the night of the mystery of the great shapes, and it is explained that the night of the great shapes is when there has been made the embalming of the body of Osiris, the good being. Justified forever. In the chapter on, the night of the laying out, of the dead body of Osiris, it is said that, Isis rises on the night of the laying out of the dead body, to lament over her brother Osiris. And again, the night of the laying out, of the dead Osiris, is mentioned, and again it is described as that on which Isis had risen, to make a wail for her brother. But this is also the night on which he conquers his enemies, and, receives the birthplace of the gods. He tramples on the bandages they make for their burial. He raises his soul, and conceals his body. So the Christ is found to have unwound the linen bandages of burial, and they saw the linen in one place, and the napkin in another. He too conceals his body. This is closely reproduced, or paralleled, in John's Gospel, where it is Mary Magdalene who rises in the night and comes to the sepulchre, while it was yet dark, to find the Christ arisen, as the conqueror of death and the grave. In John's version, after the body is embalmed in a hundred pounds weight of spice, consisting of myrrh and aloes, we have the night of the mystery of the shapes, for while it was yet dark, Mary Magdalene coming to the sepulchre, and peering in. Sees the two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body had lately lain. And in the chapter of, How a Living Being is Not Destroyed in Hell, or the hour of life ends not in Hades, there are two youthful gods, two youths of light, who prevail as those who see the light, and the vignette shows the deceased walking off. He has risen. Matthew has only one angel resplendent presence, whose appearance was as lightning, which agrees with Shepi, the splendid one, who lights the sarcophagus, as a representative of the divinity, R.A. The risen Christ, who is first seen and recognized by Mary, says to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. The same scene is described by the Gnostics, when Sophia rushes forward to embrace the Christ, who restrains her by exclaiming that he must not be touched. In the last chapter of the Preservation of the Body in Hades, there is much mystical matter that looks plainer when written out in John's Gospel. It is said of the regerminated or risen God, May the Osirian speak to thee. The Osirian does not know. He, Osiris, knows him. Let him not grasp him. The Osirified, comes out sound, immortal is his name. He has passed along the upper roads, that is, as a risen spirit. He it is who grasps with his hand, and gives the palpable proof of continued personality, as does the Christ, who says, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. The sun god rearises on the horizon, where he issues forth, saying to those who belong to his race, Give me your arm. Says the Osirified deceased, I am made as ye are. Let him explain it. At his reappearance the Christ demonstrates that he is made as they are, See my hands and feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. And when he had said this he showed them his hands and feet. Then he said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and see my hands, and reach hither thy hand and put it into my side. These descriptions correspond to that of the cut, wounded, and bleeding sun god, who says to his companions, Give me your arm. I am made as ye are. In the Gospel of the Hebrews he is made to exclaim, for I am not a bodiless ghost. But in the original, when the risen one says to his companions, 
Give me your arm, I am made as ye are, he speaks as a spirit to spirits. Whereas in the Gospels, the Christ has to demonstrate that he is not a spirit, because the scene has been transferred into the earth life. The Gnostics truly declared that all the supernatural transactions asserted in the Christian Gospel, were counterparts, or representations, of what took place above. That is, they affirmed the history to be mythical. The celestial allegory made mundane, and they were in the right, as the Egyptian Gospel proves. There are healers, and Jehoshua ben Pandira may have been one. But, because that is possible, we must not allow it to vouch for the impossible. Thus, in the Gospels, the mythical is, and has to be, continually reproduced as miracle. That which naturally pertains to the character of the Sun God becomes supernatural in appearance when brought down to earth. The Solar God descended into the nether world as the restorer of the bound to liberty, the dead to life. In this region the miracles were wrought, and the transformations took place. The evil spirits and destroying powers were exorcised from the mummies, the halt and the maimed were enabled to get up and go, the dead were raised, a mouth was given to the dumb, and the blind were made to see. This reconstitution of the deceased is transferred to the earth life, whereupon, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up at the coming of the Christ. Who performed the miracles? The drama, which the idiotime mistook for human history, was performed by the sun god in another world. I could keep on all day, and all night, or give a dozen lectures, without exhausting my evidence that the canonical gospels are only a later literalized ratio fay of the Egyptian writings. The representations in the mysteries, and the oral teachings of the Gnostics which passed out of Egypt into Greece and Rome for there is plenty more proof where this comes from. I can but offer a specimen brick of that which is elsewhere a building set foursquare, and sound against every blast that blows. The Christian dispensation is believed to have been ushered in by the birth of a child, and the portrait of that child in the Roman catacombs as the child of Mary is the youthful sun god in the mummy image of the child king, the Egyptian Charist. Or Christ. The alleged facts of our Lord's life as Jesus the Christ, were equally the alleged facts of our Lord's life as the Horus of Egypt, whose very name signifies the Lord. The Christian legends were first related of Horus the Messiah, the solar hero, the greatest hero that ever lived in the mind of man, not in the flesh the only hero to whom the miracles were natural, because he was not human. From beginning to end the history is not human but divine, and the divine is the mythical. From the descent of the Holy Ghost to overshadow Mary, to the ascension of the risen Christ at the end of forty days, according to the drama of the pre-Christian mysteries, the subject matter, the characters, occurrences, events, acts, and sayings bear the impress of the mythical mold instead of the stamp of human history. Right through, the ideas which shaped the history were pre-extant, and are identifiably pre-Christian, and so we see the strange sight today in Europe of one hundred million of pagans masquerading as Christians. Whether you believe it or not does not matter, the fatal fact remains that every trait and feature which go to make up the Christ as divinity, and every event or circumstance taken to establish the human personality were pre-extant. And pre-applied to the Egyptian and Gnostic Christ, who never could become flesh. The Jesus Christ with female paps, who is the Alpha and Omega of Revelation, was the I.U. of Egypt, and the I.A.O. of the Chaldeans. Jesus as the Lamb of God, and Ichthys the fish, was Egyptian. Jesus as the Coming One. Jesus born of the Virgin Mother, who was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost, Jesus born of two mothers, both of whose names are Mary, Jesus born in the manger at Christmas, and again at Easter, Jesus saluted by the three kings, or Magi. Jesus of the Transfiguration on the Mount, Jesus whose symbol in the catacombs is the eight-rayed star the star of the East, Jesus as the Eternal Child, Jesus as God the Father, reborn as His own Son, Jesus as the Child of Twelve Years. Jesus as the Anointed One of Thirty Years, Jesus in His Baptism, Jesus walking on the waters, or working His miracles, Jesus as the caster out of demons, Jesus as a substitute, who suffered in a vicarious atonement for sinful men. Jesus whose followers are the two brethren, the four fishers, the seven fishers, the twelve apostles, the seventy, 
or seventy-two in some texts, whose names were written in heaven, Jesus who was administered to by seven women. Jesus in his bloody sweat, Jesus betrayed by Judas, Jesus as conqueror of the grave, Jesus the resurrection and the life, Jesus before Herod, in the Hades, and in his reappearance to the women, and to the seven fishers. Jesus who was crucified both on the fourteenth and fifteenth of the month Nisan, Jesus who was also crucified in Egypt, as it is written in Revelation. Jesus as judge of the dead, with the sheep on the right hand, and the goats on the left, is Egyptian from first to last, in every phase, from the beginning to the end make whatsoever you can of Jehoshua ben Pandira. In some of the ancient Egyptian temples the Christian iconoclasts, when tired of hacking and hewing at the symbolic figures incised in the chambers of imagery, and defacing the most prominent features of the monuments, found they could not dig out the hieroglyphics and took to covering them over with plaster or tempera. And this plaster, intended to hide the meaning and stop the mouth of the stone word, has served to preserve the ancient writings, as fresh in hue and sharp in outline as when they were first cut and colored. In a similar manner the temple of the ancient religion was invaded, and possession gradually gained by connivance of Roman power. And that enduring fortress, not built, but quarried out of the solid rock, was stuccoed all over the front, and made white a while with its look of brand newness, and reopened under the sign of another name that of the Carnalist Christ. And all the time each nook and corner were darkly alive with the presence and the proofs of the earlier gods, and the pre-Christian origins, even though the hieroglyphics remained unread until the time of Champollion. But stucco is not for lasting wear, it cracks and crumbles, sloughs off and slinks away into its natal insignificance, the rock is the sole true foundation, the rock is the only record in which we can reach reality at last. Wilkinson, the Egyptologist, has actually said of Osiris on earth, some may be disposed to think that the Egyptians, being aware of the promises of the real Saviour, had anticipated that event, regarding it as though it had already happened. And introduced that mystery into their religious system. This is what obstetrists term a false presentation, a birth feat foremost. We are also told by writers on the catacombs, and the Christian iconography, that this figure is Osiris, as a type of Christ. This is Pan, Apollo, Aristius, as a type of Christ. This is Harpocrates, as a type of Christ. This is Mercury, but as a type of Christ, this is the devil, for Sut Mercury was the devil, as a type of Christ. Until long hearing of the facts reversed, perverted and falsified, makes one feel as if under a nightmare which has lasted for eighteen centuries, knowing the truth to have been buried alive and made dumb all that time. And believing that it has only to get voice and make itself heard to end the lying once for all, and bring down the curtain of oblivion at last upon the most pitiful drama of delusion ever witnessed on the human stage. And here the worst foes of the truth have ever been, and still are, the rationalizers of the mythos, such as the Unitarians. They have assumed the human history as the starting point, and accepted the existence of a personal founder of Christianity as the one initial and fundamental fact. They have done their best to humanize the divinity of the mythos, by discharging the supernatural and miraculous element, in order that the narrative might be accepted as history. Thus they have lost the battle from the beginning, by fighting it on the wrong ground. The Christ is a popular lay figure that never lived, and a lay figure of pagan origin, a lay figure that was once the ram, and afterwards the fish. A lay figure that in human form was the portrait and image of a dozen different gods. The imagery of the catacombs shows that the types there represented are not the ideal figures of the human reality. They are the sole reality for six or seven centuries after AD, because they had been so in the centuries long before. There is no man upon the cross in the catacombs of Rome for seven hundred years. The symbolism, the allegories, the figures, and types, brought on by the Gnostics, remained there just what they had been to the Romans, Greeks, Persians, and Egyptians. Yet, the dummy ideal of paganism is supposed to have become doubly real as the God who was made flesh, to save mankind from the impossible, fall. Remember that the primary foundation stone for a history in the New Testament is dependent upon the fall of man being a fact in the Old, whereas it was only a fable, which had its own mythical and unhistorical meaning. 
When we try it over again that first step once taken in the dark, we find no foothold for us, because there was no stair. The fall is absolutely non-historical, and, consequently, the first bit of standing ground for an actual Christ, the Redeemer, is missing in the very beginning. Anyone who set up, or was set up, for an historical savior from a non-historical fall, could only be an historical impostor. But the Christ of the Gospels is not even that. He is in no sense an historical personage. It is impossible to establish the existence of an historical character, even as an impostor. For such an one the two witnesses astronomical mythology and Gnosticism completely prove an alibi forever. From the first supposed catastrophe to the final one, the figures of the celestial allegory were ignorantly mistaken for matters of fact. And thus the orthodox crystallator is left at last to climb to heaven with one foot resting on the ground of a redemption that must be fallacious. It is a fraud founded on a fable. Every time the Christian turns to the East to bow his obeisance to the Christ, it is a confession that the cult is solar, the admission being all the more fatal because it is unconscious. Every picture of the Christ, with the halo of glory, and the accompanying cross of the equinox, proffers proof. The Christian doctrine of a resurrection furnishes evidence, absolutely conclusive, of the astronomical and Cronian nature of the origins. This is to occur, as it always did, at the end of a cycle, or at the end of the world. Christian revelation knows nothing of immortality, except in the form of periodic renewal, dependent on the coming one, and the resurrection of the dead still depends on the day of judgment and the last day, at the end of the world. They have no other world. Their only other world is at the end of this. Now there are no fools living who would be fools big enough to cross the Atlantic Ocean in a bark so rotten and unseaworthy as this in which they hope to cross the dark river of death, and, on a pier of cloud, be landed safe in heaven. The Christian theology was responsible for substituting faith instead of knowledge, and the European mind is only just beginning to recover from the mental paralysis induced by that doctrine which came to its natural culmination in the Dark Ages. The Christian religion is responsible for enthroning the cross of death in heaven, with a deity on it, doing public penance for a private failure in the commencement of creation. It has taught men to believe that the vilest spirit may be washed white, in the atoning blood of the purest, offered up as a bribe to an avenging God. It has divinized a figure of helpless human suffering, and a face of pitiful pain. As if there were naught but a great heartache at the core of all things, or the vast infinite were but a veiled and sad-eyed sorrow that brings visibly to birth in the miseries of human life. But, in the old pagan world men deified the beautiful, the glad. As they will again, upon a loftier pedestal, when the fable of this fictitious fall of man, and false redemption by the cloud-begotten God, has passed away like a phantasm of the night. And men awake to learn that they are here to wage ceaseless war upon sordid suffering, remediable wrong, and preventable pain. Here to put an end to them, not to apotheosize an effigy of sorrow to be adored as a type of the eternal. For the most beneficent is the most beautiful, the happiest are the healthiest, the most godlike is most glad. The Christian cult has fanatically fought for its false theory, and waged incessant warfare against nature and evolution nature's intention made somewhat visible and against some of the noblest instincts, during eighteen centuries. Seas of human blood have been spilt to keep the bark of Peter afloat. Earth has been honeycombed with the graves of the martyrs of free thought. Heaven has been filled with a horror of great darkness in the name of God. Eighteen centuries are a long while in the lifetime of a lie, but a brief span in the eternity of truth. The fiction is sure to be found out, and the lie will fall at last. At last. At last. No matter though it towers to the sky. And darkens earth, you cannot make the lie immortal, though stupendously enshrined by art in every perfect mold of mind. Angelo, Raphael, Milton, Handel, all its pillars, cannot stay it from the fall. The pyramid of imposture reared by Rome. All of cement, for an eternal home. Must crumble back to earth, and every gust. Shall revel in the desert of its dust. And when the prison of the immortal, mind, hath fallen to set free the bound and blind, 
no more shall life be one long dread of death. Humanity shall breathe with ampler breath. Expand in spirit, and in stature rise. To match its birthplace of the earth and skies. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Paul the Gnostic opponent of Peter, not an apostle of historic Christianity. Fuller Egyptian and Gnostic data, with references to the authorities, may be found in the author's Natural Genesis. It has been shown in previous lectures that the matter of our canonical Gospels is, to a large extent, mythical, and that the Gnosis of ancient Egypt was carried into other lands by the underground passage of the mysteries. To emerge at last as the literalized legend of historic Christianity. The mythical Christ was as surely continued from Egypt as were the mythical types of the Christ on the Gnostic stones and in the catacombs of Rome. Once this ground is felt to be firm underfoot it emboldens and warrants us in cutting the Gordian knot that has been so deftly complicated for us in the epistles of Paul. Today we have to face a problem that is one of the most difficult. It is my object to prove that Paul was the opponent and not the apostle of historic Christianity. It is well known to all serious students of the subject that there was an original rent or rift of difference between the preacher Paul and the other founders of Christianity, whom he first met in Jerusalem namely, Cephas, or Peter, James, and John. He did not think much of them personally, but scoffs a little at their pretensions to being pillars of the church. Those men had nothing in common with him from the first, and never forgave him for his independence and opposition to the last. But the depth of that visible rift has not yet been fathomed in consequence of false assumptions. And my own researches and determination to look and think for myself have led me to the inevitable conclusion that there is but one way in which it can be bottomed for the first time. It is likewise more or less apprehended that two voices are heard contending in Paul's epistles, to the confounding of the writer's sense and the confusion of the readers. They utter different doctrines, so fundamentally opposed as to be forever irreconcilable. And this duplicity of doctrine makes Paul, who is the one distinct and single-minded personality of the New Testament, look like the most double-faced of men, double-tongued as the serpent. The two doctrines are those of the Gnostic, or spiritual Christ, and the historic Jesus. Both cannot be true to Paul, and my contention is that both voices did not proceed from him personally. We know that Paul and the other apostles did not preach the same gospel, and it is my present purpose to show that they did not set forth or celebrate the same Christ. My thesis is, that Paul was not a supporter of the system known as historical Christianity, which was founded on a belief in the Christ Carnalist, an assumption that the Christ had been made flesh. But that he was its unceasing and deadly opponent during his lifetime. And that after his death his writings were tampered with, interpolated, and re-indoctrinated by his old enemies, the forgers and falsifiers, who first began to weave the web of the papacy in Rome. In this way there was added a fourth pillar or cornerstone to the original three in Jerusalem, which was turned into the chief support of the whole structure, the firmest foundation of the fallacious faith. The supreme feat, performed in secret by the managers of the mysteries in Rome, was this conversion of the epistles of Paul into the main support of historic Christianity. It was the very pivot on which the total imposture turned. In his lifetime he had fought tooth and nail, with tongue and pen, against the men who founded the faith of the Christ made flesh, and damned eternally all disbelievers. And after his death they reared the church of the Sarcolatru above his tomb, and for eighteen centuries have, with a forged warrant, claimed him as being the first and foremost among the founders. They cleverly damned the course of the natural river that flowed forth from its own independent source in the epistles of Paul, and turned its waters into their own artificial canal so that Paul's living force should be made to float the bark of Peter. Nevertheless, those who care to look closely will see that the two waters, like those of the river Rhone, will not mingle in one color. And it appears to me that, whether Paul was mad or not in this life, such nefarious treatment of his writings was bad enough to drive him frantic in the next, 
and make him insane there until the wrong is righted. It is the universal assumption that Paul, the persecutor of the early Christians, was converted by a vision of the risen Jesus, who proved his historic nature and identity by appearing to Paul in person. So it is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. The account, however, is entirely opposed to that which is given by Paul himself in his epistle to the Galatians. He tells how the change occurred, which has been called his conversion. It was by revelation of the Christ within, but not by an objective vision of a personal Jesus, who demonstrated in spirit world the reality and identity of an historic Jesus of Nazareth, who had lately lived on earth. Such a version as that is rigorously impossible, according to Paul's own words. His account of the matter is totally antipodal. He received his commission to preach the Christ, as he declares, when it was the good pleasure of God to reveal his Son in me, and therefore not by an apparition of Jesus of Nazareth outside of him. His Christ within was not the corpus of Christian belief, but the Christ of the Gnosis. He heard no voice external to himself, which could be converted into the audible voice of an historic Jesus. And nothing can be more instructive to begin with, than a comparative study of these two versions, for showing how the matter has been manipulated, and the facts perverted, for the purpose of establishing or supporting an orthodox history. What he did here when caught up in the spirit he tells us was unspeakable, words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. He makes no mention of a Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, Jesus of Nazareth is unknown to Paul. His name never once appears in the epistles, and the significance of the fact in favor of the present view can hardly be exaggerated. So, Jesus of Nazareth does not appear in the Gospel of Mark Ion. Or, as it was represented by some of the Christian fathers, Mark Ion had removed the name of Jesus of Nazareth from his particular Gospel being so virulent a heretic. Here we find Paul in agreement with Mark Ion, the Gnostic rejecter of Jesus of Nazareth, and of historic Christianity. Moreover, Paul was the only apostle of the true Christ who was recognized by Mark Ion. Now, as Mark Ion had rejected the human nature of the Christ, and left the sect which ultimately became the Church of Historic Christianity, it is impossible that he could have adopted or upheld the Gospel of Paul as it has come down to us in our version of the Epistles. Hence, Irenaeus complains that Mark Ion dismembered the Epistles of Paul, and removed those passages from the prophetical writings which had been quoted to teach us that they announced beforehand the coming of the Lord. That is, Mark Ion, the man who knew, recognized his fellow Gnostic in Paul, but rejected the literalizations and the spurious doctrines which had been surreptitiously interpolated by the founders, who were the forgers, of historic Christianity. Further, with regard to the Martianites, Irenaeus says they alleged that Paul alone, of all the Christian teachers, knew the truth, and that to him the mystery was manifested by revelation. They spoke as Gnostics of a Gnostic. At the same time, as Irenaeus tells us, the Gnostics, of whom Mark Ion was one, charged the other apostles with hypocrisy, because they framed their doctrine according to the capacity of their hearers. Fabling blind things for the blind according to their blindness. For the dull, according to their dullness, for those in error, according to their errors. Clement Alexander asserts that Paul, before going to Rome, stated that he would bring to the brethren, not the true gospel history, but, the Gnosis, or Gnostic communication, the tradition of the hidden mysteries. As the fullness of the blessings of Christ, which Clement says were revealed by the Son of God, the teacher who trains the Gnostic by mysteries, I. E. by revelations made in the state of trance. He was going there as a Gnostic, and therefore as the natural opponent of historic Christianity. The conversion of Paul, according to the Acts, is supposed to have occurred sometime after the year 30 AD at the earliest. And yet if we accept the data furnished by the book of Acts and Paul's epistle to the Galatians, he must have been converted as early as the year 27 AD Paul states that after his conversion he did not go up to Jerusalem for three years. Then after fourteen more years he went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. This second visit can be dated by means of the famine, which is historic, and known to have occurred in the year 44, at which time relief was conveyed to the brethren in Judea by Barnabas and Paul. 
If we take 17 years from 44, the different statements go to show that Paul had been converted as early as the year 27. Thus, according to the dates and the data derived from the Acts, from Paul's epistle, and the historic fact of the famine, Paul was converted to Christianity in the year 27 of our era. This could not have been by a spiritual manifestation of the supposed personal Jesus, who was not then dead, and had not at that time been rebegotten as the Christ of the canonical history. This is usually looked upon, by Rana, for example, as such an absurdity that no credence can be allowed to the account in the Acts. On the contrary, and notwithstanding all that has been said by those whose work it is to put a false bottom into the unknown, I am free to maintain that nothing stands in the way of its being a possibility and a fact. Except the assumption that it is an impossibility. You cannot date one event by another which never occurred, or, if it did occur, is not recorded by Paul, especially when his own account offers negative evidence of its non-occurrence. It is only using plain words justifiably to say that the concoctors of the Acts falsify whenever it is convenient, and tell the truth when they cannot help it. In Paul's own account of his conversion he continues, Immediately, I conferred not with the flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia. He did not seek to know anything about the personal Jesus of Nazareth, his life, his miracles, his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Had no anxiety to hear anything whatever from living witnesses or relatives about the human nature of this divine being, who is supposed to have appeared to Paul in person, completely changed the current of his life, and transformed his character. No wish even to verify the historic or possible groundwork for the reality of his alleged vision of Jesus. When he did go up to Jerusalem, three years afterwards, and again in fourteen years. He positively learned nothing whatever from those who ought to have been able to teach him and tell him all things on matters of vital importance, for historic Christianity, about which he should have been most desirous to know. But had no manifest desire of knowing. He saw James, Peter, and John, who were the pillars of the church and persons of repute, but whatever they were it made no matter to him, they imparted nothing to him. He says these respectable persons, these pillars, who seemed to be somewhat, communicated nothing to him, contrarywise, it was he who had a gospel of his own, which he had received from no man, to communicate to them. He had come to bring them the Gnosis. They privately gave him the hand of fellowship, and offered to acknowledge him if he would keep out of their way with his other gospel go to the Gentiles, or go to the devil, and leave them alone. There was a compromise, and therefore something to compromise, though not on Paul's account, but the only point of genuine agreement between them was that they agreed to differ. On comparing notes, he found that they were preaching quite another gospel, and another Jesus. We know what their gospel was, because it has come down to us in the doctrines and dogmas of historic Christianity. It was the gospel of the literalizers of mythology, the gospel of the Christ made flesh to save mankind from an impossible fall, the gospel of salvation by the atoning blood of Christ. The gospel that would make a hell of this life, on purpose to win heaven hereafter, the gospel of flesh and physics, including the corporeal resurrection, and the immediate ending of the world. The gospel that has no other world except at the end of this. Theirs was that other gospel with its doctrines of delusion, against which Paul waged continual warfare. For, another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel were being preached by these preeminent apostles who were the opponents of Paul. He warns the Corinthians against those, preeminent apostles, whom he calls false prophets, deceitful workers, and ministers of Satan, who came among them to preach, another Jesus, whom he did not preach. And a different gospel from that which they had received from him. To the Galatians he says, If any man preacheth unto you any gospel other than that which ye received, let him be damned, or let him be anathema. He chides them, O, oh, foolish, Galatians, who did bewitch you? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye perfected in the flesh? That is, in the gospel of the Christ made flesh, the gospel to those who were at enmity with him, who followed on his track like Satan sowing tares by night to choke the seed of the spiritual gospel which Paul had so painfully sown, and who, as he intimates to the Thessalonians, were quite capable of forging epistles in his name to deceive his followers. 
It has never yet been shown how fundamental was this feud between Paul and the forgers of the fleshly faith, because the real facts had not been grappled with or grasped concerning the totally different bases of belief. And the forever irreconcilable Gospels of the Gnostic or spiritual Christ, and of the Christ made flesh, to be set forth as the Saviour of mankind, according to historic Christianity. It was impossible that Paul and Peter should draw or pull together, the different grounds of their faith were in the beginning from pole to pole apart. He says, I made known to you, brethren, as touching the gospel which was preached by me, that it is not after man. For neither did I receive it from man, or from a man, nor was I taught it, save through revelation of the Christ revealed within. He did not derive his facts from history, nor his gospel from the apostles, he was neither taught by man nor book. He derived his gospel from direct personal revelation of the Christ within. In short, his Christ was not that Jesus of Nazareth whom he never mentions, and whom the others preached, and who may have been, and in all likelihood was, Joshua ben Pandira, the Nazarene. From the present standpoint there is no doctrinal difficulty, even about Paul being the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews. I do not need to call in another author here any more than elsewhere. The double dealing of the interpolators and forgers would be cause enough to account for all the difference and the difficulty. They who would have, or who had forged epistles in his own name, would not scruple to indoctrinate his writings when they got the chance, and if this epistle be not Paul's, then his name as author has been forged. Now, in this epistle, the Christ is non historical, he is the Cronian Christ, the Ionian manifester of the mythical, that is, astronomical prophecy. He is after the order of Melchizedek, who was, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life. This was the ever-coming one who could not become a human personage. And for that reason, I take it, Paul repudiates the genealogies of Christ. In advising Titus to give no heed to Jewish fables, he tells him to shun foolish questionings and genealogies. He counsels Timothy to warn his followers against giving heed to fables and endless genealogies, such, for instance, as we now find in the canonical Gospels of Matthew and Luke. These could have no application to the Christ of the Gnosis, hence their absence from the Gospel according to John. Human genealogy could not indicate the Gnostic mode of the divine descent, could not authenticate the Word of John, or Philo. Nor the Christ of Marcus, or of Paul, Consequently we learn that Marcus, the Gnostic, eliminated the genealogies from the Gospel of Luke, and all that was written respecting the generation of the Lord. The Docete who rejected the humanity of Christ had, as Epiphanius phrases it, cut away the genealogies in the Gospel after Matthew. Tadian, the pupil of Justin, who is called an apostle from the Church, also struck out the genealogies that were intended to prove the human descent of the Christ. He who had once accepted the gospel of the Christ made flesh, but rejected it when he had learned to know better. This they did because their Christ was spiritual, not an historic Jesus, and the same reason holds good as an explanation for Paul. He repudiated the vain genealogies employed in vain by those who sought to establish a human line of descent for the Christ, because he rejected the flesh and blood Jesus who was preached by the advocates of historic Christianity. This being so, it follows that the opening passage of the Epistle to the Romans, which now looks like Paul's first utterance to all the world, begins the tale of the interpolations, and thus appears in the right place. For it stands nearly alone in the writings of Paul, with its frank or forced acknowledgement of the humanity of Jesus, by admitting the Word made flesh to be of the seed of David. But the Christ of Paul could not, at one and the same time, have been, without genealogy, and yet be of the seed of Abraham or David. That would be a complete reversal of his teaching, who, in rejecting the genealogies, had already repudiated the descent from David. Moreover, Barnabas, the most intimate friend of Paul and fellow teacher with him, who, as a Gnostic, denied the human nature of the Christ, and, like Paul, spoke disrespectfully of the other apostles Barnabas assures us it was according to the error of the wicked that Christ was called the son of David. Paul also tells us that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit, 1 Cor 12. 3, and therefore not through the facts of an external history, or human pedigree. 
the Christ of the Gnosis was not connected with place any more than personality, or line of human descent. His only birthplace was in the mind of man. Consequently, in his Gospel, Mark Ion, who was a Gnostic Christian, does not connect his Christ with Nazareth. His Christ is not Jesus of Nazareth. And this note of the Gnosis is apparent in the writings of Paul. His Christ is nowhere called Jesus of Nazareth, nor is he born at Bethlehem either of the Virgin Mary, or of Mary the wife of Cleopa, who was not the Virgin. Of course, either an historic Jesus could become the Christ, as Saviour of the world, or he could not. And, as the world never was lost in any such sense as the ignorant have derived from a fable misinterpreted, why he could not, and as he could not, then he did not, and Paul who was an adept in the mysteries, a master of the hidden wisdom could never have mistaken the fable for a fact on which to build his system of Christology. Nor could he accept it from others. When once we have got the Gnostic clue to the hidden wisdom, we find an universal argument amongst the Gnostics concerning their tenets. Wherever we meet with them they give us the Masonic grip. And by the same sign we know that Paul was a Gnostic. This is further corroborated by his own claim to have been an adept, a wise master builder, one who spoke wisdom amongst the perfected. He was a Gnostic in the supreme degree, and all Gnostics agree that the Christ of the Gnosis could not be made flesh, and therefore all are, and must be opposed to historic Christianity, Paul included. It was as a Gnostic, a wise master builder, that Paul laid the foundations which others built upon, and the superstructure they reared became the Church of Historic Christianity. The Gnostics were Christians in an esoteric sense, but not because they explained a human history esoterically. There was no history to explain until the myth had been made exoteric by those who were ignorant, or who cunningly converted the Gnosis into history. It was the work of Peter to make the mysteries exoteric in a human history. It was the work of Paul to prevent this being effected by explaining the Gnosis. Hints of this appear in the epistles when he speaks of his gospel, and the revelation of his mystery concerning the Christ, and warns his disciples against the preaching of that other gospel, and other Jesus, which are opposed to his own truer teaching. As when he tells Timothy to, Remember Jesus Christ according to my gospel, and says to the Romans, Establish you according to my gospel, that was the gospel of the Gnosis which he had brought to them. We are also able to watch the interpolators of his writings at their work. The tampering with the text of Paul's epistles is still made apparent by a comparison of the various recensions, as the marginal notes in the revised version yet suffice to show. And if this remains so palpable in the latest transcript, what must it have been in the earlier and nearest to the author's original? In some instances, instead of a perfect join, there is a gaping gulf of doctrinal difference, too deep for the interpolators themselves. There is a ludicrous mixture of the historical Jesus and spiritual Christ in the first epistle of Paul to Timothy, where Christ Jesus is spoken of as he, who, before Pontius Pilate, witnessed the good confession. And half a dozen lines later on Paul's Jesus is the Lord of Lords dwelling in light unapproachable, whom no man hath seen, nor can see. That is the Christ of the Gnosis who could not be made flesh to stand in the presence of Pontius Pilate. Again, Paul speaks as a spiritualist of our transformation in death and the continuity of consciousness, when he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not entirely sleep, but shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This was the mystery of the Gnosis and the transformation revealed by spiritual phenomena. Then follows the interpolated doctrine of the resurrection at the last day, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. Physically, which was impossible to Paul. These are as opposite as yes and no, or day and night. Once more, we know how emphatically Paul insists on the originality of his gospel. It was his very own, personally received by revelation. He derived nothing from the supposed apostles of an historic Jesus, they imparted nothing to him, and he received nothing from any man. Yet in face of this fatal evidence the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, which is assigned to Paul, is made to say, that the salvation first spoken through the Lord was confirmed unto us by them that heard. And in his epistle to the Corinthians he is made to declare that he first of all delivered to them that which he had received, not by subjective revelation, 
but according to the history externalized, how that Christ died for our sins. According to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he hath appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to above five hundred of the brethren at once, this is piling it up. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as unto one born out of due time, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle. But James and Cephas were those whom he saw in Jerusalem, and who, as he expressly tells us, had imparted nothing to him. The passage belies what Paul has elsewhere said, and is at war with all he was. So far from lowering himself in that way, he asserts in the very same epistle, In nothing was I behind these preeminent apostles, therefore he was not behind in time. Let me speak proudly. That was his attitude when he compared himself with Cephas, James, and John. And if Paul ever did call himself an abortion, the true rendering of the sense, we may be sure that he did not apply such a figure of that which is premature to the lateness of his birth as an apostle. It cannot be made to apply. The Gnostics tell us what he did mean. They alone could understand the illusion, which carries the Christ of the Gnosis with it. The Christ appears to Paul, as to an abortion, just as did Horus the Christ to Sophia, or Akamoth, when she forlornly lay outside of the Pleroma as an amorphous abortion. And the Christ came and extended himself crosswise and gave her flowing substance form. Here the Gnostic doctrine involves the Christ of the Gnosis, and not of the human history. Paul applies the figure to himself. If these statements had been true, Paul must have been taught by men. This was to receive his information from scriptures, whatsoever they may have been, and was not to receive his revelation solely from the Christ, who came within, as he declares. In this way it becomes apparent how Paul's writings were made orthodox by the men who preached another gospel than his. With whom he was at war during his lifetime, and who took a bitter sweet revenge on his writings by suppression and addition, after he was dead and gone. The Christ proclaimed by Paul is frequently designated the firstborn. He is the firstborn of all creation, Colonel I, 16, the firstborn from the dead, Colonel I, 18, the firstborn among many brethren. Now hath Christ been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of them that slept. But in what sense? It is impossible to apply such descriptions to any historical character. No historical Jesus could be the firstborn from the dead. If continuity be a natural fact, as was held by the Gnostics, and Paul was a Gnostic. And is maintained by all spiritualists, and Paul was a spiritualist, we shall live on by a law of nature, not by some jugglery with natural law, called a miracle, performed once upon a time. The firstborn from the dead could not have waited for the resurrection until Anno Domini. Nor could our spiritual continuity have been demonstrated at that or any previous period by a physical resurrection, such as forms the foundation of the Christian faith. The doctrine enunciated by Paul was Egyptian, Chaldean, Kabbalist, and Gnostic, and, as such, it can be explained. In the ritual the soul that rises again from the dead exults and exclaims, I am the only one that comes forth from the body. That is, as the supreme soul of all the seven, the one representative of the pleroma of powers, or as Paul has it, the firstborn of many brethren. The firstborn from the dead, because the only one that attained immortality, as the spiritual man, or the Christ, called the second Adam by Paul, that celestial man referred to by Philo when he says, there is the man whose name is East. A strange appellation if it had been intended to speak of a man composed of soul and body. But if it be the incorporeal man, who comprehends in himself the divine idea, it must be admitted that East is the name that suits him best, i.e. the reorient man of the resurrection, or rearising. It is the same Gnostic typology employed by Paul when he speaks of building up the body of Christ, till we all attain unto the unity of faith, and of the knowledge, or gnosis, of the Son of God. Unto a full-grown man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of the Christ being the Egyptian, Buddhist, and Gnostic pleroma of all the seven preceding powers that culminated in the Christhood. One title of the Gnostic Christ is, All Things. He is called Totem, or All Things. 
nothing short of the Gnosis can tell us why. The Christian world is without the Gnosis, and therefore without the means of understanding Paul. Concerning the formation or creation of the Gnostic Christ in the character of all things, or totem, we are told that, the whole pleroma of the Mons, with one design and desire, brought together whatever each one had in himself of the greatest beauty and preciousness, and uniting all these contributions, so as to skillfully blend the whole, they produced a being of most perfect beauty, the very Saviour Christ. This all things, who was the consummate flower of the fullness or pleroma of the previous seven powers, is the Christ of Paul, who, himself, is all things, because in him are all things, and in all things he has the preeminence. All things are summed up in Christ, Fi. 10. Of him, through him, and unto him, are all things, Rom 11. 36. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colonel 2. 9. That is as the Gnostic totem. The all the Christ the eternal soul or spirit, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. He warns his followers against a certain false teacher, whom he knows personally, and might name, and whose teaching is after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after the Christ of the Pleroma. The Gnostic Christ was also called Eudicetos, because the whole Pleroma of the Godhead was well pleased with him as glorifier of the Father. This is Paul's Christ, in whom the whole fullness, Pleroma, was pleased to dwell. The text in Paul's epistle to the Colossians should be, for the whole fullness was pleased to dwell in him. There is neither, God, nor, Father, in the case. It is the whole Gnostic Pleroma of powers which made up the immortal soul, or came to the consummate flower of soul in man, and the Godhead in the Christ, as some total of the powers. The ancient Gnosis comes first. Paul repeats it. And then we have an adaptation of it to the later Gospel history, in which we hear the voice of the Father in heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Gnostics did not derive their knowledge from the history, any more than Paul did, and therefore it follows that the history was derived from an adaptation of the Gnosis. The founders of historic Christianity taught and enforced the doctrine that their Jesus the Christ had risen from the dead, body, bones, and all, and that he demonstrated the fact to his followers when he declared that he was not a spirit. The resurrection, therefore, was physical from the first. In a confession found in the Apostolic Creed, in the year 600, the convert has to say, I believe in the resurrection of the flesh, and only the other day Canon Gregory declared in St. Paul's Cathedral, that if you took away the physical resurrection of Jesus, the one foundation of their spiritual life was gone. If the Christ did not rise corporeally from his tomb, then that tomb would be the grave of Christianity. But Paul's doctrine of the resurrection is totally opposed to this cardinal doctrine of the Christian creed, the resurrection of the body. He does not expect to rise corporeally because of any physical resurrection of the Christ. His doctrine is that of the Gnostics, and consequently identifiable by the comparative process. It is also entirely opposed to that which was proclaimed by his contemporaries, Hymenoeus and Philetus, who taught that the resurrection was past already, and who had overthrown the faith of some in the doctrine preached by Paul. He says, they are in error, and their word will eat as doth a gangrene. Now, the sole way in which the resurrection could be set forth as already past was the same then as it is today namely, as the resurrection once for all of a personal and historical Saviour. Who there and then arose from the dead for the first time and instituted the resurrection. Paul's own resurrection from the dead was not assured by any such miraculous, non-natural, or impossible means. On the contrary, in a passage which shows a cleavage in the context, he breathes an aspiration thus, If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection from the dead, therefore. Not the means set forth by historical Christianity and he continues, Not that I have already attained, or am already made perfect, but I press on. Again, this is pure Gnostic doctrine. The perfect were those who had reached the octave, or height of attainment, in a sense which can only be understood by the Gnosis. It was his endeavor to reach the Christhood of the Gnosis on which the continuity in death depended a glimpse of which had been obtained by him in abnormal vision. This kind of working out of one's own salvation, 
and earning one's own eternal living in this life, is absolutely opposed to the Christian doctrine of the Atonement. The old Jewish doctrine of atonement by blood, continued into historic Christianity, is provably impossible to a Gnostic and a spiritualist like Paul. But this was the doctrine promulgated by those who preached that other gospel, which he repudiated. Therefore I infer that texts like these are a part of the matter interpolated, without shedding off blood is no remission of sin, Heb 9. 22. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colonel I, 20. In whom we have our redemption through his blood, Fi, 7. Such doctrine being impossible to the Gnostic, I hold these texts to have been falsely fathered upon Paul. The two doctrines cannot coexist in one mind, or system of thought, and we have to ascertain which of the two is the genuine Pauline doctrine before we can determine the nature of his Christology. Again he says, Wherefore let us cease to speak of the first principles of Christ, and press on unto perfection, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, and awe faith towards God, of the teaching of baptisms. And of laying on of hands, and of resurrection from the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this will we do. Here we find a complete repudiation by Paul of certain cardinal doctrines of historic Christianity elsewhere ascribed to him. These are called first principles, or those belonging to an exoteric or exterior interpretation of the Gnosis, which is looked upon as a pernicious and deadly heresy. They were a part of those beggarly rudiments which kept men in bondage to the Petrine gospel of the flesh. Paul positively repudiates, and most distinctly denies, salvation by means of these Christian sacraments. Those who have taken up with this teaching are treated as backsliders from the true faith, which is that of Paul's own gospel, and of the esoteric interpretation. For as touching those who were once enlightened, and tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then fell away. It is impossible to renew them again. Every special phrase reveals the Gnostic and the Gnosis. Those who fell away have lapsed from the interior teaching of Paul, and gone over to those who now preach the externalized history, the other gospel, of the other Jesus, with its corporeal resurrection. Having been fed on solid food they have become such as have need of milk. This repudiation of dogmas culminates in his banishing the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment or punishment at the last day. Here the resurrection of the dead must include that of the historic Jesus, if there had been one, and therefore this also is denied. He rejects any foundation laid on that, and says, let us cease to speak of it. Paul, like all Gnostics, taught the resurrection from the dead in this life, not the resurrection of the dead in the life hereafter. Now, it is quite certain that these Gnostic doctrines could not have been interpolated in Paul's writings by the founders of the fleshly faith. Therefore, it is the physical dogmas that have been foisted into the epistles of Paul. I have never yet seen a sign in the works of Christian writers that they knew anything whatever of the real nature of these doctrinal mysteries. All alike are ignorant of the tradition or gnosis on which a true explanation depended. They assume the human history as the initial point of a new beginning, and ignore, or are ignorant of, that which lies beyond. When called upon to face the facts in broad daylight they themselves will be all in the dark, and will have to fight against them blindfold. But it is impossible to enter within range of understanding Paul's teaching until we do know something of the doctrines that were unfolded in the mysteries. It is impossible to comprehend the mystery of Paul's Christ without a fundamental knowledge of the messianic mystery that had been from the beginning. This was his mystery, which he would not make so much of if he had started with what are held to be plain historical gospel truths. He spoke the wisdom of God in a mystery that hath been hidden, which God foreordained before the worlds unto our glory. The mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known. The mystery which is Christ in you. His was the revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence through times eternal. The fact is that Paul was a publisher of the ancient mysteries, that was why his enemies strove to kill him. He openly promulgated the Gnosis which had always been kept secret. But to comprehend him we must have some knowledge of the messianic mystery, which had an origin in phenomena that are both natural and explicable. 
When one has worked at the subject for years, it can be explained in a few hours. The root of the Messiah's name is Messi in Egyptian. One meaning, like that of the Christ in Greek and Messiac in Hebrew, is to anoint. But the fundamental signification is rebirth. The month, Mesor, was so named from the rebirth of the inundation. The man Messi was the rebirth place of the man or mummy. The evening meal on the first day of the new year was the Miziu, or festival of its birth. Cf. Sanskrit Masa, for a moon or month, and Masala for a year. This rebirth could be very various in phenomena, and so was the typical Messiah or reborn one. The serpent called Messi, the sacred word, was the Messiah by name, because the reptile sloughed its skin, and renewed itself. Hence the serpent was a symbol of the Gnostic Christ. Rebirth was the manifestation and the personified manifester was the Messiah, under whichever type or in whatever phase of the phenomena. Rebirth of the Nile, of the light in the moon, of the time cycle, or of the dead, could have its Messiah. Hence the Messiah had a monthly rebirth in the lunar orb, and a solar one every year with rebirth from the Virgin Mother in the zodiac. But there was a more mysterious manifestation when the girl or boy attained pubescence, or rebirth, into womanhood and manhood. Here the Messiah is both male and female charis as well as Christ, wisdom as well as the Word. According to the natural facts, at that period of rebirth was born the procreative power for further ensuring the future rebirth of the race. Men and women could reproduce themselves in this life. Hence the rebirth of the Anointed One, the Messiah of Adultship. But beyond these natural rebirths, it was demonstrated in the spiritual mysteries of abnormal mediumship, that there was a spirit in man, or, at least, in some men, that could reproduce itself, or, by alliance with the power above, could be reproduced, or reborn, for the next life. This was the Christ of the Gnosis, the messianic manifester in a psychical or spiritual phase, the revealer, according to the mystery of Paul. That which he had received from no man, was communicated to him by this revelation of the Christ. But Mark, in no one of these phases, elemental, cronian, or human, could the Messiah, the Christ of the Manifestation, become any one historic personage. Also, in the human phase, there is but one sense in which the Christ could be born of a virgin mother, and that can only be understood by taking the Christ as the immortal in man. And supplementing it with the knowledge that the mother was the first recognized inspirer of the soul. When typified and made doctrinal, this mother, as quickener of the soul, this mother of the Horus, or Christ, may be said to be virgin in a region beyond that of physical contact in the fleshly human phase. In a final form, the Messiah was the immortal spirit in man, or the Christ within, according to the language of Paul. Those who understood these things could not take to, or be taken in by, historic Christianity. Could only think of it as did Celsus when he says of the Christians, certain most impious errors are committed by them, which are due to their extreme ignorance, in which they have wandered away from the meaning of the divine enigmas. And as did Porphyry, who denounced the Christian religion as a blasphemy, barbarously bold. The Christian doctrine of being born again was derived without knowledge from this Gnostic rebirth, which was the conversion of the total man, and his seven lower souls, into a likeness of his supreme or divine self, with the eighth one. The Christ Spirit, as the reproducer for eternal life. Paul sometimes claims that he possesses this Christ nature, this revealer within, because, according to the Gnostics, humanity could attain to the divine altitude. And demonstrate upon the Mount of Transfiguration the immortal element in the nature of man. The Christian world let go, and lost this basis that Paul found in natural, though supernormal fact, when it ignorantly substituted the modus operandi of miracle applied to a physical resurrection. But, as we have seen, this manifester of the of the rebirth might be feminine as well as masculine. In fact, the female announcer was first, and there are mystical reasons for this in nature. In Hebrew, the Holy Spirit, or Ruach, is of a feminine gender. The soul is female. Some of the Gnostic sects assigned the soul to the female nature, and made their charis not only anterior, but superior, to the Christ. 
In the Book of Wisdom it is Sophia herself who is the pre-Christian Savior of mankind. It was wisdom that men are taught, and she is the Savior through knowledge and good works. Whereas the Christ was turned into a Savior through faith. The same tree of knowledge that supplied the fruit which damned the primal pair in the Genesis, is the tree of wisdom in the Apocrypha, where wisdom, personified as the tree, exclaims, I am the mother of fair love, and fear, and knowledge. And holy hope. Come unto me all ye that be desirous of me, and fill yourselves with my fruits. For my memorial is sweeter than honey, and mine inheritance than the honeycomb. He that obeyeth me shall never be confounded. This complete reversal of the Christian belief is to be found in the hidden wisdom. Such was the interpretation, by the men who knew, of that fable on which the fall of man was based by those who have imposed on us with their ignorance, and made us blind with their belief. Wisdom is the renewer and renovator of all things, and it is she who confers immortality on man, she who is the Christ as bringer to rebirth. The Gnostic Marcus maintained that Charis was superior to all things, or totem. And Charis, the female Christ, was the illuminating spirit of his teaching, as when he is made to say to his mediums, Behold, Charis has descended upon thee, open thy mouth and prophesy, open thy mouth and thou shalt prophesy. Apply this to the spirit as male, instead of female, and you have the Christ, or illuminating spirit of Paul. It was a question of priority in the type, and belonged to a mystical interpretation of natural phenomena. The blood of Charis preceded the blood of Christ, and but for the purification by the blood of Charis, there would have been no doctrine of the purification of souls by the blood of Christ. The Eucharist was a celebration of Charis before it was assigned to the Christ. Again, Paul's Christ is identified with the angel Metatron, as the Messiah who followed the Israelites in the wilderness. Thus he makes the angel masculine. But in the Targumist's traditions the well of Miriam takes the place of this sustaining Christ, who is the spiritual rock according to Paul. In the Gospel of the Egyptians, quoted by Clement Alexander, the Lord says, I am come to destroy the works of the woman. The two manifestors, male and female, are continued by the Shepherd of Hermas, which some of the fathers regarded as a divinely inspired scripture. Here the Spirit, or Logos, who is an old woman I. E. The ancient wisdom in one vision, becomes the Son of God in another. Of her it is said, she is an old woman, because she was the first of all creation, and the world was made by her. Wisdom, the woman, was first, she was the mother of God. Christ, the Son, was second, then he superseded the female in one representation, in another he was blended with her, and consequently portrayed in the image of both sexes, as a spiritual type. The wisdom or Sophia of the Gnostics was first at the head of the seven preplanetary powers, and was called Ogdoas, as mother of the first and inferior Hebdomad. Next the Christ was made the head as manifester of the seven later planetary powers, called by them the superior Hebdomad, he being the outcome of a later creation, and representative of the fatherhood in heaven. Which followed the fatherhood established on earth. And that same Gnostic manifester of the seven powers or gods had been Iu in Egypt, Iao in Phoenicia, Asur in Assyria, and the Buddha or Agni in India, ages on ages earlier. Now Paul was opposed to those Gnostics who exalted the feminine type of the soul the female as bringer to rebirth hereafter. He repudiated it, and proclaimed his Christ. His word, Logos or Messiah, is strictly masculine. In India this type would be Lingaic versus the Yanian. He maintains that the word by wisdom knew not God. This is exactly the same as saying that at one time men only recognized the motherhood in heaven, and did not know who were their own fathers on earth. The Lord is the Spirit, the Christ is the Spirit, he declares. Not Sophia, not the wisdom of a feminine nature. Christ, he affirms, is both the power and the wisdom of God. He proclaims all the treasures of Sophia and of the Gnosis to be contained in the Christ, and says the Christ has been made unto us wisdom. The Christ has taken her place. Again, his glorifying is not in fleshly wisdom, not in the female charis, but in the grace of God, 2 Cori, 12. For the female wisdom had been according to the flesh, 
the woman or mother being of the flesh fleshly. And Paul, as Gnostic or Kabbalist, had been acquainted with the fleshly wisdom, one of whose mysteries appertain to feminine periodicity, which he now repudiates when he says, even though we have known Christ, or the Manifester, after the flesh. Yet now we know so no more. Here it cannot be pretended that Paul ever knew the personal Christ in the flesh, and therefore some other fact has to be encountered. However interpreted, he is speaking doctrinally, and not of two historic characters. Paul's is the Gnostic Christ as the second Adam, the man from heaven, whose type superseded the man of earth. Paul knew well enough that Adam was not a man in the literal sense, he was the typical man of the flesh, the son of the woman. And as was the type, such was the antitype, when he calls his Christ the second Adam, the later spiritual type of man, and of the Father above. Neither were, or could be, historic personages. To use his own words, these things are an allegory. In her most occult phase the feminine messenger was a word that could be made flesh, for she was the flesh-maker, the mother of matter. But this was on physiological grounds alone. Hence she was superseded by the masculine messenger. The spirit that could never be made flesh. None but the initiated in these matters could possibly know what was meant by this transfer of type, and substitution of the Lord for the Lady, the Christ for wisdom, the second Adam for the first. But there it is truth like at the bottom of the well, the source of so much difficulty found in the depths of Paul's writings. And this contention of Paul on behalf of one Gnostic dogma against another has been made to look as if he were fervently fighting for an historic Jesus. This transfer of type is not limited to Paul. For instance, the vine was a feminine symbol. Wisdom says, as the vine brought I forth, ECC. 24, 17, and in the book of Proverbs Sophia cries, Come eat of my bread, and drink of the wine I have mingled. The fig tree in Egypt was the figure of the Lady of Heaven, who is portrayed as the tree of life and knowledge, in the act of feeding souls. She literally gives her body as the bread and her blood as the wine of life. In the later Ptolemian times this tree was assigned to Sophia or Wisdom. Which shows the link between Egypt and Greece. The superseding of Sophia is also illustrated in the cursing of the fruitless fig tree by the canonical Christ, where the parable of mythology is represented as a human history. In John's Gospel the type has been transferred, just as the sayings were, to the masculine nature, and the Christ becomes the bread and wine of life. In the Apocrypha it is Sophia who is the brightness of the everlasting light, the unspotted mirror of the power of God, and the image of His goodness. Wisdom 7. 26. In the Epistle to the Hebrews the Christ takes the place of Sophia. He is called the effulgence of the glory of God, the very image of His substance. Nevertheless, the male Christ could no more be made flesh in a man than Sophia or Charis could have previously been incarnated in an historical woman. You cannot understand one half without the other. Both must be taken together. The doctrine is doubly and wholly opposed to any and all historical personality. But, we have not yet completely mastered the entire mystery of Paul for modern use. And it is not possible for any one but the phenomenal spiritualist, who knows that the conditions of trance and clairvoyance are facts in nature. Only those who have evidence that the other world can open and lighten with revelations, and prove its palpable presence, visibly and audibly. Only those who accept the teaching that the human consciousness continues in death, and emerges in a personality that persists beyond the grave. Only such, I say, are qualified to comprehend the mystery, or receive the message, once truly delivered to men by the spiritualist Paul, but which was thoroughly perverted by the sarcolators, the founders of the fleshly faith. In the first place he was an initiate in the Gnostic mysteries, called Kabbalist in Hebrew. He tells us how exceedingly jealous for the traditions he had been, which must have included the traditional interpretation of the mysteries and of the gnosis or hidden wisdom. He was a perfected adept. He knew the nature of the Cronian Christ, and of the spiritual Christ, according to the gnosis. Beyond that, Paul, on his own testimony, was an abnormal seer, subject to the conditions of trance. He could not remember if certain experiences occurred to him in the body or out of it. 
This trance condition was the origin and source of his revelations, the heart of his mystery, his infirmity in which he gloried in short, his thorn in the flesh. He shows the Corinthians that his abnormal condition, ecstasy, illness, madness, or what not, was a phase of spiritual intercourse in which he was divinely insane insane on behalf of God but that he was rational enough in his relationship to them. He says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ fourteen years ago, whether in the body I know not, or whether out of the body I know not. God knoweth, such an one caught up even in the third heaven, on behalf of that man he will glory. And by reason of the exceeding greatness of the revelations, wherefore that I should not be exalted over much, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, that I should not be exalted over much. Paul's thorn in the flesh has been attributed to lechery, and to sore eyes, but no Christian commentator known to me has ever connected it with abnormal phenomena, except as miracle. The Martianites said the mystery was manifested to Paul by revelation. Paul says the same. By this abnormal mode the mystery was revealed to him in person. His eyes were opened, so that he could see for himself the truth that was taught in the mysteries. If a spirit appeared in vision to Paul, that would positively prove the rebirth for a future life, and constitute the revelation of his messianic mystery. Paul's Christ, the Lord, is the Spirit. His gospel is that of spiritual revelation, the chief mode of manifestation being abnormal, as it was, and had been, in the Gnostic mysteries. The Gnostic Christ was the immortal spirit in man, which first demonstrated its existence by means of abnormal or spiritualistic phenomena. It did not and could not depend on any single manifestation in one historic personality. And when Paul says, I knew a man in Christ, we see that to be in Christ is to be in the condition of trance, in the spirit, as they phrased it, in the state that is common to what is now termed mediumship. Being in the trance condition, or in Christ, as he calls it, he was caught up to the third heaven, and could not determine whether he was in the body or out of the body. Here he identifies his Christ with a condition of being, and that condition with the abnormal phenomena known to some of us who have studied modern spiritualism. This is the Gnostic Christ, not the Christ of any special historic personality, who is supposed to have manifested only once upon a time, and once for all. The Christ of the Gnosis, of Philo and of Paul preceded Christianity, and is sure to supersede it, because it is based upon facts known in nature and verifiable today. It was those who were entirely ignorant of those subtle and obscure facts, unfolded in the mysteries, who became Christians in the modern sense, and believed, because they were blind. Paul was both a seer and a knower. He became one of the public demonstrators of the facts, just like any itinerant medium of our time. He says to the Galatians, Ye know that because of an infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you the first time, and that which was a temptation to you in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, or spat out. But ye received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. This infirmity of the flesh was his tendency to fall into trance. When it first occurred, at a given date, he received his revelation and began to preach his own gospel. He talked and taught as do the mediums in trance today. He received his revelations visions and revelations of the Lord and gave proofs of the Christ, or Spirit, speaking within him, speaking through him, when he was in trance. And on this ground they received him as an angel of God they received him as the Christ. This Christ, persona ted by Paul as the revealer in trance, was of necessity the Gnostic Christ, the Spirit of God, as he often calls it, the Christ that spoke through him, founded on what is now termed spirit control but not based on the spirit of any Jesus of Nazareth. His Christ is the spirit which revealed itself abnormally in, and through him, so that he, spoke the wisdom and the words which the spirit teacheth, he spoke mysteries in the spirit. His Christ was the same spirit that, hath a diversity of workings, in various spirit manifestations. To one it gives the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge, to another, faith, to another, gifts of healing to another, miraculous powers, to another, prophesy, to another, seeing of spirits, to another, the gift of tongues, and to another, their interpretation. 
And as this was the Christ, that always had been so manifested, nothing depended upon any historical character. All that was real, that is, spiritual, would be the same afterwards as it had been before. Nothing did depend on it, and historical Christianity itself is but a vast interpolation, the greatest of all obstacles to mental development and the unity of the human race. One more illustration that Paul was outside the ring of conspirators who were the founders, as forgers, of historic Christianity in Rome, and I shall have done. The Christ proclaimed by Peter and James was the mythical Messiah of the time cycles, the ever-coming one, converted into an historical character, hence he who was supposed to have just come still remained the coming one. He himself is made to say that he is coming before the then-present generation shall have passed away. Apart from the mythos and its meaning, there was no other coming, or end of the times, of the age, aeon, or world. The Cronian allegory can only apply to the Cronian Christ, as the metaphorical manifester of the eternal in the sphere of time, who could neither be made flesh nor assume historic personality. This was known to Paul as an adept. Such things were an allegory, but it was not known to those who preached that other gospel. James asserts that the coming of the Lord is at hand. John declares that it is the last hour. In the second epistle of Peter we find the writer mentions Paul by name, and replies to his epistles. He is covertly trying to counteract the influence of Paul's teaching on a matter of such importance as the second coming of Christ, and the immediate ending of the world. In the first chapter he proclaims that the end of all things is at hand. Here he says that mockers are asking, where is the promise of his coming? They forget the cataclysms and deluges by which the previous heavens and earth have perished. This time the end will come with a universal conflagration, and, according to promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth. Our beloved brother, Paul, has been speaking of these things. According to the wisdom given to him he wrote unto you, as also in his epistles, speaking in them in these things, wherein are some things hard to understand. Which the ignorant and unsteadfast rest, as also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. The subject matter here is the nature of the time cycles, and the mythical destruction by flood and fire. Which Paul as an adept knew to be typical and allegorical. Peter mistakes them for literal realities. Being an outsider, he did not understand the wisdom or gnosis of Paul, but says it is misleading. Inasmuch as the ignorant rest it unto their own destruction. Peter had also said the day of the Lord will come as a thief. To this we have direct replies from Paul. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that ought be written unto you. For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief, for ye are all sons of light and sons of the day, we are not of the night nor of the darkness, as were those foolish physicalists, the Petrine Gnostics. And again he says to the Thessalonians, Now we beseech you, brethren, touching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together unto him, that ye be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet be troubled either by spirit, or by word, or by epistle as from us. As that day of the Lord is present at hand. Let no man beguile you in any wise, give no heed to that ignoramus gobmuchery. Then follows a break in the sense. But a falling away is to come first, and the man of sin must be revealed or exposed. The son of perdition, he that opposeth and exalteth himself against all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God setting himself forth as God. That, I say, is esti. Paul's opposer, Peter, who was set up in the church of Rome. Remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things. And now ye know that which restraineth to the end that he may be revealed in his own season. For the mystery of lawlessness doth already work only until he that restraineth now shall be taken out of the way. And then shall be revealed the lawless one whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to naught by the manifestation of his coming, him, whose coming is according to the working of Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceit of unrighteousness for them that are perishing, because they received not the love of truth that they might be saved. 
And for this cause God sendeth them a working of error that they should believe a lie. In both quotations the subject matter identifies Peter as palpably as if Paul had named him. He is replying to the teaching of one particular man who is proclaiming the coming of the Christ and the day of the Lord, or end of the world, as being close at hand. He says in effect do not be troubled or beguiled by any such ignorant trash. The Lord will not come in his sense, and cannot come in mine, except that man of sin be revealed. No one has ever dared to dream that this man of sin is Peter himself. But the person aimed at is considered capable of forging epistles in the name of Paul, thus attributing this kind of teaching to him, and making him father it whilst Paul was yet living. This man of sin and son of perdition has set himself up in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. This is no Emperor Nero, but a portrait of Peter, the lifelong enemy of Paul. He whose preaching is concerning signs and lying wonders, such as the stories about the end of the world, the passing away of the heavens with a great noise, the dissolution of the elements with fervent heat, and the burning up of the earth with all the works therein, and other teachings of this cataclysmalist, which Paul denounces as delusive, and knows to be a lie. This misleader of men is restrained for the time being by Paul himself, but when he departs Peter will reveal himself or be revealed in his true colors, and the Thessalonians will then see what Paul has known all along. And against which he had warned them once before, I. E. Against that working of error and belief in a lie, which we now know by name as historic Christianity. It is here, then, that we can peer right down into the deep, dark gulf that divided Peter from Paul, of which we get such a lightning glimpse in the Clementine homilies. These writings were inspired by the faction of Peter. By them Paul is designated the hostile man. His own epithet, Anomas, the lawless, is there flung back at him by Peter, who denounces the puerile preaching of the man that is his enemy, and who says, Thou hast opposed thyself as an adversary against me, the firm rock. The Foundation of the Church Paul's conversion, by means of abnormal vision, is attributed to the false Christ, the Gnostic and spiritualist opposed to an historic Christ. In Homily 17, Peter is obviously hitting at Paul and his visions when he asks, Can anyone be instituted to the office of a teacher through visions? Paul is treated as the archenemy of the Christ crucified he is the very Antichrist. He will be the author of some great heresy which is expected to break out in the future. Peter is said to have declared that Christ instructed the disciples not to publish the only true and genuine gospel for the present, because the false teacher must arise. Who would publicly proclaim the false gospel of the Antichrist that was the Christ of the Gnostics? As the true prophet has told us, the false gospel must come from a certain misleader, and so they were to go on secretly promulgating the true gospel, until this false preacher had passed away. This true gospel was confessedly held in reserve, to be secretly transmitted for the rectification of future heresies. They knew well enough what had to come out, if Paul's preaching, proclaimed in his original epistles, got vent more and more. It was Paul whom they had reason to fear. Hence those who were the followers of Peter and James anathematized him as the great apostate, and rejected his epistles. Justin Martyr never once mentions this founder of Christianity, never once refers to the writings of Paul. Strangest thing of all is it that the book of the Acts, which is mainly the history of Paul, should contain no account of his martyrdom or death in Rome. The gulf, however, cannot be completely fathomed, except on the grounds that there was no personal Christ. And that Paul was the natural opponent of the men who were setting up the Christ made flesh for the salvation of the world that never was lost. My conclusion is, that fabricated evidence is the sole support of historic Christianity which can be derived from the epistles of Paul. That the manipulation for an ulterior purpose, which is so obvious in the book of Acts, was far more subtly and fundamentally applied to his epistles and doctrines. That they have been worked over as thieves manipulate stolen linen when they pick out the marks of ownership to escape from detection. That false doctrines have been foisted into the original text, which seems to have been withheld for a century after the writer's death, until the leaven of falsehood had done its fatal work. The problem of the plotters and forgers in Rome was how to convert the mythical Christology into historic Christianity, 
and when Paul's epistles were permitted to emerge from obscurity in a collection. What had occurred was the restoration of the carnalist Christ, that other Jesus, who was repudiated by Paul in his own lifetime. Paul felt or feared, and foretold that this would be the case when once he was removed out of the way. He saw the mystery of lawlessness already at work the falsifiers sending forth letters as if from himself and we have seen what Paul foresaw. The problem of the plotters who forged the foundations of the church in Rome was how to successfully blend the Christ Jesus of the Gnostics, of the pre-Christian Apocrypha, of Philo, and of Paul. With that corporeal Christ and impossible personality, in whom they ignorantly believed, through a blind literalization of mythology, so as to make the historic look like the true starting point. And the Gnostic interpretation becomes a later heresy. This was finally effected when the declaration of John that, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, had been accepted as the genuine gospel. And that which had been an impossibility for the Gnostics was an accomplished fact for those who knew no better than to believe. The gospel, according to John, was concocted and calculated to serve as a harmonizing amalgam of doctrines that were fundamentally opposed. In this amalgam they tried to mix the gall and honey, so that, if, well shaken before taken, it might be swallowed by the followers on both sides. But there was a great gulf forever fixed between the Gnostic Christology and historic Christianity. It was a gulf that never could be soundly bridged, and never has been plumbed, or bottomed, or filled in. The bodies of two million martyrs of free thought, put to death as heretics, in Europe alone, and all the blood that has ever been shed in Christian wars, have failed to fill that gulf, which waits as ever wide-jawed for its prey. Across that gulf the Christian church was erected upon supports on either side. On one side stood those pillars of the church which were seen by Paul in Jerusalem. On the other was Paul himself, the pillar that stood alone. A difference the most radical and profound divided him from the other apostles, Cephas, John, and James. From the first they were on two sides of the chasm that could not be closed. And the Pritikatio Petri declares that Peter and Paul remained unreconciled till death. The great work of the first centuries was how to bridge the chasm over, or at least how to conceal it from the eyes of the world in later times. This could only be done by resting on Paul as a prop and buttress on the one side and Peter on the other, which had to be done by converting or perverting the epistles of the Gnostic Paul into a support for historic Christianity. In that way the Church was founded. It was built as a bridge across the gulf, and the Pope of Rome appointed an aptly designated Pontifex Maximus. It was reared above the chasm lying darkly lurking like an open grave below, and today, as ever, the Christian world is horribly haunted with the fear that a breath or two of larger intellectual life, a too audible utterance of freer thought. A dose of mental dynamite may bring the edifice of error down in wreck and ruin to fill that gulf at last, over which it was so perilously founded from the first. The Logia of the Lord, or prehistoric sayings ascribed to Jesus the Christ. References to authorities may be found in the author's Natural Genesis. It would take almost a lifetime of original research to fathom or approximately gauge the depths of ignorance in which the beginnings of historic Christianity lie sunken out of sight. The current ignorance of those pre-Christian evidences that have been preserved by the petrifying past must be well-nigh invincible, when a man like Professor Jowett could say, as if with the voice of superstition in its dotage. To us the preaching of the gospel is a new beginning, from which we date all things. Beyond which we neither desire, nor are able, to inquire. It is the commonly accepted orthodox belief that Christianity originated with the life, miracles, sayings, and teachings. The birth, death, resurrection, and ascension of an historic Jesus the Christ at the commencement of our era, called Christian, whereas, the origins were manifold, but mostly concealed. It is impossible to determine anything fundamental by an appeal to the documents which, alone out of a hundred Gospels, were made canonical. And when Eusebius recorded his memorable boast that he had virtually made, all square, for the Christians, it was an ominous announcement of what had been done to keep out of sight the mythical and mystical rootage of historic Christianity. The Gnostics had been muzzled, and their extant evidences, as far as possible, masked. 
He and his co-conspirators did their worst in destroying documents and effacing the telltale records of the past, to prevent the future from learning what the bygone ages could have said directly for themselves. They made dumb all pagan voices that would have cried aloud their testimony against the unparalleled imposture then being perfected in Rome. They had almost reduced the first four centuries to silence on all matters of the most vital importance for any proper understanding of the true origins of the Christian superstition. The mythos having been at last published as a human history everything else was suppressed or forced to support the fraud. Christolatry is founded on the Christ, who is mythical in one phase and mystical in the other. Egyptian, and Gnostic, in both, but historical in neither. The Christ was a type and a title that could not become a person. As such, the Christ of the Gnostics was the Horus continued from Egypt and Chaldea. And that which was original as mythos ages earlier cannot be also original as a later personal history. We who commence with our canonical gospels are three or four centuries too late to learn anything fundamental concerning the real beginnings of Christianity. You have only to turn to the second book of Esdras to learn that Jesus the Christ of our canonical history was both prehistoric and pre-Christian. This is one of the books of the hidden wisdom which have been rejected and set apart as the Apocrypha considered to be spurious, because they are opposed to the received history. Whereas, they contain the secret gnosis by which alone we can identify the genuine scripture. In this book it is said, My son Jesus shall be revealed with those that are with him. And they that remain shall rejoice within four hundred years. And after these years shall my son Christ die, and all men shall have life. And this was to be even as it had been in the former judgments at the end of the particular cycles of time, and the renewal of the world, which was to occur according to date. Now, if an historic Jesus Christ of prophecy is to be found anywhere it is here, foretold even as the prediction is supposed to have been fulfilled. Yet these books are not included among the canonical scriptures, because they prove too much. Because they are historical in the wrong sense, idari, they are not and could not be made humanly historical, their Jesus Christ is entirely mythical, is the Cronian Christ. And his future coming therein announced was only the subject of astronomical prophecy. The true Christ, whether mythical or mystical, astronomical or spiritual, never could become an historical personage and never did originate in any human history. The types of themselves suffice to prove that the Christ was, and could only be, typical, and never could have taken form in historic personality. For one thing, the mystical Christ of the Gnosis and of the pre-Christian types was a being of both sexes, as was the Egyptian Horus and other of the Messiahs. Because the mystical Christ typified the spirit or soul which belongs to the female as well as to the male, and represents that which could only be a human reality in the spiritual domain or the pleroma of the Gnostics. This is the Christ who appears as both male and female in the Book of Revelation. And the same Bayun type was continued in the Christian portraits of the Christ. In Didron's iconography you will see that Jesus Christ is portrayed as a female with the beard of a male, and is called Jesus Christ as Saint Sophia, either the wisdom, or the spirit of both sexes. The early Christians were ignorant of this typology, but the type still remained to be interpreted by the Gnosis and to bear witness against the history. Both the type and doctrine combined to show there could be no one personal Christ in this world or any other. Howsoever the written word may lie, the truth is visibly engraved upon the stones, and still survives in the icons, symbols, and doctrines of the Gnostics, which remain to prove that they preserved the truer tradition of the origins. And so this particular pre-Christian type was continued as a portrait of the historic Christ. It can be proved that the earliest Christians known were Gnostics the men who knew, and who never did or could accept historic Christianity. The Essenes were Christians in the Gnostic sense, and according to Pliny the Elder, they were a hermetic society that had existed for ages on ages of time. Their name is best explained as Egyptian. They were known as the Eshe, the healers or therapeute, the physicians in Egypt, and Isha or Usha means to doctor or heal, in Egyptian. The Sutites, the Mandates, the Nazarites, as well as the Docidi and Elkasites, were all Gnostic Christians. They all preceded, and were all opposed to, the cult of the Carnalist Christ. The followers of Simon, the Samaritan, were Gnostic Christians, 
and they were of the church at Antioch, where it is said the name of Christian was primarily applied. Serinthus was a Gnostic Christian, who, according to Epiphanius, denied that Christ had come in the flesh. The same writer informs us that, at the end of the 4th century, there were Ebionite Christians, whose Christ was the mythical fulfiller of the time cycles, not an historic Jesus. Even Clement Alexander confesses that his Christ was of a nature that did not require the nourishment of corporeal food. Now, from the time of Irenaeus to that of Mansell, it has been confidently asserted that Gnosticism was a heresy of the second century, a backsliding in apostasy from the true faith of historic Christianity. This is simply a delusion of the ignorant, founded on the original lie of the falsifiers. Later teachers of Gnosticism, such as Basilides and Saturninus, did arise during the second century. But these were not the founders of any fresh doctrines, nor did they make any new departure. They were revivalists. The Christian fathers only knew of the Gnostics of their time. They never troubled to trace the roots of Gnosticism in the remoter past. The Christian report respecting the Gnostics, Docidi, and others, always assumes the human reality of the supposed history, and then explains the non-human interpretation of the Gnostics themselves as an heretic denial or perversion of the alleged facts. Hence the Gnostics are charged by Irenaeus with falsifying the oracles of God, and trying to discredit the word of revelation with their own wicked inventions. We learn from Origen that, during the third century, there were various different versions of Matthew's Gospel in circulation, and this he attributes partly to the forgers of Gospels. Jerome, at the end of the fourth century, asserts the same thing, and of the Latin versions he says, there were as many different texts as manuscripts. The Gnostics, who had brought on the original and pre-Christian matter of the mysteries that were taught orally, no sooner placed it on record than they were said to be forging the scriptures of Antichrist. Whereas it was the Gnosis of the Antichrist of whom they, the Christians, were ignorant. Theirs is altogether a false mode of describing the position of those who always and utterly denied that the Christ could be made flesh, to suffer and die upon a veritable cross. Here is a specimen of the way in which the Gnostic doctrines had been turned to historic account the true light which lighteth every man coming into the world was Gnostic, and had been Gnostic ages before the prologue of John was written. And as Gnostic doctrine it has to be read. This light of the world, born, as the Gnostics held, with every one coming into the world, is the immortal principle in man. Hippolytus, referring to the teaching of Basilides, a Gnostic teacher of the second century, shows us how the doctrine of the Gnostics was falsified. And this, says he, it is which is said in the Gospels, the true light which lighteth every man was coming into the world. Was coming, is an interpolation of the believers in the fact of historic fulfillment applied to that eternal light which lighted every man coming into the world. The light that dawned within, and could not come without in any form of flesh or historic personality. The Emperor Julian also remarks on the monstrous doings and fraudulent machinations of the fabricators of historic Christianity. We may look upon the Gnostics as inside Christians, the others as Christians without. Never were mortals more perplexed, bewildered, and taken back, than the Christians of the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries, who had started from their own new beginning, warranted to be solely historic. When they found that an apparition of their faith was following them one way and confronting them in another, a faith not founded on their alleged facts, claiming to be the original religion. And ages on ages earlier in the world a shadow that threatened to steal away their substance, mocking them with its aerial unreality the hollow ghost of that body of truth which they had embraced as a solid and eternal possession. It was horrible. It was devilish. It was the devil, they said and so they sought to account for Gnosticism, and fight down their fears of the phantom terrifying them in front and rear, the Gnostic Antichrist who had now become their Antichrist. The only primitive Christians then apart from, or preceding, the Christianized pagan Church of Rome, were the various sects of Gnostics, not one of which was founded on an historical Christ. One and all they based upon the mystical Christ of the Gnosis, and the mythical Messiah, him who should come because he was the ever-coming one, as a type of the eternal, manifesting figuratively in time. Historic Christianity can furnish no sufficient reason why the biography of its personal founder should have been held back, 
why the facts of its origin should have been kept dark. And why there should have been no authorized record made known earlier. The conversion of the mythos, and of the Docetic doctrines of the Gnosis into human history, alone will account for the fatal fact. The truth is, the earliest Gospels are the furthest removed from the supposed human history. That came last, and only when the spiritual Christ of the Gnosis had been rendered concrete in the density of Christian ignorance. Christianity began as Gnosticism continued, by means of a conversion and perversion, that were opposed in vain by Paul. The mysteries of the Gnostics were continued, with a difference, as Christian. The newly christened rebeginnings were not only shrouded in mystery, they were the same mysteries at root as those that were pre-extant. The first Christians founded on secret doctrines that were only explained to initiates during a long course of years. These mysteries were never to be divulged or promulgated until the belief in historic Christianity had taken permanent root. We are told how it was held by some that the Apocrypha ought only to be read by those who were perfected, and that these writings were reserved exclusively for the Christian adepts. It must be obvious that the doctrine or knowledge that was forced to be kept so sacredly secret as that, could have had no relation to the human history, personality or teachings of an inspired founder of that primitive Christianity supposed to have had so simple an origin. True history is not established in that way, although the false may be as it has been. Nobody was allowed by Peter to interpret anything except in accordance with our tradition. Nobody, says Justin Martyr, is permitted to partake of the Eucharist, unless he accepts as true that which is taught by us, and unless he received the bread and wine as the very flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. In this we see the forgers fighting against the Gnostic Christ. There were many sects of so-called Christians, and various versions of the Christ, whether Cronian, mythical, or mystical. But the Church of Rome was the Christian Church with foundations in Egypt, hence the deities of Egypt which have been discovered at the foundations of Rome. And when historic Christianity hasn't a bit of ground left to stand upon, the Church of Rome will be able and prepared to say, we never did really stand on that ground, and now we alone can stand without it. We are the one true Church with foundations in an illimitable past. According to the unquestioned tradition of the Christian Fathers, which has always been accepted by the Church, the primary nucleus of our canonical Gospels was not a life of Jesus at all, but a collection of the Logia, oracles, or sayings. The Logia Curiaca, which were written down in Hebrew or Aramaic, by one Matthew, as the scribe of the Lord. Clement Alexander, Origen, and Irenaeus agree in stating that Matthew's was the primary Gospel. This tradition rests upon the testimony of Papias, Bishop of Hierapolis, and friend of Polycarp, who is said to have suffered martyrdom for his faith during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, about 165-167 to AD. Papias is named with Pantoius, Clement, and Ammonius as one of the ancient interpreters who agreed to understand the Hexameron as referring to an historic Christ and the Church. He was a believer in the Millennium, and the Second Coming of the Lord, and therefore a literalizer of mythology. But there is no reason to suspect the trustworthiness of his testimony, as he no doubt believed these sayings to have been the spoken words of an historic Jesus, written down in Hebrew by a personal follower named Matthew. He wrote a work on the subject, entitled Logion Curiacon Exegesis, a commentary on the sayings of the Lord. A surviving fragment of this last work, quoted by Eusebius, tells us that Matthew wrote the sayings in the Hebrew dialect, and each one of the believers interpreted them as he was best able. Thus, the beginning of the earliest gospel was not biographical. It was no record of the life and doings of Jesus, it contained no actual historic element, nothing more than the sayings of the Lord. It is not pretended that our gospel, according to Matthew, is the identical work of the scribe who first wrote down the Logia, but the statement of Papias is so far corroborated inasmuch as the sayings ascribed to Jesus are the basis of the book. We read, when Jesus had finished these sayings, or parables, several times over. Now, there is plenty of evidence to show that these sayings, which are the admitted foundations of the canonical Gospels, were not first uttered by a personal founder of Christianity, nor invented afterwards by any of his followers. Many of them were pre-extant, prehistoric, and pre-Christian. 
And if it can be proved that these oracles of God and Logia of the Lord are not original, if they can be identified as a collection, an allopadrida of Egyptian, Hebrew, and Gnostic sayings. They can afford no evidence that the Jesus of the Gospels ever lived as an historic teacher. To begin with, two of the sayings assigned to Matthew to Jesus as the personal teacher of men are these Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, etc., and, If ye forgive men their trespasses your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But these sayings had already been uttered by the feminine logos called wisdom, in the Apocrypha. We find them in the book of Ecclesiasticus. Lay up thy treasure according to the commandments of the Most High, and it shall bring thee more profit than gold, and, forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he hath done thee, so shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. Wisdom was the sayer personified long anterior to the Christ. But it has never been pretended or admitted by mankind that wisdom was ever incarnated on this earth as a woman. Yet wisdom, or charis, had the primary right to incarnation, for she preceded the Christ. Luke also quotes a saying of wisdom therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. This also is quoted or adapted from the words of wisdom recorded in a book of wisdom, Ezra 2, where we read, I sent unto you my servants, the prophets, whom ye have taken and slain, and torn their bodies in pieces. Whose blood I will require of your hands, said the Lord. Thus saith the Almighty Lord, Your house is desolate. In the verses immediately preceding, the speaker in the book of Esdras had said, Thus saith the Almighty Lord, Have I not prayed you as a father his sons, as a mother her daughters, and a nurse her young babes, that ye would be my people, and I should be your God, that ye would be my children, and I should be your father? I gathered you toge there as a hen gather th her chickens under her wings, but now what shall I do unto you? I will cast you out. This is in one of the books of wisdom hidden away in our Apocrypha. Now, if we turn to the Gospels of Luke and Matthew we shall find that they have quoted these words of wisdom, but we now see that wisdom is not credited with her own sayings concerning the Father God. On the contrary, they are given to an historic Christ, as a personal teacher and a prophet. That which was said of the house of Israel by wisdom in Esdras is now applied to the city of Jerusalem by the Christ. And if you redate a saying like that by a few hundred years there is little wonder if it dislocates the history. Paul likewise quotes the saying from the book of Esdras when he says, I will receive you and will be to you a father, and ye shall be to me sons and daughters saith the Lord Almighty. But he does not refer or reapply it to Jesus as is done in the Gospels. Here we see the current coinage of wisdom has been defaced by the gospel compilers not by Paul and then reissued under the sign and superscription of another name, that of Jesus the Christ. And historic evidence of a nature like that is as futile as the Negro's non-effective charge of gunpowder which he shrewdly suspected of having been fired off before. Paul likewise quotes or refers to one of the sayings found in Matthew. Faithful is the saying, he writes to Timothy. But although he is speaking of the Christ, he does not say his saying, nor refer it to an historic teacher. It was one of the sayings, or true words, called the Logia, which had been the dark sayings and parables of the pre-Christian mysteries from of old, and which in Egypt were the sayings of truth herself. The Hebrew psalmist says, I will utter dark sayings of old. The Proverbs of Solomon are the sayings. The Jewish Haggadah were the sayings. The commandments were sayings, as is shown by Paul, Rom 13. 9. Peter, in the Clementine Recognitions, does not pretend to pronounce the sayings of the Lord as spoken by himself, or profess that they were spoken by himself in person, as I read the passage. He admits that it is not in their commission to say this. But they are to teach and to show from the sayings how every one of them is based upon truth. This is in reply to Simon Magus, who has pointed out the contradictory nature of the sayings. I hold it only to be a matter of time and research to prove that the sayings in general assigned to Jesus, which are taken to demonstrate his historic existence as a personal teacher, were pre-extant, pre-historic, and pre-Christian. One of the sayings in the mysteries reported by Plato was, Many are the thyrsus bearers but few are the mystics, 
which is echoed twice over by Matthew in the saying, Many are called but few are chosen. It is more blessed to give than to receive, is one of the logia of the Lord quoted in the book of Acts, but not found in the Gospels. Two of the sayings are identified as Essenic by Josephus, who says the Essenes swear not at all, but whatsoever they say is firmer than an oath. And when Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, there was certainly nothing new in that which had been a command and a practice of the Essenes ages before. Men knew who were the Essenes by their love for one another. Some of the parables appear in the Talmud, amongst them are those of the wise and unwise builders and that of the marriage feast. Various sayings are collected from the Talmud, such as the golden rule, Do unto others as ye would they should do unto you. Love thy neighbor as thyself. With the measure we meet we shall be measured again. Let thy ye be just and thy nay be likewise just. Whoso looketh upon the wife of another with a lustful eye is considered as if he had committed adultery. Be of them that are persecuted, not of them that persecute. But as Deutsch has said, to assume that the Talmud borrowed these from the New Testament would be like assuming that Sanskrit sprang from Latin. The nature of the sayings is acknowledged by Irenaeus when he says, according to no one saying of the heretics is the word of God made flesh. That is the sayings which were current among the Gnostics as knowers. Markion knew and quoted the Gnostic saying which was afterwards amplified and quoted in John's Gospel, No one knew the Father save the Son, nor the Son save the Father, and he to whom he will reveal him. This is a Gnostic saying, and it involves the Gnostic doctrine which cannot be understood independently of the Gnosis. It is quoted as one of the sayings before it was reproduced in the Gospel according to John. Such sayings were the oral teachings in all the mysteries ages before they were written down. Some of them are so ancient as to be the common property of several nations. Prescott gives a few Mexican sayings. One of these, also found in the Talmud and the New Testament, is called the, the Old Proverb. As the Old Proverb says whoso regards a woman with curiosity commits adultery with his eyes. And the third commandment according to Buddha is, commit no adultery, the law is broken by even looking at the wife of another man with lust in the mind. Amongst other sayings assigned to Buddha we find the one respecting the wheat and the tares. Another is the parable of the sower. Buddha likewise told of the hidden treasure which may be laid up by a man and kept securely where a thief cannot break in and steal, the treasure that a man may carry away with him when he goes. The story of the rich young man who was commanded to sell all he had and give to the poor is told of Buddha. It is reported that he also said you may remove from their base the snowy mountains, you may exhaust the waters of the ocean, the firmament may fall to earth, but my words in the end will be accomplished. Some of Buddha's sayings are uttered in the same character as that of the canonical Christ. For example, when speaking of his departure Buddha, like the Christ, promises to send the paraclete, even the spirit of truth, who shall bear witness of him and lead his followers to the truth. The Gnostic Horus says the same things in the same character, and these sayings, by whomsoever uttered, carry the mythical character with them. The sayings of Krishna as well as those of the Buddha are frequently identical with those of the Christ. I am the letter A, cries the one. I am the Alpha and Omega, or the A.O., exclaims the other. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end, says Krishna, I am the light, I am the life, I am the sacrifice. Speaking of his disciples, he affirms that they dwell in him and he dwells in them. The attitude of the sayer as the personal revealer, the veritable and visible image of the hidden God in the Gospels, is that of the mythical Horus, the representative of Osiris of Iu as manifester of Adam, and of Kunsu as the son of Amenare. Who was the hidden God by name? The status had been attained, and the stand was occupied by the mythical divinity, and no room was left for a human claimant many centuries later. If we take the transfiguration on the mount, Buddha ascended the mountain in Ceylon called Pandava or Yellow White. There the heaven opened, and a great light was in full flood around him, and the glory of his person shone forth with double power. He shone as the brightness of sun and moon. This was the transfiguration of Buddha, identical with that of the Christ, and both are the same as that of Osiris in his ascent of the Mount of the Moon. 
The same scene of the temptation on the mount was previously portrayed in the Persian account of the devil tempting Zarathustra, and inviting him to curse the good belief. But these several forms of the one character do not meet, and did not originate in any human history lived either in Egypt, India, Persia, or Judea. They only meet in the mythos, which may be traced to a common origin in Egypt, where we can delve down to the real root of the matter. Astronomical mythology claims, and Egypt can account for, at least 30,000 years of time. And that alone will explain these relationships and likenesses found on the surface by an original identity at root. The myths of Christianity and Buddhism had a common origin, and branched from the same root in the soil of Egypt, whence emanated several dogmas, like that of the Immaculate Virgin Motherhood. And the Divine Child who is the ancestral soul self-reproduced. And in company with the doctrines we naturally find a few of the sayings of the Buddha, which have often been paralleled with some of those assigned to the Christ. The Logia or sayings are the mythoi in Greek. They were mythical sayings assigned to sayers, who were also mythical in that mythology which preceded and accounts for our theology and Christology. The sayings were the oral wisdom, and, as the name implies, that wisdom was uttered by word of mouth alone. They existed before writing, and were not allowed to be written afterwards. The mode of communicating them in the mysteries, as in masonry, was from mouth to ear. And, in passing, it may be remarked that the war of the papacy against masonry is because it is a survival of the pre-Christian mysteries, and a living, however imperfect, witness against historic Christianity. Mythos or myth denotes anything delivered by word of mouth, myth and mouth being identical at root. Now, as the mouth of utterance preceded the word that was uttered, it follows that the first form of the sayer or logos was female, and that the feminine wisdom was first, although she has not yet been made flesh. The mother was primordial, and the earliest soul or spirit was attributed to her, she was the mouth, utterer, or sayer, long before the sayings were assigned to the male logos or Christ. Thus in the Apocrypha, as in other Gnostic books, the sayings of wisdom are found which have been made counterfeit in the mouth of the Christ made historic. She was the primal type of wisdom, who built her house with the seven pillars, and who was set in the heavens as Kepha, later Sephek, and latest Sophia. She is called the living word or logos at Ombos, because as her constellation, the great bear, turned round annually, it told the time of the year. She is portrayed in the planisphere with her tongue hanging out to show that she is the mouthpiece of time who utters the word. Wisdom was also the earliest teller of human time. In her mystical phase she told the time for the sexes to come together. Thus, on the ground of natural phenomena, the logia were first uttered by the lady, and not by the Lord. This is the woman who has been so badly abused by those who desired to dethrone her, the primitive Protestants who set up the male image in her place and on her pedestal. In Egypt the sayings were assigned to various divinities, that is mythical characters. One of these was the solar god Ium Hept, the Egyptian Jesus, who was the son of Adam, and who is called, the Eternal Word, in the, Book of the Dead. After these sayings have been recorded it is said of them in a text at least 5,000 years old, I have heard the words of Ium Hept and Hartatief as it is said in their sayings. The Osirian form of the, the Lord, who utters the Logia in the Egyptian ritual is Horus, he whose name signifies the Lord. I cannot prove that sets of the sayings of the Lord, as Horus, were continued intact up to the time of Papias. Nor is that necessary. For, according to the nature of the hidden wisdom they remained oral and were not intended to be written down. They were not collected to be published as historic until the mysteries had come to an end or, on one line of their descent, were merged in Christianity. But a few most significant ones may be found in the Book of the Dead. In one particular passage the speaker says he has given food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, and a boat to the shipwrecked. And, as the Osirified has done these things, the judges say to him, Come, come in peace, and he is welcome to the festival which is called, Come thou to me. Those who have done these things on earth are held to have done them to Horus, the Lord. And they are invited to come to him as the blessed ones of his father Osiris. In this passage we have not only the sayings reproduced by Matthew, 
but also the drama and the scenes of the Last Judgment represented in the Great Hall of Justice, where a person is separated from his sins. And those who have sided with Sud against Horus are transformed into goats. Here it is noticeable that Matthew only of the four evangelists represents this drama of the Egyptian ritual. Among the sayings of Jesus, or Logia of the Lord, is the saying that, the very hairs of your head are numbered. And in the ritual every hair is weighed, also the night of the judgment day is designated that of, weighing a hair. Various chapters of the ritual are the th sayings. They are preceded by the formula, said by the deceased, or, said to the deceased. Horus, the Lord, is the divine sayer. Says Horus, is a common statement, and the souls repeat his sayings. He is the Lord by name, and therefore his are the original sayings, or Logia of the Lord. These sayings, or Logia of the Lord, were written by Hermes or Tot, the scribe of the gods, and they constituted the original Hermene or inspired scriptures. Which the Book of the Dead declares were written in hieroglyphics by the finger of Hermes himself. This recorder of the sayings is said to have power to grant the mocker to the solar god that is, the gift of speaking the truth by means of the word, because he is the registrar of the sayings, the scribe of the wisdom uttered orally, the means. Therefore, by which the word was made truth to men. Not flesh in human form. This is the part assigned to Matthew, the called one, the evangelist and scribe, who first wrote down the logia, or sayings of the Lord. Now, the special name or title of Hermes in the particular character of the recorder and registrar in the Hall of the Double Truth, or Justice, is Matthew in Egyptian that is, Meshu. And my claim is not only that the primary logia of the Lord were the sayings of Horus, whose name means, the Lord, but also that the Matthew who, according to the testimony of Papias, first wrote down the logia of the Lord, was none other than Meshu, or Hermes, the recorder of the sayings in the Egyptian ritual, who has been made an historic personage in the canonical gospel in exact accordance with the humanizing of the mythical Christ. One mode of manipulating the sayings, and making out a history is apparent, and can be followed. This was by looking it out in the alleged Hebrew prophecies, and inserting it piecemeal between the groups of sayings. There is proof that, with the sayings as primary data, the history of the canonical gospel, according to Matthew, was written on the principle of fulfilling the supposed prophecies found in the Old Testament, or elsewhere. The compiler was too uninstructed to know that the prophecies themselves belonged entirely to the astronomical allegory, and never did or could relate to forthcoming events that were to be fulfilled in human history. And never were supposed to do so, except by the ignorant, who knew no better, and who, in fact, thought the zodiacal virgin had brought forth her child on earth, which could only be born, and that figuratively, in heaven. Those who did no better, whether Jews, Samaritans, Essenes, or Gnostics, entirely repudiated the historic interpretation, and did not become Christians. They could no more join the ignorant, fanatical Salvation Army in the first century than we can in the nineteenth. The so-called prophecies not only supply a raison d'etre for the history in the Gospels, the events and circumstances themselves are manufactured one after another from the prophecies and sayings that is, from the mythos which was pre-extant. In the course of the literalization into a human life, and the localization in Judea, under the pretext, or in the blind belief, that the impossible had come to pass. Justin Martyr's great appeal for historical proofs is made to the Old Testament prophecies, and so is Matthew's. According to him, Jesus was born at Bethlehem in order that it might be fulfilled which was said by Micah that a governor and shepherd for Israel should come out of Bethlehem in Judea. That was in the celestial Bethlehem or house of bread corn, the zodiacal sign of the fishes, where the mythical Messiah was to be reborn about the year 255 BC. Again, the young child was only taken to Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, that he should be called a Nazarene. And yet he would no more become a Nazarene in that way than a man could become a horse by being born in a stable. Jesus came to dwell in Capernaum, on the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that a saying of Isaiah's might be fulfilled. He cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. For the same impotent reason he charged his followers not to make him known to men as the Christ. 
he taught the multitude in parables only that it might be fulfilled which had been spoken by the prophet. Although Jesus wrought his miracles, and did so many wonderful works, yet the people believed not on him, because Isaiah had previously said, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause, or on this account, they could not believe. And where, then, was the sense in expecting them to believe? Jesus only sent the two disciples to steal the ass and colt, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Zechariah. The choosing of Judas as one of the disciples, and his consequent treachery, do but occur in the Gospels, because it had been written by the psalmist, Yeah, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread. Hath lifted up his heel against me. Which refers to an identifiably Egyptian mythos. In another psalm assigned to David, the speaker cries, My God! My God! Why hast thou forsaken me? They part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. And in another he exclaims, They gave me also gall for meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And these sayings, which were pre-extant and pre-applied, constitute the Christian record of the historic crucifixion. It cannot be pretended that they are prophecies. The transactions and sayings in the Psalms are personal to the speaker there and then, whether mythical or historical, and not to any future sufferer. And the tremendous transactions portrayed in the Gospels are actually based upon a repetition of that which had already occurred. When Jesus is represented by John as being in his death agony, he only said, I thirst, in order that the Scripture might be fulfilled and not because he was thirsty, the Scripture being these sayings previously attributed to the psalmist David. The earlier sayings are repeated as the later doings, and the non-historical is finally the sole evidence for the historical. When the Roman soldiers had crucified Jesus they took the vesture that was without a seam, and said, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots. Such was the familiarity of the Roman soldiers with the Jewish scriptures, and such their respect for them, that they could do nothing that was not laid down in the Hebrew writings to be interpreted as prophecy. And in such a desperate way the prophecies had to be fulfilled in order that the history might be written. In the first place the sayings are not original, not personal to any historical Jesus, and yet they are the acknowledged foundations of the four Gospels. Therefore in them we have the foundations laid independently of any supposed founder of Christianity. Next, we have more or less seen how a part of the history superimposed on the sayings first collected by Matthew was extracted piecemeal from the parables, oracles, alleged prophecies, and unalleged mythos of the Old Testament. And thus we get upon the track of the compilers, and can trace their method of working from the matter of the mythos. Now, when we find, and can identify, the skeleton of some particular person, we have got the foundation of the man, no matter where the rest of him may be recoverable or not. So is it with the Christ of our canonical Gospels. The mythical Christ is the skeleton, and that is identifiably Egyptian. This mythical Christ, as Horus, was continued in the more mystical phase as the Horus of the Gnostics. The Gnostic rituals repeat the matter, names, symbols, and doctrines found in some later chapters of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The Gnostics supply the missing links between the oral sayings and the written word. Between the Egyptian and the canonical Gospels, between the Matthew who wrote down the sayings of the Lord in Hebrew or Aramaic, and the Meshu who is said to have written the ritual in hieroglyphics with the very finger of Hermes himself. The Gnostics were the knowers by name, their artists perpetuated the Egyptian types. And the original myths, symbols, and doctrines now recovered from the buried land of Egypt vouch for their knowledge of the mysteries which lurk in the sayings, parables, events, and characters that have been gathered up in our Gospels. To be naturalized and reissued in an historic narrative as the fulfillment of prophecy. They inherited the Gnosis of Egypt, which remained unwritten, and therefore was unknown to the Christians in general, the mysteries that were performed in secret, and the science kept concealed. The Gnostics complained, and truly maintained, that their mysteries had been made mundane in the Christian Gospels. That celestial persons and celestial scenes, 
which could only belong to the Pleroma could only be explained by the secret wisdom or Gnosis had been transferred to earth and translated into a human history. That their Christ, who could not be made flesh, had been converted into an historical character. That their Anthropos was turned into the Son of Man according to Matthew Monogenes into the Only Begotten, according to John, their hemorrhoidal Sophia into the woman who suffered from the issue of blood. The mother of the seven inferior powers into Mary Magdalene possessed by her seven devils, and the twelve eons into the twelve apostles. Thus, the Gnostics enable us to double the proof which can be derived directly and independently from Egypt. They claim that the miracle of the man who was born blind, and whose sight was restored by Jesus, was their mystery of the Aeon, who was produced by the Only Begotten as the sightless creature of a soulless creator. Irenaeus, in reporting this, makes great fun of the word that was born blind. He did not know that this Gnostic mystery was a survival of the Egyptian myth of the two Horuses, one of whom was the blind Horus, who exclaims in his blindness, I come to search for mine eyes. And has his sight restored at the coming of the second Horus the light of the world. Nor did he dream that the twofold Horus would explain why the blind man in our Gospels should be single in one version and twofold in another account of the same miracle. The Gnostic Horus came to seek and to save the poor lost mother, Sophia, who had wandered out of the Pleroma. And the Gnostics identified this myth with the statement assigned to Jesus when he said he had only come after that lost sheep which was gone astray. For, as Irenaeus says, they explain the wandering sheep to mean their mother. This shows how the character of the Christ was limited to the mold of the mythos and the likeness of Horus. But the lost sheep of the house of Israel has not yet found Jesus. The very same transactions and teachings ascribed to Jesus in the Gospels are assigned to the Gnostic Christ, who, like the Egyptian Horus, is the sayer in heaven, or within the Pleroma, and not upon our earth. And, in the Gospel according to John, we have Jesus identifying himself as the Son of Man which is in heaven, whilst at the same time he is represented as talking and teaching the Gnosis of the mysteries on earth. He tells Nicodemus, who came to him by night, that, No man hath ascended into heaven but he that descended out of heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. As was Anthropos when he taught the Twelve according to the Gnostic account of the transactions within the Pleroma. Also, the twelve eons are addressed in the language of the Gnosis when Jesus says to the twelve ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. They tell us, says Irenaeus, that the knowledge communicated by the Christ to the eons within the Pleroma has not been openly divulged, because all are not capable of receiving it. But it was mystically made known, by means of parables, to those who were qualified for receiving it. The Gnostic Christ reveals the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven to the twelve eons in parables. And in the Gospel the Christ speaks to the twelve in parables only, and to them alone is it given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In this process of converting the mythical into the historical we are told that Jesus, the very Son of God, was sent into the world to teach and enlighten and save mankind, and yet he spoke his teaching in parables which the people could not and were not intended to understand. All these things spake Jesus in parables to the multitude, and without a parable spake he nothing unto them, in order that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden from the foundation of the world. He spoke to the multitudes in this wise, so that they might not understand. Yet in the chapter following it is said, He called to him the multitude, not the disciples, and said unto them, Hear and understand, and immediately uttered a dark saying. We are also told that the common people heard him gladly. In another instance, as crucial as it is interesting illustrative of the way in which the mythical, the Cronian Christ, was made human as the instructor of man it is said as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately, and asked him to tell them about his coming in the clouds at the end of the world. And amongst other things they are to do, he says, Let them that are in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him that is on the housetops not go down. But what sense is there in advising any such mode of escape from the great tribulation and catastrophe which involved the end of the world? There would not be much advantage on the housetop or even the hilltop if the stars were falling from heaven, with the firmament raining all round with flames, and the end of all things had indeed come. 
we might just as well seek refuge at the top of a fire escape. And they are to pray that their flight may not be in winter, or on the Sabbath, as if it could possibly matter to any mortal in what season of the year, or day of the week, such a catastrophe should occur. The final explanation of all such foolishness is that the matter is mythical, and, of course, it refuses to be realized in any such literal way. The parable never meant the end of this world, the literalizers of the mythos thought it did. That was only a false inference of ignorant belief. But such are the foundations of the faith. Such desperate dilemmas as these are the inevitable result of representing the mythical sayer in heaven as an historical teacher on earth. The two chief abiding places to which the peripatetic Christ retires are called the mountain and the desert. These localities in the Egyptian mythos are the upper and lower heavens, otherwise the mount of the equinox and the wilderness of the underworld, and where John cries in the wilderness, On or Anup howled in the desert. Now, according to Egyptian thought and mode of expression the dead are those who are on the mountain, the living are those who are in the valley or on the earth. Horus on earth, or in the valley, is mortal, the child of the Immaculate Mother Isis alone. Horus on the mountain is spiritualized as the son of the father Osiris, in whose power he overcomes the devil. Sut or Satan has the best of it down in the wilderness, and Horus conquers up on the mount, in the day of their great battle. Jesus undergoes the same change as Horus does in his baptism. He likewise becomes the son of the father, and in the strength of his adultship he ascends the mountain and becomes the vanquisher of Satan. This typical mountain is a pivot on which a good deal may be said to turn. The contest between Jesus and Satan, called the Temptation on the Mount, is portrayed upon the monuments in a scene where Horus and Sut contend for supremacy, and at last agree to divide the whole world between them. Horus takes the south, and Sut the north, called the hinder part, where Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. The devil's long tail is an extant sign of this hinder part, which was typified in Egypt by the tail. If the Christ had been historical in this transaction, the devil must be historical too. Both stand on the same footing of fact or fable. According to the record, Satan must have been as real as the Christ, or Christ as mythical as the devil. Was Satan also incarnated for life in the flesh? If so, when did he die? Where was the place of his burial? And did he also rise again? Nobody seems to care what became of the poor devil after he was told to get behind, or take a back seat, that of the hinder part. The scene in the Mount of Transfiguration is obviously derived from the ascent of Osiris, or Horus, and his transfiguration in the Mount of the Moon. The sixth day was celebrated as that of the change and transfiguration of the solar god in the lunar orb, which he re-entered as the regenerator of its light. With this we may compare the statement made by Matthew that, after six days Jesus, went up into a high mountain apart, and he was transfigured. And his face did shine as the sun, of course, and his garments became white as the light. The natural phenomena on which these Egyptian legends or myths were founded are the contentions of light and darkness at the time of the equinox, or in the waxing and waning of the light in the lunar orb. He must increase, but I must decrease, says John, who plays the part of Satan to Jesus as the light of the world. This was the battle between Horus and Satan. In one legend it is said that Sut was seven days fleeing on the back of an ass from his battle with Horus. That means the seven days of the second quarter of the moon, during which Horus triumphs as lord of the growing light. And here we can point to a curious survival. The unicorn was a type of Sut, and the lion of Horus. And their conflict is described in our legend. The lion and the unicorn were fighting for a farthing. The lion beat the unicorn up and down the garden. The lion and the unicorn were fighting for a crown. The lion beat the unicorn up and down the town. The farthing is a fourth, and they fought for a fourthing, or a quarter of the moon. Equal to the seven days during which darkness was put to flight, and the crown is the full, round disc of the moon. Thus, as the Egyptian imagery proves, the arms of England illustrate the same subject matter as the contest of Horus and Sut, of Angromanus and Zarathustra, and of the Christ and Satan. And now, if you will have the patience, 
I will show a scene in which the Christ of the Gospels is restored to his proper place and station in the heavens, as the teacher on the mount, and as such can be identified. Jesus goes up into the mythical mountain when he appoints the twelve disciples, that they might be with him, and have authority to cast out devils, Mark 3. 14. In Matthew's compilation Jesus calls the twelve, and gives them authority to cast out devils. It is here that he says, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Luke describes the same scene in the same words, and the same commission is granted, the same powers are given to the disciples. But now the seventy have taken the place of the twelve. And the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us in thy name. The seventy in the mount are an ancient pre-Christian institution. They were once the seventy elders who received their instructions from Moses in the mount. But in many ancient authorities these seventy with Christ are seventy-two. The two different numbers are identifiably astronomical, and they go to double my proof. Previous to the heaven of twelve divisions, and seventy-two subdivisions, or duodecans of the zodiac, there was a heaven of ten divisions and seventy subdivisions. And we find the same mixture of the seventy with the seventy-two, and of the ten with the twelve, in the astronomical book of Enoch. Here, in the canonical version, we have the twelve, and the complementary seventy-two, but no ten to account for the seventy. This missing factor we shall find in the divine commander, or fragments of Hermes. There we meet with the ten in the mount, and the ten are the expellers of devils or torments, just as the twelve and the seventy are in the Gospels. All these parts belong to one system of mythological representation, and wherever they are separately found can be identified, as certainly as the scattered pieces of a puzzle by those who know the subject matter of the total picture. As before said, the scene on the Mount of Transfiguration reproduces the ascent of Buddha into Mount Pandava or Yellow White, and of Osiris into the Moon. Now, this Mount of the Moon was a seat of the eight great gods of Egypt. And in the divine commander it is called the octonary of Tat, who is lord in Smen, the region of the eight, at the north celestial pole. Lower down it was the mount of the four quarters, or of the moon, and of the four with Horus in the mount. And, still lower down, it becomes the heaven of the twelve signs, the zodiacal circle, and here the fragments of Hermes, or the divine commander, have brought on matter of very special importance. One of the chapters is entitled, The Secret Sermon on the Mount of Regeneration. Regeneration is the mystical form of the transfiguration of Osiris in the Mount of the Moon. This mount, also called the Tabernacle, is said to consist of the zodiacal circle, the signs of which are the twelve belonging to the Mount the Zodiac being the lowest of three heavens, or stories to the Mount, Stellar, Lunar, and Solar. Now, let us see how the Mount, together with the Sayer and the Sermon on the Mount, have been reproduced in the Gospels. In the account furnished by Matthew we find but four companions with Christ in the Mount. These are the two pairs of the brethren, who answer to the four brothers of Osiris, who are the gods of the four quarters. But in Luke's Gospel the Mount of the Four has become the Mount of the Twelve. Accordingly the sermon is here delivered lower down, at the bottom of the Mount. In fact, Jesus, instead of being seated with the four on the mount, is said to stand with the twelve in the plain below. This shows the mount to be astronomical as well as mythical. Further, in the same scene, where the disciples are twelve in number, as lords of the harvest according to Matthew's gospel they are seventy or seventy-two according to Luke. The number of duodecans into which the twelve signs of the zodiac were finally subdivided. In the Divine Commander the title of the Mount of Regeneration serves to show the nature of the sermon. It is the Secret Sermon. O, oh, son, says Hermes, this wisdom is to be understood in silence. That is, the knowledge or experience of the regeneration taught by the Secret Sermon on the Mount. Hermes had said that no man can be saved before regeneration, and Tat desires to understand the nature of this regeneration. He says to Hermes, I do humbly entreat thee, at the going up to the mountain. Just as the twelve besought Jesus privately in the mount. And Hermes shows him how the mortal man while in the flesh can transform into the immortal mind. In the mysteries this was figured as the rising from the dead, and it was so taught by the Gnostics. 
The process was illustrated by transformation, or entering into the state of trance, whereby, as was held, the mortal was changed into the immortal in this life. And it is evident that in the scene of the transfiguration described by Matthew, the vision of the three witnesses belongs to the trance condition, for they had a vision which they were to tell to no man. In the canonical Gospels the mythical mount has been made mundane, the divine speakers have been made human, the mystical teaching has been literalized by the endeavor to make the total transaction historical. After the secret sermon, or spiritual representation, in the Mount of Regeneration, and the profession of silence, Hermes tells Tat to keep silence these things are neither to be taught nor told, they are to be hid in silence. In the Gospels Jesus charges the disciples that they shall tell no man what things they have witnessed, save when the Son of Man shall have risen again from the dead. And the disciples, who are said to have just seen a resurrection from the dead performed before them, are described as questioning among themselves what the rising again from the dead should mean. Mark 9. 9. In the Osirian myth the rising from the dead was the rebirth of the Lord of Light in the orb of the new moon. That was the transfiguration of Osiris in the Mount of the Moon, on the sixth day of the month. In the mystical phase the rising from the dead in the Mount of Regeneration, as portrayed by Hermes, was a transformation into the spiritual or abnormal state, which demonstrated immortality. Thus we have the rising from the dead in two phases astronomical and spiritual, both Egyptian, both able to explain their own meaning, and both pre-Christian. In the Gospels we have the same mount, the same mythos, the same matter, the same numbers, the same characters, rendered historically. You can't help seeing the bones of the mythos staring through its skin. You are positively present at the transformation of the mythical into the historical. The solely lunar God and the Gnostic Christ have both contributed obviously to the makeup of the humanized Christ on the Mount of Regeneration and the Profession of Silence. No wonder the disciples could not understand what the rising from the dead should mean. In this manner the mythos can be followed, as it goes on eating its way through the history, like the larves of the Anobium Pertinax. Of which it is recorded by Pequot that one specimen perforated twenty-seven folio volumes in a line so straight that a cord could be passed through the hole, and the twenty-seven volumes slung up altogether. It is claimed by Christian teachers that the Christ was incarnated as the especial revealer of the Father who is in heaven, and that the revelation culminated on the mount when he taught the fatherhood of God in the Lord's Prayer. But the Lord's Prayer is no more original than is the Lord to whom it was last assigned. In the Jewish, Kadesh, we have the following pre-Christian form of it, which is almost word for word the same, Our Father which art in heaven. Be gracious to us, O Lord our God. Hallowed be thy name. And let the remembrance of thee be glorified in heaven above and upon earth below. Let thy kingdom reign over us now and for ever. Thy holy men of old said, Remit and forgive unto all men whatsoever they have done against me and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from the evil thing. For thine is the kingdom, and thou shalt reign in glory for ever and for ever. If such a revelation had ever been historical, if the Divine Son had once been incarnated to reveal the fatherhood, it could not have remained until the Christian era for this to be done. It did not need any deity to descend from heaven to reveal that which had been common doctrine in Egypt at least four thousand years earlier. And this prayer was prayed by the one particular people who rejected the Son of God when he had come down. But the matter is mythical and mystical, it can only be understood doctrinally by means of the Gnosis. The initial point of the teaching is this, there could be no fatherhood in heaven until the human fatherhood was individualized on earth. Previously there was only the Divine Mother and the Fathers in general. Hence the first Messiah was called the Son of the Woman, as he is in the Book of Enoch. The later is the son of man the Gnostic Anthropos, and the only begotten of the Father, the Gnostic Monogenes. This is he who was the last of the aeons, and who came at the end of the world. He instructed the aeons who had preceded him, and taught them that those who had a comprehension of the unbegotten were sufficient for themselves, or needed no higher knowledge than that proclaimed by him. He first announced among them what related to the knowledge of the Father, but that was within the Pleroma, not on the earth. This was the great and abstruse mystery of the Gnostics, says Irenaeus, that the pork, 
the power which is above all others and contains all, is termed Anthropos, hence the Manifester is styled the Son of Man. This title of the Christ occurs nearly eighty times over in the Gospel according to Matthew, where he is identical with the Gnostic Anthropos son of Anthropos. That is, the son of the God who was now imaged in the likeness of the individualized Father, which was the latest institution in heaven, because it had been last on earth. Here, it may be observed in passing, is a fact that is forever fatal to the theory that the Christology of the Gospels was derived from Buddhism. There is no divine fatherhood proclaimed by the Son in Buddhism. But the teaching was Egyptian. The most important sayings assigned to Jesus by the writer of John's Gospel are not recorded or referred to by the Synoptics Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These contain the secret wisdom of the Gnostics. They are the Logia of the Gnostic Christ, who was Horus, the Lord, in Egypt. They are spoken by the Son of Man, who is in heaven, John 3. 13, and who taught the twelve eons there with the same doctrinal sayings that are here assigned to the teacher of the twelve on earth, or on the mount. Moreover, in John's Gospel we meet with the seven fishers on board the boat. These correspond to the seven who are followers of Horus in the Egyptian ritual, and who are said to fish for Horus. They go a fishing with Horus in his boat, and they are also called the seven planks in the boat of souls. The miraculous draft of fishes occurs in both. Now, it is noticeable that this miraculous take of fishes is described by Luke as occurring during the lifetime of Jesus, but according to the Johannine Gospel, the transaction takes place in a region beyond the tomb, or at least after the death and resurrection of Jesus and therefore in the very region where the Gnostics declared these things had occurred. Which, think ye, was first the assuredly mythical, or the alleged historical? The Gospel according to John is the link of connection between the true Gnosis and the false history of the other Gospels. It shows the very ground on which the mythos alighted to be made mundane, and that is why it was kept secret, and withheld until the middle of the second century or so, by which time the doctrine of the Christ made flesh was considered safe. And sure to supersede the teachings of the Gnostics with the Gospel of Historic Christianity. An identifiable personal founder and historical teacher of Christianity is the least of all the various factors. The Church of Rome did not derive its secret dogmas and doctrines from the canonical Gospels in which his teachings are believed to be enshrined. Various Egyptian doctrines, not to be found in our canonical Gospels, survived in the Church of Rome. These were taught esoterically according to an unwritten tradition, and only allowed to become exoteric as time and opportunity permitted. Take for example the worship of the Sacred Heart. That is no recent invention of Rome or the ritualists. The doctrine is Egyptian, and of the remotest antiquity. The heart, on account of its relation to the blood, was held to be the house of life, and also the mother of life. The heart was the shrine of the soul. Its Egyptian name of Hat, and Hor, the soul, or divine child, composed the name of Hathor, the mother of Horus, the Christ. And as the heart or habitation is the mother of life, it was adopted as a type of the birthplace. And so in the ritual the soul, speaking as Horus, says, My heart is, or was, my mother, in a chapter, 30, which contains the doctrine of the sacred heart. For this reason the heart-shaped fruit of the Percy tree of life was an emblem of Hathor and her child. The stone of it was shown through a cleft in the fruit to denote the seed of the woman. Now, as previously said, one name of Hathor is Mary. Horus was the child Christ of the sacred heart of Mary, who was the goddess of love in Egypt, as well as the abode or dwelling of life, before she became the Madonna Mary in Rome. This is not only the source of the sacred heart as a Christian doctrine, it is also the origin of Cupid, the child god of love, and the typical heart still sacred to lovers on Valentine's Day. Possibly the nearest we can get to Jesus Ben Pandira as a teacher, if he makes any appearance whatever in the Gospels, is in the gloomy ascetic, the anti-naturalist, who mistook the non-natural for the divine. Who would have had men to save their protoplasmal souls by becoming eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake? And whose model for heaven itself was a monastery, as when he says, In my father's house are many monai, or monasterian with no women there to cause a second fall from heaven. 
He might possibly have been the self-tormenting teacher of a creed of Moncieri, only that institution was already established, and no place was left for him to be the founder even there. It is just possible that Joshua ben Pandira may have brought out of Egypt a version of the sayings of the original Meshu or Matthew, together with a form of the Horus myth. If so, these would be manipulated by his followers, one of whom, James, is said, in the book Abed Azura, to have been a follower of Jehoshua the Nazarene, and so by degrees the historic Joshua would be confused with, and finally converted into Jesus the Christ of Nazareth, and the mystical sayer into the Word made flesh, the Jesus of that other gospel, which was opposed by Paul. The sayings themselves, selected in a last assortment, have not even the consistency of a kaleidoscope. They will not fall into any set form of themselves, or reflect any mental unity anywhere. And so each sect or system of interpretation has to take them and construct its own kaleidoscope, and determine its own views, doing all it can to impose them upon others. Texts may be quoted on all sides for purposes the most antagonistic. Diversity radiates outwardly from them because there was no unity of origin, no individual life at the heart of them all. When our missionaries first made the sayings known to the Arawaks of Guiana, they remarked, the word is good but we knew most of it before. Most of the true sayings were known before. As we have them they are so various good, bad, and indifferent as to constitute that hybrid mixture which is certain to entail sterility. Some of the sayings are no more appropriate to our human wants than was the old lady's tract on the sin of dancing, which she offered to a poor fellow who had to hobble about on two wooden legs and crutches. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Of what value is such advice as that? Also, it is impossible for us to love our enemies, if it were right to do so, and, as has been said, it would be wrong to do it if it were possible. Blessed are they who have not seen yet have believed. Why, tyranny could devise no doctrine that could be turned to more fatal account. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you call the teaching of that saying divine? I think it would be false and fraudulent if uttered by a voice from the infinite with all heaven for its mouthpiece. The poor in spirit are the accursed, the outcasts, and pariahs of the earth. Those who sink into the squalor and crawl in the filthy dens of poverty, to become the natural victims of all its parasites of prey. The poor in spirit are the prematurely old men, weary, worn-out women, and wizened children, all bleaching into a ghastly white in the chilling shadow of daily want. The poor in spirit are those who crouch and offer their backs to the whip, who remain bowed just as they were bent, and allow their hands to be fettered and held fast in the attitude of prayer, when they ought to be up and striking. They who are content to crawl like caterpillars, and be trodden as caterpillars underfoot. Poverty of spirit is the very devil, the source of half the evil extant, most of the meannesses in human nature may be traced to poverty of spirit. It dwarfs the mental stature of men, makes them bow the neck, and creep and grovel for a little gain, or go down on all fours in the dirt, as beasts in human form, from lack of spirit enough to stand erect. The poor in spirit dare not think for themselves, or utter what they think. They only wonder what other folk will think. They who are only mere preliminary people that go monkeying round under the pretense of being women and men. In this world of struggle, this scene of survival for the fittest, the poor in spirit stand no chance, and find no place, there is no victory for those who fight no battle. And as to heaven do you really think heaven is a harbor of refuge for the poor in spirit and the area sneaks of earth? The poor and needy, the hungry and suffering, are not the blessed, and no assumption of divine authority on the part of the sayer will ever make them so. These beatitudes are not divine revelations, they are only the false promises of the priests, who were the crafty founders of the faith, made comfortable to Roman rule. One very striking note of the want of human personality and historic verity in the Christ of the canonical Gospels is the absence of all recognition of Rome. There is no shadow of Rome to be seen on the face of the Christ. No word of rebuke for her inhuman and non-natural crimes, no sign of anything contemporary, except the counseling of submission to Caesar. The slave would look in vain to the sayings of Jesus for any denunciation of slavery. 
There is not one word of condemnation for the oppressors, nor of comfort for the oppressed. No vision of the better day on earth for them. Nothing but the mythical day of the Lord. Yet the existence of slavery was endorsed by the Roman law, was practiced with all its evils, and enforced by all her legions. Jesus, however, makes no attack on the institution. And the fact was quoted and emphatically emphasized by the ministers of the Gospel of Christ against the persecuted abolitionists of America. Nor is there a single word uttered on behalf of subjugated, downtrodden womankind. Not a saying that will aid in lifting woman to an equality with man not a rebuke to the bigoted Jew who thanked his God each morning that he was not a woman. Nor is he credited with uttering one word against cruelty to animals. He gives no voice to the dumb creation. No quickening of conscience in these matters can be attributed to him. Neither the mother, the wife, nor the sister, owes any gratitude to his alleged teaching, who exclaimed, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Neither the slaves, nor the women, nor the children, nor the animals, owe their deliverance from inhuman thraldom to him. He had nothing to say about these pitifully human interests. And it is a foolish farce to go on attributing the emancipation of humanity to the teachings of Jesus the great reformer. As a human history nothing can be made of it. It does not even begin to be however much you believe. The contradictions are such as make history impossible. Amidst the dissolution of dogmas and the universal wreck of creeds, vain is the endeavor to prop the falling structure with the personality of the canonical Christ, which evades us and vanishes in proportion as we seek for it in the Gospels. The common assumption is that the historic element was the kernel of the whole, and that the fable accreted around it. But, if you will try it over again this other way, you will find the mythos which was fundamental will explain all. The mythos being pre-extant, shows that the core of the matter was mythical, and it follows that the alleged history is incremental. And when at last we do get to the bottom of the abyss we learn that the historic grounds have been formed from the sunken debris or dregs of the ancient mythology. That pyramid of imposture reared by Rome. All of cement, for an eternal home. Must crumble back to earth, and every gust shall revel in the desert of its dust. And when the prison of the immortal, mind hath fallen to set free the bound and blind. No more shall life be one long dread of death. Humanity shall breathe with fuller breath. Expand in spirit and in stature rise. To match its birthplace of the earth and skies. Gnostic and Historic Christianity My purpose in the present lectures is to enforce with further evidence, and sustain with ampler detail, the interpretation of facts, which has been already outlined in the Natural Genesis. My contention is, that the original mythos and gnosis of Christianity were primarily derived from Egypt on various lines of descent, Hebrew, Persian, and Greek, Alexandrian, Essenian, and Nazarene, and that these converged in Rome. Where the history was manufactured mainly from the identifiable matter of the mythos recorded in the ancient books of wisdom, illustrated by Gnostic art, and orally preserved amongst the secrets of the mysteries. My standpoint had not previously been taken. It was not until this, the era of excavation, that we were able to dig down far enough to recover the fundamental facts that were most essential for the student of survivals and development to know anything certain concerning the remoter origins and evolution of the Christian system. The most ancient evidences having been neglected until now. Instead of the Roman Church being a crucible for purging the truth from the dross of error, to give it forth pure gold, we shall have to look upon it rather as the melting pot. In which the beautiful and noble mental coinage of Greece and Egypt was fused down and made featureless, to be run into another mold, stamped with a newer name, and reissued under a later date. In the course of establishing apostolic Christianity upon historical foundations, there was such a reversal of cause and outcome that the substance and the shadow had to change places. And the husk and kernel lost their natural relationship and value. All that was first in time and in originality has been put latest, in order that the prophecy might be fulfilled, and the last become first. All that preceded Christianity in the religion of knowledge, of the Gnostics, has come to be looked back upon as if it were like that representation in the German play where Adam is seen crossing the stage in the act of going to be created. 
historic Christianity has gathered in the crops that were not of its kind, but were garnered from the seed already in the soil. Whosoever tilled and sowed, it has assumed the credit, and been permitted to reap the harvest, as undisputed master of the field. It claimed, and was gradually allowed, to be the source of almost every true word and perfect work that was previously extant, and these were assigned to a personal Christ as the veritable author and finisher of the faith. Every good thing was redated, rewarranted, declared, and guaranteed to be the blessed result of historic Christianity, as established by Jesus and his personal disciples. It can be demonstrated that Christianity pre existed without the personal Christ, that it was continued by Christians who entirely rejected the historical character in the second century. And that the supposed historic portraiture in the canonical Gospels was extant as mythical and mystical before the Gospels themselves existed. In short, the mythical theory can be proved by recovering the mythos and the gnosis. The picture of the new beginning commonly presented is Rembrandt like in tone. The whole world around Judea lay in the shadow of outer darkness, when suddenly there was a great light seen at the center of all, and the face of the startled universe was illuminated by an apparition of the child Christ lying in the lap of Mary. Such was the dawn of Christianity, in which the light of the world had come to it at last. That explanation is beautifully simple for the simple-minded, but the picture is purely ideal or, in sterner words, it is entirely false. When the fountainheads of the Nile were reached at last, it was perceived that the great river did not rise from any single source in one particular place, but from a vast concourse of many tributary springs. So when we come to examine for ourselves the vast complex that passes under the vague name of Christianity, we learn that it can be traced to no one single source or locality. So far from its being an original system as product of the life, character, work, and teachings of a personal founder. We have to acknowledge sooner or later that it is more like a unique specimen of what schoolboys profanely call a resurrection pie. Another popular delusion most ignorantly cherished is, that there was a golden age of primitive Christianity, which followed the preaching of the founder and the practice of his apostles. And that there was a falling away from this paradisiacal state of primordial perfection when the Catholic Church in Rome lapsed into idolatry, paganist and perverted the original religion and poisoned the springs of the faith at the very fountainhead of their flowing purity. Such is the pious opinion of those Orthodox Protestants who are always clamoring to get back beyond the Roman Church to that ideal of primitive perfection supposed to be found in the simple teachings of Jesus. And the lives of his personal followers, as recorded in the four canonical Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles. But when we do penetrate far enough into the past to see somewhat clearly through and beyond the cloud of dust that was the cause of a great obscuration in the first two centuries of our era, we find that there was no such new beginning. That the earliest days of the purest Christianity were prehistoric, and that the real golden age of knowledge and simple morality preceded, and did not follow, the apostolic Roman Church, or the deification of its founder. Or the humanizing of the Lamb of God, whom Lucian calls the Impaled One of Palestine. In an interesting book just published, entitled Buddhism in Christendom, Mr. Lilly thinks he has found Jesus, the author of Christianity, as one of the Essenes, and a Buddhist. But there is no need of craning one's neck out of joint in looking to India, or straining in that direction at all, for the origin of that which was Egyptian born and Gnostic bred. Essenism was no new birth of Hindu Buddhism brought to Alexandria about two centuries before our era, and Christianity, whether considered to be mystical or historical, was not derived from Buddhism at any time. They have some things in common, because there is a beyond to both. The crucial test, however, is to be found on the threshold, at the first step we take, in the doctrine of the Divine Fatherhood. The supreme role assigned to the Christ of the Gospels, as of the Gnostics, is that of Manifester and Revealer of the Father in Heaven. His sign manual is the seal of the Father. A dozen times, according to Matthew, he calls God, my Father. In John's Gospel, he says, I and my Father are one. I am come in my Father's name. My Father hath sent me. My Father hath taught me. I am in my Father. The word ye hear is my Father's. Buddha makes no revelation of the mythology. 
The Buddha is the veiled God unveiled, the unmanifested made manifest, Buddha, like Putha, or Kepurta, was begotten by his own becoming, before the time of the divine paternity. There being no real father God in Buddhism, the Buddha has none to make known on earth. The doctrine was Egyptian, as when it is proclaimed in the texts that Horus is the son who proceeds from his father, and Osiris is the father who proceeds from his son. Again, in the Hindu myth of the ascent and transfiguration on the mount, the six glories of the Buddha's head are represented as shining out with a brilliance that was blinding to mortal sight. These six glories are equivalent to the six manifestations of the moon god in the six upper signs, or, as it was set forth, in the lunar mount. During six months, the Horus, or Buddha, as lord of light in the moon, did battle with the powers of darkness by night, whilst the sun itself was fighting his way through the six lower signs. Now, in the Gospel according to John, there is no contest with Satan, and no transfiguration on the mount. Instead, we have the light of the world, which is in heaven, warring with the darkness, and manifesting his glory in six miracles no more, no less answering the six glories of the Buddha's head on the mount. Or the six manifestations in the luminous hemisphere of the superior signs. The beginning of his signs, by which Jesus manifested his glory, was the turning of water into wine. The sixth, and last, of these, was the raising of Lazarus, which corresponds exactly with the rising of the mummy constellation, Sahu, of Orion, which ascended as the star of the resurrection. When the solar god returned from the dark hemisphere of the underworld, or the sun re-entered the sign of the bull at the vernal equinox. The source of all is the identifiable astronomical allegory in the solely lunar phase, but the fable followed in the Gospel is Egyptian, not Buddhist. The Christ is one with Horus as Lord of the Lunar Light, who manifested the glory, or the six glories, of his Father, in the six upper signs, as his only begotten Son. The claim now made is that the common mythos determined the number of the six glories, or six miracles, and the history was molded accordingly. I also think that Jesus or Joshua ben Pandira was an Essene. That is, he was a Nazarite, and the Nazarites were one with the Essenes. And these, for example, are amongst the sayings in the Book of the Nazarenes. Blessed are the peacemakers, the just, and faithful, feed the hungry. Give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked. When thou makest a gift, seek no witness whereof, to mar thy bounty. Let thy right hand be ignorant of the gifts of thy left. Such were common to all the Gnostic scriptures, going back to the Egyptian. This is a Nazarene saying from the book of Adam, No poor sculpture of earth has fashioned his throne. The palace of the king was not built up by earthly masons. And this is from an Egyptian hymn, He is not graven in marble, nor adored in sanctuaries. There is no building that can contain him. In the ancient Egyptian, Maxims of Ani, we read, The sanctuary of God abhors noisy demonstrations. Pray humbly with a loving heart, all the words of which are uttered in secret. He will listen to thy words, he will accept thy offerings. Exaggerate not the liturgical prescriptions, it is forbidden to offer more than is prescribed. Thou shalt make adorations in his name. These contain the essence of the early verses in the sixth chapter of Matthew, where the injunctions given are, Sound not a trumpet before thee, etc. Pray in secret to thy Father, which is in secret, and he shall recompense thee. And in praying use not vain repetitions. Ani denotes one of the names of Tot who, as Matty equals Matthew, wrote down the sayings of the Lord, some of which are amongst these maxims. But, unfortunately, you cannot prove anything, or, still more unfortunately, you can prove anything from the Gospels. You must first catch your Jesus, before you pretend to tell us what he was personally, and what were his own individual teachings. These sayings of mine cannot be judged as his if they were pre extant, and can be proved to be anyone's sayings, or may be identified as ancient sayings, whether Buddhist, Nazarene, apocryphal, or Egyptian. Also, there are different versions of the same sayings in the Gospels. In Matthew, we read, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. In Luke it is, Blessed are ye that hunger now. In Matthew, Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
In Luke, blessed be ye poor. Woe unto you that are rich. Which, then, is the version that is personal to Jesus, the Nazarene? Or where is the sense of claiming that the personal Jesus was an Essene or Nazarite one of those who never touched wine, or strong drink when one of the inspired writers testifies that he was described as a glutton, and a wine-bibber. And, according to another, his very first miracle was the turning of water into wine for a marriage feast. Suppose we admit that you have laid hold of Joshua, the Essene, the Nazarite, the reputed great healer, the comforter, what can you make of a character so unhuman as this? A poor Canaanitish woman comes to him from a long distance and beseeches him to cure her daughter who is grievously obsessed. Have mercy on me, O Lord, she pleads. But he answered her not a word. The disciples, brutes as they were, if the scene were real, besought him to send her away because she cried after them. Jesus answered, and said, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She worships him, and he calls her one of the dogs. And it is only her extreme deference that wins a kindly word from him at last. The Essenes and Gnostics absolutely denied the physical resurrection, because they were spiritualists. Therefore, it was impossible for an Essene to have taught the resurrection of the dead at the last day as Jesus is made to do. John 6. 39, 40, and 11. 24. Again, if the pupil of Ben Parachia was an Essene, or, as reputed, an initiate in Egyptian mysteries, he never could have endorsed the mistakes attributed to Moses. Never would have died for the reality of a parable, which he must have known to be astronomical. As one of the Magi or an Essene, he would understand the doctrine of angels, i.e. of the cycles of time, the character of the Cronian Messiah and the coming in four hundred years, according to the prophecy of Esdras. He would know the celestial nature of the seventy-two whose names were written in heaven as servants of the Lord of Light, and who had been with him, from the beginning, as the opponents of the seventy-two Sami who served Sutiphon. The Devil of Darkness He would know that the myths were not to be fulfilled in human history, and could not have personally set up the crazy claim that he was the messenger of Hebrew prophecy in person. No. The claims are made in his name by those who naturalized the mythos on its Hebrew-Aramaic line of descent in Matthew, Egyptian in Luke, and Greek in John. What we do here is not the voice of the founder teaching one thing at one time and the direct opposite at another. We hear the voices of the different sections, each proclaiming its own particular doctrines and dogmas, each assigning them to the Christ as their typical teacher, in the course of making out a personal history from the mythos and of giving vent to their own particular prejudices. The sayings of the Lord were prehistoric, as the sayings of David, who was an earlier Christ, the sayings of Horus the Lord, of Elijah the Lord, of Manna the Lord, of Christ the Lord, as the divine directions conveyed by the ancient teachings. As the sayings of the Lord, they were collected in Aramaic to become the nuclei of the earliest Christian gospel according to Matthew. So says Papias. At a later date they were put forth as the original revelation of a personal teacher, and were made the foundation of the historical fiction concocted in the four Gospels that were canonized at last. In proving that Joshua or Jesus was in a scene there would be no more rest here than anywhere else for the sole of your foot upon the ground of historic fact. You could not make him to be the founder of the Essene, Nazarite or Gnostic brotherhoods, and communities of the genuine primitive Christians that were extant in various countries a very long while before the era called Christian. Nor is there any need to go to India for the original healers, called Essenes or Therapeute. The dawn of civilization arose in Egypt, with healing on its wings. Egypt was the land of physicians through all her monumental history. Amongst the nations of antiquity she stands a head and shoulders above the rest, first in time and preeminent in attainment. Egypt was the great physician of the human race, and she sent out her medical missionaries from the earliest times. The Essenes were the same as the therapeut or healers, and they are the healers by name in Egyptian. Philo farther identifies their name with Essa in Hebrew, for healing. But Egypt had given birth to the Essenic name, and, therefore, to the persons named, before the letter E existed, that was previous to the Middle Empire, which ended over four thousand years ago. 
In Old Egyptian, the word Usha means to doctor. Whence the Ushai, later, Eshe, or Essenes, are the healers and physicians Josephus has compared the Pythagoreans with the Egyptian therapeute or Alexandrian Essenes. And attempts have been made to show the derivation of Buddhist doctrines from India through Pythagoras whose name has been derived from put equals Buddha and Guru, a teacher with intent to prove that he was a teacher of the religion of Buddha. But the Egyptian Putha, the original of Buddha as I suggest, is indefinitely older than any known Buddha in India. Therefore, as Pythagoras was learned in the wisdom of Egypt and was a teacher of it, I should derive his name from Putha, Ta, and Kuru, e.g., the voice or word of, as a teacher of the cult of Putha or Ta, the opener, and Lord of Life. Also, when he entered the first stage of the Essenic Mysteries as a student of divinity, the initiate was presented with an axe, that is the Egyptian hieroglyphic of divinity, called the neuter. The sign with which the name of the priest, prophet, or holy father, was written. Philo informs us that the Jewish lawgiver, Moses, had trained into fellowship a large number of those who bore the name of Essenes. There were both Egyptian and Jewish communities of the healers preceding those that were known by the Christian or Gnostic names. Jerome calls the Essenes or Therapeutes the monks of the old law, and Evagrius Ponticus speaks of, a monk of great renown who belonged to a sect of the Gnostics that dwelt near Alexandria, and were known by name as the Christian Gnostics. Clement of Alexandria also claimed to be a Gnostic Christian. As M. Rena points out, the life of the so-called Christian hermits was first commenced in Egypt. Ages earlier there had been Egyptian communities of recluses, both male and female, near the Serapsum of Memphis, which were supported by the state. In Philo's letter to Hephstion, he says the cells of the Egyptian healers are scattered about the region on the farther shore of Lake Mariotis, in Egypt. Pliny speaks of the ages on ages during which the Essenes had existed, and Epiphanius, about the year 400, says the Essenes continue in their first position, and have not changed at all. Such permanency, of course, demands a long period of induration. But it is enough for the present argument to know they were extant for at least 150 years before the Christian era. Epiphanius also admits that the Christians were at first called Therapeutes and Jesseans, an equivalent name, as he explains, for the Essenes. They were all healers and doctors. As the Ushai or Jesseans they were already extant as the healers by name, independently of any personal Jesus or Joshua the healer. Also, in Greek the verb for healing comes from the same root as the name of Jesus. The Essenes were healers, not because they were the workers of mythical miracles like Jesus, but because they were profound students of nature's secret powers. Because they were masters of the science of mental medicine, consciously able to draw on the spirit world for healing influences. They had discovered that health was infectious as well as disease, and that the capacity for receiving and giving, as a medium of the higher life, depended on conditions that could be cultivated in this life. Hence the stress they laid on personal purity and its eight stages of attainment. They were healers by virtue of the Christ within. Again, we learn from Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite, that the name of healer, i.e., the Essene or Therapeute, whom Eusebius calls the curate, was employed in the early church to denote the perfected adept, who had attained the highest standing, just as it was with the earlier Essenes. The current expression a cure of souls, or a curacy, still shows the Christian line of descent from the pre-Christian healers. We sometimes hear of early Christian communities in which there was no private property, but all things were held in common, as we read in the book of Acts, although in that case the twelve would but constitute a late community. The members of these brotherhoods are said to have dwelt together in perfect equality, in fact, to have lived according to those principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity which were formulated as an aim of the French Revolution. But such societies did not first originate as the result of establishing historic Christianity. They did not come from the Twelve Apostles, nor from the Church at Jerusalem, nor from Rome. They were founded by the prehistoric Christians, who were primitive enough to practice their creed instead of merely preaching it as a faith. But such primitive Christians were quietly at work in various parts of the world, giving health to the sick, peace to the troubled, freedom to the slave, and knowledge to the ignorant, 
long before the existence of papal or apostolic Christianity. Philo Judsis, who was one of the Essenes but does not seem to have met with the Gospel Jesus amongst them, or heard of him Philo says of them, three things regulate all they learn and do viz, love to God, love of virtue, love for man. A proof of the first is the matchless sanctity of their entire life, their fear of oaths and lies, and the conviction. That God is only the originator of good, never of evil. They show their love of virtue by their indifference to gain, glory, and pleasure, by their temperance, perseverance, simplicity, absence of wants, humility, faithfulness, and straightforwardness. They exemplify their love for their fellow creatures by kindness, absence of pretensions, and lastly by the community of goods. There you have what is termed an ideal Christian community. But this was a reality, and it was not founded by any personal Jesus, nor was it a result of his personal teachings being reduced to practice. It preceded, and was not a birth of, historic Christianity. Philo tells us that those who retired from the turmoil of public life to dwell apart in solitary places, these being the precursors of the monks and nuns in the Roman Church, handed over their private property to others, and left their parents. Brothers and sisters, wife and child, and gave up all to the mysteries of a dedicated life. This, which was a common reality with the Essenes, is set forth as an ideal when the canonical teacher says, If any man cometh unto me, and hadeth not his own father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Here the ideal is perhaps a trifle overdone. The Essenes did not express or inculcate any such spirit of hatred to all one's relations. They were no such rabid anti-naturalists as that. The peaceful ascenic spirit is not present, but rather the spirit of Christian persecution that lighted the fires of martyrdom. Of those Essenes who moved about in the world Josephus tells us, he also was an Essene in early life who did not find Jesus, they have no uncertain city, but many of them dwell in every city. And if any of them come from other places, what they have lies open for the strangers, just as if it were their own for which reason they carry nothing at all with them on their travels. Nor do they buy or sell anything one to another, but every one of those who have gives to him that requires it. The Essenes were phenomenal spiritualists, in the current sense, who walked with open sight, and could never become the blind followers of the shut-eyed faith of the historicizers, who banned the malignant spirit of free inquiry. As spiritualists they could not, and did not, believe in the resurrection of the body, consequently a corporeal resurrection of the Christ was a fundamental fallacy upon which no Essene or Gnostic could found at any time. So anti-Christian were they in the Catholic sense, and so opposed to the Messiah of pubescence, the Christ according to the flesh, that they repudiated anointing with oil, and considered it to be a filthy defilement. Therefore their Christ did not depend upon any external anointing in baptism at the age of thirty years, and they never could become Christians as the anointed ones. They were the opponents of all blood sacrifice, animal or human. The only sacrifice upheld by them was that of the self. Therefore they did not accept the bloody sacrifice of the incarnate Son of God when it was proclaimed. The Essenes as Gnostics held that every man must be his own Christ. Their Christ came within the Christ that could not become historical without. In the minds of those who knew, historic Christianity was repudiated beforehand. And it was as impossible after the facts were forged, the falsehood established, and the dogma was founded, as it was before, consequently those Gnostics who had been anti-Christians beforehand were of necessity anti-Christians afterwards. The Essenes discarded the Pentateuch and repudiated most of the later prophets that is, they rejected the groundwork of the future redemption of mankind, together with the fall that never was a fact. And the fulfillment of prophecy which never could be human. The Essenes and other Gnostics are constantly charged by the ignorant Christians with turning very plain matters of fact into fantastical parables. M. Renat talks of Simon's and Philo's allegorizing exegesis as if the ancient fables had been historic facts which the Gnostics perverted into myths. They were nothing of the kind. They were fables and allegories from the first the mysteries that were taught in parables and all Gnostics rejected the historic explanation from beginning to end, because they preserved the true interpretation of the supposed history. 
Philo tells us they regard the letter of each utterance as the symbol of that which was concealed from sight, but was revealed in the hidden meaning, not by its being rationalized into history. Mythology is, in its way, as real as mathematics, but its way is not that of the literalizers, who have made the symbolism false on the face of it to the underlying natural facts. The fall of man, the temptation of the serpent and the coming of a messiah were not historic realities, which the Gnostics converted into their allegories. It is altogether misleading to speak of the allegorizing ascetic and docetic methods of exegesis, as if the Gnosis consisted in whittling away and attenuating the solid facts of history. That is merely echoing the language of those who were at war with the Gnostic interpretation, on behalf of the supposed history by which we have been misled. The allegories were first, and they are final, the history had no deeper foundations. The Essenes knew the hidden nature of these representations and taught it, through symbols, with time-honored zeal, being in possession of the books of wisdom and other scriptures than ours. They were the jealous preservers of the hidden Gnosis, and qualified expounders of the ancient mysteries by means of the secret tradition. The initiate was sworn to keep secret the scriptures of the hidden wisdom and not to communicate the Gnosis to others, not even to a new member except in the same way in which it had been communicated to him. But it was especially prescribed that the doctrine of the angels, i.e. of the time cycles, was not to be revealed to any non-Essene. Unfortunately that secrecy in the mode of communication became the fatal curse of all the ancient knowledge by allowing the false to come first in being publicly proclaimed. De Quincey, in his essay on the Essenes, has remarked on the monstrosity of the omission when the Christians are not even mentioned by the Jewish historian, Josephus. There is the same portentous omission when the Essenes are never mentioned in the Christian Gospels. They are there in fact, though not by name, nor as any newborn brotherhood. They are only there in disguise, because historic Christianity has drawn the mask over the features of primitive Christianity. The existence of primitive and prehistoric Christians is acknowledged in the Gospel according to Mark when John says, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. That, as the context shows, was done in the name of the Christ, and, consequently, such were Christians. According to the account in Matthew, before ever a disciple had gone forth or could have begun to preach historic Christianity. There was a widespread secret organization ready to receive and bound to succor those who were sent out in every city of Israel. Who, then, are these? They are called, the worthy. That is, as with the Essenes, those who have stood the tests, proved faithful, and been found worthy. According to the canonical account these were the prehistoric Christians, whether called Essenes or Nazarenes, the worthy, the faithful, or the brethren of the Lord. Peace be with you. Was the greeting or password of the Essenes, and also of the Nazarenes, to judge from its appearing in the book of Adam. And in the instructions given to the seventy, Luke X. 5, it is said, Into whatsoever house ye enter first say, Peace be to this house. After the resurrection the mystic password is employed three times over by the risen Christ. And, he who comes with peace, is the name of the Egyptian god, Ium Hept, the son of Adam, who, as the coming son, is Iusu equals Jesus. We also learn from the Clementine Homilies, 3, 19, that the, mystery of the scriptures, which was taught by, or ascribed to, Christ was identical with that which from the first had been communicated to those who were the worthy. We may learn from the Gospel according to Luke that the worthy were those who had been initiated into the mysteries of the Gnosis, and who were accounted worthy to attain that resurrection from the dead in this life. Which Paul was not altogether sure about those who knew that they could die no more, being equal to the angels as sons of God and sons of the resurrection. Such were then extant as prehistoric Christians, chxx. 35-6 these communities of the primitive Christians had long been accustomed to send forth their barefooted apostles into all the known world, to inculcate the common brotherhood of man, founded on the common fatherhood of God, and to labor for the family of the human race. That had been the practice in the past which was afterwards made a matter of precept in the present, and a prospect for the future. For this ancient practice of the Essenes is reduced to the precept of the teacher made personal, who says, Go your way, 
carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and gives instructions to do the very things the Essenes had always done. The supposed personal teacher and historic founder of primitive Christianity is made to say to his followers, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. But the statement is entirely untrue. There was nothing new in it. This was a primary commandment of the Essenic communities who had practiced the principles they professed, and had lived for ages according to the golden rule which is afterwards laid down as a divine command, a direct revelation from God. In the Gospels No matter who the plagiarist may be, the teaching now held to be divine was drawn from older human sources, and palmed off under false pretensions. Josephus declares in his account of the Essenes, that, whatever they say is firmer than an oath. But swearing is entirely avoided by them. They consider it worse than perjury. And such is the original revelation in the Gospel. But I was sorry to find, in the Clementine homilies, that the same speaker breaks the Essenic pledge, for it is there written and Christ said, with an oath, Verily I say unto you, unless ye be born again of the water of life ye cannot enter in the kingdom of heaven. Thus we have an Essene who swears as well as tipples and plays the part of Bacchus. Again, Jesus is presented as the original revealer of the mysteries and author of the Gnosis. He says to his disciples it is given you to know the mysteries of heaven. But the Essenic communities always had been composed of those who were in possession of the Gnosis, and had already obtained and sacredly preserved the knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, which they had taught only in parables. The divine morality inculcated in the sayings ascribed to Jesus had been completely forestalled by the Essenes in their lives and works, their individual characters, common practices, and societary conditions. His words are but a later echo of their very human deeds. We are told that Jesus taught mankind to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But this was exactly what the prehistoric Christians had been working out in life. They strove to found the kingdom there and then, and realized the world to come in this. Everything noble and ennobling, unselfish and spiritual, in the ethics of Jesus, or rather in the sayings assigned to him as a teacher of men, had been anticipated by the Egyptians, the Essenes, and the primitive Christians of the Gnostic religion. Nothing new remained to be inculcated by the Gospel of the New Teacher who is merely made to repeat the old sayings with a pretentious air of supernatural authority. The result being that the true sayings of old are, of necessity, conveyed to later times in a delusive manner. The commandments are not new. Life and immortality were not brought to light by any personal Jesus, but by the Christ of the Gnosis. The most important proclamation assigned to Jesus turned out to be false. The kingdom of God was not at hand, the world was not nearing its end, the catastrophe foretold never occurred, the second coming was no more actual than the first. The lost sheep of Israel are not yet saved. And the supposed divine truth in very person remains exposed as the genuine false prophet to this day, or rather as the mere mouthpiece of the most ignorant beliefs of that day. It may be said more justly of historic Christianity, than of anything else within the compass of my knowledge, that what is true in it was not new, and that which was new in it is not true. It is not new, because it represents the ancient mythos under an intended disguise. It is not true, because it is not a genuine history. The supposed human original, set forth in the Gospels, is but the mundane shadow of the Gnostic Christ. Christianity began as Gnosticism, refaced with falsehoods concerning a series of facts alleged to have been historical, but which are demonstrably mythical. By which I do not mean mythical as exaggerations or perversions of historic truth, but belonging to the pre-extant mythos. Of course, the setting up of this vast falsehood made all truth a blasphemy. The Gnostics, says Irenaeus, have no gospel which is not full of blasphemy. Their crime was that they denied the Christ carnalist, and they were denounced as being anti-Christian, because they were anti-Christian. We are told in the book of Acts that the name of the Christiani was first given at Antioch, but so late as the year 200 AD no canonical New Testament was known at Antioch, the alleged birthplace of the Christian name. There was no special reason why, the disciples, should first have been named as Christians at Antioch, 
except that this was a great center of the Gnostic Christians, who were previously identified with the teachings of the mage Simon of Samaria. Simon had taught the people of Antioch for a long time before, and had been accepted by them, from the least to the greatest, Acts. Simon was the great Antichrist in the eyes of the founders of the belief in historic Christianity, for whom the Antichrist was always, and everywhere, the Antichrist. And it was necessary to account for their being Christians, other, and earlier, than the believers in a carnalized Christ. This was clumsily attempted in the Acts, by making Simon become a baptized convert to the new superstition, and then backsliding a common mode of accounting for Gnostic heretics, but false on the face of it. Irenaeus shall furnish us with a crucial instance of the Orthodox lying on this subject. He tells us that the Gnostics, such as those who followed Valentinus and Mark Ion, in the second century, had no existence before these later teachers, b. 3. ch. 4, 3, whereas he had already stated in his first book, that Simon of Samaria was the first and foremost of all the founders of Gnosticism, and the father of all its heresies, and he was a century earlier. Simon had brought in the Gnosis from Alexandria. He taught his doctrines, and wrought his wonders long anterior to the apostles of the later creed. Epiphanius acknowledges that all the heretical forms of Christianity were derived from the pagan mythology that is, they were survivals of the original prehistoric Gnostic religion. It is obvious that the Roman Church remained Gnostic at the beginning of the second century, and for some time afterwards. Mark Ion, the great Gnostic, did not separate from it until about the year 136 AD. Tatian did not break with it until long after that. In each case the cause of quarrel was the same. They left the church that was setting up the fraud of historic Christianity. They left it as Gnostic Christians, who were anathematized as heretics, because they rejected the Christ-made flesh and the new foundations of religion in a spurious Jewish history. The church in Jerusalem, at the head of which was James, called the, the Brother of the Lord, was one of the ascetic or therapeutic communities that were founded by the Gnostic Nazarenes. James was reputed to have been a follower of Joshua, the Nazarene Idari, Ben Pandira who was converted more or less into the later Jesus of Nazareth. The Jewish legends show that he was of the Nazarene sect. But no Nazarene brotherhood could have been founded on any supposed Jesus of Nazareth. They also show that James was a Nazarene of the ancient ascetic type one of those who were set apart and consecrated from the mother's womb one who never shaved or cut his hair, who drank neither wine nor strong drink, nor ate of any animal food. He would not anoint himself with oil, nor wear woolen garments. Bishop Lightfoot admits that the members of the early church at Jerusalem were Gnostics, like the other Essenes, only, for him, they were heretics. He cannot make out the hiatus, which was not then filled in with the gospel history. Now, whether it be called Christian or pre-Christian, the gospel of James is good, as far as it goes. It was undoubtedly the same gospel of the Essenes that opened the poor man's door to heaven. It teaches their doctrines in their own language, and without the historic apparatus. It puts certain things which have been disestablished on their original foothold. In the Lord's Prayer we are taught to ask the Divine Father not to lead us, His children, into temptation. But James declares emphatically that, No man should say he is tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempteth no man. The Epistle of James is of supreme importance. Eusebius, the suspected forger and falsifier, when he made his fatal admission, must have known that the scriptures of the Essenes had been utilized as groundwork for the epistles and the later canonical history. He claims the Essenes themselves as Christians when he tells us that Philo describes with the closest accuracy the lives of our ascetics, that is, of the therapeut. He confesses, it is highly probable that the ancient commentaries, which Philo says they have, are the very gospels and writings of the apostles, and probably some expositions of the ancient prophets such as are contained in the Epistle to the Hebrews and many other of Paul's epistles. He might have said, including the Ebionite Epistle of James, only that was to be denounced as spurious. But it is impossible to claim the Essenic Scriptures as being identical with the canonical records, without, at the same time, admitting their prehistoric existence, their non-historical nature, 
and their anti-historical testimony. They could only be the same in the time of Eusebius by the non-historical having been falsely converted into the historical. This was what had been done, and that alone will explain why the earliest scriptures, which ought to have contained the historical record, have not been preserved. But were got rid of altogether when the Council of Nice suppressed all the devices of the heretics. I have previously shown that the real root of the whole matter can be delved down to and identified in the mythology and mysteries of Egypt. When we see the child Horus emerging from the lily lotus, or holding the forefinger to his mouth, as portrayed upon the Gnostic stones and in the catacombs of Rome, absolutely the same as on the Egyptian monuments. We know that it is the identical divinity, no matter how it came to represent the Christian Christ. But identification is more difficult when the mythical type has passed into the more mystical phase. That is, the portraits of deities are more recognizable than the hidden doctrines and veiled features of the Gnosis. Yet, the Egyptian doctrines were as surely continued by the Gnostics and the Christians as the personal likenesses of Egyptian deities were reproduced by Gnostic art in Rome. And by aid of the Gnosis, we can recover much that has been dislimmed and made indefinite in the doctrinal stage, to be left as an unfathomable mystery. For example, the child Horus, with finger to mouth, wherever found, indicates the divine word or logos in a particular way. He was the child of the Virgin Mother alone, and always remained the child. He, therefore, was not the true voice, or voice of truth, only the imperfect word, the inarticulate discourse, as Plutarch calls the first Horus. But, just as the voice of the boy changes and becomes manly at puberty, so in his second reveral character Horus, as representative of the Father, becomes a true voice, and is the word of truth personified. In this character he was designated Harmakuru, i.e., Horus, the word of truth, from Ma, truth, Keru, the word. In the Egyptian texts the word of Horus is truth, the function confided to him by the father. He vanquishes his enemies with the word of truth. It is said of the Osirified deceased, he goes forth with the word of truth. To make the truth by means of the word is synonymous with the giving of life here or hereafter. In a prayer to the Pharaoh it is said, Grant us breath by the gift which is in thee of the word of truth. Moreover, men conquer their sins by means of this word of truth within, the Makaru conferred on them by the deity. This title of Makaru, the word of truth, was translated the justified by Dr. Birch, which M. Pierret says is unfortunate. But there is a Christian sense in which that is a correct rendering. With the Egyptians, the Christians, O. Oh, Cresto. The faithful departed, were actually called by this title of Makaru or the Justified. They were those who always had been saved by the Word of Truth, in Egypt long ages before the Christian era. Now, let us return for a moment to the Epistle of James canonized in the New Testament, and called by Luther, an Epistle of Straw, because it had not a grain of historic Christianity in it. James was the head of the Church in Jerusalem. He was titled a brother of the Lord no doubt in relation to the Nazarite brotherhood. The Lord being a typical character like Horus, Manna, or Elias, who was ignorantly assumed by the literalizers of legends to have been a Judean peasant named Jesus or Joshua. Hence the imposition of certain family details in the canonical Gospels, which will be traced hereafter. James is believed to have died about AD 60. But in the whole seven chapters of this epistle of James, excepting an opening salutation, there is not one single sign of historic Christianity. It recognizes no Jesus of Nazareth, and it announces no salvation through the atoning blood, the death, resurrection and ascension of a personal Christ. Nothing whatever begins with or is based on the history which was afterwards made canonical, nor on the Christ that was localized at a later stage of development. Everything is absent that was and still is essential to the physical faith. Instead, we find the exact opposite of all that was made historic in the Gospels. The doctrine of salvation is Gnostic, Essenic and Egyptian. Salvation, according to James, cometh of the Word of Truth. Speaking of the Father of Lights, Lord of Lights being a title of Horus, he says, of his own will begot he us with the Word of Truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
Wherefore receive ye with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The transaction is direct between the Divine Father and the human soul. The Christ within is the only Saviour. The total teaching of the Epistle of James is based on this ancient Egyptian word of truth, the implanted word which confers the mockery on man, which never could be represented by an historical Christ. The word of truth as rendered by James is the best possible translation of the Egyptian makaru. Moreover, the context shows that the word of truth is the Egyptian makaru by the exhortation, Be ye doers of the word, which renders good Egyptian doctrine in perfect accordance with exact Egyptian phraseology. Just as Horus Makaru was the word of truth, or that which was said was fulfilled indeed, so men are rebegotten in the divine likeness by the word of truth. And as livers or doers of that word they are to be saved as it was taught in Egypt thousands of years previously without the word of truth becoming incarnate in Horus as a human person. This word of truth, the Christ of James and Paul, which alone was able to save, is identical with that made known aforetime, which needed not to be brought down from heaven for any personal incarnation. Needed not to be brought up from the dead by any physical resurrection, needed not to be sent from over the sea, because, as was said by the Mosaic mouthpiece of Egypt's wisdom, that word is in thy heart that thou mayest do it. And this is the position reoccupied, this is the teaching re-echoed by Paul, in whose mouth the word of truth becomes doubly anti-historic, cf Deuteronomy triple x. 12-14, with Romans x 6, 7. There is also a reference to the word of truth in Paul's epistle to Timothy, which still further identifies the makaru. The word ma, for that which is true, originally means to hold out straight before one. And Paul exhorts Timothy, as a workman, to hold a straight course according to the makaru, or, word of truth. This true voice or word of truth is, I take it, that living and abiding voice which is appealed to by Papias as evidence for his Christ, who was the Lord of the Logia. And, if so, his testimony thus far does not make for, but tends to invalidate, the history. Of course, he is supposed to mean the voice of contemporaries when he decries what would be the more certain voice of written records. But that is not what he means. He prefers, in reality, the traditions of the oral wisdom, and may be claimed as another witness for the non-historical Christ. Also, the epistle to Diognetus, supposed to have been written by Mark Ion, contains the same doctrine as the epistle of James. Speaking of the Gnostic Christians, he says, they are put to death and they come to life again. And the reason of this is that, God the Invisible hath himself from heaven planted the truth and the holy incomprehensible word and established him in their hearts. This epistle of James is indefinitely older than the canonical history. James is believed to have died about the year 60 of our era, and in this, one of the earliest utterances of the church, instead of the history, we find the divine makaru of the Egyptian mythos in a mystical and doctrinal phase. Instead of an original gospel based on the life, character, and teachings of his own human brother, James presents us with the translated word of truth the Horus of Egypt, and the Christ of the Gnostics, who could not become historical. This beginning, then, is doctrinal, and the doctrine, like the portrait, is Egyptian. The same mythos was visibly continued in the Gnostic phase. In the Gospels, which were being compiled at least 100 years later, we find this same word of truth, which was persona ted by Horus Makaru and by Iuem Hept in Egypt some 3,000 years earlier, is now represented in a personal character as Jesus the Christ. This word of truth, which is doctrinal and non-historical, according to James, is the word of truth made flesh according to John. Also, the Christ is the Horus continued in his two characters. Hence the word, or spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, is to come as the mystic paraclete who shall testify to the reality of an historic Jesus. These two characters, as the sayer and doer, constitute the double foundation of the Christ in the other Gospels. The Christ of Matthew is chiefly the sayer. The Christ of Luke is mainly the doer. He is mighty in deed and word. He is the healer or doer with the word. What a word is this! Exclaim the multitude, who are amazed at the miracles. Both characters had been blended in one as Horus Makaru, 
the word of truth, who was mythical in Egypt, and who is mythical in the teaching of James before the word was described as being made flesh. To become an historical personage in the later gospel according to John. This is the fatal kind of fact that turns the canonical history into fiction, and brands the falsifiers full in the face. There is no room left here for any historic fulfillment, and no need of any personal savior or vicarious victim. The word of truth is the Spirit of God, the begetter of souls, the Christ within, the bringer of immortality to man, as it is in the teaching of Hermes, of Zarathustra, of Philo, and of Paul, as well as James. As it was in Egypt, in Chaldea, in India, in all the mysteries, no matter where the Gnosis or Kabbalah may be found. In presence of the Gnosis, here as elsewhere, there is no place, no significance, in the alleged facts of a human history, lived for us by a carnalist Christ. And yet such a history was made out, and we are now able to get a glimpse of the forgers engaged in the process of making it out. Our canonical gospels are a palimpsest, with one writing so elaborated over another that the first is almost crossed out, and the rest are thoroughly confused. Yet, the whole of them have to be seen through before the matter can be really read. By holding this palimpsest up to the light, and looking at it long and closely, we can trace the large outline, the watermark, of the Egyptian mythos, with its virgin mother, who was Hathamary the Madonna its child Christ of twelve years. And the virile adult of thirty years, who was Horus, the anointed son of that father in heaven whom he came to reveal. This is the earliest and most fundamental of the nuclei. Next we find a collection of sayings as the nucleus of the Gospel of Matthew. These sayings were attributed to the Lord, and that Lord is supposed to have been a Judean peasant, as the original author. It is noticeable, though, that the title of the Lord is not once applied to Jesus by Matthew in the earth life, but after the resurrection he is called the Lord. Now, it is well known to scholars that the Gospel according to Luke is based upon, or concocted, with suitable alterations, from an earlier, Gospel of the Lord. That is, the latest Gospel according to the Gnostics, preceded the earliest of those that were made canonical. This was called the, Gospel of the Lord, the Curios and it is commonly referred to as the Gospel of Mark Ion, the great Gnostic. But the Lord, as known to the Gnostics, was not a character that could become historical. As Arensis declares, according to no one Gospel of the heretics could the Christ become flesh. Consequently the Gospel of Mark Ion, who was the arch-heretic and very antichrist of the second century, in the sight of the incipient Catholic Church, could not have been a gospel of the Christ made historical. And we have now the means of proving that it was not. When once we know that the origins were mythical, that the Christ was mystical, and the teachings and the mysteries were typical, we shall be able to utilize the gospel of Mark Ion as a connecting link between the Egyptian mythos. The Epistle of the Word of Truth, and the canonical history according to Luke. The Lord had been Horus by name in Egypt, and the Greek Curia, or Curios, agrees with the Egyptian Keru, for the word, voice, or logos, as in Ma Keru, earlier, Makuru. This was the Lord continued as the Gnostic Manifester, their Horus, or Christ. Mark Ion assigned his gospel to the Christ, in the same way that the Egyptian ritual is ascribed to Hermes. Later on, the sayings of the Lord were also called the writings, as we see by Pseudo-Dionysius, who charges the Gnostics with having falsified the writings of the Lord. Mark Ion claimed that his was the one true gospel the one and he pointed to the multiplicity of the Catholic gospels, full as they were of discrepancies, in proof that they could not be genuine. In the fourth century even, there were as many different gospels as texts. As transmitted to us by the Christian copyists, who were nothing if not historicizers, Martian's Gospel opens with the statement, that, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Xar, Pontius Pilate ruling in Judea. Jesus came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, or, into Judea, as reported by Irensis. Tertullian says, according to the Gospel of Mark Ion, in the fifteenth year of Tiberius, Christ Jesus deigned to emanate from heaven, a salutary spirit. But, he also says, according to this, great anti-Christian, the Christ was a phantom, who appeared suddenly at the synagogue of Capernaum in the likeness of a full-grown man for the purpose of protesting against the law and the prophets. 
It would be difficult to date the descent of a phantom Christ, and impossible to date the descent of the Gnostic Christ at all, except as Lord of the Sun in relation to an astronomical period. But it is certain that the Lord or Christ of Mark Ion is entirely non-historical. He has no genealogy or Jewish line of descent, no earthly mother, no father, no mundane birthplace or human birth. The Gnostic nature of this Christ is further and fully corroborated by both Irensis and Tertullian. Clearly then nothing can be made of the statement on behalf of the canonical history. This statement in Martian's Gospel takes the place of the baptism and descent of the Holy Spirit in Luke's. And this same date is quoted by Luke for the time when the Word of God came to John in the wilderness, which is followed by the baptism of Jesus and the transformation into the Christ or Horus of thirty years. Whose unpronounceable name contained thirty letters, according to the Gnosis. Such a beginning is entirely unhistorical, and applicable solely to the mythical Christ, who became the virile adult, the anointed son of the father at thirty years of age. Of course Christian apologists like Irensis and Tertullian maintain that Mark Ion had mutilated their version of Luke. And they managed to get rid of the Gospel of the Lord, and to suppress the writings of Mark Ion in proof to save us the trouble of judging for ourselves. But that was only another Christian lie, as we have now the means of knowing. The Gnostics were not the falsifiers of the historic scriptures, it was not they who had anything to falsify. Hitherto the forgers and falsifiers have been believed, and now the accusers and accused are about to change places in the witness box and the dock. Everywhere the Gnosis was first, the history was last. You are only asked to take this view tentatively. And then let us watch the process and see how the compilers and forgers of our Luke put in the touches by which the mythos was rationalized and the human history was added to the Gnostic, Gospel of the Lord. The sayings of the Lord were first, and they were not personal. The Gospel of the Lord was first, and the Lord was not historical. The Jesus of Mark Ion, like the Jesus of Esdras, of Paul, and other Gnostics, is no Jesus of Nazareth. This title has been added by Luke. Martian's Jesus being mythical and not historical, he has no Jewish father and mother, consequently we find the test question is not this Joseph's son, does not appear in the Gospel of the Lord. It has been added by Luke. Again, the statement, there came to him his mother and brethren, and they could not get at him for the crowd, Luke 8. 9, is not to be found in Martian's Gospel, it has been added by Luke. And for what? But to manufacture and make out that human history which was at last believed in, but which had no place in any gospel according to the Gnostics or true primitive Christians. It can be proved how passage after passage has been added to the earlier gospel, in the course of manufacturing the later history. For example, the mourning over Jerusalem, Luke 13. 29-35, is taken verbatim from the second Esdras, I. 28-33, without acknowledgement, and the words previously uttered by the Almighty Lord, are here assigned to Jesus as the original speaker. The account of Pilate's shedding the blood of the Galileans and mingling it with their sacrifices, Luke 13. 1, has been added by someone so ignorant of Hebrew history, that he has ascribed to Pilate an act which was committed when Quirinus was governor, twenty-four years earlier than the alleged appearance of Jesus. Again, the anti-Nazarene, anti-Gnostic passage about the publicans being baptized with water, and the Son of Man coming eating and drinking as a glutton and a wine-bibber, has been added. In the scene on the Mount of Transfiguration, which is purely mythical, and therefore common to Osiris, Buddha, and Zarathustra. We are witness to the forging of another historical nexus in the statement that, Moses and Elijah appeared in glory and spake of his decease which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, Luke 9. 31. This passage does not appear in the, Gospel of the Lord. Nor does the statement, Luke 18. 31-34, and he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets shall be accomplished by the Son of Man. This mode of making out the history in the New Testament by fulfillment of prophecy found in the Old was not adopted by the compilers of Martians, Gospel of the Lord. 
the story of the colt and the riding into Jerusalem in triumph, to turn all the Jews out of their sacred stock exchange, are additions to the earlier gospel. In the scene of the Last Supper almost the whole of the text is missing from Martian's gospel. Twelve verses of Luke 22 have been added. In Martian's gospel there is no distribution of the paschal cup amongst the disciples. No promise is given that the apostles shall eat and drink and judge the twelve tribes of Israel in the kingdom of Christ, nor is there any appointment made with the dying thief on the cross to meet him that day in paradise. These have been added. Now, this is no mere matter of a difference in doctrine. We are witnessing the very forgery of the human foundations and the insertion of the manufactured facts upon which the history was established. The primitive Christiani, the so-called heretics, who preceded the historic Christians, were all of them spiritualists in the modern sense. In the sight of Bishop Lightfoot the Gnostic spiritualism was a shadowy mysticism which loses itself in the contemplation of an unseen world. This he looks upon as the false teaching and the heresy of the Gnostics. He knows nothing of any underlying natural verities, or phenomenal facts, only sees a refining, a mysticizing and a whittling away of the gospel histories. But as practical spiritualists, the Essenes had eight stages in the evolution of perfect personal purity and the attainment of the highest spiritual powers. 1. Purity of Baptism. 2. Purity from Animal Desire. 3. Spiritual Purity. 4. The Purity of a Meek and Gentle Spirit. 5. The Purity of Holiness. 6. The Purity by which the body became a temple of the Holy Ghost. 7. The Purity which gave the power of healing the sick and of raising the dead, i.e. the spirits of the dead. 8. They attained the mystic state of Elias, who was the ascetic Christ. And in the middle of the 19th century, Bishop Lightfoot rises to explain that the Essenes were fortune-tellers. Orthodox Christianity knows nothing of spiritualism today, and consequently can know nothing of spiritualism in the past, because it is fact alone that can prove the fact. They reject it because it was repudiated by the founders of the historic faith, because it offers no facts to prove, whereas it does offer facts that furnish us with disproof of a physical resurrection. But it is absolutely necessary to be a phenomenal spiritualist, or at least to know that phenomenal spiritualism is founded upon facts of possible human experience. Before we can take the first step toward really understanding this matter of the beginnings, or gauge the impassable gulf of difference that lies between the Gnostic religion and historic Christianity. With the Gnostics knowledge was the foundation of their faith. But the historic Christians made faith the basis of knowledge, and the first demand of the new faith was for the convert to believe that all the mythical typology of the past had been made literally true in the present. By faith the fable was crystallized into the dogma of historic fact. The Gnostic doctrines of the prehistoric religion were formulated as being those of knowledge, faith, and immortality. Knowledge was fundamental. On this their faith was founded by means of a first-hand acquaintanceship with those facts which gave them their faith for the present, and sustained it with something more than the hope or promise of continuity for the future. Knowledge, Faith, and Immortality Historic Christianity was based upon faith without that knowledge, and those who knew the least were actually considered and designated the better believers, just as it is in the Salvation Army of today. Lord Bacon, in a most unworthy utterance, affirmed that, the more irrational and incredible any divine mystery is the greater the honor we do God in believing it, and so much the more noble is the victory of faith. Such, however, was the teaching of the Church whose divine mysteries were manufactured from misinterpreted mythology. Nor was it very difficult to literalize the mystical representation when a man like Origen could maintain that the planets were animated bodies and rational beings. All the secrets of the great knowledge of the interior and mystical life, which M. Renat calls the most glorious creation of Christendom, were in possession of the Gnostics of various lands long ages earlier. Whilst their modus operandi of ascertaining the truth was now to be rejected and denounced as damnable by the corporeal Christians, or carnalisers of the Christ. They not only let go, they anathematized the knowledge that was already won from nature, and prohibited the means of continuing it or of recovering it again. 
The Gnostics, as Irenaeus shows, pointed out the very serious error that was committed by those who imagined that the Christ had arisen in a mundane body, not knowing that flesh and blood do not attain to the kingdom of God. The Christ of the Gnostics was a mystical type continued from mythology to portray a spiritual reality of the interior life. Hence the Christ in this human phase could be female as well as male, Sophia as well as Jesus, the spirit of both sexes. It was impossible for such to become historical, or be made so, except by ignorantly mistaking a mythical impersonation for a hermaphrodite in person. What, for example, is the actual base of the great renunciation ascribed to the Buddha or the Christ in the doctrinal, mythical, or spiritual phase? It is this, when the soul of man came to be considered as a divine principle of celestial origin, it was figured as being entirely opposed to the evil nature of matter. Therefore, birth or manifestation in matter was a descent of the soul from the heaven of pristine condition into a lower state of impurity and impermanence. Of disease, decay, and death, where it was bound to bear or struggle to get out of it again as soon as possible. This soul, personified as the divine man in Buddha or the Christ is afterwards represented as being consciously able to renounce the pleasures of paradise, and of its own free will and choice come down to earth as the saviour of the world. By giving lessons in divinity and living a life so lowly that this life should be conquered by rejecting it on behalf of the other thus revealed to men. The mode of glorifying such a being is simply that of the infantile mind. The proof of his supernatural character is shown through his power of suspending the known laws of nature by miraculous means, such as are humanly impossible. As the Lord of life he raises the dead. The tree bends down and bows its acknowledgement to him in the womb of his mother, or the wild beasts grow tame in presence of the radiant child that lights the darkness of the cave when born. As a mere babe he becomes a teacher to the teachers. In youth he surpasses all competitors, conquers in every trial. All nature is turned into an elastic vesture that will fit this figure of the impossible the false ideal that makes our common everyday world a scene of phantasmal unrealities. In certain respects the Buddhist portrait of this divine ideal, believed to have been realized in Gautama, transcends the Christian in the depths of its tenderness, the range of its sympathies, and the embrace of its compassion. All true lovers of animals are naturally Buddhistic rather than Christian. For, it is upon the downtrodden beasts which perish that the Christian sets his foot for the first step upward as the possessor of an immortal soul. His brutalizing belief, and baseless assumption, that animals have no souls, are guilty before God and responsible for most of the cruelties suffered by them throughout all Christendom today. In his large love for the dumb things this Hindu ideal Redeemer is greater, and stoops lower than the would-be saviour of human beings alone, and only the Jewish part of them, who is portrayed as the canonical Christ. But cui bono? When it is only an ideal and that ideal takes the place of possible reality. These false ideals are forever fatal to human verity. What has the worship of Mary ever done for woman in the character of wife? You cannot live by a lay figure. When once we know it to be unreal, whether as the Christ, or Buddha, or Madonna, it becomes a type that we cannot print from any longer, because it fails to impress deeply enough. Whether considered as the God made human, or as man made divine, this character never existed as a person. That prehistoric ideal Christ of the Gnosis had always persona Ted the divine in human form, the immortal incarnated, the majesty within superior to all the physical conditions without, with power to bear and serve. To serenely suffer the ills of flesh, become a sacrifice and glory in the cross of its earthly suffering. Spiritual mediums were considered to be a kind of intermediate beings, because they first demonstrated the existence of a living link betwixt the divine mind and matter in the human form. But the original intermediate being was the spiritual nature itself, called the Son of God, the Christ within, which constituted that living link in whomsoever it existed. No human medium could become the Christ of the Gnosis, who represented a principle which could only become a person in a future state of being never in this world. So was it before the history alleged to have been lived, and so the fact remains today, and forever. The historical was an impossible mode of realize ing that which could only be a spiritual possibility. 
And thus the truth according to the Gnosis has been refracted in the falsehood according to the history. The Gnostic Christ was the real founder of Christianity. This was the Christ of the first Christians, and this was their model man, the ideal meek and lowly one, which the writers of the Gospels have sought to realize in the form of historic personality. This lunar, solar, mystical, or spiritual type could not be made historical in the creed of those who knew, i.e., the Gnostics. But it was humanized. It was turned into a one person, who became the one Christ in this world, and the one spirit of all others, for those who did not know. For the earliest appeal of the new faith was made to men who were so ignorant, according to the record, that when they had just witnessed a rising from the dead of certain historic characters, they did not comprehend what this rising again from the dead should mean. Historic Christianity had retained possession of a dead Christ, the mere husk of the grub, together with a vague belief in the butterfly. And if you, likewise, believe in its one dead grub, you may cultivate the hope of some day, also, becoming a butterfly. But, for the Gnostics, the transformation from the chrysalis condition of matter to the spiritual was a natural fact of which they had an ever-present vitalising consciousness. They were transforming and seeking attainment all their life through. And their Christ was the representative type of that transformation of the mortal into an immortal. Historic Christianity abolished the Gnostic spiritualism for all who accepted the false belief. Henceforth there was but one spirit, that of the historic bringer of immortality to light, and, if any apparition appeared to the abnormal or normal vision, it would be the historic Christ for ever after. It was so with the vision of Paul, which was reported and perverted in the book of Acts. When his inner eyes were opened he saw spirits as Swedenborg and many others are reported to have done whereupon they avowed he had seen the risen Jesus, their only witness for a spirit world. So has it been with the non-spiritualists ever since, for whom an apparition must be the Christ. In an island near Rotterdam, says Rena, the peasants believe that Christ comes to the bed of death to assure the elect of their justification. In point of fact many see him. On the other hand, the Buddhist, Lotus, declares that thousands of Buddhas show their faces to the virtuous man at the moment of his decease, which proves the Buddhas to be spirits. So has it been with the ecstatics and mediums in all the religious sects. Whenever they saw a spirit they saw Jesus the Christ their Savior, because they knew of no other spirit or name the history being established for the other world as well as in this and so one delusion was bound to support the other. The true vision was made untrue, and all the facts of spiritualism have been falsified and turned into lying witnesses, to substantiate the truth of the gospel history. All such manifestations as had previously occurred and had been attributed to the spirits of the departed, were now ascribed to the power of Christ, in whose name the prophesying was performed, the healing effected, and the mental medicine dispensed. Henceforth there was to be no other name under heaven but this. In this name only were the Gentiles to have hope. Redemption was made dependent on this name. Cripples were cured, the blind made to see, devils were cast out, the dead raised, sins remitted, souls saved, and eternal life ensured by belief on this name supposed to be new. At the mention of this name the dead arose up out of their graves, and, according to the testimony of Irensis, they survived amongst the living many years. So much more potent was faith than fact. The earlier spiritualism was founded upon facts in nature, which did not need the desperate expedient of a miracle to explain. But in the later cult the more the miracle the larger loomed the supernatural, and the broader were the foundations for the belief that was based on faith instead of facts, and on materialism plus miracle. They accounted for the spiritual phenomena of the Gnostics by declaring, as Justin Martyr did, that when the devil and the demons knew that Christ was believed on, and that he was expected, in every race, they put forth Simon, Menander, and the other Gnostics to deceive the multitude with magic. Because spiritualism was naturally and forever at war with the historical misinterpretation, Justin asserts that after the ascension of Christ into heaven, the demons put forward certain men like Simon to declare that they were the gods. Whereas, historic Christianity proclaimed them to be devils, and devils they have remained ever since, according to the false belief. The founders of the Catholic Church were the despiritualizers of primitive Christianity, 
and the destroyers of the Gnostic religion as such, by placing their ban upon all spiritualistic phenomena. The foundations of the ancient cult were to be built upon no longer. In the recently discovered Didache or the Teaching of the Apostles, the facts of spiritualism are admitted, and the practices of the prophets are recognized. They are spoken of as ordering a table in the spirit, and of assembling together for a cosmic mystery. But those are the true mediums alone who have the manners of the Lord. And the law as laid down in these didache is, Thou shalt not play the mage. Thou shalt not practice witchcraft or spirit intercourse. No prophet that speaks as one of the possessed is to be tried or tolerated. Every sin shall be forgiven, but this sin shall not be forgiven. It was now and henceforth to be spiritualism without spirits, abstract and ideal, not tangible or real, an article of faith versus fact. We see from the Epistle of John how mortally afraid of Gnostic spiritualism were the founders of the historical fraud. Many deceivers are gone forth into the world that confess not that Jesus Christ cometh in the flesh. These words of John state the Gnostic position. Their Christ had not so come, and could not be carnalized. These Gnostics were in the world long before they heard of such a doctrine, but when they did they denied and opposed it. This, says John, is the Antichrist. But, every spirit which confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit which annulleth Jesus is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it cometh, and now it is in the world already. A story is told of two early English saints, one of whom was supposed to have died. They were about to bury him, when, as he was being lowered into the grave, face upward and uncovered, he opened wide his ghostly staring eyes and told them he had only fallen into a trance. He had been into the other world, and found that what they were preaching about it in this was not true. There was no fall of man, he said. There is no hell, he cried, no personal Christ no Redeemer. But here his fellow saint outside the grave interposed, for God's sake fill in the earth and stop the blasphemer's mouth. They did so, and the rest of his revelation remained unknown. That was how the Catholic Christians dealt with the Gnostic spiritualists when they had the power. They would shut up the living mouth of the spirit world, because the reports from the other side were fatal to the historic fiction. They broke down the bridge between the two worlds, and proclaimed a great gulf fixed forever, which could only be crossed by faith in the historic Jesus. Here the movement of historic Christianity was a direct and deliberate shunting of the human mind from off the main line, the highway of its natural development, and running it head first into all sorts of byways and blind alleys. From which we have had to turn back and grope out again as best we could for any progress to be made. Historic Christianity originated with turning the Gnostic and esoteric teachings inside out and externalizing the mythical allegory in a personal human history. All that was interior with the knowers was made objective. All that was spiritual in significance was embodied to be made palpable for the ignorant. A corporeal Christ was substituted for the transcorporeal man a Christ whose advent was without, instead of the one that must be evolved within a personal Savior who died for all. Instead of the Christ that was the living spirit working within all. It was remarked by Augustine, de Civ. Day, 7, 24, that the Gnostics, promised eternal life to anybody, that is, with them the soul of man was an eternal principle, and the resurrection was not cunningly reserved for the elect who accepted the historic belief. The Gnostic claimed to be illuminated by the presence of the Christ within, the Christian, according to Justin, by the name of the Christ without. And a very curious mental link of connection between the genuine Gnostic and the counterfeit historic Christ is apparent in the Ignatian epistle to the Smyrnians. The writer says, I know that even after his resurrection he was in the flesh, and I believe that he is so still. Now this combines both, after a fashion. The writer is seeking to establish the history against those who denied that the Christ could be made a man. In doing this, he has recourse to the Gnostic Christ, who always was in the flesh, or matter, as the salt of soul, and the only spiritual savior from death and dissolution. Speaking from his Gnostic standpoint, Paul declared to the historic Christians who followed John and Peter, that God had sent them a working of error, that they should believe a lie. 
because they rejected the truth as it was according to his spiritual gospel. The lie was established by externalizing the Christ that can only dwell within by successfully falsifying for a time that truth which is true forever. In this way, you see, that the coming of the Holy Spirit, which always had been within, was henceforth to be without. Thus, the descent of the Holy Ghost upon Jesus, in Jordan, is an external transaction. The Holy Spirit that comes from heaven in the form of a dove Gnostic type of the Spirit, that is, of both sexes or, later on, as a whirlwind, in which the gust and ghost are one. In the course of this conversion of the inner to the outer, we are told that the Holy Ghost, which always had been extant with the Gnostics, was not yet given, because the historical Jesus was not yet glorified. But after he had risen from the grave, and returned bodily to the disciples, he breathed upon them, and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And again, the Holy Ghost, as an external effusion, could not be given until after forty days. Whereas, in the Essenic Mysteries, the body of the disciple became the temple of the Holy Ghost when he had reached the sixth stage of interior progress. This shows the literalizers of the legend, the rationalizers of the mythos, the anti-mystics, the exoterists, externalizing the gnosis, and converting the matter of it into human history. There was to be neither spirit within nor spirit world without for the ignorant Christians, until the resurrection and ascension of Jesus had historically established both. Two distinct charges are brought against the carnalizers by Tatian in the second century. He cries out shame upon the Catholic Church, and exclaims, You have given the Nazarite wine to drink, and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. They were debauching the Christian community and destroying the primitive Nazarite purity which Tertullian claimed for the Christians when he said, We are they of whom it is written, Their Nazarites are whiter than snow. Next, they have determined to put an end to practical spiritualism on behalf of the new faith. And this is treated by Tatian as part of a subtle scheme for destroying the purity and spirituality of that Christianity which was primitive and non-historic, too. The transformations of the pagan cult into the Christian, and of the Gnostic into the historical representation, were effected behind the veil identifiable as the discipline of the secret. The strictness of which was only relaxed after the fourth century, when the truth had been hidden in a fog of falsehood. The inner mysteries turned to an outer mist, that made confusion cunningly complete. The Gnostic spiritualism was declared illegal and impious. The objective realities of the phenomenal spiritualists, which had heretofore furnished the one bit of foothold in natural fact for a belief in the future life, were now discarded on behalf of the more subjective idealities derived from a faith that was founded by means of a fraudulent history mistranslated from a mystical fable. The Roman Church adopted the angels and archangels of the celestial allegory as its saints, including Saint Bacchus and Saint Satan in place of guardian spirits that were once human beings. A dogma of the real presence of the historic Christ was now substituted for the real presence of spirit friends in the earlier communion. The mysteries in which the early Christian neophytes had been initiated into a lawful communion with the dead were gradually suppressed. And in the 6th century we find the doctrine of a communion with the saints was substituted for the practical intercourse with spirits. It happens that the time when the doctrine was inserted in the creed coincides almost exactly with the suppression of the mysteries which were connected with the so-called agaps of the early Christians. The agaps were only a continuation of the ancient pagan funeral feasts and Eucharistic rites in honor of the departed. Hence they were held in the cemeteries and catacombs in presence of the dead, where the mummy type or the charist was the Christ, as the image of rising again. The image that was carried round and pointed to as a cause for festive rejoicing at the Egyptian feast. In this way we can watch the false faith taking the place of the facts. And as the Gnostic sects and brotherhoods gave up the ghost, historic Christianity assumed their glory. In this strange scene of transformation and dramatic illusion by some satanic sleight of hand and turn of head, the afterglow of the ancient religions was changed into the dawn of the superseding faith, which was then proclaimed to be the fountainhead of all future enlightenment. Or rather the waning light of ancient knowledge has been mistaken for the dawning of the new belief, a dawn that was followed by the grey twilight that deepened into the thousand years-long intellectual night of the Dark Ages.
It matters not what may be the relative share of responsibility attributable to knavery on the one hand and ignorance on the other, the fact remains that a huge and hideous mistake has been made. An irretrievable error committed in the name of historic Christianity. For ages past the false faith did feed the flames of martyrdom with the fires of hell on pretext of giving light to them that it had covered with its smoke of torment and pall of darkness. And now the sun of a better day has arisen to put out the fires infernal, to disperse the clouds of human size, that have obscured the heavens so long, and to aid in drying the tears from our afflicted earth at last. Revelation, by means of evolution, has now made known forever that the fall of man was not historic fact. Humanity has not to bear the penalty eternally for a divine failure in the beginning of time. This world is not a prison house of fallen beings. Consequently, the promised redemption and proffered mode of salvation are a vain delusion. And all in vain has the spirit of the living Christ within been compelled to drag the dead body of the corporeal Christ from the grave for the purpose of proving the history for the ignorant. Until its corruption is a sickening stench in the nostrils of the nations, and there is a clamor for the burial that shall get rid of both together. The history of Christ as our impersonated Savior on earth, equally with the story of Adam's fall from Eden, is mythology misbelieved. The Old Testament was read backwards to be rewritten as the New. The only original elements in this interpolation between the ancient Gnosis and modern science are those that prove false to the governing laws of the universe, and those facts of nature which make the soul true revelation. Theory avails nothing in the presence of the fact that historic Christianity was founded on the resurrection of the flesh, and that it has left the world where it was itself, after putting out the Gnostic light. All in the dark concerning our spiritual continuity in death. Canon Gregory said only the other day if Jesus did not rise corporeally from the tomb, then that tomb must be the grave of Christianity. And the spectator, for August 13, 1887, speaking of the Greeks who died before the resurrection was thus historically established, says, in the nature of things the Greeks could have had no sure hope of a glorious resurrection. Such was and is, when honestly confessed, the genuine Christian creed. It does seem to me as if those archforgers in Rome had subtly succeeded in converting that which was true in the old religion into a secret support for all that was false in the new. Gnostic Christianity was absolutely, fundamentally, and forever opposed to the historic rendering, and yet the Gnostic doctrines of the Fourth Gospel, and of Paul's and James' epistles, have been allowed to remain under cover and control as spiritual forces artfully tethered to draw for the physical and anti-Gnostic faith. I am sometimes compelled to say to myself it has been most devilishly done, and so have we. We have spiritualists today who lay hold of the scriptures, or can be laid hold of, by means of the gnosis that remains there as a lure, and turn it to the account intended, that is, as a decoy towards accepting the history. And so when the risen Christ reappears in the actual body that is missing from the grave, they are prepared to explain away the physical fact by means of the spiritual gnosis. In that way nothing is bottomed, and nothing can be really understood. But the purpose of the promoters, who were the founders of the falsehood, and who founded it well nigh unfathomably, their purpose continues to be fulfilled. In writing to a Christian spiritualist the other day, I said, I know no better way of waging the battle for truth than arraying the facts face to face on either side and letting them fight it out. His reply was, I do not believe in your facts because I do not know. Now, that is good firm ground to stand upon, however late in life we take the position. But, to be of any real service, we must apply the same reason all round. As an adherent of historic Christianity, that writer has all along been a believer in what he did not know to be facts, and a believer just because he did not know. And now he finds it too late, perhaps, to correct his early belief by means of later knowledge. All I ask is that people shall no longer believe because they do not know. No matter what they may call themselves they are traitors to the truth who will not face the facts or examine for themselves, but will go on repeating ignorantly, or in pious pig-headedness, the orthodox assumptions. And applying the hypotheses of accommodation to the Christian documents. You might as well expect to reach the next world by going round and round this, as to think of making ends meet by unifying the Gnostic religion with historic Christianity. 
phenomenal spiritualists who go on philandering with the fallacies of the Christian faith, and want to make out that it is identical with modern spiritualism, have at last to face the great. Indubitable fact that historic Christianity was established as a non-spiritualist and an anti-spiritualistic religion. Its primary fact, its initial point of departure, its first bit of foothold for a new departure, was the acknowledgement of the physical resurrection of the dead historic Christ. It is useless to try to wriggle out of that. The reappearance of the Corpus Christi is the fundamental fact of the faith. The strings are pulled so that the marionette messiah may be forced to exclaim that he is not a bodiless ghost, not a boneless phantom, not a spirit anyway. And he offers the proof palpable that he is none of your spiritualistic or Gnostic Christs, or the spirit of anybody. Moreover, this is the veritable dead body that is missing from the tomb. And still further, the passage in Luke has been altered from Martian's Gospel of the Lord, on purpose to substitute the corporeal Christ of historic Christianity for the spiritual representation of the Gnostics. In Martian's version the word phantasma is used, and this has not only been omitted by Luke, the phantom is made to protest very emphatically that he is not in any wise phantasmal, but is a being of flesh and blood even as they are. And after demonstrating the fact, clinches it by asking if they have got anything there for him to eat. The entire fabric of the new faith rested upon the reality of a physical resurrection. And it is too late now to shift the basis of the edifice by trying to lift it bodily, like the city of Chicago, onto the higher and surer ground of spiritualism, so as to find a firmer basis for it and all its weight of errors. We can trace the very bifurcation and fresh starting point of the new faith in the account given of the resurrection in the canonical Gospels. They proclaim the resurrection of the dead in Jesus and through him only. The historic Jesus who alone had power to open the gateways of the grave, and who had personally left with Peter the keys that lock up heaven and open hell. There was nothing to constitute a new faith in a spiritual resurrection. That was already the common property of the Gnostics, whether called pagans or Christians. That was according to the natural fact, and here only was the miracle, in the dead body rising again to prove the presence and the power of the divinity. Such is the religious foundation, for which the Christians are responsible trustees. As a spiritualist, then, I assert that the new Christian dispensation was founded upon the death and burial of the ancient spiritualism. Or upon the gagging of it and getting it underground dead or alive. And the tomb out of which a corporeal Christ was believed to have emerged as the Savior of the world, and brought immortality to light by a physical resurrection from the dead, has been the burial place of genuine spiritualism for eighteen hundred years. For this reason the defenders of the faith were bound to make war upon the facts of phenomenal spiritualism, and persecute and put the psychical demonstrators to death, which they did with a consuming fury so long as they were allowed. The terrible craze that was caused by this perversion of the ancient wisdom has sown the germs of insanity broadcast, and half filled the world with pious lunatics for whom it offers no cure. And who are still told to look forward for an asylum in the world to come. But such pernicious teaching will make people as insane for another life as for this. Here, or hereafter, falsehood must be fraudulent, though it may be found out too late. What of the myriads of suffering souls who have been forced to wear the blinkers of ignorance all through this life for fear they should learn to see for themselves who were drugged and deceived from birth till death with the nostrums of a false, deluding faith? What of them when they awake from their stupor in death to find out that they have been foully, cruelly hocused with a creed that was an illusion for this life and a delusion for the next? Delusion that is perfectly complete for those who die to find out the deceit. If the teachers of the fleshly cult could but see how their fallacies dissolve in death how the false ideal set up in this life dislims and fades as the terrible light of reality whitens in the next. If they could but see that mournful multitude of the helplessly deceived who staked their all upon the truth of what they had been taught and find they have lost because the teaching was false. If you could see them wander up and down on the other side of the dark river and wring their hands over their blighted hopes and broken hearts. Hear the pitiful wailings for the Christ that is no more objective there than he was here for the visionary glory that they may not grasp, the distant rainbows, never reached. That weep themselves away in tears for the lifeboat gone to wreck on the wrong shore because of the false beacon lights. 
If you could only dream how these poor souls desire to have the deception made known on this side of life how they want to send some word of warning to their friends how they will almost hiss at me through the mouths of mediums whenever they have the chance. As if their fierce feelings had turned into tongues of flame, praying for us to work on faster and cry louder against the established lie, for time is getting short and the helpers are few. And the atmosphere around each live soul is so deathly dense with indifference. This would be unbearable but for those calm other voices of the Gnostics who in this life walked our world lords of themselves with inward glory crowned. And who lived on after the Gnosis was suppressed and the ancient oracles made dumb who live on yet, and are working with us still who fill and inflate us at times with their influence. As if each single soul of us were a hundred thousand, sent mill, as his men used to call Napoleon. It is they who are joining hands with us today to bridge over that dark gulf betwixt two worlds which the historic and fleshly faith first excavated, and has been deepening and widening now for eighteen centuries. This is the resurrection day of the pre-Christian Gnosticism, as shown by the recent revival of spiritualism, by the restoration of the tree of knowledge, by the elevation of womankind, instead of the fall of man. And we are living witnesses of the fact that truth, crushed to earth, shall rise again. The eternal years of God are hers. But error, wounded, writhes with pain. And dies among his worshippers. Note. I have been asked whether I am able to explain by means of the Egyptian mythos, the two diverse statements in the Gospel according to Luke and the Book of Acts concerning the ascension of Jesus into heaven. In Luke the risen Christ is carried up into heaven on the third day following the crucifixion. In the Acts he is not taken up into heaven until the fortieth day, or after forty days. Such serious discrepancies as these are forever irreconcilable as history, but they are found to contain the very facts that reconstitute the mythos. The resurrection of Osiris at the autumn equinox was lunar, at the vernal equinox it was solar. After he was betrayed to his death, when the sun was in the sign of Scorpio, he rose again on the third day as Lord of Light in the moon, or as Horus, the child of the Mother Moon. The solar resurrection was at the vernal equinox when the sun entered the first of the upper signs and Orion rose. This time it was in the character of the second Horus, the adult of thirty years. And this second resurrection followed the forty days of mourning for the suffering God which were celebrated in the mysteries, and survived in a Christianized form as our Lent. And just as the myth of the double Horus in the two characters of the child of twelve years, and the adult Horus of thirty years, has been continued in the Gospels to furnish the two phases in the life of Jesus. So have the two different resurrections with their correct dates been applied to the Christ made historical. Thus interpreted by means of the mythos these two versions of one alleged fact tend to corroborate my explanation already made that the two different dates for the crucifixion given in the otherwise irreconcilable accounts belong to the lunisolar. Reckoning in the same lunisolar myth. In Egyptian the signs of a half-moon and fourteen days are identical, and in the dark half of the moon Osiris was torn into fourteen parts. Therefore the fourteenth of the lunar month was the day of full moon. Whereas in the solely lunar month of thirty days the fifteenth was the middle of the month. Now the crucifixion or the crossing at Easter was and still is determined by the day of full moon. This will be on the fourteenth of the month of twenty-eight days in the reckoning by the moon only, but on the fifteenth of the month according to the solely lunar reckoning. The fourteenth of the month would be the lunar reckoning of Anup equals John, and the fifteen th that of Totmati equals Matthew in the two forms of the Egyptian mythos. Both reckonings were extant in two different cults and both were separately continued by the Eastern and Western churches for the one day of the crucifixion. Both cannot be historically correct, but they are both astronomically true. Both could be made to meet at a given point in the total combination which was determined by the conjunction of the sun and moon at the equinox as the day of full moon. But the two different dates for the mid-month remained, and these are represented by the traditions of two different dates for the crucifixion. Both the lunar and the solar dates could be utilized by the mythos, in which there were two crucifixions and two resurrections, though these will bear witness for the single fact of the historical crucifixion. As we have seen, the two ascensions of Osiris on the third day and at the end of forty days, have been preserved, and are repeated as historical transactions.
Two different crosses were also contained in the Christian iconography as the Cross of Autumn and of Easter, and although we may not be able to show two crucifixions in the canonical Gospels, nevertheless the total matter of the mythos is there. When Jesus was led up into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and to suffer during forty days, we have the parallel to the struggle between Osiris and Sut, which was celebrated during the forty days of mourning in the mysteries. Moreover, there were two days of death or crucifixion kept in Rome until the present century, when the dead Christ used to be laid out and exhibited on the Thursday before Good Friday. And two days of resurrection were also celebrated in the two Sabbaths on Saturday and Sunday. As the Apostolic Constitutions show, both of these days were continued for the two weekly holidays of the Christians, Saturday being the day of rising again on the seventh day of the week in the lunar cult. Sunday, the Sabbath of the eighth day, according to the solar resurrection. Such are the fundamental facts, and, to my thinking, they are of sufficient force to cleave the canonical history right in two, each half being then claimed by the mythos. Here, as elsewhere, the mythos does explain the fact, but only by abolishing the history. From beginning to end the ascertainable facts are astronomical, and interpretable solely by means of the Gnostic explanation of the Egyptian mythos, which always denied, because it disproved, the alleged human history. The same correspondent desires to know whether I would exclude the Bible from our children's schools. Most certainly. I would have the Bible basis superseded for all future teaching as unscientific, immoral, and false to the facts in nature. The mass of people who are Bible taught never get free from the erroneous impressions stamped on their minds in their infancy, so that their manhood or womanhood can have no intellectual fulfillment and millions of them only attain mentally to a sort of second childhood. The Hebrew and other creations fundamentally explained. If you would correct my false view off facts, says Emerson, hold up to me the same facts in the true order of thought. That is the process attempted in these lectures of mine. And the true order and sequence of the facts can only be ascertained by delving down to the foundations in the physical genesis, can only be stated by means of the evolutionary method can only be proved by the wisdom of Egypt. I claim that on each line of research my interpretation is derived from the facts themselves, and is not arbitrarily imposed upon them, or read into them by my own theoretic speculation. I do but flesh the skeleton of facts. It is not the ancient legends that tell us lies. The men who created them did not deal falsely with us by nature. All the falsity lies in their having been falsified through ignorantly mistaking mythology for divine revelation and allegory for historic truth. Geology was not taught among the mysteries of ancient knowledge, floating fragments of which have drifted down to us in the book of Genesis. The Christian world assumed that it was or, at least, some sort of globe-making and therefore it was found to be entirely opposed to scientific geology. Mythology never did inculcate the historic fall of man. Theologists have ignorantly supposed that it did, and as a result they were bitterly opposed to the ascent of man, made known by means of evolution. Such doctrines as the fall of man, the failure of God, and all that bankrupt business in the commencement of creation, the consequent genesis of evil and original sin, the depravity of matter. The filthy nature of the flesh have no other basis or beginning than in the perversion of ancient typology, and the literalization of mythology. According to the Hebrew Genesis the first man was born without a mother or a female of any kind. If that be fact according to Revelation, it cannot be according to nature. But there is nothing gained by calling it, Revelation. By doing so, Revelation has come to be a name applied to anything which we may not, for the time being, understand. Revelation has come to mean a series of confounding lies, warranted by God to be true. By making this a revelation direct from deity you destroy the character of the divine intelligence, which did not know the facts, processes, or order, of its own works. Or if it did it must have palmed off a lying version on the medium of communication to the world as a divine revelation made to man. But Adam never denoted a first man who was produced without a mother, nor Eve a first woman formed from an actual rib of Adam. That is but the literalization of a symbolical mode of representation, the key to which has been long mislaid. Speaking of the matter found in the Pentateuch, Philo, 
the learned Jew, told his countrymen the truth when he said, the literal statement is a fabulous one, and it is in the mythical we shall find the true. On the other hand, he asserts of the myths found in the Hebrew form, these things are not mere fabulous inventions, in which the race of poets and sophists delight. But are types shadowing forth an allegorical truth according to some mystical explanation. Not a history. The literal version is the false, and it is in the mythical that we shall find the true, but only when it is truly interpreted. Mythology is not to be understood by literalization, even though the Christian creed has been founded on that fatal method. It is not to be made real by modern rationalizing, though that is the basis of Unitarianism. Nor is it to be utilized by each one furnishing their own system of hermeneutical interpretation. Mythology is an ancient system of knowledge, with its own mode of expression, which enshrined the science of the past in what looks to us at times like foolish and unmeaning fables. It is entirely useless to speculate on such a subject, or try to read one's own interpretation into the myths, with no clue whatever to their primordial meaning. Anybody can make an allegory go on all fours, and read some sort of history into a myth. And, of course, he that hides can find, if you put your own meaning into what you read, you can discover it there. You may say it is so. Anyone can say, and possibly get a few others to hearken and believe, but no amount of mere assertion will establish the truth by means of a false interpretation of the fable. Some persons will tell us that if the fall of man be not a fact once and for all, better still, it is true forever, because men and women are always falling, therefore the allegory is over true, and, in point of fact, a divine revelation. I have heard preachers resolve the nocturnal wrestling match between Jacob and the angel into an exquisite allegory, made to run on all fours for very simple people to ride on, an allegory full of light and leading. And lovely in its moral and spiritual significance, for sorely tempted men. The night of the struggle is made internal. The angel is transformed into the devil, and we have the wrestle of the soul with the tempter, and a man on his knees all night in prayer. It is the conflict of Christian and Apollyon humanized, and fought out in a bedroom, in place of the dark valley of the shadow of death. It is in this wise that such stories are to be saved from absurdity, orthodoxy is to regain its lost supremacy, and science and religion are to be reconciled forever. But there is no truth in it all. The history was not human at first, and this subjective mode of treatment does but reface it with another sort of falsehood. If we would ascertain what these old stories originally meant we must go to mythology. In this case the Hottentots can enlighten us. They have a myth or fable of Tsunigom and Ganab, the twins, who personate the presence of light and darkness, the powers of good and evil. These two contend in mortal conflict night after night, the good one getting the better of the bad one by degrees, and growing stronger with every battle fought. At last Sunigom grew mighty enough to give his enemy a blow at the back of his ear, which put an end to Ganup. But just as he was expiring and falling back into his own abyss of darkness, Ganub gave his opponent a blow in the hollow of his leg, that made him go limping for life. In consequence he was called, Sunigom, the meaning of which name is, Wounded Knee. The struggle was that of light and darkness in the orb of the moon, or the sun of night fighting his way through the valley of the shadow of death in the underworld, during the winter, when his movement was slower. And he was represented as being lame in one knee, or maimed in his lower member. A wounded knee with a knife thrust through it is the Egyptian hieroglyphic sign for being overcome. Hence, although he conquers the powers of darkness, Tsunigom is said to have been wounded in one knee. The myth is found in many lands, and is identical with that of Jacob wrestling all night with the power called an angel, who maimed him in the hollow of his thigh, and made him a form of the wounded knee. Also, it is worse than useless, because misleading, to begin by applying a modern mystical system of subjective interpretation to the fragments of ancient wisdom found in the Hebrew book of Genesis, after the manner of Swedenborg. According to him the account of the creation in Genesis is not a real history, but a narrative written in the style of the ancient churches, signifying spiritual and divine things. The general subject of the first chapter is not the generation, but the new creation, the genesis becomes the regenesis, 
the perverted mythos is an intentional spiritual allegory, the six days are six states in the recreation of man. The seventh day represents the celestial man, and he is the Garden of Eden, and also the most ancient church. Adam's nakedness denotes the purity of the internal man, or the state of innocence of the celestial church. Eve also signifies the church. Cain is the name of those who falsified the doctrine of the most ancient church. The serpent going on its belly denotes the groveling of the sensual principle seeking after corporeal things. The flood or deluge was a total immersion of mankind in evil and falsehood. Everything in the word relates to the heavenly and spiritual, and is falsified if transferred to a lower level. But spiritual significations are not primary. The natural or physical must come first, because they were first, the eschatological is last. Man was no more remade than he was made on the sixth day. Swedenborg knows or acknowledges nothing of the origin in natural phenomena. Nothing of the true mythical mode of representation. Nothing of an astronomical basis for the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Knowledge, the Serpent, or the Primal Pair, whose figures are portrayed and whose story can still be read as it was first written in the stars of heaven. The imagery and types of mythology can, of course, be used as a mode of expression for later ideas, and for moral or spiritual significations just as we continue to say the moon rises, or the sun sets, after we know better. But, from the mundane standpoint, the natural, the physical, the external alone were primal. Hence primitive mythology is no more moral or immoral than it is obscene, senseless, or insane, simply because the phenomena were not human. Before the Egyptian hieroglyphics were understood Swedenborg undertook to vouch for the fact that they represented spiritual ideas by means of natural objects, according to his own doctrine of correspondences. Which is no more true than his interpretation of the Hebrew Genesis. This can be proved. The hieroglyphics began as direct object pictures, which became symbolical in a later phase. The three water signs of the zodiac do not represent a spiritual experience in this veil of tears, but the three months inundation which is annual in the valley of the Nile. The fact is that we cannot translate the thought of primitive or prehistoric man without first learning the language in which his was expressed. The wisdom, or gnosis, so carefully hidden and jealously guarded in the past, is not to be recovered with any certitude by clairvoyant insight or intuitional memory, whosoever sets up the claim. You may have the vision to see the hidden treasures lying buried at the bottom of the ocean, but you will not be able to bring it back to men by merely dredging for it in your dreams. There were Illuminati in the mysteries of old, but they did not trust to the intuitional faculty for that information, which took them seven or ten years to acquire. They were no mere self-Illuminati. They knew that intuition could not take the place of research, and were careful to communicate all the exact knowledge they possessed to those whom they instructed. Add to your faith knowledge, is the counsel of Paul. In vain we read our own thought into the primitive types of expression, and then say the ancients meant that. Subtilized interpretation will not read the riddle to the root. Nor did such things originate in riddles or intentional enigmas. You may believe me when I affirm, and you can prove it for yourselves, that mythology was a primitive method of teaching natural facts, and not an esoteric mode of misinterpreting them. What we need to know is the primary meaning of the myth-makers, and this can only be recovered by collecting and comparing all the extant versions of the original mythos. There is no beginning with the mystical or metaphysical in the past before we have mastered the mythical, that can only lead to a maze, or to being lost in a mist of mystification, as soon as we are out of the wood of literalization. Cardinal Baronius has said that the intention of Holy Scripture is to teach us how to go to heaven, and not how the heavens go. But the earliest Scripture did teach how the heavens go, and it became sacred because it was celestial. The first creation of heaven and earth was but the division into upper and lower, by whatsoever means expressed, answering to the discreeting of light from darkness. This was also rendered by the dividing of an egg or calabash, and by the cutting of the heaven, the cow of heaven, or the heifer of the morning and evening star, in two. It was neither earth-making nor heaven-making in any cosmical sense nothing more than distinguishing the light from the darkness, the vault above from the void below. 
This is illustrated by the creation legend found on the Assyrian tablets, which commences, At that time the heaven above had not announced, nor the earth beneath recorded, a name. The word first uttered in heaven related to times and seasons, and the earliest word was uttered by the appointed timekeepers. The account of creation given in the second chapter of Genesis is that, these are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created. And the generations of the heaven were astronomical. We learn from the cuneiform legends of creation how in the beginning God created the heavens, Bel prepared the seven mansions of the gods. He fixed the stars, even the twin stars, to correspond to them. He ordained the year, appointing the signs of the zodiac over it. He illuminated the moon god that he might watch over the night, says. This version, however, is comparatively late, because the fatherhood had then been founded. Then, as Hermes says in the Divine Commander, the heaven was seen in seven circles, and the gods were visible in the stars with all their signs, and the stars were numbered with the gods in them, the gods being seven in number. When the old genetrix is excluded. From the first, our theology, based on the Old Testament records, has never been anything else than a dead branch of the ancient mythology, and just when all men, free to think, were finding out this fact, Mr. Gladstone came forward and made another effort to rehabilitate the old book so generally discredited, and chivalrously led one more forlorn hope for a cause that is hopelessly lost. Surely no Christian martyr of an earlier time could have made a more pathetic or pitiable appeal to human sympathies than this man of intellect who is so much larger than his creed holding on to his pious opinion in the face of facts the most fatal to his faith. For, with the literal interpretation of the book of Genesis, the fall of man remains a historic transaction, and the ascent made known by evolution is a stupendous delusion. It is a sad sight to see a man like Mr. Gladstone, who by his position and powers can attract a world's attention to his words, cheerfully content to become a leader in misleading. Still fondly believing that the creations in the book of Genesis contain a veritable history that could not have been written unless it had been divinely inspired. Still trying to make out that it is in accordance with geology, and the scientific interpretation of nature. In his case the child is not only father to the man, but a terrible tyrant over him as well. Mr. Gladstone still maintains the opinion that the man who wrote the account of the creations in Genesis was gifted with faculties passing all human experience, or else his knowledge was divine. The order of development presented, he says, is first the water population, second, the air population, third, the land population of animals, and fourth, the land population consummated in man. And Mr. Gladstone says this same fourfold order is understood to have been so affirmed in our time by natural science, that it may be taken as a demonstrated conclusion and established fact. The reply of science is a point-blank denial. It admits nothing of this kind. It knows better. This is not the order in which the various populations made their first appearance on the globe. And it was only by classing these populations according to the notion of distinct creations, which were produced at the rate of one a day or so, that any such definition or distinction could ever have been made. Whatsoever the order of succession, that succession was gradual, with a good deal of parallelism and lapping over on various lines of development. In short, the account is not geological, is not true, when judged by the earth's record itself. Besides, when the ancients placed water before earth, in their series of elements, they had no particular thought whether water or earth was first in existence. They were only concerned with water being their first recognized necessary and essential element of life. And if we were teaching our children without any pretense of revelation or assumption of divine knowledge, if we limited ourselves to the natural facts, we should have to point out that the water population as a whole did not exist before there was any land population. There was no such thing as a completion of creation no. 1. Before the beginning of creation number 2. No such thing as creation in that sense at all, neither as the act of one day, nor of a million years. We know that many forms of life on land preceded various forms which are found in the waters, and that life was proceeding on its special lines of variation in several elements at once. Moreover, 
Though man is the crowning outcome of the animal world, it is not necessary to assume any sudden or complete ending to the animal creation before he could appear as if all lines of descent had to converge and culminate in him. It is very likely that man was earlier than the horse, and almost certain that he was before the dog, as we know that animal. Man had probably put in an appearance as head of his line before various other species had reached the last term of their series. It is certain there never were four or three definite and successive periods of time, and no other, in which three or four distinct populations could have originated. That which is wrong as scientific matter of fact cannot be made right as trustworthy matter of faith, not even by the specious dialectic of Mr. Gladstone or any other non-evolutionist. Nor is there any loophole of escape in supposing that the day and night of each creation were not intended by the compiler of Genesis to mean a day and night of twenty-four hours. We are not allowed to wriggle out of that conclusion. The six days might have meant vastly indefinite periods, after we had heard of the geological series and sequence, but for that fatal seventh day which completes the week of seven days. The reason why we keep the Sabbath every seventh day is because this was the day of rest for the Lord after his six days hard labor. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because that in it he rested. This was the accepted origin of keeping holy the seventh day every week, and not at the end of eons of time, or six ages. The plain meaning of the compiler is not to be evaded or got away from. The writer of the Hebrew Genesis says positively that all things were made and finished in one week, and for that reason we celebrate the Sabbath day. Seven days in one week are also shown by the dedication of each day to one of the seven planetary gods. And seven days in one week cannot be geological periods any more than they can apply to the subjective experience of the soul. Mr. Gladstone says the question is, whether natural science in the patient exercise of its high calling to examine facts finds that the works of God cry out against what we have fondly believed to be his work, and tell another tale. The answer is, they do cry out, and give the lie to that authority so foolishly supposed to be divine. The word of God says that the act of Adam brought death into the world. The older record shows, leaf after leaf or stratum beneath stratum, that death had been at work tens of millions of years before man appeared on the earth. In all these orthodox attempts to rationalize mythology, writers and preachers are dealing with matters which they have not yet understood, and which never can be understood on their plane of thought, or within their narrow limits. In Aesop's fable the wolf overhears the nurse threaten to throw the child to him, and he believes her, but, after long waiting for the fulfillment of prophecy to bring him his supper, he finds that she did not mean what she said. So is it with the myths, they never meant what they said when literally interpreted. And the literalization of mythology is the fountainhead of all our false belief, mystification being the secondary source. From my point of view, this is merely slaying the slain over again. And yet this literalization of mythology is continued to be taught as God's truth to the men and women of the future in their ignorant and confiding childhood. And some eight or ten millions of pounds are annually filched from our national revenues for the benefit of a church and clergy established and legally empowered to make the people believe that these falsified fables are a true divine revelation. Received direct from God. And if they doubt and deny it they will be doomed to suffer atrocious tortures through all eternity. Mr. Gladstone says he is persuaded that the belief of Christians and Jews concerning the inspiration of the book is impregnable. He believes the Genesis to be a revelation for the Christians, made by God to the Jews, such as presents to the rejecter of that belief a problem which demands solution at his hands, and which he has not been able to solve. For himself, Mr. Gladstone is so simple and profound a believer in revelation, if biblical, and in the inspiration of the Mosaic writer in particular, that he is lost in astonishment at the phenomenon it presents to him. He asks, how can these things be, and not overcome us with wonder? How came they to be, not among Akkadians, or Assyrians, or Egyptians, who monopolized the stores of human knowledge when this wonderful tradition was born, but among the obscure records of a people who Dwelling in Palestine for twelve hundred years from their sojourn in the valley of the Nile, hardly had forced to stamp even so much as a name on the history of the world at large. 
and only then began to be admitted to the general communion of mankind when their scriptures assumed the dress which a Gentile tongue was needed to supply. It is more rational, I contend, to say that these astonishing anticipations were a God-given supply than to think that this race should have entirely transcended in kind, even more than in degree, all known exercise of human faculties. The answer is, that it does not do to begin with wonder in matters which demand inquiry and research the answer is, that this matter of the creations did not originate with the Jewish race at all. Mr. Gladstone's assumption is the sheerest fallacy. The wonderful tradition was not born among them. It was wholly and far more perfectly pre-extant amongst the Persians, the Akkadians, and Egyptians. The book of Genesis is assigned to a man who was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. I cannot answer for the man, but I can for some of the matter. To begin with, the legend of Eden is one of those primeval traditions that must have been the common property of the undivided human race, carried out into all lands as they dispersed in various directions from one center. Which I hold to have been African. As Sharp, an early English Egyptologist, and a translator of the Hebrew Scriptures, asserts correctly dash, the whole history of the fall of man is of Egyptian origin. The temptation of the woman by the serpent, and of man by the woman, the sacred tree of knowledge, the cherubs guarding with flaming swords the door of the garden, the warfare declared between the woman and the serpent. May all be seen upon the Egyptian sculptured monuments. The French Egyptologist, M. Lefebure, who has lately identified Adam with the Egyptian Adam, as I had done seven years earlier in my book of beginnings, refers to a scene on the coffin of Penpii in the Louvre which is similar to the history of Adam in the terrestrial paradise, where a naked and ithophilic personage called the Lord of Food, Nebtepha, is standing before a serpent with two legs and two arms. And the reptile is offering him a red fruit, or at least a little round object painted red. The same scene is again found on the tomb of Ramesses VI. And on a statue relatively recent in the Museum of Turin it is to Adam equals Adam that the serpent, as tempter, is offering the round object, or fruit of the tree. The same writer says, the tree of life and knowledge was well known in Egypt. And, whether the scene of Nebtepha can be identified with the history of Adam or not, we can see that the greater number of the peculiar features of this history existed in Egypt the tree of life and knowledge, the serpent of paradise. Eve thinking of appropriating divinity to herself, and in short Adam himself, are all there. Trans S. Bib Arch V.9, Pt. 1, page 180. These and other matters pertaining to the astronomical allegory and the natural genesis of mythology were pre-extant in Egypt, and had been carried out over the world untold ages before a Palestinian Jew had ever trod the earth. And yet, incredible as it may sound, Mr. Gladstone has the reckless confidence to declare that the Hebrew account of creation has no Egyptian marks upon it. That would indeed be strange if it had been written by a man who was a master of the wisdom of Egypt. Mr. Gladstone may have been misled by the Hibbert lecturer, Mr. Renouf, who has said, p. 243, it may be confidently asserted that neither the Hebrews nor Greeks learned any of their ideas from Egypt. A statement which reveals a congenital deficiency of the comparative faculty. The same may be said of Professor Sayce when he asserts the, the theology and the astronomy of Egypt and Babylonia show no vestiges of a common source. The creation of the woman from the man in the second chapter of Genesis is likewise found in the magical texts, where it is said of the seven spirits they bring forth the woman from the loins of the man, says, H.I.B. Lect. 395. This also has an Egyptian mark upon it. Such a creation is alluded to in the Book of the Dead, where the speaker says, I know the mystery of the woman who was made from the man. Professor Sace also asserts that there is, no trace in the book of Genesis, of the great struggle between the god of light and the dragon of darkness, who in one form are Merodach and Tiamat. The conflict is there, however, but from the original Egyptian source. It is represented as the enmity between the woman and the serpent, and also between her seed and the serpent. The Roman Church renders the passage, Gen 3. 15. Addressed to the serpent, she shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise her heel. Both versions are Egyptian. 
Horus is the son and seed of Isis. Sometimes he is portrayed as bruiser of the Apap serpent's head. At others it is she who conquers. Both are combined in the imagery which the Egyptians set in the planisphere, where Isis in the shape of Virgo bears the seed in her hands, and bruises the serpent's head beneath her feet. This seed in one form was sown in Egypt immediately after the inundation, and in this way, as I have shown, the zodiacal representation reflects the seasons of Egypt all round the year. The serpent itself in the Hebrew Genesis is neither an original nor a true type. Two opposite characters have been fused and confused in it for the sake of a false moral. Serpent and dragon were primarily identical as emblems of evil in physical phenomena, each was the representative of darkness, and as such the deluder of men. Afterwards the serpent was made a type of time, of renewal, and, therefore, of life. The dragon crocodile a zoo type of intelligence. Both crocodile and serpent were combined in Sevicare. Both were combined in the polar dragon. And in the book of Revelation the dragon remains that old serpent, considered to be the deluder of mankind. Both were combined in the Knubis serpent dragon of the Gnostics, which was a survival of Neph as the Agatha demon or good serpent of Egypt. The Akkadian type as Ea, is the good serpent, the serpent of life, the god of wisdom. Now it was the serpent of wisdom that first offered the fruit of the tree of knowledge for the enlightenment of mankind. Whether this be Egyptian, Akkadian, or Gnostic, it is the good serpent. And as guardian of the tree said in heaven it was the good serpent, or intelligent dragon, as keeper of the treasures of astral knowledge. It was the later theology, Persian and Hebrew, that gave the character of the evil one to the serpent of wisdom, and perverted the original meaning, both of the temptation and the tempter who protected the tree. Which has been supplemented by the theology of the vitriol throwers who have scarified and blasted the face of nature on earth, and defiled and degraded the starry intelligencers in heaven. Professor Say's statements are no more correct than Mr. Renouf's, and Mr. Renouf's is no more true than Mr. Gladstone's. Further evidence may be found in my natural genesis. But no non-evolutionist can understand or interpret the past. He is too ready to accept the re-beginning, where there can be at most a new point of departure. Mr. Gladstone has been too much wrapped up in the one book. He does not know that the story of Genesis is to be found written in the Bible above, and that the happy garden, the primal pair, the war of the serpent, and the first mother, together with the tree of knowledge are all constellated in the stars of heaven, according to Egyptian mythology, and are all verifiable on the monuments. When he does learn that such is the fact, he cannot claim that the history inscribed upon the starry walls was written by the Jews, or copied from the Hebrew record. But let us see whether we cannot discover a few more Egyptian marks on the Genesis. A paradise or garden that is watered without rain by a mist that went up from the earth to fall upon it in refreshing dew is certainly suggestive of an Egyptian origin, as that was the one way in which Egypt was watered from above. This was not so in the Eden at the head of the Persian Gulf. Besides which the eight primary powers or gods of Egypt were the dwellers in Eden or Aeum's men, the paradise of the eight, who comprised the genetrix and her seven children. The original Genesis and all the chief types are identifiably Egyptian to begin with. But the Hebrew version was more directly derived from the Persian, as the evil serpent proves. Water was the first element of life recognized by the primitive perception. Water was considered to be the mother, or maternal source, personified. In Egypt the mother of life pours out the water of life from the tree of life. She is the first form of the celestial waterer. In the mystical sense, blood is the water of life, and therefore the mother of life. This beginning on earth with and from the water was Egyptian, Babylonian, Mexican, Indian, Chinese, Greek, British, universal. It is said upon an Assyrian tablet that, the heaven was made from the waters. So in the Egyptian beginning the sky was looked upon as the celestial water. This water was also entified in the river Nile, which was called the way of the gods, when the nature powers had been divinest. In that sense, as it were, heaven descended, to be continued on earth. From this water of heaven the land in Egypt was visibly deposited, 
and the earth was, compacted out of water and by means of water. When these were discrete there was the dry land. Here if anywhere is the primary hint of a cosmical beginning with a fact in nature, but not with a theory of nature nor a system of geology. The second element of life was breath, anima, or air. In Egyptian, breath or spirit is nef, and this was personated by nef, a form of the first god, who is said to be the breath of souls, or those who are in the firmament. Nef, for breath and spirit, explains the Hebrew nefesh for soul, as the breath of life. Nef, the breathing life in the firmament, is also the sailor on the water. In the Hebrew version, Nef becomes the spirit moving on the face of the waters. In the Egyptian representation he sails the waters in his ark, just as Ea does in the Akkadian version of the myth. The god Nef is also the spirit that presides over the bow, which had become the pit hole, or the tomb from the womb of the beginning. The Egyptian bow is the Hebrew bohu, or the void. In both it is a place left unpersonified. In the later phase of personification this bow of birth becomes the Phoenician bathe, called the consort of Kalpia, the wind or spirit. The bow was also personified in the Babylonian goddess Bohu. The Phoenician bathe points back to the Egyptian bab, or beb, for the hole, cave, well, source, or utrans the original of all the babs in later language, including Babylon. Now, that which is performed by the Elohim and grow in Genesis is done by the Ali, or seven companions, in Egypt, most of whom can be recognized individually in relation to the seven elements. As the Hebrew Elohim, they may be dislimbed and lose their likeness, but they are the same seven powers of eternal nature, as explained by the Gnostics or Kabbalists. In one of the Egyptian creation legends shown by a monument which was restored in the time of Shabaka it is said of the Creator, a blessing was pronounced upon all things in the day when he bid them exist. And before he had yet caused gods to be made for Ta. This, it appears to me, has left another Egyptian mark on the first chapter of Genesis in the refrain, and the Elohim saw that it was good, which is uttered seven times over, in accordance with the sevenfold nature of the Elohim. And the blessing is pronounced and God blessed them. And God blessed the seventh day. It would be going too far afield to show all the Egyptian marks in one lecture, but I must offer another example. The Hebrew word employed for creating, when the Elohim formed the heaven and the earth, is, bara. The essential meaning of the word is to give a manifestation in form to material previously without shape. Nothing could so perfectly realize it as the potter at work on his clay. And the Egyptian image of a creator, as the former, is Kapper, who, as the beetle, formed his little globe with his hands, and who, as Kepertah, is the potter sitting at his wheel, and shaping the egg of the sun and moon. Or the vase of matter to contain life he who was the former or creator, in his name of let earth be. The potter, in Hebrew and Phoenician, is the Jatzer, and this word is also applied to the Hebrew god as creator, Jatzariah being Jah the potter. Thus the Kabbalist book of creation, named the Sefer Jatzira, is the book of creation as the workmanship of the former or potter. Anyone who knows anything of the monuments will here recognize another Egyptian mark. I may say the Egyptian potter's mark on the Hebrew creations. The creator or former, as Kepertah the potter, is the head of the seven Nemo, who are his assistants in the work of creation. He is the chief of the Ali or Elohim, as the fashioner and builder of the heavens. He is also the father of the Egyptian Adam, or Adam, the Red One, just as the Hebrew or Phoenician Elohim are the creators of Adam the Red. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord God of the second chapter of Genesis, can be further identified with Ta, the founder of the earth and former of men. Ta is the father of Adam equals Adam, the father of human beings. He is designated the father of the fathers, an equivalent to the title of Ialdabaoth, chief of the seven Gnostic Elohim. The name of Ta signifies the opener from put to open. And the Hebrew name of XYXTP shows that Ja is Puthak equals Putha, or Ta, as the opener, cf. 1st, page 1166. These we may claim for other Egyptian marks. But I have now learned that the account of the creations in Genesis is not so directly derived from the Egyptian as I had once thought. 
That is, it was rewritten after the time of the captivity in Babylon, and the consequent acquaintance with the creation legends in their latest Persian form. This can be shown by a comparison with the Parsi Bundahish or Aboriginal creation more literally, the creation of the beginning. Indeed, we may suspect that the first words of the Hebrew Genesis have to do with the title of the Bundahish. They are, Brasheth Elohim bara, and, Brasheth, when literally translated, reads, in the beginning of, leaving an ellipsis, without stating in the beginning of what. Now the meaning of the word Bundahish is, the creation of the beginning. This far more perfect statement seems to have been bundled in adapting it for the Hebrew version. The first two facts distinguishable in external phenomena by man were those of darkness and light. The panorama of mythological representation is drawn out from these as its opening scene, and the long procession of the powers of nature, which became divinities at a later stage, starts upon its march through heaven above to cast its shadows on the earth below. By observing the alternation of light and darkness, a primary measure of time was first established as the creation of a night and day, marked by the twin star. And, there was evening, and there was morning, one day, as the result of this earliest creation of the beginning. In the Persian Bundahish, the deity Ahura Mazda is the chief of the seven Amchaspans just as the creator Ta is of the seven Knemu, and the Gnostic Ialdabaoth of the seven Elohim. Here we learn that the God created the world in six periods, although not in six days. The first of Ahura Mazda's creatures of the world was the sky, and his good thought by good procedure produced the light of the world. This is identical with the Elohim seeing the light that it was good, and with the blessing pronounced on his creations by the Egyptian deity. The light now separated and distinguished from darkness in the creation of time is quite distinct from the divine, the abstract, or the illimitable and eternal light already existing with Ahura Mazda, it is the evening and morning, one day. Darkness and light are personified and represented as being at ceaseless enmity with each other in the confusion of chaos, but they come to an understanding as co-creators, and make a covenant, in appointing this primeval period of time. And such was the first creation in the Persian series of six. And of Ahura's creatures of the world, it is said, the first was the sky, the second, water, the third earth, the fourth, plants, the fifth, animals, the sixth, mankind. The creation of light in the Hebrew Genesis is the creation of the sky in the Persian, and the creation of water in the Persian Genesis, becomes the dividing of the waters in the Hebrew version. The time of this creation is called the second day. The third Persian creation is that of earth, which is the dry land of the Hebrew and the Elohim called the dry land earth. The fourth Persian creation, or rather creature, is that of plants. This is not a separate creation in the Hebrew version, it is thrown into the third creation, that of earth. Nevertheless, the third must have included the plants because it includes every herb yielding seed and every tree that bears edible fruit. And yet in chapter 2, verse 5, when the creations are all completed, and the Elohim had finished the work which they had made, we are told that, no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up. Which proves how mixed and muddled, as well as unoriginal, is the Mosaic version. In the fourth Hebrew creation the heavenly bodies become the timekeepers for signs and seasons. This is not one of the six Persian creations, which six are followed by the formation of the luminaries. Of these it is said, Ahura Mazda produced illumination between the sky and the earth, the constellation stars, and those not of the constellations, then the moon, and afterwards the sun. The fifth Persian creation is that of the animals. This creation is limited to the winged fowl, sea animals, and fishes, in the Hebrew account, which is considerably mixed. Mr. Gladstone asks, is there the smallest inconsistency in a statement which places the emergence of our land, and its separation from the sea, and the commencement of vegetable life, before the final and full concentration of light upon the sun, and its reflection on the moon and planets? And as there would be light diffused before there was light concentrated, why may not that diffused light have been sufficient for the purposes of vegetation? Certainly, as there was light enough to make day before there was any sun or moon, there ought to, and should, have been. 
In my reply I am not concerned to reconcile the literal rendering of the Hebrew Genesis with scientific fact. But I shall have to point out on behalf of the mythical original that according to the present interpretation the heaven and earth could and did exist before the stars, or the moon and the sun. There was no time kept on earth or in heaven until night and day were divided and marked by the alternation of light and darkness, or by the twin star of evening and dawn, therefore the heavenly bodies were not made use of. Ergo they did not exist in any requisite sense of the mythos. Lastly, man is the product of the sixth creation in both renderings. If taken literally, man of the sixth Persian creation appears on the scene before the stars or moon or sun, which follow the six creations, not as mere light-givers to the earth, but as time-keepers for man. And that alone will explain why the stars are said to be in existence before the moon, and the moon before the sun. In the Persian writings the invariable order is that of stars, moon, and sun. In describing the mythical Mount Albors, the Mount Meru of the Persian system of the heavens, it is said that it grew for two hundred years up to the star station, for two hundred more years up to the moon station, for two hundred more years up to the sun station, for two hundred more years up to the endless light. That is a mode of building up the heavens in accordance with the order of the celestial timekeepers, and of the Cronian creations. Time was first told by the stars, morning and evening, and by the seven which turned round once in the circle of a year, next by means of the moon and its monthly renewal, next by means of the sun. Solar time being last because the most difficult to make out. In a papyrus at Turin it is said of Tot, the god of lunar time, in Egypt, he hath made all that the world contains, and hath given it light when all was darkness, and there was as yet no sun. This was figurative, and applies solely to the moon, by which time was kept earlier than it could be defined by the sun. It is well known that the lunar year and the lunar zodiac, or pathway of the moon, were earlier than the solar zodiac of twelve signs, which is too late for the mythical beginnings. In the Babylonian account of creation the moon is produced before the sun. As George Smith points out, this is in reverse order to that of the Hebrew Genesis. Evidently, he says, the Babylonians considered the moon the principal body, while the book of Genesis makes the sun the greater light. Here is becomes evident, says this bibliolator, that Genesis is truer to nature than the Chaldean text. The uninspired Babylonians, you see, did not know that the moon was the lesser, and the sun the larger light. Professor Sais likewise tells us that, the idea which underlay the religious belief of Akkad, was, that, the moon existed before the sun, H.I.B. Lect, 165. Neither of these Assyriologists appears to have had any notion why this was so represented. The Arcadians, the Argives, the Quiches, and other races of men claimed to be proselenes, or those who lived before the time of the moon, not before the existence of that luminary. Truer to nature can have no meaning for an account of the creation of light prior to the existence of the heavenly bodies that is, if literally taken. But neither the Egyptians, Babylonians, nor Persians were talking about the cosmical creation in the modern sense, as has been ignorantly assumed, and foolishly contended for, but about the mythical beginnings of the timekeepers. In these the mapping out of the lunar month came before the solar year. Hence the sun god was called the child of the moon god Sin, in Assyria, and the lunar god, Tot, or Tehudi, is called the father of Osiris, the sun god, in Egypt. The priority being dependent on the earlier observations for the keeping of time. So the Mexicans held the planet Venus to have been created before the sun. It was earlier than the moon, they said, and properly the first light that appeared in the world. That would be as a star of morning and evening which made the first day. Hence we are told that the first man, O Ans, came up out of the Red Sea, and landed in Babylonia on the first day. The Great Mother, to whom the planet Venus was dedicated, was represented by the heifer, the pure heifer, the sacred heifer, the golden calf, as it was called. This being of either sex, it supplied a twin type for Venus, as Hathor or Ishtar, the double star, that was male at rising and female at sunset, and therefore the twin stars of the first day. Any other earlier sense these creations have besides that of timekeeping was merely elemental, 
and relating to the order in which man recognized and represented the natural elements. Darkness, with its voice of thunder, was the first. Out of the darkness issued the light. These two were the twins of eternal alternation in external phenomena, found in so many forms of the mythos as the two brothers, who fought each other for the birthright. The next two were moisture and air, or the water of life and the breath of life. These four creations, or, as the Bundahish has it, for creatures of Ahura Mazda, were the four elements of darkness and light, water and air. In Egypt they were typified by the jackal of darkness, the hawk of light, the ape of breath, and the hippopotamus or dragon of the waters, which were made those keepers of the four corners who are universal in mythology. They indicate four elements, or four seasons, for quarters of the year, or the fourfold heaven by which the circle of the whole was divided, and squared as it was in the circle of Yima. I have followed out the various creations, or heavens, from beginning to end in the natural genesis. At present we must turn once more to the Persian Bundahish where it says in Revelation such being the formula frequently employed on matters of religion or on the periods for the observance of religious duties, the creatures of the world were created by me complete in 365 days. That is the six periods of the festivals which are completed in a year. Here, then, we part company with the six days and one week of creation in the Hebrew book of Genesis. We can see that is but a condensed summary of an earlier account, which may lead us a little nearer to nature, and to those phenomenal facts on which mythology was founded the rock on which our biblical theology will be wrecked. In this version of the creation legend the six creations are completed in one year of 365 days, or rather the year of 365 days has been finally completed in six stages, or seasons, or periods of timekeeping. In accordance with this sixth creation we learn from the Targum of Palestine that Adam, as the Adamic man, was created in the image of the Lord, his Maker, with 365 nerves. Here the divine model of humanity was the solar god of time, or of the creations perfected at last in a year of 365 days. Which figures are reflected in the 365 nerves. Now we can see how the Persian sixth day of celebration of each of the six creations became the six days of creation in the Hebrew Genesis, in the process of condensing mythology into cosmical and human history. And one year into one week to make it more tangible at a later time. The creations include the elements identified, together with the various systems of keeping time, which culminated at last in a year of 365 and a quarter days. These systems may be roughly sketched as, 1, the one day of a light and dark, 2, one turn round to a year, 3, the half years of the solstices, 4, a lunar month of the four quarters, 5, planetary time, 6, solar time, or a year of 365 days. When it says in the Persian Revelation, the creatures of the world were created by me in 365 days, it does not mean during that period, any more than it means the six days of the Hebrew misrendering of the matter. It means that the concluding creation of the six different creations culminated in a year of solar time, or 365 days to the year, in the image of which Adamic man was formed with 365 nerves. The origin of the Sabbath in Genesis is curiously paralleled, or suggested, in the Bundahish. We read, on matters of religion, it says in Revelation thus, the creatures, or six creations, were created by me complete in 365 days. That is the six Gehanbars, which are completed in a year. And here the matters of religion are explained as being the periods for observance of religious duties. That is, the six festivals or Sabbaths were instituted to commemorate the six creations which were created complete, or culminated, in a year of 365 days. The Persians represented their god as resting during five days after each of the six seasons of creation. And they also celebrated a great six days festival annually, beginning on the first of March and ending on the sixth day, as the greatest holiday, because in this. The sixth season in place of the sixth day in the Hebrew Genesis, Ahura Mazda had created the most superior things. Thus the six creations in the Hebrew version have been visibly condensed into six periods of time, and there is but one period for religious observance on the seventh day. 
And whereas the Persians, or Parsas, hold their six festivals and periods of rest in one whole year, we have fifty-two Sabbaths, which shows the latest rendering, as well as the development of the same mythos. The Hebrew Elohim rested on the seventh day, whereas the Persian Ahura Mazda rested for five days at a time after each of the six creations. Further, the six seasons or periods of creation had been reduced from the earlier Babylonian version, in which the seventh day was not a Sabbath, but the period in which the animals and man were created. We are also told in the Bundahish it says in Revelation that before the coming of the destroyer vegetation had no thorns upon it or bark about it, and afterwards, when the destroyer came, it was created with bark, and things grew thorny. And in the Avesta, an older scripture, this destroyer, the evil opponent, is a serpent as it is in the book of Genesis. It is too late now to advance the claim, or assume that the Persians, the Babylonians, and the Egyptians borrowed their versions from that given by the inspired writer of the Hebrew Pentateuch. And these facts, I submit, furnish sufficient evidence that the book of Genesis does not contain an original revelation made by God to the Jews, in short, it does not contain any revelation at all. We are compelled to seek elsewhere before we can really understand what it does contain. The six creations, creative acts, or periods are Persian, but the legends in Genesis have been derived from more than one source. Of late years a mighty fuss has been made about the fact that two different systems, known as the Elohistic and Javistic, have been imperfectly blended and utilized in the Hebrew version of the Genesis. But with no application of the comparative process to the various systems of creations, according to mythology, and with no clue whatever to the natural phenomena in which the mythology was founded. Or to the gnosis by which the myths were anciently interpreted. According to the Persian reckoning, the human creature was formed as the sixth creation, or, as the Hebrew version has it, on the sixth day, whereas in the version of the seventy man was created on the eighth day. Now, if we look closely at the first chapter of Genesis, we shall find both these reckonings combined, but not blended. Although there are no more than six days of creation mentioned in the Hebrew Genesis, there are eight distinct acts of creation or utterances of the word. These are enumerated as follows. 1. The Elohim said let there be light. 2. The Elohim said let there be a firmament. 3. The Elohim said let the waters be gathered together. And let the dry land appear. 4. The Elohim said let the earth put forth grass. 5. The Elohim said let there be light in the firmament. 6. The Elohim said let the waters bring forth. 7. The Elohim said let the earth bring forth. 8. The Elohim said let us make man in our image. The Bundahish has six creations only. The eight are Egyptonastic, in keeping with the Ogdoad of primary powers. According to the Gnostics, who had preserved the only true knowledge of these mythical matters, man, as the eighth creation, belongs to the mystery of the Ogdoad. Irensis tells us how the Gnostics maintained that man was formed on the eighth day of creation, sometimes they say he was made on the sixth, and at others on the eighth day. B. 1, C. 18, 2. These two creations of man on the sixth day and on the eighth were those of the Adamic or fleshly man and of the spiritual man, who were known to Paul and the Gnostics as the first and second Adam, the man of earth and the man from heaven. Irensis also says they insisted that Moses began with the Ogdoad of the seven powers and their mother, who is called Sophia, the old Kapha of Egypt, who is the living word, at Ambos. Thus we find the two systems are run into each other, and left without the means of distinguishing the one from the other, or of knowing how they had either of them originated. So that, instead of a revelation of the beginning in the Hebrew Genesis, we have to go far beyond it to find any beginning whatever. So it is with the fall. Here, as before, the Genesis does not begin at the beginning. There was an earlier fall than that of the primal pair. In this, the number of those who failed and fell was seven. We meet with these seven in Egypt, eight with the mother, where they are called the children of inertness, who were cast out from Am's men, the paradise of the eight. Also, in a Babylonian legend of creation, as the seven brethren, who were seven kings, like the seven kings in the book of Revelation, and the seven non-sentient powers, 
who became the seven rebel angels that made war in heaven. The seven chronids, described as the seven watchers, who, in the beginning, were formed in the interior of heaven. The heaven, like a vault, they extended or hollowed out. That which was not visible they raised, and that which had no exit they opened, their work of creation being exactly identical with that of the Elohim in the book of Genesis. These are the seven elemental powers of space, who were continued as seven timekeepers. It is said of them, in watching was their office, but among the stars of heaven their watch they kept not, and their failure was the fall. In the book of Enoch the same seven watchers in heaven are stars which transgressed the commandment of God before their time arrived, for they came and not in their proper season, therefore was he offended with them. And bound them until the period of the consummation of their crimes, at the end of the secret, or great year of the world I. e. the period of precession, when there was to be the restoration and rebeginning. The seven deposed constellations are seen by Enoch, looking like seven great blazing mountains overthrown that seven mountains in Revelation, on which the Scarlet Lady sits. The book of Genesis tells us nothing about the nature of the Elohim, erroneously rendered God, who are the creators of the Hebrew beginning, and who are themselves pre-extant and seated when the theater opens and the curtain ascends. It says that in the beginning the Elohim created the heaven and the earth. In thousands of books the Elohim have been discussed, but with no application of the comparative process to this and the earlier mythologies, and therefore with no conclusive result. Our bibliolators were too conceited in their insular ignorance to think there was anything worth knowing outside of their own books. Foolishly fancying they had gotten a revelation all to themselves, a supernatural version of the cosmical genesis, they did not care to seek for, did not dream of, a natural or scientific genesis, and could not make out the mythical. Consequently they have never known what it was they were called upon to worship in the name of God. In his paper on the evolution of theology, Professor Huxley assumes that the Elohim of Genesis originated as the ghosts of ancestors, in doing which he no more plums to the bottom than does Mr. Gladstone. The Elohim are seven in number, whether as nature powers, gods of constellations, or planetary gods. Whereas the human ghosts are not, and never were, a septenary, although they may be, and have been, confused with the typical seven as the Pitris and Patriarchs, Manus and Fathers of earlier times. The Gnostics, however, and the Jewish Kabbalah preserve an account of the Elohim of Genesis by which we are able to identify them with other forms of the seven primordial powers. They are the children of the ancient mother called Sophia. Their names are Ialdabaoth, Jehovah, or Iao, Sabaoth, Adonai, Elohis, Orius and Estamsis. Ialdabaoth signifies the Lord God of the Fathers, that is the Fathers who preceded the Father. And thus the seven are identical with the seven Pitris or fathers in India. Irensis B.1, 30, 5. Moreover, the Hebrew Elohim were pre-extant by name and nature as Phoenician divinities or powers. Sankaniathan mentions them by name, and describes them as the auxiliaries of Cronus or time. In this phase, then, the Elohim are timekeepers in heaven. In the Phoenician mythology the Elohim are the seven sons of Siddiq, identical with the seven Kabiri, who in Egypt are the seven sons of Ta, and the seven spirits of Are in the Book of the Dead. In Britain, with the seven companions of Arthur in the Ark, in Polynesia, with the seven dwarf sons of Pinga, in America, with the seven Hogates, in India, with the seven Rishis, in Persia, with the seven Amchus bands. In Assyria, with the seven Lamatsi. They had one common genesis in phenomena, as I have traced them by number, by nature, and by name, and also one common Chemite origin. They are always seven in number as a companionship or brotherhood, who cab, that is turn round together, whence the Thakabari. The Egyptian Ali or Ari, gives us the root meaning. The Ari are the companions, guardians and watchers, who turn round together. Hence the Aliahim or Elohim. They are also the Eli or gods, in Assyrian, who were seven in number. Eight with the mother in the beginning, or the manifester in the end. In their primordial phase they were seven elementary powers, warring in chaos, lawless and timeless. They were first born of the mother in space. 
And then the seven companions passed into the sphere of time, as auxiliaries of Cronus, or sons of the male parent. As Damascus says, in his, Primitive Principles, the Magi consider that space and time were the source of all. And from being powers of the air, the gods were promoted to become timekeepers for man. Seven constellations were assigned to them, and so they could be called the auxiliaries of Cronus, when time was established. As the seven turned round in the arc of the sphere they were designated the seven sailors, companions, rishis, or Elohim. The first seven stars are not planetary. They are the leading stars of seven constellations, which turned round with the great bear in describing the circle of a year. These the Assyrians called the seven Lamatsi, or leaders of the flocks of stars, designated sheep. On the Hebrew line of descent or development, these Elohim are identified for us by the Kabbalists and Gnostics, who retain the hidden wisdom or Gnosis, the clue of which is absolutely essential to any proper understanding of mythology or theology. The creation of the Elohim as auxiliaries of Cronus was not world-making at all in our sense. The myth-makers were not geologists, and did not pretend to be. The chaos which preceded creation was simply that of timelessness, and of the unintellectual and non-sentient nature powers. Creation proper began with the first means of measuring and recording a cycle of time. Thus the primary creation in the Genesis, as in the Bundahish, is the creation of time, in which the morning and evening measured one day. But the seven cronies, as we may now call them, were found to be telling time somewhat vaguely by the year, in accordance with the annual revolution of the starry sphere. And, being found inexact and unfaithful to their trust, they were dispossessed and superseded or, as it was fabled, they fell from heaven. The seven were then succeeded by a polar pair and a lunar trinity of timekeepers. For example, it has been observed that there was a fixed center, which was a pivot to the starry vast all turning round. Here there were two constellations with seven stars in each. We call them the two bears. But the seven stars of the lesser bear were once considered to be the seven heads of the polar dragon, which we meet with as the beast with seven heads in the Akkadian hymns and in the Book of Revelation. The mythical dragon originated in the crocodile, which is the dragon of Egypt. Plutarch tells us the Egyptians said the crocodile was the sole animal living in water which has his eyesight covered over with a film, so thin that he can see without himself being seen by others, in which he agrees with the first god. Now, in one particular cult, the Suttyphonian, the first god was Sevek, who wears the crocodile's head, as well as the serpent, and who is the dragon, or whose constellation was the dragon. The name of Sevek signifies the sevenfold. Hence the seven heads of the dragon, the dragon who is of the seven and, is himself also an eighth, as we are told in Revelation. In him the seven powers were unified, as they were in Ea, Iochnobis, and various other of the chief gods who summed up the earlier powers in the Supreme One, when unity was attained at last. For it is certain that no one god was ever made known to man by primitive revelation. The only starting point was in external phenomena, which assuredly manifested no oneness in personality. The group of totemic brotherhood preceded the fatherhood, and finally the fatherhood superseded the totemic group in heaven, as it was on earth. One form of this god was Sut Nub, and Nub means the golden. Thus the reign of Sut was that age of gold afterwards assigned to Saturn by the Greeks. In Egypt the great bear was the constellation of Typhon, or Kepha, the old genetrix, called the mother of the revolutions. And the dragon with seven heads was assigned to her son Sevek Cronus, or Saturn, called the dragon of life. That is, the typical dragon or serpent with seven heads was female at first, and then the type was continued as male in her son Sevek, the sevenfold serpent, in Ea the sevenfold, in number Ra, in the seven-headed serpent, Iaochnobis, and others. We find these two in the book of Revelation. One is the scarlet lady, the mother of mystery, the great harlot, who sat on a scarlet-colored beast with seven heads, which is the red dragon of the pole. She held in her hand the unclean things of her fornication. That means the emblems of the male and female, imaged by the Egyptians at the polar center, the very uterus of creation as was indicated by the thigh constellation, called the Kepsh of Typhon, 
the old dragon. In the northern birthplace of time in heaven. The two revolved about the pole of heaven, or the tree, as it was called, which was figured at the center of the starry motion. In the book of Enoch these two constellations are identified as Leviathan and Behemoth equals Bekmat, or the dragon and Hippopotamus equals Great Bear, and they are the primal pair that was first created in the Garden of Eden. So that the Egyptian first mother, Kepha, whose name signifies mystery, was the original of the Hebrew Chava, our Eve. And therefore Adam is one with Sevek, the sevenfold one, the solar dragon, in whom the powers of light and darkness were combined, and the sevenfold nature was shown in seven rays worn by the Gnostic Iaoknubis, god of the number seven. Who is Sevek by name and a form of the first father as head of the seven. Another bit of evidence here may be adduced from the rabbinical legends relating to Adam's first wife. Her name was Lilith, and Lilith equals Ririt, is that Egyptian goddess whose constellation was the great bear. Thus Adam and Eve are identified at last with the greater and lesser bears, and the mythical tree of knowledge with the celestial northern pole. The Hebrew Adam can be likewise shown to have been a form of the chief one of the earlier seven who fell from heaven. Not only is he the head of the first group of patriarchs turned into historical characters in the Genesis, who are seven in number, preceding the ten, but also learn that, in the mysteries of Samothrace. The name of Adam was given to the first and chief one of the seven Kabiri, who were a form of the earliest seven timekeepers, that failed and fell from heaven. Moreover, the Gnostics identify these primary seven by nature and by name as the seven mundane demons who always oppose and resist the human race, because it was on their account that the father among the seven was cast down to a lower world. Not to the earth. One name of this father is Ialdabaoth. Adam is another name of the same mythical personage, and Adam at Samothrace was chief of the seven. Adam, as the father among the seven, is identical with the Egyptian Adam, who was the father god in his first sovereignty, and whose other name of Adon is identical with the Hebrew Adonai. In this way the second creation in Genesis reflects and continues the later creation in the mythos, which explains it. The fall of Adam to the lower world led to his being humanized on earth, by which process the celestial was turned into the mortal, and this, which belongs to the astronomical allegory, got literalized as the fall of man. Or descent of the soul into matter, and the conversion of the angelic into an earthly being. The Roman Church has always held that mankind were created in consequence of the fall of the rebel angels who raised a revolt in heaven, which was simply a survival of the mythos, as it is found in the texts when Ea, the first father, is said to grant forgiveness to the conspiring gods, for whose redemption did he create mankind, says H.I.B. Lect. 140. The subject matter is celestial solely, and solely celestial because it was astronomical. The fall was not to the earth, nor on the earth, but to a lower heaven, called the Adama in Genesis. Nor did Adam and Eve become human realities below because they were outcast gods of constellations that were superseded above. The matter is mythical, and I am trying to show, as the result of wide research, what is the meaning of that which we call, mythical, by tracing the physical origin of the ancient gods, the Hebrew included, to natural phenomena. In accordance with data and determinatives still extant. As nothing was known concerning the genesis and nature of the Elohim, it has always been a moot question as to whom the speakers addressed the speech, let us make man in our image. It has commonly been assumed that the thus denoted a plural of dignity like the we of royalty and editorship. But it is not so. The Elohim are the Egyptian, Akkadian, Hebrew, and Phoenician form of the universal seven powers, who are seven in Egypt, seven in Akkad, Babylon, Persia, India, Britain, and seven amongst the Gnostics and Kabbalists. They were the seven fathers who preceded the Father in heaven, because they were earlier than the individualized fatherhood on earth. Mythology reflects the primitive sociology, as in a mirror, and we could not comprehend the reflection in the divine dynasties above until we knew something fundamental about the human relationships on the earth beneath. The field of Babylonian mythology is one vast battleground between the early motherhood and the later fatherhood that is, the mother in space, in the stellar and lunar characters opposed to the later and solar fatherhood. 
which became more especially Semite. Indeed, where the Akkadians wrote the female and the male, the Semite translators propensely reverse it, and render it by the male and the female. This setting up of the supreme god as solely male, to the exclusion of the female, has often been erroneously attributed to a supposed monotheistic instinct originating with the Semites. In Egypt the solar fatherhood had been attained in the sovereignty of Adam R.A., when the records begin. But this same battle went on all through her monumental history, more fiercely when the heretics, the motherites, the blackheads, were now and again reinforced by allies from without. When the Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, there were seven of them who represented the seven elements, powers or souls that went to the making of the human being who came into existence before the Creator was represented anthropomorphically, or could have conferred the human likeness on the Adamic man. It was in the sevenfold image of the Elohim that man was first created, with his seven elements, principles, or souls, and therefore could not have been formed in the image of the one God. The seven Gnostic Elohim tried to make a man in their own image, but could not, from lack of virile power. Thus, their creation in earth and heaven was a failure. The Gnostics identify these seven as the Hebrew Elohim who exhorted each other, saying, Let us make man after our image and likeness. They did so. But the man whom they made was a failure, because they themselves were lacking in the soul of the fatherhood. When the Gnostic Ialdabaoth, chief of the seven cried, I am the father and God, his mother Sophia replied, Do not tell lies, Ialdabaoth, for the first man, Anthropos son of Anthropos, is above thee. That is, man who had now been created in the image of the fatherhood, was superior to the gods who were derived from the mother parent alone. For, as it had been at first on earth, so was it afterwards in heaven. And thus the primary gods were held to be soulless, like the earliest races of men because they had not attained the soul of the individualized fatherhood. The Gnostics taught that the spirits of wickedness, the inferior seven, derived their origin from the Great Mother alone, who produced without fatherhood. It was in the image, then, of the sevenfold Elohim that the seven races were formed which we sometimes hear of as the pre-Adamite races of men. Because they were earlier than the fatherhood which was individualized only in the second Hebrew creation. These were the primitive people of the past, the old, despised, dark races of the world who were held to have been created without souls, because they were born before the fatherhood was individualized on earth or in heaven. For, there could be no God the Father recognized until the human father had been identified nothing more than the general ancestral soul of the fathers, or the soul of the seven elemental forces. These early races were first represented by totemic zootypes, and were afterwards abominated as the dog men, monkey men, men with tails, mere preliminary people, created in the likeness of animals, reptiles, fish, or birds. Warriors with the body of a bird of the valley, and men with the faces of ravens, were suckled by the old dragon Tiamat. And their type may be seen in the image of the twin Sut Horus, who has the head of a bird of light in front, and the nay, or black vulture of darkness, behind. Ta and his seven Knemu are the pygmies. As the black race was first on earth, so is it in the mirror of mythology. These are the people of the black heads, who are referred to on the tablets, and classed with reptiles, during a lunar eclipse. These typical black heads were the primeval powers of darkness, to which the old black aborigines in various lands were likened or assimilated by their despisers. In the Babylonian prayers we find the many-named mother goddess is invoked as, the mother who has begotten the black heads. These at times were intentionally confused and confounded with their elemental prototypes. Seven such races are described in the Bundahish, or Aboriginal creation, as the earth men, the men of the water, the breast-eared, the breast-eyed, the one-legged, the bat men, and the men with tails. These were the soulless people. They are also referred to by Esdras as the other people who are nothing, but be like unto spittle, that is, when compared with those who descended from the Father, as Adam, or Adam, on earth, and who worshipped a Father, as Adam, or Jehovah. In heaven. There were seven creations altogether, seven heavens, which were planetary in their final phase, seven creators, and seven races of men. 
And when the one God had been evolved he was placed at the head of the seven. Hence Ta in Egypt was called the father of the fathers, who in India are known as the seven Pitris. So Ahura Mazda, Ayaldabaoth, or Jehovah, was placed first in the later creation. The chief of the seven Ali equals Elohim as supreme one of the group became the Semitic Al or El, designated the highest god, who was the seventh as Saturn. So that El and Jehovah, Elohim are identical in their phenomenal origin, whilst El Shaddai is the same son of the old suckler who was Typhon in Egypt and Tiamat in Assyria. When in the second creation, and in the second chapter of Genesis, Jehovah Elohim forms man from the dust of the ground, and woman from the bone of man, Jehovah is that one God who sums up in himself the seven previous powers. Precisely as they were totaled in Adamare, Sevekare, Agni, or Ahiramista. He has been identified for us by name as one of the seven Gnostic Elohim, their Iao, or Jehovah. This God appears by name in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, and yet in verse 26 of chapter 4, it is stated that, Then began men to call upon the name of Jehovah. And again the same God, apparently, is announced by name in Exodus 6. 3, where he affirms that he has not been known previously by the name of Jah or Jehovah. But the difference between Jehovah Elohim and Jah or Iao is a fact which can only be determined by a knowledge of the phenomena. The Jewish Kabbalah and Gnosticism have never yet been grappled with or discussed in relation to mythology and the rootage in nature. The subject has only been nibbled at in a little grazing, with a go-as-you-please, modern interpretation of the doctrines concerning spirit and matter. The sevenfold one God is the same in origin, whether known by name as Jehovah, Iao Sabaoth, Sevek the sevenfold, Ea the fish with seven fins, Ra with seven souls, Agni with seven arms, the Gnostic Knubis or Heptoctus with seven rays. El of the seventh planet, or the dragon with seven heads. But there is another Jah or Iao, who is the lunar divinity, and who is that duad of the mother and child which becomes a triad as the child grows into the consort for the same mother. It is more ancient than the divine fatherhood, and preceded the lunisolar trinity of father, mother and son. This was the moon god who rode on the heavens by the name of Jah. And in this phase the zoo types were superseded by the human likeness, and the god was imaged as one in the threefold human character, when time was reckoned by the mother moon, the child moon and the virile new moon. The human family exalted to heaven as the divine father, mother and child followed the recognition of the personal fatherhood in sociology, and the knowledge that the lunar light was derived from the sun. Just as this institution superseded the mother and the brotherhood of the totemic stage on earth, so was it in heaven. In each phase the human sociology is reflected in the mirror of mythology. One Jewish sign of this trinity, given by Bochet, is a circle containing three yod letters, the numerical value of which is thirty or ten days to each of three phases of the moon. Another of the lunar types is the ass the three-legged ass of the Bundahish. In the Egyptian hieroglyphics the head of the ass is a sign for number thirty on the same ground. And on account of such typology the Jews were charged with being worshippers of an ass. Thus the Elohim were the seven powers elemental, preplanetary, or planetary. Jehovah Elohim was the sevenfold one as supreme amongst the planetary gods, and Jah is the threefold lunar deity, the trinity in unity and the likeness of the human family. These were again combined in a totality that is tenfold in the divine fatherhood. Hence the Hebrew letter Yod, the sign of ten, is a symbol of the ineffable name of Iao, Jah, or Jehovah. Thus the name of the Iao can be expressed in Roman numerals by the one and zero, which figure the number ten, and this figure of the tenfold totality so made up is both the heavenly man, called Adam Cadman by the Kabbalists. Composed of what they term the ten Sephiroth, and the supreme being worshipped by the whole of Christendom today as the one God, supposed to have been made known by divine revelation to a monotheistic race of men. The Egyptian Aten will show us how and why the Jews could use the name of Adon as an equivalent for that of Jah or the Yod, which has the numerical value of 10. Aten as a title of highness is determined by the numerical sign of 10, and therefore is an equivalent for I.O., or I.A.O. of the tenfold nature, 
unified at last in Aten or Adon as the Lord, who was God of the ten tribes. Such, to put briefly what I have elaborated elsewhere, was the origin in natural phenomena, and such was the unity at last attained in a tenfold totality by the Supreme One, the All, the unity not being initial but final, a pluribus unum. Mr. Gladstone's last and most pathetic plea pitiful as a flag of distress fluttering at the masthead of a doomed vessel visibly going down is that the tale in Genesis is beautiful if not true. He says, if we view it as a popular narrative it is singularly vivid, forcible, and effective, if we take it as a poem it is indeed sublime. But the question is, is it false or true? Have we been deluded, misled, and cheated? The essence of poetry even must be truth, and not falsehood, however attractive, must not mislead us on the pretext of being a revelation. The older I grow the faster I am losing my faith in all lovely unrealities. Consider the effects of such false teaching. Only the other day a child who had been taught that God made man out of the dust of the earth was watching an eddying cloud of dust being whirled into shape by the wind, when she cried, Oh, mother, come here. Look. I think God is creating another baby. Our mental standpoint has been made quite as childish with regard to other beginnings. And from every pulpit of the past we have been implored to remain as little children at the mother's knee. We have been taught and compelled to surrender our reason, doff our manhood and grovel like worms in the earth as the successful mode of wriggling our way through this world into heaven. We have been robbed by a thief in the night. Children have been cheated out of their natural senses, and the mental emasculation of men has taken the place of the physical once inculcated by the Christ, Math. 19, 12. Men who are sane on most other subjects will give up all common sense on this, and talk like intellectual lunatics. See how the teachers of the people, who ought to have learned better for themselves, continue all their life through to wear the cast-off vestments of ancient mythology. Take Mr. Ruskin as another typical example. He is in many ways a most diligent searcher after truth, and a worshipper of all things noble and beautiful. But he was so profoundly infected by the falsehood made religious to him in childhood as to be marked by it and mentally maimed for life. In his, Modern Painters, he tells us that, man perished in seeking knowledge, and, there is not any part of our nature, nor can there be through eternity, uninfluenced or unaffected by the fall. Tis most painful to see such a man, so human at heart, such a seer and lover of all loveliness believing so damnable a lie, and endorsing it not only for his own lifetime, but for so long as his writings may last. Because it was told to him in his own confiding childhood. It is good to waken the eyes of men to the beautiful, but still better to lead them to the enduring truth. So soon as my own eyes were opened wide enough to take in the immense imposture that has been based upon mythology, I gave up my chance of a seat upon the Mount of the Muses. And turned aside from the proffered crown of poetry as a seeker after verifiable certitude. And after all how can the picture of a divinest fool at the head of affairs with so certain a breakdown in the beginning be beautiful when such a representation reduces the drama of the whole universe into a most pitiful one-act farce? Any god who demands the worship of fear would be unworthy the service of love. Our modern atheism is mainly the result of this false theism being torn up by the root to expose its godlessness. Falsehood is always fraudulent. No matter how it may be poetized or painted, no matter how religiously we have believed it true, or how long we may have been imposed on by its fairness, and woe to the revelation that is proved to be false. Woe to the Sphinx when her secret is at last found out. It will then be her turn to be torn. The Hebrew Pentateuch has not only retarded the growth of science in Europe for eighteen centuries, but the ignorant believers in it as a book of revelation have tried to strangle every science at its birth. There could be and was but little or no progress in astronomy, geology, biology, or sociology until its teachings were rejected by the more enlightened among men the free thinkers and demonstrators of the facts. The progress has been in proportion to the repudiation. And, for myself, the nearer I draw towards death the more earnestly nay, vengefully do I resent the false teachings that have embittered my life not for myself only, but more for others, and most of all for the children.
Remember, the education of English children today is chiefly in the hands of the Orthodox teachers, who still give the Bible all the preference over nature and science. And who will go on deluding the innocent little ones as long as ever they are paid or permitted to do so. But what a dastardly shame it is for us to allow the children to be taught that which we know to be false, or do not ourselves believe to be true. The present calls upon you with an appealing voice to protect the unborn future against this terrible tyranny of the past. Do not any longer let the winding sheet of death be the swaddling bands put on the helpless little ones for life at their intellectual birth. It is appalling to think of the populations that have already passed on victimized, the lives that have been wrecked, the brains that have been bruised. And the hearts broken of those who have dashed themselves against these barriers to human progress and the freedom of thought, which were ignorantly erected and then made sacred in the name of God, by means of this Hebrew book of the beginnings. In short, by a literalization of mythology. That should inspire one effort more. Mightier than any made before. The barrier wall at last shall fall. The future must be free for all. In reply to Professor A. H. Sace. As an opponent of what may be termed the Aryan school of interpretation it has been my special work to show that mythology is not a farrago of foolish fables, nor the mere raving of words that have lost their senses. I have amply demonstrated the fact that the myths were no mere products of ancient ignorance, but are the deposited results of a primitive knowledge. That they were founded upon natural phenomena and remain the register of the earliest scientific observation. Those, however, who have not yet learned that mythology contains the gnosis of the earliest science, and is the great prehistoric record, are unable to teach us anything fundamental concerning it. They cannot read the record itself or verify it by continual reference to those natural phenomena on which it is based, and by which the truth of the interpretation has to be verified and tested. Without this foothold of fact being firmly established mythology resolves itself into a bog without a bottom. It appears to me that Professor Sace in his lectures on the Babylonian religions, is frequently dealing with matters which can only be fathomed by the comparative process. And that it is misleading to compare the ancient mythologies with the Egyptian omitted, whereas he rigorously rejects any light from that source. No mythological religion can be explained by itself alone. The comparative method is as the bringing together of flint and steel to strike the first spark for the necessary light. Without question or inquiry. Without collecting and comparing the data, without presenting his evidence for the assertion, he makes the following authoritative declaration. Apart from the general analogies which we find in all early civilizations, the script, the theology, and the astronomy of Egypt and Babylonia show no vestiges of a common source. H.I.B. Lect, page 136. There may be a pitfall intended in these delusive words as the mythology and so-called cosmology are entirely omitted. But you cannot have the astronomy apart from the mythology by which it was represented. The Prof. Says further there is one conclusive and fatal objection to the derivation from Egypt inasmuch as there is no traceable connection between the hieroglyphics of Egypt and the primitive pictures out of which the cuneiform characters were developed. Professor Sace is an expert and an authority passably orthodox, whose word will be taken for gospel by those who are not qualified to question it. I am not an acknowledged authority. I can only plead that my facts may have a hearing. Without knowing the facts we cannot attain the truth, and short of the fullest truth there is no final authority. The Egyptian hieroglyphics were developed out of the same primitive pictures and natural objects as the Akkadian. Both were direct transcripts from nature at first, and there is but one origin in nature for the earliest figures. Again he says, if Lepsius were right, in maintaining the opposite view, the primitive hieroglyphics out of which the cuneiform characters were evolved would offer resemblances to the hieroglyphics. But this is not the case. Even the idea of divinity is represented differently in them. In Chaldea it is expressed by an eight-rayed star, in Egypt, by a stone-headed axe, page 435. That is true, and yet in the sole illustration adduced by him the professor is wrong. The evidence of the first witness called is against the truth of his vaguely vast generalization. The star with the eight rays is likewise an Egyptian ideograph of divinity, 
it is a numerical figure for the Nunu or associate gods. Burton E. H. 34. This is the sign of the Pleroma of the Godhead, the divine Ogdoad. It was continued as a symbol of Horus Orion, the manifester of the eight, the mummy constellation of the only one who rose again. The eight-rayed sign was also a symbol of Hathor and of Tot because, like the eight-rayed or eight-looped star, it was the numerical figure of the eight gods, hence it was the sign of the abode as Hathor, and the manifester as Tot's men. As it is of Ishtar and of Asur. The Egyptians not only used this octave of divinity, they also give us the reason for using it. This numerical sign of the primary group of eight gods was not continued as the symbol of abstract divinity, and it is rare, but still it exists to refute the professor, who has to plumb far more profoundly before he touches bottom. The five-rayed star, Seb, is likewise the hieroglyphic symbol for a god or divinity, so that the professor's suggested inference is false twice over. It will never do to presume too much on the common ignorance concerning the buried past of Egypt, the rootage out of range, and the long development of the original ideographs. For example, the Egyptian pictograph of a soul is a human-headed bird, and that type is continued and the Babylonian dead are described as being clad like birds in a garment of feathers. Notwithstanding Mr. Says offhand dicta it will be seen in the future that Egypt was as truly the parent of hieroglyphics as she is of alphabets. But to show the professor's determination to avoid Egypt, after pointing to the fact that the statues from Tel Lo bear a great likeness to the Egyptian in the time of the pyramid builders. And after admitting that the Egyptian art of sculpture was infinitely superior to the Babylonian at that time, he quietly suppresses Egypt altogether on behalf of an entirely unknown school of sculpture in the Sinaitic Peninsula. p. 138. Anything rather than look Egypt honestly in the face. The professor is so anxious to hustle unacceptable facts out of sight and get rid of their testimony. He asserts that the existence of a Kushite race in Chaldea solely depends on a misinterpretation and a probable corruption of the text in the book of Genesis. But Cush is the black. The Cushites were the black race, and the aborigines of Babylonia were the black men of the monuments, the blackheads, of the Akkadian texts. Hence the god Cus, their deity of eclipse and darkness. The professor is all hind before with regard, or disregard, to the origins in the black land, the primeval birthplace. He is not yet out of the arc of the Semitic or the shadow of the Aryan beginnings, which have so darkened and deluded us. And has to advance backwards a good deal further beyond the Altaic boundaries. As I have already shown in the Natural Genesis, the beginnings of mythology in Egypt and Akkad are definitely identical. The old dragon of chaos and the abyss is the same weather called Tiamat, Tav, or Typhon. By Typhon I mean the beast that imaged the first great mother, Hippopotamus in front and crocodile behind, who therefore is the dragon of Egypt. Her name of Tep, Teb, or Tept is the original of Typhon. Tiamat equals Tath represents that abyss of the beginning which is the Egyptian Teft. This Teft is the abyss, the source, the void, the hole of the snake, the habitat of the dragon, the utrance or uterus of birth as place which preceded personification. Another name for the abyss is Abzu, the earlier form of which is the Egyptian Kepsh in the north that is, the pool of Kep, the hippopotamus or Typhon equals dragon. Tept and Tav are one, the water horse and dragon horse are one. In both forms they give birth to the well-known seven primal powers, elemental energies, or demons of physical force, first recognized as warring in chaos, who were afterwards cast out and superseded, or moralist as the seven wicked spirits. When the primary powers become the seven evil spirits, it is said of them, they are not known among the sentient gods. So in Egypt the same seven were denounced as the non-sentient children of inertness. And just as the Akkadian seven were continued and made the messengers and ministers of wrath to the supreme god, Anu, so did the Egyptian seven survive as the seven great spirits in the service of R.A. Their station being in the region of the Great Bear, the constellation of their mother. Writ, ch. 17. This mother goddess first brought forth in space and next in time. If we take the star of evening and morning as the type of the earliest time, 
then the mother Tiamat passes into Ishtar, goddess of the evening and the morning star. The dragon Tiamat was called the Bispis, identified by George Smith with the crocodile as the symbol of Egypt. And Ishtar equals Venus, the Lady of Dawn, was called Bispizi, which shows the survival of the same genetrix in her change of character out of space into time. Another proof of this continuity by transformation is furnished when Ishtar as Queen of Heaven, so rendered by Mr. Sace, called herself the Unique Monster, page 267. Precisely in the same way do we see the Typhonian genetrix Tarot in Egypt pass into his Tarot, whence Hesteroth or Ashtaroth, and Hathor, when the domesticated cow succeeded the water cow as the zoo type of his, as, Isis, or of Hathor. The lunar form of the goddess of love, in whose person the beast was transfigured into the beauty. According to ancient tradition, the culture of Chaldea was brought to that country by a fishman, who rose up in, the first year, from that part of the Red or Erythrosan Sea which borders upon Babylonia. The original of this type can be identified in Ea the fish god, deity of the house of the deep and divinity of wisdom. Whence came Ea, then, by the Red Sea? Lepsius says from Egypt so says Egypt herself. Professor Sace had previously denied our right to compare the myths of two different nations before their relationships have been established by language, and that by grammar, which is late, in preference to the vocabulary. Thus mythology is put out of court, and words are to be accounted of no weight. Still, it is well to remember that the professor has before now taken his stand on a false bottom that was found to be crumbling underfoot day by day. It is at least suggestive to find that the name and nature of Ea, the oldest Akkadian form of the One God, may be so fully explained by the Egyptian Ua, later Ea, for the One, the One alone, isolated as the only One. Also the thinker and the captain of the boat. It should be premised that the Egyptian U preceded the letter or sound of E, hence Ua equals Ea. The Egyptian Ua, which passed into Ea, also appears in the Akkadian Ua for the Supreme One, the Sole Lord or Chief. In one form Ea is the fish god, and the hieroglyphic sign for Ua equals Ea is fishing tackle. Ea was the deity of the deep, and Ua equals Ea is boat and captain both. Of course the fish was the earlier image, but the Egyptians had gone far ahead in substituting the work of their own hands for the primitive natural types. Ea is the wise god, the thinker and instructor, and Ua Ua, e.g., means to think, consider, meditate. Ea's prototype in the indefinitely earlier mythology of Egypt is number equals Neph, whose twofold nature is indicated by the two ways of spelling one name. As number he is lord of the inundation, as Neph he is the breath of those who are in the firmament. Neph signifies breath, and is also the name of the sailor. Ea is god of the watercourse and the atmosphere. Ea was the antelope of the deep. Number was the bearded he goat, the sea goat of the zodiac. One type of number is the serpent, as it is of Ea. Ea is said to represent the house, which is a in Egyptian. In a case of this kind, Professor Sace can only perceive or will only admit a general analogy. Egyptian also offers the likeliest original for the name of On or Oans, the Greek form of Ea, the fish, seeing that Ua equals Oa, and that An is the fish in Egyptian. Whilst An, to appear, to show, is determined by the fish in the water precinct, where the fish is the revealer who emerged from the waters as Eaan, or Oans. Denkmaler 3, 46c. If the original fish man came from Egypt, it would probably be as the crocodile equals dragon, the Typhonian type of both the ancient mother and her son Sevek. The crocodile is the fish that passes the day on dry land and the night in the waters. Its name of Sevek is identical with that of the number seven, and Ea is connected with a typical fish of seven fins. The crocodile, as Plutarch tells us, was a supreme type of the one god, or, as the name shows, of the sevenfold powers in one image. Sevek was the same good demon of one cult in Egypt that number Ra was in the other, but indefinitely earlier. To my apprehension, the Babylonian, house of the seven bonds of heaven and earth, is identical with the, house of the seven halls and seven stairways, assigned to Osiris, and the god Nebo as stellar, lunar, and planetary deity. 
as prophet and proclaimer, is identical with Satanub, later Nub and Anubis, in a dozen different aspects, whilst Nibonuscu equals the double Anubis. Further, the same great mother who was Venus as Hathor became the Mother Moon. Professor Says seems to think that where the moon is male it cannot also be female. If I am right, Ishtar must also have had a lunar character as the mother goddess. But Professor Says makes the point-blank assertion that Ishtar was not a goddess of the moon. p. 256. The moon was conceived of as a god, not as a goddess. He assures us that Ishtar was the spirit of earth and the goddess of love, the dual divinity of the planet Venus. But there is no male moon without the female goddess. It is not a question of conception, but of begettal. The observers were concerned with the lunar phases as natural facts, the mother or reproducing phase being first. The mother goddess brought forth the child of light, whether as Tot, Kunsu, Duzu, Tammuz, or Horus, and there is no lunar myth possible without the motherhood, which preceded the fatherhood. The child of the moon in one phase is her consort in the other. Thus when Ishtar makes up to Isdabar, the solar god who represents the later fatherhood, he twits her on the subject of her child consort, the bridegroom of her youth, whom she had so long pursued, like Venus wooing Adonis. In the legend of Tammuz and Ishtar the goddess, in descending to the underworld in search of her bridegroom, passes through seven gates. In each of these she is stripped of a part of her glory, represented as her ornaments. On her return she ascends through seven other gates, when her ornaments are restored to her, both being done according to ancient rules. These gates are the fourteen lower lunar mansions in which the lunar Osiris was torn into fourteen parts by Typhon, the power of darkness, when Isis descended in search of her beloved. They likewise coincide with the fourteen houses of judgment and the fourteen trials in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Which will explain the tests and punishments of the goddess as the pre-solar type of the suffering and triumphing souls who had to win their crown of justification in these fourteen trials. Besides which one of Ishtar's titles is that of Goddess 15, because that is the day of mid-moon in a sololunar month of thirty days. Professor Says leaves this title unnoticed, and then denies that Ishtar was a goddess of the moon. Moreover, there is another test to be applied in natural phenomena. The goddess in her course is credited with various infidelities. Not only is she charged with having clung year after year to her child consort Tammuz, as the bridegroom, amongst her victims are the eagle, Alala, the lion, the horse, Tabula the shepherd, and Isolanu, the gardener. These, as I read the mythos, refer to certain constellations, corner keepers or others, to be found in the lunar course, which cannot apply to the planet Venus or to the spirit of the earth. A sign of the lunar reckoning may be read in the statement that Ishtar rode the horse with whip and spur for seven leagues galloping, or during one quarter of the moon. Another lunar sign may be seen in the statement that Ishtar had also torn out the teeth of the lion seven by seven, or for seven nights together, in her passage through the lion quarter of the moon, eagle, horse, pegasus. And lion must probably stand for three of the four quarters of a lunar zodiac. Also the errand of Ishtar corresponds to the descent of Isis into the underworld in search of Osiris, who was torn into fourteen parts, and Isis was the lunar goddess. Moreover, Ishtar robbed her lover, Isolanu, of his eye, and in his blindness mocked him, just as Horus and Samson were each robbed of an eye. Lastly, the bow was lunar and Ishtar was goddess of the bow. Here, as elsewhere, we are left utterly adrift if we cannot secure a firm anchorage in the various natural phenomena themselves, by which the types of divinity must be determined. Professor Sais acknowledges his inability to account for the name of Ishtar. Its true etymology was buried in the night of antiquity. It is therefore quite useless to speculate on the subject. p. 257. And so, of course, there is an end of it, the last word being said. It is just possible, however, that Egypt, from which the professor looks religiously away, has something final yet to say on these matters. Not perhaps by such interpretation as Mr. Renewfs. Professor Sais admits that Ishtar appears as Esther in the Book of Esther. 
Here it is Hadassah who figures in the mythical character of Ishtar as the virgin dedicated or betrothed during twelve months. Whether the typical character is thus continued or not, it is the fact that the word Shtar is the Egyptian name of the betrothed female, and Shtar denotes that which is most mystical, secret, and holy, the very mother of mystery. Ishtar was the betrothed of Tammuz, she was called the bridal goddess, the goddess who was mystically betrothed to the child that grew up to become her own consort. She remained the mother of mystery. Thus Ishtar equals Venus, the goddess of love, was the star or betrothed, as the pre-monogamic consort or bride, i.e., the bridal goddess, who is denounced in Revelation as the great harlot. Again, it appears to me that much of what I have already said of Horus, of Tot, of Kumsu, Apollo, and other forms of the solely lunar hero is applicable not only to Mithras but to Merodach, and to an Assyrian god called Adar, provisionally. I may claim to have discovered the origin of this particular mythical character through seeking the foundations in natural phenomena. Adar is a solar hero who is especially related to night and darkness, and yet is a deity of light. He is a warrior and champion of the gods. He is the voice or supreme oracle of the divinities. He is the sun, the messenger, the revealer of the solar god hidden in the deep of the underworld. In other features he is like Tot and Kunsu, each of whom is the visible representative, the revealer, of the sun god by night. Adar was designated, Lord of the Date, just as Tot was called, Lord of the Date Palm. Adar was likewise, Lord of the Pig, just as Kunsu is the personified lord over the pig of Typhon in the disk of the moon at full, zodiac of Dendra. This is the god who, as Adonis, was slain by the pig or boar at one season of the year, but who was victor over it in the first of the six upper signs, which is the sign of Pisces in the zodiac of Dendra. This same character is continued in Tammuz, the deity who was first brought forth by the mother alone, to become her consort, the only one of a twofold nature and who was made the later revealer of a father in heaven as the child of the solar god when reborn as such of the mother moon. The month of Tammuz in the Aramaic calendar is, roughly, our month of June. This is the month of Duzu in the Assyrian calendar. In the Egyptian it was the month Mazor, as June in the sacred year, the month of the rebirth of the river and of the child Horus, who was reborn, Mes, of the river at the rebirth of the inundation. In the pre-Osirian mythos the child was the representative of Tum and to be the reborn, Mes, Tum or the child of Tum, as was Iumhept, the eternal word, would be renderable as Tumus or Mesu, just as Aremesu means the child of the solar god. Although I am not aware that Tum does appear under that form of name, and I am supposing that Tammuz was a development from the Egyptian Tum. For this reason, we are told in the texts that Tum is the duplicate of Aten equals Adon equals Adonai, and Adon equals Tammuz. Aten was the child god, Tum was the father. This child of the sun god was always born in the moon as the solar light of the world by night, the son of the spirit of the deep who was the hidden sun in the underworld. He is portrayed in the disk of the full moon both as Horus, or Tumemes, and Kunsu, planisphere and zodiacs of Dendra. Now, when the actual deluge began with the sun in the sign of the beetle, later crab, and in the month of Tammuz or Mazor, the moon rose at full in the sign of the sea goat, and the child was therefore reborn of the full moon in that sign. And so on through the three water signs, which are consequently solar on one side of the zodiac and lunar on the other. Rightly read this absolutely proves the Egyptian origin of the sign set in heaven in relation to the inundation, the lunar zodiac being first, and identifies the child of Tum as the original of the Akkadian Dumuzi, Apsu. And of the Semite, Timuz, or Dimas, of the flood. Not Noah's unfortunate deluge, but the inundation of the Nile, the deluge that began in the month Mes Horus or Tum Mes equals Tammuz, and culminated at the autumn equinox as it always has done, and did this year. The Akkadian name of the month Tammuz is Sukolna, Caesar of Seed, and to explain that we must go back to the sign of the beetle set above by the Egyptians. Because the beetle kepper began to roll up his seed at that time to preserve it from the coming flood. The beetle is the sign of cancer in the oblong zodiac of Dendra. 
Professor Say's account of Tammuz and Ishtar shows neither gauge nor grip of the real subject matter. He tells us that Adonis equals Tammuz was slain by the boar's tusk of winter, and his funeral festival was held in June because the bright sun of the springtide was then slain and withered by the hot blasts of summer, pages 227-9. But here is the true rendering as restored according to the Egyptian myth, which was extant in the pre-monumental times of the Shu Zenhar, who are claimed to have been the rulers for 13,000 years before the time of Menes. The solar god as source of life was reborn in natural phenomena, as his own child the Horus of light in the moon, the child of the lotus in the water, the seed as the bread of life in the corn. In each phase he was opposed by Sut Typhon in the form of darkness, drought, or death. Previous to the inundation he was pierced by Sut in the Parchain drought. Then it was the errand of Isis as of Ishtar to fetch the water of life. This she did as the lunar mistress of the water. At the birth of the river in Mazor Tammuz, the moon rose at full in the first lunar water sign, whither she had gone for the water of life in the underworld or, astronomically, entered the lowest signs. Here is one proof. Papsicle is the regent of Capricorn, the first water sign, and he is the messenger that hurries off to the sun god, who is certainly not the dead Tammuz, with the news of Ishtar's arrival in search of the fountain of life. Isis in her search was accompanied by Anup, her golden dog, and in the Hermine zodiac Anup is stationed in the sign of the sea goat, where he is shaking the sistrum of Isis to frighten away the Typhonian influences, Plutarch. Here is additional evidence. When the moon rose at full in these three signs they represented the waters of life to Egypt, in accordance with the then flowing inundation of the Nile. But when the sun itself entered the sign of Capricorn, in winter, the passage became the crossing of the waters of death, for the solar god, or the souls in the eschatological phase. Hence the typical, two waters, of the Egyptian mythos, called the pools of the north and south. My contention is, that the imagery thus set in heaven to reflect the seasons on earth was Egyptian from the first, and that it can only be rightly read in the original version according to time and season in Egypt. Professor Sais makes the perplexing assertion that the month of Tammuz was called in the Akkadian calendar the month of the errand of Ishtar. But the month Kianana, formerly read Ki Jingarna, the message of Nana or Ishtar, is Ulyalu, two months later than Tammuz. And the message of Ishtar, as Virgo, in August, is not to be converted into the legend of her descent into Hades in June, when the sun was in Cancer and the full moon was in Capricorn. Meridak represents the sun in Scorpio, as the deity of that sign, but this does not mean that he is the sun itself. In the Egyptian mythos it was as the sun in Scorpio that Osiris was betrayed to his death by Typhon. Then his son, Horus equals Meridak, was reborn of the moon in the bull, the first of the six upper signs, to become the avenger of his victimized father. Thus as heir apparent of the solar god, the hero comes to the aid of the moon during an eclipse, and overcomes the dragon of darkness. This revealer of the father god in natural phenomena, under whatsoever name, is supremely important as the mythical character that supplied the type to current Christology. When the scientific fact was first discovered the doctrine of a divine trinity, consisting of father, mother, and child, was then established. The child was the light of the sun, his father being the hidden source in the underworld, his mother the moon, as reproducer of that light. This reflex image of the father's glory, his light of the world by night, the representative of his power in the six upper signs, whilst the sun was in the six lower signs, is the child as Horus, as the reborn Tum equals Tumimies, Tammuz, Apollo, Meridak. The hero, the warrior against the dragon, and the powers of darkness at night or during the lunar eclipse, the Masu, the anointed, the only begotten, furnished by the past as a factor in the theology of the present. Which meets with no recognition whatsoever from Professor Sais, or from any other writers on mythology who are known to me. Except in the technique of his scholarship, one sees but little sign that the professor has thought out his far-reaching subject fundamentally. For example, Barrasso's repeats a Babylonian description of nature, which he distinctly affirms to have been allegorical. The professor admits, page 392, that these composite creatures were really the offspring of totemism. That is, 
they were symbolical zootypes. And yet he can say of them, we may see, in these, a sort of anticipation of the Darwinian hypothesis. But men with wings, two heads, and horses' feet, centaurs, mermaids, and sphinxes, belong to a mythical mode of representing ideas, not to, imperfect, first attempts of nature, in accordance with the doctrine of development. Such confusion of thought is likely to make the truth of the matter doubly indistinguishable. Again, he tells us that, the god was a beast before he became a man, whereas he means that the primary forces recognized in nature first were represented by zootypes before the superhuman powers were imaged in the human likeness. He does not define what he means by worship or religion when he imports these terms into the remoter past, and thus sets up a false standard of judgment. Worship of the heavenly bodies was nothing more than the looking up to them as the tellers of time, even though they may be called oracles. The Cronian gods were only types of time in a world without clocks and watches. He speaks of theological conceptions becoming mythical, whereas the mythical representation preceded the theological phase. He can find no trace of ancestor worship in the early literature of Chaldea, page 358. But I doubt whether a man who resolves the Zman of Socrates into an intuition, can know how or where to look for the proof. He tells us the earliest Babylonian religion was purely shamanistic, only the spirits it recognized were not spirits in our sense of the word, whichever sense that may be. Now shamanism is the most primitive kind of spiritualism, but it includes human spirits as well as the elementals. And as human spirits include the spirits of ancestors, and as Molil is the lord of ghost world, and Nurgle is the god of apparitions, called the Kadi, which agrees with the Egyptian Kadi for the dead. Then the shamanism of Babylonia must have included a worship of ancestors. The non-evolutionist cannot truly interpret the past for us, even when reinforced by the non-spiritualist. It matters little to me that Professor Sayce should ignore my work, but it does matter greatly to him that he should have to ignore all the facts which are fatal to his assumptions. He cannot get rid of the facts by thus ignoring them. He cannot establish a negation by closing his eyes to all that is positively opposed to his conclusions. In trying to do so he has blindly shut out all that Egypt had to say and show and suggest. That simple policy was practiced long ago by the ostrich, and the ruse is generally acknowledged to have proved a preposterous failure. As the superstructure of Assyriology is now reared and settling down securely upon fixed foundations, I am willing to discuss the matters here mooted in the press or debate with Professor Sace upon the platform. Where I will undertake to demonstrate the common origin of the mythological astronomy, and prove that the Egyptian is the primeval parent of the Babylonian. Meanwhile the foregoing pages and the following comparative list, not to say anything of the natural genesis, contain a sufficient answer to his declaration that the two have nothing in common but general analogies. Egyptian. Babylonian. Teft, the abyss equals Taf, the abyss. Kepch, pool of hippopotamus. Equals Abzu, the deep. Bao, the hole or void. Equals Bahu, the void personified. Tep, Typhon, the dragon. Equals Tav equals Tiamat, the dragon. Matit, storm god. Equals Matu, storm god. Isis as the scorpion. Equals Ishtar as the scorpion. Triad of Isis, Nephthys, and Horus. Equals Triad of Ishtar, Tilil, and Tammuz. Ra, god of the double house. Equals Ye, god of the house. Five celestials born of Seb equals five Anunas, or spirits of heaven. Seven evil spirits. Equals seven evil spirits. Seven servants of Ra equals seven servants of Anu. The Nu Nu, eight gods, or spirits. Equals the Anunas, or eight spirits of earth. The put circle of nine spirits, or gods of equals the Ijijai, nine spirits of heaven. Heaven. Number. God of the deep and inundation, equals Ea, God of the deep and the good and the good wind, wind. Ua equals Ea, the captain. Equals Ea, God of the boat. Hathor, the white heifer. Equals Ishtar, the white heifer. 
Shitar, the betrothed. Equals Ishtar, the bridal goddess. Anup, the announcer. Equals Nebo, the announcer. Double Anubis. Equals Nebo and Nusku. Tatkunsu. Equals Adar. Horus, lunisolar hero. Equals Meridak. Tum as Aten or the Mesu. Equals Tammuz. Kek, god of darkness. Equals Kus, god of darkness. A, moon, lunar divinity. Equals A, lunar divinity. Cake, a spirit. Equals Ijijai, spirits. Rupa, the prince. Equals Robu, the prince. Narau, the chief, the victor. Equals Nera, the victor. Ser, chief, head. Equals Sar, king. Tabu, great bear or hippopotamus. Equals Dabu, the great bear or hippopotamus. Gerald Massey. P.S. By the by, is Professor Sace equally certain that he is correct in his dates of precession? He gives the entrance of the vernal equinox into the signs of the bull and ram as being about the years, 4700 and 2500 BC. I found that Cassini and other astronomers gave the figures 4565 and 2410 BC. And from data kindly supplied to me by the present Astronomer Royal from independent calculations made at Greenwich, these were the dates, corroborated and confirmed. The Devil of Darkness in the Light of Evolution Fuller Egyptian and Gnostic data, with references to authorities, may be found in the author's Natural Genesis. There are two things which I have come to look upon as constituting the unpardonable sin of the father and mother against the helpless innocence of infancy. The one is in allowing their little children to run the risk of blood poisoning such as was once suffered by a child of mine from the filthy fraud of vaccination. The other is in permitting the mind and soul of their children to be inoculated with the still more fatal virus of the old, false, orthodox dogmas and delusions. By allowing them to believe that the fables of ancient mythology are the sacred and solely true word of God, if they are found in the Hebrew scriptures the one book of the religiously ignorant. Generation after generation we learn, unlearn, and relearn the same lying, legendary lore, and it takes the latter half of all one's lifetime to throw off the mass of corrupting error instilled into us during the earlier half. Even when we do break out and slough it off in a mental eruption, and have to find ourselves in utter rebellion against things as they are. Unfortunately, the mass of people never do get rid of this infection, nor of the desire to give their disease to others. The fact of the matter is, the Christian dogmas and doctrines began as such with being unintelligible and inexplicable. They were to remain as mysteries, and any true explanation of them is death to their false pretensions. It is my method to explode by explaining them. Take the doctrine of the Trinity for example. Can any theologian throughout all Christendom today give us any intelligible account of its origin and primary meaning? Not one. For that we must go to mythology, which was earlier than our theology, and which alone enables us to explain its primitive mysteries. The natural genesis of the Trinity was found, and is to be re-found, in lunar phenomena. The moon, in mythology and chronology, was a time measurer of a threefold nature. At fifteen days of age, or full moon, it was the mother moon. Hence Ishtar, in Akkad, is designated goddess fifteen. The lessening, waning moon was her little one, the child of the moon, who became the virile one, the adult, as the horned new moon, the reproducer who was fabled to rebeget himself on the mother moon, and thus become his own father. As a natural mode of describing natural phenomena. These three are eternally one in external nature, a trinity always manifesting monthly, and the triple aspect was humanly, or naturally, expressed by means of the mother, child, and reproducing male which three are also one in the total human being. In the Christian iconography, you will sometimes see the Virgin Mary enthroned in the new moon, with the child in her arms, and these two, with the horned or phallic moon, constitute the Christian trinity in unity. Such was the primitive mode of thinking in things, afterwards continued in a mystical or doctrinal phase. Such, I affirm to be the origin of the trinity in mythology, 
which preceded religion. And when this is applied abstractly, to the nature of deity, or to mind and nature, by means of metaphysic, the result is an imposition, and he or she who practices imposition, consciously or not, is an impostor. No such thing can be known as a triune or triangular god, but we are able to show how such types originated. When our words are examined, we shall frequently find that our metaphysic has been abstracted, or falsely filched from primitive physics, as was the Trinity by Plato, which was continued by the Christian fathers. Who tell us that but for Plato they would never have understood the doctrine of the Trinity. As with the Trinity, so it is with the origin of the theological devil. The crucial question of the savage man, Friday, was too fundamental for the theology of Robinson Crusoe. Friday asks, but, if God much strong, much mighty as the devil, why God no kill the devil, and so make him no more wicked? Crusoe, imitating other theologists, not knowing what to say, pretended not to hear him. I am told this passage has been omitted from certain recent editions. To give an answer to that question we shall have to go round to work. It would never do to begin a lecture on this subject like the well-known chapter headed, Snakes in Iceland, which consisted of the statement, There are no snakes in Iceland. If I did, my lecture might be summed up in the words, There is no devil. But every belief, superstition, and mental type, had its natural genesis once, the devil included. The result of fourteen years' research in the records of the past is a personal conviction that the human mind has long suffered an eclipse, and been darkened and dwarfed in the shadow of ideas, the real meaning of which has been lost to the moderns. Myths and allegories, whose significance was once unfolded to the initiates in the ancient mysteries, have been adopted in ignorance. And reissued as real truths divinely vouchsafed to mankind for the first and only time when found in the Hebrew writings. The earlier religions had their myths interpreted by means of the oral and unwritten wisdom. We have ours misinterpreted. And a great deal of what has been imposed upon us as God's direct, true, and sole revelation to man, is a mass of inverted myths, under the shadow of which men have been cowering as timorously as birds in the stubble. When a kite in the shape of a hawk is held hovering overhead to keep them down. As I have seen it practiced in England. The parables and types of the primeval thinkers have been elevated to the sphere, as the hawk, or serpent, the bull, or the crab, that give names to certain groups of stars. And we are precisely in the same relationship to these religious parables and allegories as we should be to astronomical facts, if we thought the serpent and bull, lion, sea goat, and ram were real animals up in heaven. Instead of constellations with symbolical names. The Jews picked up various traditions of other races. Moses, they tell us, was an initiate in all the learning of the Egyptians. And these myths have been so handled as to efface their primitive features altogether. They have been so, sweated, down, by later theologies, to make capital get gold dust, as it were, out of them that they can only be recognized by comparison with the earlier copies yet extant among other nations from which the Jews derived their versions. Fossil remains, found in the lowermost strata of human thought, have been preserved as divine patterns for the ignorant and superstitious of later ages. The simple realities of the earliest times were expressed by signs and symbols, and these have been taken and applied to later thought, and converted into theological problems and metaphysical mysteries. For which our theologians have no basis whatever, and can only wrangle over NL air. They cannot touch solid earth with one foot when they want to kick opponents with the other, and when they try to bite you very viciously they find that they have only been furnished with a set of teeth that are false. The only possible way of exposing the false pretensions of theological dogmas is by explaining them from the root, and showing what they meant as mythos. The orthodox teaching which is founded on the fall of man, is shattered, even as a pane of glass is fractured at a blow, when once we can apply the doctrine of development. The Hebrew devil, or Satan, means the opponent or adversary, and the first great natural adversary recognized by primitive man was darkness simply darkness, the constant and eternal enemy of the light, that is. The power of darkness was literal before it became metaphorical, moral, or spiritual. Hence darkness itself was the earliest devil or adversary, the obstructor and deluder of man, 
the eternal enemy of the sun. We speak of the jaws of darkness, and darkness was the vast, huge, swallower of the light, night after night. We know this was identified as the primary power, because the primitive or early man reckoned time by nights, and the years by eclipses. This mode of reckoning was first and universal. So many darks preceded so many days. The dark power is primarily in all the oldest traditions and cults of the human race. Hence sacrifice was first offered to the powers of darkness. The four words of universal mythology are, there was darkness. All was dark at first within the mind. And the all was the darkness that created dread without. The influence of night, the eclipse, and the black thunder cloud being first felt, the primitive man visibly emerges from the shadow of darkness as deeply impressed and indelibly dyed in mind as was his body with its natural blackness. The black man without was negroid within, as his reflection remains in the mirror of mythology. The darkness then, in natural phenomena, was the original devil that put out the light by swallowing it incessantly, as the subtle enemy, the obstructor, deluder, and general adversary of man. The first form of the devil was female, called the dragon of darkness, who was Tiamat in Akkad, and Typhon in Egypt. Typhon gave birth to Sut, who became the Egyptian devil our Satan and who was represented by the black jackal, the voice of darkness, and Sut, the black one, gives us the name of Sut, the black thing. Angromanus, the Persian devil, was the black one of the two powers of light and darkness. Primitive man, however, did not imagine or personify a devil behind visible phenomena, that caused the darkness. Darkness itself was the devil, and even as late as the Parsi Bundahish, which means the aboriginal creation, external darkness is the devil. The seven devils or seven heads of the old dragon, in the Akkadian myths of creation, are born in the mountains of sunset, which shows the same natural genesis in physical phenomena. They had their birthplace where the sun went down. At the same place, in the west, the Egyptians stationed the great crocodile that swallowed down the lights, sun, moon, and stars, as they set each night, in its wide-open jaws of darkness. Hence the crocodile was an ideograph of the swallowing darkness and of earth, or the waters below, called the abyss, and the tail of the crocodile remained in the Egyptian hieroglyphics as the sign of cam that is, of blackness or darkness. The crocodile was the typical dragon of the waters below, the old Typhon, as the serpent was of the waters, or overwhelming darkness, above. Hor Apollo tells us the Egyptians represent the mouth by a serpent, because the serpent is all mouth. This was another figure of the swallower, as the Akek and the Apap serpent. Akek signifies darkness, and Apap means that which rises up vast and gigantic in short, the monster the typical Apap being based on the great African rock snake. Here, then, is the reason why the mythical dragon and the old serpent are identical or interchangeable in mythology, each being a representative of the devil of darkness and of Satan, that old serpent. Who imaged the evil which was first perceived in physical phenomena? Out of the darkness leapt the lightning bolt, and in the deep waters lurked another subtle foe of life, and thus the jaws, the fong, and the sting of death were assigned to the devil of darkness. Who gradually assumed the character of man's mortal enemy that brought death into the world. The course of this development can be traced from the beginning, in physical darkness, to the culmination, in a psychotheistic phase. For everything yields to an application of the evolutionary method and you may depend upon it that evolution has come into the world to stay. And evolution and the Hebrew Genesis cannot coexist in the same mental world. The earliest mode of representing the eternal alternation of external phenomena called night and day, or darkness and light, the good and bad, is to be found in the universal myth of the two brothers, who are born twins. Very imperfect versions of which may be found in the legends of Cain and Abel, and of Esau and Jacob. In this myth, the dark and day are born twins of the great mother, and these brothers are portrayed as always being at enmity with each other, and in conflict before their birth, as are the darkness and the light when struggling at dawn. They fight one another in the effort of each to get born first. This becomes the well-known struggle of the birthright, which is universal in mythology. 
Far more perfect versions of the same mythos are extant among the blacks of Australia, the Red Indians of America, the Bushmen and Hottentots of Africa, more perfect, because simpler, nearer to nature, and less moralized. It is the myth of Sut Horus in Egypt. Sut Horus is the dual manifester of dark and light, who is depicted with the double head of the black vulture of night and the golden hawk of light, upon one body. The dark one was born first, because darkness was first cognized. But they both continued to struggle for supremacy after birth, as they had done before it, because they dramatized the ceaseless and endless alternation of night and day, of dark and light, seen in the heavens at even dawn. In the orb of the moon, and the lengthening of darkness, or of light, in autumn and in spring. Here again the dark power is the devil, the bad dev, and the light is the good power, the bright dev. The same conflict, based upon the alternation of light and darkness, is portrayed as the struggle of Asti. George, our solar hero, who conquers the dragon just as Horus overthrows the Apap dragon upon the monuments of Egypt. And when the devil's knell is rung annually at Horbury, in Yorkshire, England, that is in celebration of the death of the dragon of darkness, and the same custom is also continued in ringing out the old year, on the last night in December. When in New South Wales I picked up a tradition of the blacks. The devil, called Mullion, lived in a very tall tree, at Gira, on the Barwon River, and used to eat black fellows. They tried to burn down this vast tree, in which the devil of darkness dwelt, but the fires were always put out by invisible spirits. Then they got a red mouse, put a lighted straw in his mouth, and started him up the tree. The loose bark caught fire, the tree blazed for weeks, the devil was burned out, and never came back again. This red mouse is also a type of Horus in Egypt. Naturally, then, the devil of darkness was the first divinity, because the dark power is primal. When it came to worshipping, or, rather, to propitiating, by offering the fruits of fear, it was the dark power that predominated, because this struck terror and elicited fear. Primos in Orb Deus fake it to more. Sometimes these twins of darkness and light are called the ugly and beautiful brothers. And here the persistence of the mythical types may be noticed, for these two are not only continued as the Sut Horus, or double Horus of Egypt, but they are likewise extant in that museum of mythical types, the Catacombs of Rome. As the twin Christs, one of which is portrayed as the beautiful youth. The other is the little, old, and ugly Christ. Just as it was in the pre-Christian times, from which these figures were a Gnostic survival. Next, mind becomes an element in the manifestation of phenomena. And in the American myths, the born twins are called the bad mind and the good mind. In this phase the twin brothers are not only mental, they are also moralized on their way to becoming the dual divinity, or modern god and devil. In the Avesta, and other Persian scriptures, for example, the twin brothers can be traced from the natural genesis in phenomena, as light and darkness, to their becoming personified as divinity and devil, in Ahura Mazda, the god of mental light. And Angramanus, the devil of mental darkness. Here the older bogey of the night has been found out. Men had dipped into the dark, and suffered from the shadow of eclipse so long, and passed through them so often and so safely, that their essential unreality was discovered at last. Thus Angromanus, the black mind, is only accredited with the creation of all that is untrue, unreal, and utterly delusive in nature. The light had now become the enduring reality, and darkness was only its deluding shadow. They now recognized that the dark one in the physical, mental, or moral domain, was only negative and negational. The bright one, the god of light, the good mind, was the supreme being, the reality, therefore the author of all that was finally real and eternally true. These are the two causes of the universe it is said. They were united from the beginning, and, therefore, are called the twins, and the Persian, Revelation, contains the gnosis and explanation of the doctrine concerning these twin spirits. Such was the natural origin of that doctrine of duality, which is discussed nowadays as a metaphysical mystery, and as if it were a reality from the root of it, made known to the world by direct revelation. The origin of good and evil in the nature of man considered as a being of flesh and spirit, 
as the personal embodiment of two opposite principles. Assumed to have a spontaneous or automatic tendency towards good on the part of the one which is supposed to originate in the spirit, and the other to originate in the flesh, as a natural antagonist. Is traceable to this most primitive interpretation of the duality called good and evil in external phenomena, which was continued in the mental and moral, and lastly in the psychotheistic phase of thought. In its latest stage the doctrine is destructive of individual responsibility in man and of personal unity in deity, or the operating intelligence. There was no revelation, no new point of departure in phenomena, nothing added to nature or human knowledge in these later views of mythology into metaphysic, philosophy, or theology. In which the supposed revelation of newer truth was largely founded on a falsification of the old. We are not only contemporaries of savage men in many of our current customs and benighting beliefs. We are also the victims of his leavings various of our superstitions being the primitive fetishism that still survives in the last stage of perversion. But now for a development of the devil. In Egypt the old devil of darkness, as Sut Typhon or Sevek, the crocodile-headed divinity, acquired a soul in the stars and a place in heaven, as Plutarch says. To him was given the crocodile or dragon constellation in the planisphere, whose casting out of heaven is described in the book of Revelation, and in the Persian Baman Yasht, where Sut, or Sevek the dragon, that old serpent, is identified as Satan, the eternal adversary of souls, just as it is in the Egyptian ritual of the dead. Thus, the devil that first rose up in revolt, as the natural darkness, called the dragon of the deep, the rebel against the light god, was gradually transformed into a supposed starry or spiritual being, the vice dew of the dark, who, in the Christian scheme, is still considered to be the supreme power of the two, or if their dominions be equally divided, he is supreme below and the light god above just as it had been from the beginning. And, finally, our theology has made the primal shadow of physical phenomena substantial in the mental sphere, and from the external darkness of that beginning extracted and internalized the modern devil in the end. I have now given you a sample of what I meant by our being in the shadow of ideas whose original signification we have not understood. There is no devil such as Milton saw. And as you must know, much current theology has been derived from Paradise Lost. The hawk that has been flying or flown to keep timid souls cowering down to the ground, is not the real bird of prey after all. You may trace every motion of it to the end of the string held in the puller's hand. When you go close up to it, the devil of theology is not alive. It is a bogus bugbear, hideous, but harmless as that scarecrow in the field, the imposture of which had been found out and despised by a small bird who had built its nest. And laid and hatched its eggs in one of the grim monster's waistcoat pockets. We have an old saying that the devil is an ass. But, in Egypt, the devil as Sut or Satan was the ass the ass that carried the Christ as Horus, the Savior. This was the ass that was figuratively kicked out in the Christian sport of beating the ass, when that pastime used to be practiced up and down the aisles of Christian churches, and the priest used to bray three times. And the people responded like asses. The German devil was at one time the red-bearded thunder, the voice of darkness. Which takes us back to Sut Typhon, who, as Plutarch informs us, was of a reddish complexion. It is common for our giants to be endowed with a red streaming comet's tail of a beard. Our forefathers, the Norsemen, had little respect and no reverence for the devil. And as to hell, why, if you did not get to heaven, then hell was the next best place in the other world, if there were but two. To be sure, they were badly off for firewood in the Norse hell. And spirit sat shivering in the presence of the cold, uncomfortable goddess Hela, who was blue with cold, and it was trying to think how they were keeping it up overhead they who had climbed to the top of the tree, Yggdrasil. Or secured a seat in Valhalla where the wine cups flowed and the faggots flared, and the merry dancing flames might be reflected on the windows of a heaven that was closed against them. For the Northmen knew nothing of a hell of everlasting fire. If they had, it might have proved the more attractive place of the two, as one of our missionaries once discovered. He had gone out to Greenland to carry the gospel of good tidings, and illustrate it with the aid of an eternal fire. But he found himself in the wrong latitude as regards the effect of fire. 
he pictured it in the warmest colors, and was surprised at the result. Instead of seeing awe and terror whitening their faces, or the tears trickling down them, as he had expected, they were blubbering in quite another fashion, for the whale's fat began to run and glisten on their relaxed faces. Which he saw rounding and brightening into full moons of happiness and jollity. And instead of wringing their hands at the prospect he had pictured, they sat as if spiritually warming them at this everlasting bonfire, that was so earnestly warranted never to go out. If this were the gospel of good tidings, why had they not heard the glorious truth before? Such a welcome and delightful change from the life they had lived in their inclement, wintry climate. They had never dreamed of conditions so delightful. So far from shunning such a place forever, as he desired them to do, they were quite ready and willing, all of them to go to it at once, and stay there forever. The mythical devil was pretty much dying out, until it was revived and sublimated by the theology of Luther, Calvin, and Milton. The Romish church did not deify the devil as the Protestants have done. She was better acquainted with the tradition of his creation and the earthly nature of his character. It was her cue to keep dark. And the devil of the Middle Ages is a poor devil enough without grandeur or terror. A very fallen intelligence, indeed, whom Romish saints can tweak by the nose with red-hot tongs, or the simplest countrymen have cunning enough to outwit. Instead of the archenemy of God and man, majestic in his dark divinity, infernally inspired, as Milton pictures him, he has become a grotesque image. The storyteller's most popular figure of fun, on a par with the giants of our nursery lore, whom the clever, redoubtable, little Jack, always gets the better of. Indeed, both devil and giant as well as the serpent and dragon, had one origin, and the orthodox Satan is, after all, the popular monster of mythology. Luther and Calvin doubled the devil, and placed one at each end of their scheme of things, the upper or bright god being rather the worst devil of the two. They put the doctrine of dualism as perplexingly as did the Negro preacher who told his congregation there were but two roads open to them one of these led directly to destruction, and the other went straight to perdition. Stop a bit, brother, cried one of the congregation, hold hard, whilst I get out ob dis. And there are many people who desire to become followers of that Negro, and get out ob dis. The Satan of sacerdotal belief, then, is not a being for God or man to kill, but an effigy and shoddy that only wants to be ripped up to show you that it is stuffed with sawdust. Some people may cry out in an agony of earnestness, as Charles Lamb stammered in his fun, but this is doing away with the devil, ddd don't deprive me of my devil. We hope for better things. How shall we be able to force people into thinking as we do, and frighten them into our fold of faith, for the glory of God, if we have no devil for our ferocious shepherd dog? And there is no doubt but that, in giving up the orthodox hell and ancient devil, we are losing one of the most potent motive powers. Our difficulty is how to find a substitute for the appeal to selfish fear. The fact remains that the devil is a fundamental part of the Christian scheme. No devil, no redeemer. And those who will yell at me, and call me a blasphemer, know that well enough. I sympathize with them. They begin to see dimly, what we see clearly, that Orthodox Christianity is answerable with its life for the literal truth of these stories of the devil, the fall of man, and the doctrine of a dying deity's atonement. Its life is staked upon the stories being true, and its life must pay the forfeit of their being found to be false. And false they are, however their defenders may squirm and wriggle, until the backbone of all manhood is changed into caoutchouc. I can imagine that people who are not sure of their own souls, whether they are lost or are not yet found, unless their Hebrew genesis be true, will feel the world is a rather hollow affair without their accustomed devil. It will be like depriving them of half their heaven on earth, and the whole of it hereafter, to take away the devil. What on earth, or in another place, will they do? Those who are so virulent by nature for the Calvinistic sulfur, if, after all, there is no brimstone there, and they have passed out of this life with their itch for hell red hot upon them, and there is no old scratch to console them after all. One would like to believe in just a very little hell for their dear sake. They have so devoutly believed in a big one for ours. There is devil enough, 
however only of another kind than the one we have played with. We have talked of the devil long enough. But to a spiritualist, for instance. The devil exists for the first time in some of the facts made known by modern spiritualism facts which are as much matters of personal experience and constant verification to myself and myriads of others as are those of your ordinary life. Think for a moment tentatively of there being a personal motive on the other side, a vested interest in our wrongdoing degraded spirits present with us in the enjoyment of our most secret sins the ghosts of old dead drunkards haunting the drinker's live warm atmosphere. Because in that there may pass off into spirit world some ghostly gust of the old delirious delight, and you may get at a real, present, self-interested, manifold, tempting devil that altogether surpasses the mythological monster of theology. The devil and hell of my creed consist in that natural nemesis which follows on broken laws, and dogs the law-breaker, in spite of any belief of his, that his sins, and their inevitable results can be so cheaply sponged out. As he has been misled to think, through the shedding of innocent blood. Nature knows nothing of the forgiveness for sin. She has no rewards or punishments nothing but causes and consequences. For example, if you should contract a certain disease and pass it on to your children, and their children, all the alleged forgiveness of God will be of no avail if you cannot forgive yourself. Ours is the devil of heredity, working in two worlds at once. Ours is a far more terrible way of realizing the hereafter, when it is brought home to us in concrete fact, whether in this life or the life to come, than any abstract idea of hell or devil can afford. We have to face the facts beforehand. No use to whine over them impotently afterwards, when it is too late. For example. In the olden days when immortals. To earth came visible down. There went a youth with an angel. Through the gate of an eastern town. They passed a dog by the roadside. Where dead and rotting it lay. And the youth. At the ghastly odor. Sickened and turned away. He gathered his robes about him. And hastily hurried thence. But not annoyed the. Angel's clear, pure, immortal sense. By came a lady, lip luscious. On delicate, mincing feet. All the place grew glad with her presence. All the air about her sweet. For she came in fragrance floating. And her voice most silvery rang. And the youth, to embrace her beauty. With all his being sprang. A sweet, delightsome lady. And yet, the legend saith. The angel, while he passed her. Shuddered and held his breath. Only think of a fine lady who, in this life, has been wooed and flattered, sumptuously clad, and delicately fed, for whom the pure, sweet, air of heaven had to be perfumed as incense. And the red rose of health had to fade from many young human faces to blossom in the robes she wore, and every sense had been most daintily feasted. And her whole life summed up in one long thought of self-think of her finding herself in the next life a spiritual leper, a walking pestilence a personified disease a sloughing sore of this life which the spirit has to get rid of an excrement of this life selfishness at which all good spirits stop their noses and shudder when she comes near. Don't you think if she realized that as a fact in time, it would work more effectually than much preaching? The hell of the drunkard, the libidinous, the bloodthirsty, or gold-greedy soul, they tell us, is the burning of the old devouring passion which was not quenched by the chills of death. The crossing of the cold, dark river even was only as the untasted water to the consuming thirst of Tantalus. In support of this, evolution shows the continuity of ourselves, our desires, passions, and characters. As the Egyptians said, whoso is intelligent here will be intelligent there. And if we haven't mastered and disciplined our lower passions here, they will be masters of us for the time being hereafter. There is no such possibility as deathbed salvation. No such thing as being, jerked to Jesus, if you are converted on the scaffold. These old passions of ours burn and burn, and will and must burn on till they burn out. That, they tell us, is as absolutely necessary a process in the spiritual world as in the case of a fever in the physical body, which may be fed frightfully by the impurities of the previous life. Moreover, the fever will rage so long as it is supplied with fresh fuel. 
So long as the infatuated spirit does not try to put out the fire, and give the spiritual nature its one chance of throwing off the infernal disease, but lusts in imagination after that which fed the flame at first. And stirs the fire that kindles with every sigh for the old flesh pots of evil passion still. And will come back to earth to prowl in filthy places, and snuff the ill odors of the lowest animal life, seeking in vain for some gust of satisfaction in shadowy apparition, as a spirit earthbound, and self-bound to earth. Such is the teaching inculcated by our facts, accept or reject them whosoever may. For, where the treasure is there will the heart be also. Think of that, you treasure seekers in the earth, who have found and laid your treasures on the earth. Whose treasures represent the life you have spent on the earth. You have put the better part of your life into them. They are your better part. But you cannot take them away with you. The only treasure we can carry away with us must be laid up within. Now, spiritualism reveals the possibility of the spirits being doomed to haunt this treasure house of earth until every particle of that hoarded wealth has been redistributed and restored to the channels for which it was intended by the Maker. And the first stage on its way back may be that the riches so carefully gathered and miserly garnered shall be the means of sinking your spendthrift son down to the lowest range of spiritual penury. For the Creator whom we postulate will not be balked in carrying out His purposes by any temporary obstructions like these, and if you have hindered here you will have to help hereafter, when you do at last get into line with natural law. You have been amused with a dolly devil long enough, whilst inside of you, and outside of you, and all round about you, the real devil is living, working with a most infernal activity, and playing the very devil with this world of ours. Not an ideal devil, but a legal devil, with a purpose and a plan, the devil in reality. We have been following a phantom of faith, and the actual veritable devil has been dogging us indeed. This is not a Satan of God's making. Not an archangel ruined, who, in falling, found a foothold on this earth for the purpose of dragging men down with him to that lower deep for which he is bound, but a devil to be recognized by his likeness to ourselves. The devil that is our worser self. The devil of our own ignorance, and the deification of self a devil bequeathed to us by the accumulated gains of centuries of ignorant selfishness, and selfish ignorance a devil to be grappled with and wrestled with and throttled, overthrown. And overcome, and put out of existence not only in the struggle against all that is evil in the isolated, individual life. Our devil has grown too big and is too potent for that. But by the energies of all collected and clubbed, and made cooperant to destroy the causes of evil whensoever and wheresoever these can be identified, whether as religious, or political, moral, or social. We stand in heaven's own light and cast the evil shadow of self, and say it is the devil. And then our theologists have the blasphemous impudence to make God the author of this dark shadow of ourselves, which we shed on his creation. And assume it to be an eclipse from another world of being. No doubt it may be shown that the operative power we postulate is responsible for certain natural conditions which inevitably result in what we recognize to be evil. Nor will he shirk his responsibility in that matter. It was a necessary part and process in the human education, in strict accordance with the laws of evolution. But we see more and more every day that such evil was good in the making. We may trace many of the healing springs of heavenly purity filtering through this dark stratum of earth. Also, we are apt to look on things at first sight as evil which we finally find to be blessings in disguise. A piercing vision will perceive the deeply underlying intention of good working upward through many a superficial appearance of evil. Seen in the light of evolution, the existence of evil is no longer a mythological mystery to be made the most of by pious ignoramuses for preaching purposes, but a necessary concomitant of development. One of the conditions by means of which we grow into conscious human beings to attain the higher life. Indeed, whether there be a God or not, it was impossible to discuss the matter intelligently until the doctrine of creation, by the slow processes of evolution, had been taken into account. This shows us that the evil for which nature is responsible, is a means of evolving in us the very consciousness of good. The moment we recognize evil, and have acquired the consciousness of its existence, the responsibility for its existence becomes ours. Here is a problem set for us to solve by way of education. 
Here is a foe to fight to the death, whether as a misguided passion in the individual, or a disease in the life of a nation. Here is something to be turned into good, a devil to be converted. The moment man sees so far, he must accept the responsibility for the continued existence of the evil, and war against it as he would if clearing any other jungle from poisonous reptiles. Ours is not a doll to dandle, and claim divine parentage for, but a misbegotten devil of ignorance, and a miscarriage of humanity in the past. We see that life comes into visible being according to conditions. Where these are unprepared and not humanized, the life takes the lowest forms, those of reptiles and weeds, poisonous plants, thorns, thistles, and briars, forms inimical to man, and therefore considered to be evil. Then man comes to cultivate and modify, and turn the evil into good. The whole world of natural evil has to acknowledge its master. Let me give you an illustration. Pain, for example, is a consequence of imperfect conditions. It is the signal of the sentinel that warns us of the enemy. And how those faithful sentinels stand in the outworks of the body, to guard the more vital parts from approaching danger. It is necessary to warn us, or we should do most foolish things, as a child might, but for this warning of pain, thrust his hand in the fire and have it consumed. The soul's health is continually protected by this warning sentinel of pain, mental and corporeal. Pain is necessary, then, to the development of consciousness, and the perfecting of conditions. It is the reminder that there is something wrong. Therefore something to be remedied. It is a part of the process in our education. Also, the loftiest pleasures of our spiritual life continually flower from a rootage in the deepest pain. I am not here to preach a gospel of the blessedness of suffering for the poor and needy the victims of this world's laws. But suffering, as I read the Book of Life, is an incentive to effort. And the greatest pressure from without will sometimes evolve the strongest character from within, by evoking the greater force of effort. As Shakespeare points out, the flowers of March are not so fine as the flowers of June, but the finest flower of March is finer than the finest flower of June. It has overcome more opposition, and turned it to account. Perhaps in consequence of the pressure, it has established a nearer relationship at root to the source of life. Pain is but a passing necessity, for, as it is the result of imperfect conditions, it follows that pain itself must pass away as those conditions are perfected and we are here to improve and perfect them. God does not destroy the devil of pain right off, by working a miracle at a moment's notice. For God is not that automaton of the sex that weathercock atop of creation which they suppose will veer round at every breath of selfish prayer. You are called upon to ascertain what is the law of the case, who is the lawbreaker, and how is the law to be kept. You must look out for natural consequences, and effects that follow causes, not for rewards and punishments. You know that a little bile in the blood may cause great mental distress. But it is perfectly absurd to ask God to save you from these blacks in your eyes and blue devils in your brain. You must look to your liver, and obey the laws of health. Eschew tobacco and take less whiskey, or coffee, as the case may be. God works no immediate miracle in response to your offer of a tempting opportunity. He intends man to get rid of evil as he grows enlightened enough to deal more wisely with our human conditions in the process of what? Of becoming manlier and womanlier. Our science grasps with its transforming hand. Makes real half the tales of fairy land. It turns the deathliest fader to perfume. It gives decay new life and rosy bloom. It changes filthy rags to virgin white. Makes pure in spirit what was foul to sight. We burn the darkness and the density out of earthly matter, and transfigure it into glass, which we can see through. We are here to apply a similar process of annealing to our dense, unexcavated, earthy humanity, so that the light from heaven may shine through it purely. We are here to try and clear away these visible causes of obstruction which have been bequeathed to us by ages on ages of horrible ignorance, and not look forward helplessly to their being burned out of human souls by an eternity of hellfire, or backwards, for a salvation supposed to have taken place some eighteen centuries ago, but which is known nearer now than it ever was, on the terms set forth by orthodox teachings. 
It was impossible to see anything clearly, or get any glimpse of justice above or below, in heaven, or earth, or hell, under the old creed. Which proclaims that pain and suffering constitute the curse wherewith God has unjustly afflicted all for the sin of one, instead of the beneficent, though stern, angel of his presence and bearer of his blessing, that it was an eternal decree. To be executed through all eternity, instead of an awakener in time, that calls to action now and at once, for the changing of the present conditions in which humanity crawls, as it were, upon all fours, or hobbles on crutches. As if we were born mental cripples. We all know there is an awful deal of suffering in the world that cannot be considered as a mere individual question. Sufferings that we do not individually cause, and are not personally responsible for sufferings bequeathed to us as individuals and as members of the state. For we have to bear the accumulated burdens of centuries on centuries of ignorance, or, worse still, of willful crime, and, worst of all, of wrong made sacred by religious sanction, and supported by law and the press. And the burden of the many crushes the individual to the earth, and the God of justice appears to be blind to the case makes no rush to the rescue, even when we suffer for the sins of others. Be sure even these can be turned to eternal account. But, he has this lesson to convey to the world humanity is one. And the power that is has instituted certain laws laws that operate for the species rather than the individual, an important distinction to be made in any interpretation of nature. Laws that deal with the species as one in spite of our manifold diversities and our deified doctrine of everyone on his own hookism. He does not put forth his hand to take you off your hook when it happens to run into you particularly sharp, flesh or soul, and makes you supplicate or swear. Establish what private relationship you can with your Maker, and derive what spiritual succor you may whilst bearing the burden, or writhing on the iron that enters you, the laws that do deal with humanity in the aggregate. And operate for the good of the species, will go grinding on with their larger revolutions that subserve eternal interests whilst crushing terribly many smaller claims of individual life for, mark this. The Eternal intends to show us that humanity is one, and the family are more than the individual member, the nation is more than the family, and the human race is more than the nation. And if we do not accept the revelation lovingly, do not take to the fact kindly, why then, tis flashed upon us terribly, by lightning of hell, if we will not have it by light of heaven. And the poor neglected scum and canale of the nations rise up mighty in the strength of disease, and prove the oneness of humanity by killing you with the same infection. It has recently been shown how the poor of London do not live, but fester in the pestilential hovels called their homes. To get into these you have to visit courts which the sun never penetrates, which are never visited by a breath of fresh air, and which never know the virtues of a drop of cleansing water. Immorality is but the natural outcome of such a devil's spawning ground. The poverty of many who strive to live honestly is appalling. And this disclosure is made with the customary moan that such people attend neither church nor chapel, as if that were the panacea. I should not wonder if these revelations result in the building of more churches and chapels, and the consecration of at least one or two more bishops. The Bishop of Bedford said the other day, it was highly necessary that in these times when the poor have so little earthly enjoyment, the joys of heaven should be made known to them. It is not possible to caricature an utterance so grotesque as that. How appallingly unjust it seems that the victims of this world's laws should be handed over as ready-made victims of nature's laws that the most helpless poor should be the favorite thriving ground for tapeworms just because they are in such a poverty. This is hard, but so it is, and so it will and must be till the lesson is learned and applied that the human family is one, and all are bound up together by certain laws willy-nilly. That we are our brother's keeper for all our cane like questionings of the fact. We cannot shirk our responsibility. And you are not allowed to get out of the grip of the violated law of the whole, on any pretense of individuality or limited liability. It is we who create the fevers to feed on the poor, when we allow others to get rich by permitting the filth and the poisoned air and water that are sent into the world sparkling with purity. When we allow the rights of property to override the interests of humanity. It is we who breed the diseases and literally invent the hungry, hundred-mouthed tapeworms that get their living out of poverty-stricken blood and hungry stomachs, churning the slime of gnawing emptiness, 
because we created, or continue. The laws that doom the many to poverty and its parasites of prey. Providence that is a very comprehensive name, providence does not create poverty. The cupola of heaven overhead is like the inverted horn of everlasting plenty, pouring down its blessings of abundance in sunshine and shower, in air and dew, in ripening fire and purifying frost, and the harvests never fail the world over. All round, all ways, there is plenty for all, if not in one country, there is in another. There is no failure on the part of Providence, the creator of plenty. This neglected garden of our world, which has in it every element of a paradise, if rightly planted and properly tended, has been left to run to weeds of sin and ignorance and crime, in the most wasteful way. Heavens of spirit worlds around us are forever sowing the divine seed germs broadcast over our earth, and they have to scatter a harvest in order that we may grow a single grain, because the human conditions are so unreceptive. The fields are so neglected, the soil so unprepared to receive their bounty. The heavens around us are ever ready to pour out blessings in a larger measure than we are to make a lap for receiving them. All they ask are the conditions under which we may receive most abundantly. We are the manufacturers of misery. We have sedulously cultivated or permitted all manner of foul conditions, and then in the midst of some calamity, for which we are criminally responsible, that comes home to all. The praying machine of the state is set rotating with a furious 40,000 parson power, and God is implored to stay his hand or work a miracle forthwith on behalf of us poor human worms. Who ask the Creator to take particular notice of these our penitential writhings at his feet? The Bishop of Truro said recently that we are approaching a period of pain and peril, and the situation calls for strong words and strong prayers. You must cry aloud or the Lord won't hear you. Standing face to face with certain facts, the result of things as they are, and have been, the atheists exclaim, there is no God. If there were an omnipotent God such things would not be tolerated by Him. But by an omnipotent God, is meant a God with power to change, at a moment's notice, all that is fixed forever. Let me assure our freethought friends, that evolution necessitates a new idea altogether of the operative power. It abolishes the incompetent personal creator of the Hebrew Genesis. But, in presence of evolution, it is useless to demand that, if there be a God, it shall prove itself to be the deity of the Orthodox, which, as I said before, is a sort of eternal weathercock on the summit of creation. That may be made to veer round as it is blown about by every breath of selfish human prayer, if people collect together in sufficient numbers to blow it round. A vain idea of divinity whosoever entertains it. The deity who is belabored so unmercifully, and, as I think, so cheaply, by Robert Ingersoll, is the god of the non-evolutionary theory of creation, the impossible monster of the past. Did God govern America when it had four millions of slaves, asks Ingersoll. Well, why not? In accordance with the laws of evolution, seeing that slavery has come to an end. If he had put an end to it, ab extra, Americans could not have had the credit of doing the work, and might never have evolved the consciousness that slavery was criminal. God did not put an end to slavery as an outside governor of men. But who shall say that the power, the will, the perception, the affection, or whatsoever we can express by analogy with the human that is called God was not operant, and, therefore, governing. Within the souls of the men who rose up foremost in revolt against the accursed wrong, and called upon their fellows to cast it out. Possibly the existence of God, then, does not depend upon the particular visible way of working that may be so easily indicated. Slavery only existed pro tem, to come to an end, and, therefore, was consistent, like other educational forms of evil, with the divine government, according to the laws of evolution. The argument of the non-theist is continually directed and limited to the false premises and inadequate conclusions of the orthodox, which it is as easy and cheap to pulverize as it is to pummel a sack of straw. We can know nothing of an omnipotent God who plays fast and loose with the conditions of law. Were it so, all human foothold and trust in the stability of the universe would be gone. Education would be impossible. We are first taught by means of the fixed facts, in order that we may found on solid earth, 
not on the ever-shifting sands with prayers for God to catch them now and again, and keep them quiet, for God's sake. I rather think it would be more just to reply, there is not sufficient manhood and intelligence in you to put an end to the evils you deplore. I, God, gave the earth for all. And you permit the initial iniquity of absolute private property in land, whereby one man may clutch a county all to himself, and a few may claim a country. You allow the rights of property to overrule and override the interests of humanity. If your national property is doubling every thirty years, so is the national pauperism. You allow the one to possess the soil, and the thousands to be driven off and exported as refuse, in order that game may multiply, and the human parasites of earth may pursue their savage sport. I gave the land for all. To be the property and grazing ground of each living generation brought to birth, and you allow it to be locked up by the dead hand of the past, for the benefit of the few. These few frame the laws that inevitably doom the many, sooner or later, to poverty, to man-made sufferings, to diseases and miseries innumerable. All of which get mixed up with a supposed inscrutable origin of evil and other grotesque and fallacious views, endorsed and inculcated by the current theology for the benefit of parsons and patrons, which are only fit to be made a mock of. And to be laughed into oblivion. And here, let me say, that whilst recognizing the inexorableness of the natural law in certain spheres of operation, where it works like the bound Samson of blind force for the good of the species. I find that spiritualism introduces a consciousness akin, and, at least, equal, to the human, into the working of law in a realm beyond the immediately visible. It shows the existence of subtler forces and modes of law for dealing with man the individual, and the culminating consciousness of creation. When the mind of man had been evolved on this earth, remember, a new factor was introduced amongst the natural forces one that was destined to greatly modify and counteract them, fetter the fire, and ride the ocean waves. Guide the lightning, and train it to carry messages, bridge the planetary spaces, and outstrip time itself. In like manner, the knowledge of an existence beyond the visible present no matter by what means and of intelligence operating in hidden and extraordinary ways introduces a new factor among the forces now to be reckoned with as mental modifiers in certain domains of law. The unseen world can no longer be the same when we learn that intelligence is there, no more than this world could remain the same after the advent of man. And when we can identify the consciousness there as being akin to the human here, we know all that is necessary for putting a conscience into the previously inexorable law, and an eye into the image of blind force. Here we get a margin that would take a long while to fill in with possible annotations. Man is no longer alone in the universe. There are other intelligences, affections, powers of will and work, beside his. And in relation to him this just makes all the difference in the manifestation and interpretation of the law that is blind and inexorable in its lower range. We begin to distinguish. Here are the means for a possible response to invocation and to the need of mental help. The now demonstrated fact of thought transference, which was familiar enough before, in common with other kindred phenomena, to many of us, opens up a vista of immortal possibility in the mode of mental manifestation. And in the modification of supposed hard and fast, or immutable, law, in relation to life in its higher phases. It seems to me that this fact alone turns the ground of mere materialism into a kind of Goodwin Sands. We extend this thought transference upwards or round us by means of living telegraphic mental lines. The operators on which at one end can work, and only work according to the conditions at the other end. At present I do not perceive, and cannot pretend to know, when and where we can touch conscious source itself along these lines. Who does know anything of God, in the domain of things? Or who has any right to pretend to know, or to be paid a salary for pretending to know, anything of God personally, or a personal God. To me the question as to the personality of God is altogether premature. I can wait for a few future lifetimes to find out God. In a sense it may be, there is no God yet, but there's one coming. And you will find the saying a profound one if you think it over for a month. We ourselves, of the race of man, are only in the condition of becoming, let us cultivate a becoming modesty. 
and such is the human apprehension of the cause of becoming. The eye, as Goethe has said, can only see what it brings with it the power of seeing, and so, in a sense, a god is not yet. But one is coming. The deity hitherto set up for worship is more or less an effigy of the god of primitive or savage man. If that be a true likeness, why, then, men ought not to become atheists merely they ought not to marry and propagate. But commit suicide forthwith. It is such an outrage on all human feeling, this primitive portraiture of eternal power, that the moral revolt is certain, and the mental result is atheism. I assert that non-theism is sometimes, and in some natures. The necessary revolt of the most inner consciousness against the abortion called God. They shut their eyes altogether to get rid of a representation so unsightly and unworthy, and better is such blindness than much false seeing. I say it is the real presence operating within that is at war with this hideous sham set up for worship without. I seldom use the name of God myself in speech or writing now. It has been so long taken in vain so profaned by the orthodox blasphemers. It has been so degraded as a brand and hallmark, made use of to warrant the counterfeit wares that are passed off upon the ignorant and unsuspecting. Who think them genuine so long as they are stamped with that name, as to have become quite discredited. For myself, I have come to apprehend a conscious source of all, working outwardly from the core of things, by means of what we term matter, and understand as the laws of evolution. A conscious source of all. I cannot state that consciousness in words, but it appears to me that this is the work of phenomena which do actually state it in the process of appealing to, or becoming, the consciousness in us. But I am utterly unable to personify this power. Also, I find the essence of the whole matter is sacred to privacy. The more intuition, the less blabbing the more reverence, the more reticence. The facts of an abnormal or extraordinary nature that came under my own cognizance during many years of my life, which were continually occurring and verified, proved to me that mind exists and operates out of sight. By degrees these facts peopled the unknown void with life and intelligent beings, that finally gave one bit of foothold on the very first step of a ladder which will stand up for the first time when one tries to prop it against the sky. That one step bridges the dark void of death for me. I don't trouble myself, for myself, about the other world at all that's all right, if we are. It is for this world people need to be helped. Life is not worth living if we are not doing something towards helping on the work of this world. It is only in helping others that we can truly help ourselves. And we have reason to think that myriads of those who have already left this life with false hopes of salvation are only too glad to help themselves by coming back and helping us to carry on the work of this world. It is only when we pass out of the domain of self, that the unseen helpers can steal in upon us, and help us as agents for those who are agents for others, and so on and on, until the whole vast universe is filled and quick with modes and motions. And forms of being all athrob with subtly related life. All radiating from central source to uttermost limit. All unified in one eternal consciousness, in which the soul of man, full statured and full summed, may possibly become conscious that it touches God at last, as a presence, a power, a principle. And may then be made aware that it did so unconsciously from the first. Our orthodox teachers in the present are responsible for playing into the hands or claws of the devil that was created for them in the past. They are the consecrators of all the ignorance, robbery, and wrong. In England the sinister army of 40,000 men in masks, as it has been truly termed, is paid from the national revenue to act the part of a secret Sunday police. Their chief representatives are the obstructives of sane and humane legislation today as ever. A man can't marry his wife's sister because of them. At the debate on the pigeon bill in the House of Lords, some time since, not a single bishop was found to lift up his voice on behalf of the poor dumb and miserably murdered doves. Not a man was to be found behind any one of the aprons. Every bishop present in the house voted against opening the museums and picture galleries on Sunday. They say, in effect, if you won't come to church, DNU. You shan't go anywhere else, if we can help it. They want to stand just where they have always stood, 
at the end of the long dark passage through which mankind slowly emerges out of darkness into day in the very entrance of the light. To shut out the face of heaven itself from those who are groping their way through the gloom, and bid them in God's name to go back and religiously keep to the obscurity of the cave, if they would be saved. Each Sunday they trail the red herring across the scent of their followers, so that their attention may be drawn off from this world and all the wrongs we are sent here to remedy. They promise that those who remain sufficiently poor and worm-like in spirit during this life, shall rise erect from the grub-like condition in death, full-fledged, to soar as winged angels in the next life. They have exalted the lot of Lazarus as a scriptural ideal for the most needy and miserable to live up to, as if the cowering outcast and diseased starveling of earth were the proper model man for the heavens. They keep us the lying farce of insisting that man is a fallen creature, and persist in preaching their doctrine of his degradation and damnation in order that people may go to them to be saved and pay well for it. The secularist asserts that the orthodox cult and theology are a hopeless failure for this world, and as a spiritualist I affirm that they are also a fraud for the other. False beliefs are, and forever must be, opposed to all real and true doing. And these false beliefs have from the beginning been bitterly opposed to every truth revealed by science, and every advance made for humanity has had to be made in spite of them. Moreover, this doctrine they teach, of saving yourselves and devil take the hindmost, is most miserably degrading to any true sense of real manhood or womanhood. He wouldn't be much of a hero who in the midst of the battle took it into his head that the first duty of man is to get himself saved. They get up a horrible hullabaloo in the rear, as if all hell were let loose after you, on purpose to frighten the blind and foolish, and make them rush through the one door open in front of those who are fleeing from the wrath to come. At which they take tax and toll. But there is no hell, there is no devil, close after the hindmost of those who are furiously fleeing from the avengers of the fall of man. Moreover, it's of no use rushing. However fast you go you carry your own heaven or hell inside of you, whether for this life or any other. All this is a bogus business, with the mythical devil for bogey. The world is not yet on fire with the final conflagration, nor can they set it on fire with the painted flames of a pictorial hell. A little girl was once asked what she must first do to be saved, and the innocent replied, get lost. Moreover, before we join in the stampede of self-salvation at the call of those who cry, fire, when the theater is crammed, let us be sure that we have grown a soul that is worth saving. If we had, I doubt whether we should manifest such a consuming anxiety of utter selfishness, or be in such an infernal hurry to get it saved anyhow. Those who are truly desirous of saving or helping others, seldom trouble much about their own souls. Theirs is the burden of a nobler care. Theirs is a loftier inquietude than any sense of self can ever give. They lose all such unworthy fears for themselves in the thought of others. They are like that grand captain of the North Fleet, of whom I proudly wrote some years ago. Others he saved. He saved the name. Unsullied, that he gave his wife. And, dying with so pure a name. He had no need to save his life. I also hold their other cowardly doctrine, that of vicarious sacrifice, to be the real, if indirect, cause of vivisection. It would have been impossible for a nation of animal lovers like the English to tolerate the vivisection of the dog, for example, man's first friend in the wilderness of the early world, his ally in the work of civilization. Unless the motor nerve and conscience of the race had been paralyzed by the karari of vicarious suffering. The beastly cruelties of its practitioners, which are flaunted in our faces with intent to terrorize the conscience of others, could not have been permitted by men who had not been indoctrinated by the worship of a vivisecting deity. Whose victim was his own son. And these myriads of slowly murdered dogs and rabbits, cats and frogs, cannot have the consolation of knowing that vivisection is salvation, and they are saviors of the human race from the consequences of its own crimes against nature. And sins against self. It is impossible to establish the throne of eternal justice by the violation of all that is human, as is fruitlessly attempted on this ground of the orthodox creed. It is impossible for you to save or serve humanity by sacrificing all that constitutes the essence of humanity, as is done in this portrayal of a vivisecting deity, 
who is the responsible operator, with his own son for suffering victim. And this victim of vicarious punishment is held forth as a lure to draw humanity toward a father in heaven of such a nature as that. We may depend upon it that this preaching of what is called Christianity, to get a Sunday sensation. Or solace out of it, this plunging of the theological poker red hot into your seventh day dose of spiritual flip to give it a zest this using of hellfire as a persuader, after the manner of the furnace heated beneath the turkeys. Which persuaded the poor things to dance to music played in quick time this weekly whipping of the devil round the stump is, as the Americans say, pretty well played out. There is nothing new to be said. Suppose we go to work and try to do something, instead of making ourselves miserable on Sunday, doing nothing but putting ourselves through all the postures and impostures of the orthodox sabbatical fashion. In future, mankind will not herd together, like terror-stricken cattle in a thunderstorm, to deprecate the wrath of their God, and offer Him praise and presence by way of propitiation, and as a bribe for Him not to lose His temper. Good God! What an idea of a God! It is precisely the elemental God of Browning's Caliban, and of the primitive savage. In future, I say, men will not look upon it as a sacred duty to herd together, on purpose to praise and glorify their God one day in seven with their psalm of conceit. Let all creation hold its tongue. While I uplift my Sunday song. Lest, being a jealous God, he should blight their harvest, or peradventure burst the boiler of the excursion train. Nor will men form leagues, religious or otherwise, on purpose to think alike and make all other people think the same. They cannot think alike if they are ever to grow. The lower the type the greater the likeness. The loftier the development the larger the diversity. That is the natural law. We may cooperate to work, but not to think alike. That could never be free thinking. Nor will mankind henceforth allow their arms to be paralyzed for action by being fixed or bailed up in the posture of prayer. We say, it is a farce, a pitiful one, not a laughable one, for you to pray for God to work a miracle for the kingdom of heaven to come, when you are doing all you can, all your lives, to prevent its coming, or doing nothing to hasten its coming. It is the sheerest mockery of God and man. You were sent here to create the kingdom, to work it out by living that law of love proclaimed as laying down the life in love for others, and the very reason why the kingdom does not come, and cannot come, is because you stand in the way of its coming. And you, and all who think and act as you do, praying for the better day to come, must be swept out of the way in order that it may come. Get up from your knees and work for it. Take your weapon in hand and fight for it. Turn fiercely on the devil that dogs our own footsteps, and rescue those that fall by the way and succumb to the powers that make for evil. Turn on the devil not theoretically, but practically, having ascertained the work that needs to be done. Turn on the devil, not singly, but associated together for doing, instead of believing and talking and praying for God to do. What the Eternal Worker asks of us, as I apprehend the whole matter, is that we shall become conscious co-workers with Him in carrying out the divine purposes in proportion as we can make them out. He does not want us to be fear-bound and devil-driven slaves. Not beasts in blinkers, not laggers behind, forever probed by the goad of sheer and sharp necessity. Not blind obeyers of His sternest laws that go grinding on willy-nilly, hauling and hurling us along with them in their incessant, vast revolution. But seers of His work, intelligent interpreters of His will, and sharers in His life and love. In conclusion, there is no origin of evil in the moral domain that is not derivable from ignorance. The wickedness of a soul, said Hermes, is its ignorance. And there is no devil in the moral domain except in the devilish determination to do the wrong or permit the wrong to be done, after we have evolved the consciousness that recognizes the right. The reason then why God does not kill the devil is because man has unconsciously created or permitted all that is the devil finally. And here or hereafter he has to consciously destroy his own work, and fight himself free from the errors of his own ignorance. Not man the individual merely, but man as part of the whole family of universal humanity. Not man as mortal simply, but as an immortal, standing up shoulder to shoulder, 
and marching onward step by step and side by side with those who are our elders in immortality, and who still unite with us. And lend a hand to effect in time the not altogether inscrutable, but slowly unfolding, purposes of the eternal. Lineolatry, Ancient and Modern for thirty years past Professor Max Muller has been teaching in his books and lectures, in the Times, Saturday Review, and various magazines, from the platform of the Royal Institution. The pulpit of Westminster Abbey, and his chair at Oxford, that mythology is a disease of language, and that the ancient symbolism was a result of something like a primitive mental aberration. We know, says Renouf, echoing Max Muller, in his Hibbert lectures, we know that mythology is the disease which springs up at a peculiar stage of human culture. Such is the shallow explanation of the non-evolutionists, and such explanations are still accepted by the British public, that gets its thinking done for it by proxy. Professor Max Muller, Cox, Gubernatis and other propounders of the solar mythos have portrayed the primitive mythmaker for us as a sort of Germanist Hindu metaphysician, projecting his own shadow on a mental mist and talking ingeniously concerning smoke, or, at least, cloud. The sky overhead becoming like the dome of dreamland, scribbled over with the imagery of aboriginal nightmares. They conceive the early man in their own likeness, and look upon him as perversely prone to self-mystification, or, as Fontenelle has it, subject to beholding things that are not there. They have misrepresented primitive or archaic man as having been idiotically misled from the first by an active but untutored imagination into believing all sorts of fallacies, which were directly and constantly contradicted by his own daily experience. A fool of fancy in the midst of those grim realities that were grinding his experience into him, like the grinding icebergs making their imprints upon the rocks submerged beneath the sea. It remains to be said, and will one day be acknowledged, that these accepted teachers have been no nearer to the beginnings of mythology and language than Burns' poet Willie had been near to Pegasus. My reply is, tis but a dream of the metaphysical theorist that mythology was a disease of language, or anything else except his own brain. The origin and meaning of mythology have been missed altogether by these solarites and weathermongers. Mythology was a primitive mode of thinking the early thought. It was founded on natural facts, and is still verifiable in phenomena. There is nothing insane, nothing irrational in it, when considered in the light of evolution, and when its mode of expression by sign language is thoroughly understood. The insanity lies in mistaking it for human history or divine revelation. Mythology is the repository of man's most ancient science, and what concerns us chiefly is this when truly interpreted once more it is destined to be the death of those false theologies to which it has unwittingly given birth. In modern phraseology a statement is sometimes said to be mythical in proportion to its being untrue, but the ancient mythology was not a system or mode of falsifying in that sense. Its fables were the means of conveying facts. They were neither forgeries nor fictions. Nor did mythology originate in any intentional double-dealing whatever, although it did assume an aspect of duality when direct expression in words had succeeded the primitive mode of representation by means of things as signs and symbols. For example, when the Egyptians portrayed the moon as a cat, they were not ignorant enough to suppose that the moon was a cat, nor did their wandering fancies see any likeness in the moon to a cat. Nor was a cat myth any mere expansion of verbal metaphor. Nor had they any intention of making puzzles or riddles to mislead others by means of such enigmatical sign language, at a time when they could not help themselves, having no choice in the matter. They had observed the simple fact that the cat saw in the dark, and that her eyes became full-orbed and grew most luminous by night. The moon was the seer by night in heaven, and the cat was its equivalent on the earth. And so the familiar cat was adopted as a representative, a natural sign, a living pictograph of the lunar orb. Where we should make a comparison, and say the moon saw in the dark like a cat, or the cat saw like the moon by night, they identified the one with the other, a mode of metaphor which still characterizes the great style in poetry. And said the cat up there can see by night. And so it followed that the sun which saw down in the underworld at night, could also be called the cat, as it was, because it also saw in the dark. The name of the cat in Egyptian is Mao, which denotes the seer, from Mao, to see. 
One writer on mythology asserts that the Egyptians imagined a great cat behind the sun, which is the pupil of the cat's eye. But this imagining is all modern. It is the Mullerite stock in trade. The moon as cat was the eye of the sun, because it reflected the solar light, and because the eye gives back the image in its mirror. In the form of the goddess Pash the cat keeps watch for the sun, with her paw holding down and bruising the head of the serpent of darkness, called his eternal enemy. The cat was the eye of night in the same symbolical sense that our daisy, which opens and shuts with the rising and setting of the sun, is called the eye of day. Moreover, the cat saw the sun, had it in its eye by night, when it was otherwise unseen by men. We might say the moon mirrored the solar light, because we have looking glasses. With them the cat's eye was the mirror. The hair was another type of the eye that opened in heaven and saw in the dark. Consequently, we find the hair in the moon is a myth that gave birth to a common and widespread superstition. In later times the symbol is literalized, and it is supposed that primitive men were always on the lookout for likenesses, like a youthful poet in search of comparisons and that they saw some resemblance to the form of a hare in the dark shadows of the lunar orb. Whereas in mythology things are not what they seem to anybody, that would lead to no consensus of agreement, nor establish any science of knowledge. A learned man once remarked to me on the strange fact that the ancients should have selected the least observable of all the planets, Mercury, to make so must of, as the messenger. He was entirely ignorant of the fact that mythology includes a system of timekeeping, and that Mercury was made the planetary messenger, in addition to his lunar character. Because his revolution round the sun is performed in the shortest space of planetary time. In like manner, Max Muller will tell you that the moon was called by the name of Sasanka in Sanskrit, from Sasa, the hare, because the common people in India think the black marks in the moon look like a hare. But this is mere fool's work or child's play with the surface appearance of things which has little or no relation to true myth or ancient symbolism, and all such interpretation is entirely misleading. Egypt, as I contend, has left us the means of determining the original nature and significance of these types. When the Egyptians would denote an opening, says Hor Apollo, they delineate a hair, because this animal always has its eyes open. The name of the hair in Egyptian is An, which signifies open, to open, the opener, especially connected with periodicity, as the word also means the hour. This will explain how the wide, open-eyed hair became a type of the moon, which opens with its new light once a month, as the hair in heaven. The hair is the hieroglyphic sign of the opener, which can be variously applied to the phenomena of opening, to the sun as well as the moon. The hair is an especial emblem of the god Osiris in the character of un -Nefer, the good opener. In later phrase, the good revealer. It is as the seer that both hare and cat are associated with the witch as types of abnormal seership. The hare also denoted the opening time, as the period of pubescence, when it was lawful for the sexes to come together. Hence it was the type of periodicity and legality in the human phase. For this reason, the youths among the Namaqua Hottentots are, or were, not allowed to eat the hare. With the Chinese the rabbit takes the place of the hare as a lunar type. Its period of gestation being thirty days, that would make it an appropriate representative of the lunation, of opening anew, and of rebirth. The Sealish Indians have a myth of the frog in the moon. They tell how the wolf, in love with the frog, was pursuing her by night, when she leaped into the moon, and escaped. Amongst the superstitions of our English folklore, we also have one respecting the frog or toad, that is supposed to be visible in the moon. Now it can be shown how the frog got deposited there. But only as a type, not in reality, nor as a mere appearance. The frog is a natural transformer from the tadpole phase in the water to the four-legged stage on land. The moon likewise transforms, and the metamorphosis of the lunar orb could be typified by the change in the frog, and so the frog as picture object, natural type and living demonstrator for the moon, ultimately became the frog in the moon. The moon rose up monthly from the celestial waters, renewed like the frog, and as the horned one grew fuller bed it might be thought of as losing the tail of its tadpole condition. The frog was figured as the head of the Egyptian goddess Hecate, equals Greek Hecate, 
the consort of Knef, one of whose titles is the King of Frogs. Hecate being a lunar goddess and Knef a solar god, this title would denote that he was lord of the numerous transformations of light in the moon, described as being the father, and she as the mother, of frogs. Because the frog was the typical transformer, as representative of the moon. The Chinese have a three-legged frog in the moon that was an ancient beauty, named Chang No, who lives there because she once drank the Amrita of Immortality. I have elsewhere suggested that the original Phryne of Greece was a form of the frog goddess who transformed. The name of Phryne denotes the frog. And in the most famous statue of her, carved by Apelles, she was portrayed as Venus transfiguring from the foam, as did the frog goddess Hecate, of Egypt, who was the frog in the moon. Only be reading these types, which preceded letters, can we at all understand the thought and intention of the primitive thingers or thinkers. Another example, the dung beetle in Egypt was a type of Kepreta, the creator by transformation, who is said to have been begotten by his own becoming, and to have been born without a mother, through repetition of himself. Kep, the root of the name, signifies to transform. External nature was the scene of eternal transformation and never-ending metamorphosis. And it had been observed that Kep, the beetle, was likewise a transformer, inasmuch as it laid its eggs in dung found on the banks of the Nile, rolled it up into a ball, and buried itself deep in the dry sand along with its seed, where Qua beetle, it transformed, the old beetle into the young one, and so continued as the same beetle by transformation. Thus the beetle served to typify that being or existence which could not be expressed, but which was seen to continue forever by self-repetition in phenomenal manifestation. They knew nothing of beginning, and did not pretend to know, but only of becoming, and of repetition or renewal coming of itself. So the beetle was adopted as a type of transformation, whether of the old moon into the new one, of the sun out of the lower into the upper heaven, or, in the latter times, of the dead mummy into a living soul. Hor Apollo says the scarabaeus deposits his ball of seed in the earth for the space of twenty-eight days, the length of time during which the moon passes through the twelve signs of the zodiac, and on the twenty-ninth day it opens the ball. The day on which the conjunction of sun and moon occurred was the day of resurrection for the new life. The beetle in heaven had once more transformed, and there was another new moon. The orb of the moon with its changes night after night, its drama longer even than any performed by the Chinese nowadays, its drop scene of the darkness at the end, and the transformation into the new life of light in the beginning. Presented the earliest form of the primitive theater, which offered its celestial show in heaven, gratis to all eyes that gazed up from below. This must have been one of the earliest educators in natural phenomena. There is nothing more interesting to me than to watch the nascent mind of man making its infantile clutch, and trying to catch on and lay hold of external things to lay hold, as it were, of the skirts of the passing powers. That were held to be superior to itself, nothing more instructive than to follow the primitive ways of keeping touch with the life of external nature, and of sharing in the operations going on, so as to be on the right and safe side. And get on the true line for deriving some benefit from the way in which things were seen to be going. This is very touching in its simplicity, and will teach us more concerning the past of man than all the metaphysical interpretation hitherto attempted. The proper time for prayer, wishing or invoking aid, was at first sight of the new moon, just as it started visibly on the way to fulfillment, the mental attitude being, may my wish be fulfilled like the light in thy orb, O moon. May my life be renewed like thy light. Such was the prayer of the Congo Negroes. The full moon being the mother moon, the eye that mirrored or reproduced the light of the sun, that will account for the day of the full moon being accounted as it was by the Greeks, Britons and others the most propitious time for the marriage ceremony. The full moon was held to come forth great with good luck. Boy children ought to be weaned when the horned moon was waxing, and girls when it was on the wane the female being the reproducer as bringer forth. So peas and beans were sown in the wane of the moon to rise again like the moon renewed. Corn ought to be cut during the wane of the moon if you would have them disappear quickly. In very simple ways the primitive observers had tried to set their life in time with the life going on around them, and thus get what light they could from nature for their own guidance, and also make her language their own. Butler asks, in Hudibras. 
why on a sign no painter draws the full moon ever but the half. Now, that is very good sign language, especially as the half moon is a public house symbol. It was an invitation to eat and drink to the full, or come to the full as the half moon does, it may be, to get foo, in the Scottish sense. A moon already full would not have answered the purpose. An eclipse projected the shadow of coming calamity. The renewed light of the old moon was like a promise of eternal life and everlasting youth. When personified this was the healer, the savior, an image of very life. The firstborn from the dead, the firstfruits of them that slept in the graveyard of sunken suns, and cemetery of old dead moons, was reproduced visibly in external phenomena as the new moon which was personated by the male moon god taught. Called the eighth, and lord of the eighth region, as the place of rising again from the dead in the orb of the moon. There was a lunar mythology extant long before it was known that the lunar orb was a reflector of the solar light. There was a time also when it was not known, and could not be divined, that the moon which dwindled and died down visibly was the same moon that rose again from the dead. Hence there were two different messages conveyed from heaven to men on earth, by the hair as messenger for the moon in the lunar myths of the Hottentots and other primitive races. In one of these versions the moon declared that, as it died and did not rise again from its grave, even so was it with man, who went down to the earth and came back no more. But, when it had made out that the same moon returned as the old orb renewed, the nature of its revelation was reversed. Its message now contained a doctrine of the resurrection from the dead for man as well as moon. The re-arising and transforming orb at last proclaimed that even as it did not die out altogether, but was renewed from some hidden spring or source of light, so was it with the human race. Who were likewise renewed to relive on hereafter like the moon. In a myth of the Caroline Islanders it is said that at first men only quitted this life on the last day of the dying moon, to be revivified when the new moon appeared. But there was a dark spirit that inflicted a death from which there was no revival. This dark spirit, with its fatal message, was primary in fact, and the true assurance of survival, like the moon, depended on its being identified as the same moon which rose again. It is in this way that we can rethink the primitive thought, by getting it rethinked in the physical realities of natural phenomena. In the Ute mythos, the task of making a moon was assigned to Whip Poor Will, a god of the night. The frog offered himself as a willing sacrifice for this purpose, and he was transformed by magical incantations into the new moon. The symbolism is identical, whether derived from Egypt or not. So is it when the Buddha offers his body as a sacrifice, and transforms himself into the lunar hare. The Maoris have a tradition of the first children of earth, in which they relate that the earliest subject of human thought was the difference between light and darkness. They were always thinking what might be the difference betwixt light and darkness. Naturally, the primary conditions of existence observed by primitive men were those that were most observable, and, foremost amongst these, were the phenomena of the day and the dark, which followed each other in ceaseless change. Mythology begins with this vague and merely elemental phase of external phenomena, alternating in night and day. In a secondary stage, it was observed that the battlefield of this never-ending warfare of day and dark was focused and brought to a definite point in the orb of the moon. Where the struggle betwixt the two personified powers of light and darkness went on and on forever, each power having its triumph over the other in its turn. These being depicted in one representation as the solar light and the serpent of darkness, in another by the lion and the unicorn. These phenomena of light and darkness were at first set forth by means of animals, reptiles, birds, and other primitive types of the elemental powers. And lastly the human type was adopted, and the cunning of the crocodile, or the jackal of darkness, is represented by the Egyptian Sut, the Norse Loki, the Greek Hermes, or the Jewish Jacob, the dark deceiver. And today, we find the Christian Evidence Society engaged in defending such characters as that of Jacob, in the full and perfect belief that Jacob was a human being, and one of God's chosen race. Whereas, he was no more a person than was Satanup in Egypt, or Reynard the Fox in Europe. The human form, like that of the earlier animal type, was only representative of some power manifested in natural phenomena. 
This mode of representation was known when these sacred stories were first told of mythical characters, it was afterwards continued and taught in the so-called mysteries, by means of the Gnosis. When the art or Gnosis was lost to the world outside, the ancient histories were ignorantly supposed to be human in their origin. Mythology was euhemerized, that is, the ideal was mistaken for the real, and Egyptian mythology was converted into Hebrew miracles and Christian history. Thus when the Iroquois Indians claim that the first ancestor of the red man was a hare, we do not know what that saying means until we learn the representative value of the symbol. So is it all sign writing through? When Herodotus went to Egypt, he recognized the originals of the gods that were adored, amplified, embellished, or laughed at in Greece. At present, however, the Molarites dare not mention Egypt, but look askance at those who do. Here is a crucial instance of survival, evidenced by philology the name of Mars as Ares will serve to prove how Egyptian underlies the Greek. The planet Mars is called Hartash in Egyptian, which signifies the Red Lord, or the Lord of Gore. Sidrinus writes the name of Ares as Hartosai, and Vettius Valens as Hartz, whence Artis, and finally Ares. Again, the name of Hera denotes the heaven, over, in Egyptian, which certainly describes the nature of the Greek goddess of that name. When we are told by the Roman Catholic Egyptologist, Renouf, that neither Hebrews nor Greeks borrowed any of their ideas from Egypt, we can only think of such a dictum as an intentional blind. Or as a result of putting up the glass to an eye that cannot see. It is simply impossible for the non-evolutionist, the bigot bibliolator, or the Mullerite, to interpret or to understand the mythology of Egypt. Its roots go deep, and its branches spread too far, for their range of thought. And now, let me offer a remarkable example of the modes in which the Egyptians expressed or tinged their thoughts, by means of external phenomena. The sun god Ra is represented as possessing fourteen spirits or cause, the living likenesses and glorified images of himself. These are portrayed as fourteen personages at Edfu and Dendera. In one text it is said, Hail to thee and thy fourteen spirits fourteen times. These are also mentioned in the tablet of Ipsambul, as the fourteen cause of Ra, which, Tot has added to all his ways. Tot is the moon god, and this gives us a clue to the fourteen spirits, which, I think, no Egyptologist has yet suspected. But Tot is the god of the first fourteen days of the moon's lunation, and fourteen nights of the new moon reproduced the likeness of the solar god in light fourteen times over, these were designated his apparition seen nightly in the moon. Indeed, the moon in its dark half was treated as the mummy or unilluminated body of the sun god, who is described as coming to visit, to comfort it, to beget upon it, in the underworld. This lunar body of the solar soul is represented by the ass-headed god Aai, upon which the sun god rode, who is found mummified on the tomb of Ramesses VI. Thus, the dark orb or body of the moon was the mummy of the sun, and its fourteen days of growing light were thought of as fourteen manifestations of the solar god in spiritual apparition, visible by night in the moon. Hence it will be seen how natural it was that the lunar orb should be looked up to as the home of spirits, as when the Egyptian prays that his soul may ascend to heaven in the disk of the moon. Another fable of the dark half of the lunation has been preserved by Plutarch, who relates that when Typhon, the evil power, was hunting by moonlight, he by chance came upon the dead body or mummy of Osiris prepared for burial, and, knowing it again, he tore it into fourteen parts, and scattered them all about. These fourteen parts typify the fourteen days of the lessening light, during which the devil of darkness had the upper hand. The twenty-eight days made one lunar month according to Egyptian reckoning. The earlier and simpler representation of the lunar light and dark is portrayed in the myth of the two brothers, who always contend for supremacy over each other. The most ancient and primitive myths are found to be the most universal. And this of the twin brothers is extant all over the world. It is the myth of Suthorus in Egypt, the Asvins or Krishna and Bulrama in India, the crow and the eagle of the Australian blacks, Tsunigom and Ganab among the Hottentots. Jack and Jill, and twenty other forms that I have compared in my Natural Genesis. 
It is that struggle of two brothers in the beginning which is represented in the Hebrew book of Genesis as the murderous conflict of Cain and Abel. Cain as the victor is the same character as the Egyptian kunsu, kun or ken, meaning to chase, hunt, beat, be the victor, and therefore I take it that the name of Cain is probably one with the Egyptian kun. Abel is the dark little one that fades and falls and passes away, the one who becomes a sacrificial type, because of the nature of the phenomena. The conqueror is portrayed as the killer. The Gnostic Cainites, however, maintain truly that Cain derived his being from the power above, and not from the evil power below. They knew the mythos. The contention of Jacob and Esau for birth and for the birthright is another form of the same myth. Esau, the red and hairy, is really the Lord of Light in the new moon. Jacob is the child of darkness, hence the deceiver by nature and by name. A Jewish tradition relates that Esau, when born, had the likeness of a serpent marked upon his heel. This shows he was a personification of the hero who bruised the serpent's head, and that Jacob, who laid hold of Esau's heel, was a cotype in phenomena with the serpent of darkness. There is nothing moral or immoral in mere physical phenomena themselves. No fratricide is actually committed by the conquering Cain, nor fraud by the dark and wily Jacob. But when these same phenomena are dramatized, and the characters are made human, or inhuman, as the case may be, the unmoral becomes immoral, and the human image is disfigured by the most willful flaw, or wanton brand of degradation. Cain is made the murderer of his own brother, in the beginning, and that red stain is supposed to run through all human history, as a first result of Adam's fall. And to burn on the brow of man until it is washed out at last in the blood of a redeeming Saviour who is equally mythical. This lunar representation has several shapes in Egyptian mythology, where the twin brothers are Sut and Osiris, Sut and Horus, the two Horuses, Tot and An, or Kunsu and Typhon. In his Hibbert lectures Mr. Renouf says curtly, the Egyptian god, Kunsu is the moon. But such Egyptology has not yet blazed the various surface of the mythology. Such statements teach nothing truly, because they do not put in the bottom facts. They do not help us to think in those phenomena which have been entified or divinest in and as mythology. It may be said quite as bluntly that Kunsu is not the moon. He only represents one phase of the lunar phenomena, which are triadic. Kunsu is the child of the sun and moon. His name denotes the young hero. When this deity was evolved it had been discovered that the moon derived her light from the sun. In the planisphere of Dendera the youthful god Kunsu is portrayed in the disk of the full moon at Easter, where he represents the light and force of the sun that is reborn monthly and annually of the lunar orb considered to be his mother. Who thus reproduces the child of light in the disk of the moon. The same myth is likewise Osirian, as we learn from one of the hymns, where it is said, Hail to thee, Osiris, Lord of Eternity! When thou art in heaven thou appearest as the sun, and thou renewest thyself as the moon. But this renewal of light in the moon was portrayed as the rebirth of the god in the person of his own child. Hence the child Horus is also depicted like the child Kunsu in the disk of the full moon, as both may be seen in the same planisphere of Dendra. Kunsu is the Egyptian Jack the Giant Killer. In the ritual he is called the Slayer of Rebels and Piercer of the Proud. His natural genesis was in the tiny light of the new moon, which rose up with its sharp horns to pierce the powers of night, and drive them out of the darkened orb. The giants of the primitive mind were the powers of darkness, which forever rose up in revolt against the light, kept all life cowering in their shadow by night, took possession of the moon in the latter half of the lunation or covered its face with the blood and dust of battle during the terrible time of an eclipse. Then the little hero, the child of light, arose and made war on the giants, and overcame them as he grew in glory and waxed greatly in the plenitude of his hidden father's power and might. The name of Kunsu's father is Amen, the hidden god, the child Kunsu being his visible representative reborn in the new moon. Mythology is the groundwork of all our theology and Christology and it is only by mastering the plan that we can learn how the superstructure has been built. This character of Kunsu is that of the mythical messiah, or manifester in external nature, 
as a representative of the Eternal in the phenomena of time. In Egypt, Seb Cronus, or time, was designated the true Repa, or heir apparent to the father, Osiris, or Amenare, and the rebirth in time, might be monthly or annually, every 19 or 25, 500 or 2,155, years. According to the particular period, in the mystical or spiritual phase this representative of divinity was the Christ within, the Son of God incarnate in matter, the Christ of the Gnostics who was not a man, their Jesus, who could not be a Jew. Their Redeemer, who was but the immortal principle in man, a deliverer from the degradation, a savior solely from the dissolution of matter, which the Greek poet Linus calls the giver of all shameful things. But to return to the moon mythos. The legend of Samson can now be read for the first time as the Hebrew version of the Egyptian myth of Kunsu, the lunisolar hero who slays the giants or Philistines and overcomes the powers of darkness. It was impossible to read the riddle by supposing, with Steinthal, that Samson was simply the sun god himself, because if he were, in killing the lion he would be only slaying the reflection of himself the lion being a solar type. The name of Shimshan denotes the luminous or shining one, as an emanation of the solar fire. Samson, like Kunsu, is the typical hero. Kunsu is the Egyptian Heracles. Samson, like Heracles, slays the lion, as his first great labor, or feat of strength. This deed is represented allegorically, and is put forth as his riddle. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the mighty came forth sweetness. The mighty one who devours is the lion, and the honey was found in its dead carcass. The Mithraic and Egyptian monuments will enable us to read the riddle. In the Persian we see the lion depicted with a bee in its mouth. The lion, or rather the lioness, was an Egyptian figure of fire the lioness in heat. She was represented, by the goddess of the solar fire and alcoholic spirit, as Seket, who carries the sun's disc on the head of a lioness. The name of this she-lion, Seket, is also the name for the bee, which is the royal symbol of Lower Egypt, and the bee denotes the sweetness in the lion. Now, the fiercest solar heat was coincident with the waters of the inundation, two-thirds of which, according to Horapollo, poured down into Egypt whilst the sun was in the sign of the lion. Seket was also the goddess of sweetness or pleasure we may say literally, goddess of the honeymoon. Hence the association of the lion and the bee, or the honey in the lion. The triumph over the lion may be understood in this way. Seket, the she-lion, impersonated the force of the sun, which was often fatal, hence she was made the punisher of the wicked with hellfire. And this lunar hero, as Heracles, Kunsu, or Samson, was the conqueror in the cool of the night, which followed the fiery fervor of the sun by day. Further, at the time the sun was in the lion sign, the full moon rose vis a vis in the sign of the waterman, or water woman, in the Hermine zodiac, and we cannot read one part of the celestial imagery independently of the other. In this full moon, which brought the sweet, fresh waters to Egypt, the hero attained the height of his glory, as conqueror of the furnace heat which culminated then and there with the sun in the sign of the lioness. As reflector of the fiercest solar fire, as the moon was the bringer of the waters, and the breath of life in the coolness and the dews of night, the lunar hero was not only credited with drawing the sting of Seket, but with extracting honey from the dead lion. When the young hero as son of the sun god, reborn of the new moon, has once more conquered in conflict with his eternal enemy, and he breaks out in triumph, free from the throttling folds of the dragon, of the Sami, or the Philistines. As he ascends aloft he is seen bearing the dark orb of the old moon as a palpable proof of his power. He had burst through the barriers of the underworld, the gates of death and darkness, and so it would be fabled that he carried the barriers away with him, and bore them visibly on high to the summit of the lunar ascent. It is so represented when Samson not only breaks out of Gaza, but tears up the city gates, and carries them away by night with their posts, bolts, and bars, to the top of the hill, or mountain of the moon, as the lunar height was called. The solely lunar nature of the hero is shown by the number 30, the 30 days to the month in the solely lunar reckoning. Samson has 30 companions. He smote 30 men at Ascalon, and spoiled them of 30 changes of raiment. 
The number 7 is also an all-important factor in the lunar mythos, with its 28 days to the month. In the cuneiform legend of Ishtar the goddess descends and ascends through seven gates, each way in her passage to and from the netherworld, as female representative of the moon. So when Sut Typhon, the dark one of the lunar twins, was beaten by Horus, he is described by Plutarch as fleeing from the battle during seven days on the back of an ass. In each case the number seven signifies one quarter of a moon. The number seven, answering to one lunar quarter, is prominent in the legend of Samson. In one phase he tells Delilah that if he is bound with seven new bowstrings his strength will depart, and he will become weak, and be as another man. But when these are applied to him they are snapped like a string of fire-singed tow. We may suppose this phase to represent the first seven days of the growing crescent moon. Hence the seven new bowstrings, which are in keeping with the seven strings of the lunar harp. In the second phase the hero is bound with new ropes, which he freed himself from as if they had been thread. Fourteen days brings us to the moon at full, and to the culmination of Samson's glory. Then he confesses to his charmer that if the seven locks of his head are shaven off his strength will assuredly depart. Now, hair is an especial, primitive type of virility, potency, and power. In the Egyptian ritual the Osirified as Horus, ascends the heaven with his long hair reaching down to his shoulders as a type of his growing glory. Moreover, Samson's hair, the emblem of his strength, is in seven locks. These answer to the seven nights of the quarter in which the lunar splendor comes to the full, and the opposing powers of darkness, called the Philistines, are very literally, cleared out. When this period is past, and the hero is shorn of his hair, the Philistines are upon him once more. This time the drama is to come to an end. But not without an intimation of its being continued or repeated in the next new moon, for the narrative confesses conscientiously that Samson's hair began to grow again after he was shaven. But for the present the powers of darkness prevail. And having shorn the hero of his glory during seven nights, and brought him low, they put out his sight and bind him with fetters of brass, eyeless in Gaza, pitiful and forlorn as, blind Orion hungering for the morn. The eye of the blinded Horus being put out by Sut, who was at the head of the Typhonian powers, called the Sami, or conspirators, is identical in the Egyptian mythos with the putting out of Samson's eyes in the Hebrew version. In the Osirian myth, however, it is the eye of Horus that is wounded, the eye that is swallowed by Sut. The eye that is restored at dawn of day, and this one-eyed form of the mythos survives in the account of Samson's blindness when he prays for strength enough to avenge the loss of one of his two eyes, as we have it in the margin. The lunar light was the eye of the sun, but this becomes the two eyes of the hero when he is rendered according to the complete human likeness, which shows us how the mythos was rationalized as history. It is Delilah who causes the ruin of Samson, just as Ishtar, called Goddess 15, as the moon at full, is the ruin of her lovers, in the legend of Ishtar and Isdabar, where she is charged with being an enchantress, a poisoner. A destroyer of male potency. Isdabar, the sun god, reproaches her with witchcraft, her murderous lust, her merciless cruelty, and declines to become her lover himself. According to the myth the lunisolar male divinity was represented in the wane of the light as suffering from the evil influence of the female moon. It is very evident that the myths were made by men. As in case of a fall or catastrophe it was always she who did it. She tempted the poor man, or overcame the god. It was she who had shorn him of his glory, she who had given him poison to drink, and betrayed him to the powers of darkness. She who is the cause of his impotential mood, his waning, languishing, and drooping down. And the true meaning of Delilah's name, I take it, expresses the weakened, worn out, impotent condition of the lunar hero thus brought low the name being derivable from a root signifying to totter, droop. And hang inertly down Delilah being the personified cause of this emasculated condition of the reduced and wretched, bound and blinded lunar god, the mighty hero in his fallen state. The Danes have a lunar Delilah or Lady of the Moon, who is described as being very beautiful when seen in front, but she is hollow behind, she plays upon a harp of seven strings, and with this she lures young men to her on purpose to destroy them. The Hebrews have a Talmudic tradition that Samson was lame in both his feet. 
And this was the status or condition of the child Horus, who was said to be maimed and halt in his lower members, the crippled deity, as he is called by Plutarch. Other scattered fragments of the true myth are to be found, for instance, in the lunar triad of the mother and the twin brothers, one of them accompanies the female moon during the first half of the total lunation, the other during the latter half. And this appears to be reflected by the Hebrew mythos when Samson's wife is given to his companion whom he had used as a friend. Again, the jackal was an Egyptian type of the dark one that devoured by night, and of Sut, the thief of light in the moon, he who swallowed the eye of Horus. Jackal and fox are co-types, and they have one name, that of Shugal, the howler, in Hebrew. This enables us to understand the story of the three hundred foxes or jackals in the Jewish form of the myth. Samson being the representative of the sun god who drives the darkness out of or away from the lunar orb, and does all the damage he can to the Typhonian powers, or Philistines. The storyteller multiplies the jackal to enhance the triumph of his hero. And instead of the struggle between Horus and the jackal-headed Satanup, we have the more difficult feat of catching three hundred jackals and setting fire to their tails, so that they might consume the crops of the Philistines, or, in other words, burn out the darkness from the orb of the moon. It is probable that Mitra, son of Ahura Mazda, a natural opponent of the dark power, is the same representative of the god of light, reflected in the moon as the witness by night for the absent sun. It may be noted that Matra in Egyptian means the witness, or more fully, the witness for our A. The scene portrayed on the Persian monuments is nocturnal, and the time of year is that of the sun's entrance into the sign of Scorpio, where it is deprived of its virility. At this time the moon rises at full in the sign of the bull, the first of the superior signs. The lord of light in the moon is now the dominating power during six months. Thus Mithras slaying the bull is equivalent to Samson killing the lion, or overcoming the fierceness of the solar fire, and also of Osiris doing battle with Sut Typhon and conquering his terrors in external phenomena. Osiris dies on the seventeenth of the month Athar, which was at the time of the autumn equinox, or rather he enters the six lower signs at that time. An ark was made in the shape of a crescent moon, and on the nineteenth of the same month the priests proclaimed that Osiris was found, his resurrection on the third day being in the moon. Thus it was in the new moon that the dead Osiris first returned to life in the form of his own son. Our modern solarite interpreters can talk of little else but the sun, the dawn, and the dark. Mr. Renouf, in his Hibbert lectures, identifies Sutanubis with the twilight, or as the dusk. Hence, when it is said in the texts that he swallowed his father Osiris, this on the face of it looks like the darkness of night swallowing the disappearing sun. But Egyptian mythology is by no means so simple as that. It is not to be fathomed on the face of it, nor can it be interpreted without such a knowledge of the total typology, as the Aryan school all put together do not possess. There is nothing simply solar in it anywhere. It is true that Sut represents the presence and the power of darkness. It is true that the nocturnal sun in the underworld was called Osiris, or Adam, or Amenare. Also, the setting orbs of light were represented as being swallowed down by the crocodile or some other type of the devourer. But the continual conflict and alternate victory of light and darkness were seen to have their most obvious, most visible, most interesting field of battle in the moon. It was there the watchers observed the never-ceasing struggle for the birthright of the twin brothers, who personated the opposing powers. The Dark One was first born from the Mother Moon at full. But the Light One was acknowledged to be the genuine heir apparent. There is a myth of the blind Horus in which he is described as sitting solitary in his darkness. Sud is said to have swallowed his eye, or to have wounded it, and put out the sight. In one text Horus says, Behold, my eye is as though Sut, Anup, had pierced it. In another he cries, I am Horus. I come to search for mine eyes. Sut, who swallows the eye, is made to restore it again. In one account the eye is said to be restored at the dawn of day, that is in the vague stage of the conflict between the darkness and the light. At one time, says Plutarch, Sut smote Horus in the eye, this represented the diminution of the moon. At another he plucked the eye out and swallowed it, afterwards giving it back to the sun. 
this blinding denoted the eclipse. In the lunar phase of the mythos the eye of light, or of the sun, is the moon. The moon at full was the mirror of light, hence it was the mother of Horus as the child of light. But the eye was the primitive mirror. So the moon was called the eye of the sun, when it was known as a reflector of the solar light. Thus the lunar orb was the consort of the sun, his eye by night, as the reproducer of his light when he was in the underworld, and in reproducing the light she was as the mother bringing forth his child. For instance, the cow was a type of the moon as Hathor, or as Adi, and when the cow is portrayed with the solar disk between her horns, the imagery denotes the mother moon as bearer of the sun, that is, as reproducer of the solar light in the lunar orb, or, as it was also said, in the eye. For this reason the mother of Horus, child of light, is also described as being the eye of Horus, the moon mirror in which the father Osiris made babies in the eye, as the poets say, or was reflected as Horus, the child of light. Reborn monthly of the moon as his mother. The lunar god Tot is sometimes portrayed with the eye of Horus, or the new moon in his hand. And the goddess Mary equals Mary bears the eye upon her head, as typical reproducer of the child. Now this is the eye that was swallowed by Sut. When the power of darkness had put out the lunar light, the eye was not only pierced but swallowed, as the phenomena were rendered in the mythos. Moreover, as Osiris had become the father of all, he was also the acknowledged father of Sut. And as it was the father who was reflected by the mother moon, or the eye, Sut may be said to have swallowed his own father when he obscured the lunar light, or swallowed it with the darkness during an eclipse. This was the symbolic eye that was full on the fourteenth of the month in the lunar, or on the fifteenth in the solilunar reckoning, or on the thirtieth epiphy, when the eye of the year was full, according to the Egyptian ritual. The swallowing of Osiris by Sut belongs to the solilunar phenomena. Plutarch tells us that some of the Egyptians held the shadow of the earth, which caused an eclipse of the moon, to be Sut Typhon. By aid of which we can identify the original dragon of the eclipse. The mythical and celestial dragon, as I have elsewhere demonstrated, was founded on the crocodile as the natural type of the swallowing darkness. The crocodile is the swallower of the lights as they go down in the west, and the tail of the crocodile reads cam, i.e., black, darkness. Typhon, both male and female, is represented by the crocodile, the dragon of the waters and of darkness. Now the most thrilling and fearsome act of the lunar drama was during the period of eclipse. There is something very weird, uncanny, and unked, in the projection of the earth's shadow across the luminous face of the moon. To the primitive mind it was the crocodile above, or the dragon, swallowing the orb of light, or Sut swallowing his father Osiris. An eclipse was the mealtime of the monster. An eclipse was the scene of the great battle between Horus and Sut, or Horus and the dragon, and the great battle was identical with that of our George and the dragon. The same struggle between the powers of light and darkness is portrayed in the book of Revelation when the woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, is about to bring forth her man-child. And the great dragon of Eclipse stands before her ready to devour the child as soon as it is born. In the oldest astronomy the years were reckoned by the eclipses, as it was in Egypt, China, and India. And the most ancient type of time or Cronus, as Egyptian, is Sevek, the crocodile-headed god, that is, the dragon of eclipse who annually swallowed the moon containing the Lord of Light or his infant image. According to the mythical mode of representing the natural fact, three days and three nights were reckoned for the absence of the lunar light, between old and new moon. And the Lord of Light in the lunar orb was said to be swallowed by a dragon or a monster fish and to remain for that length of time in its belly. The legend is Egyptian. The great fish is the crocodile, the dragon of the deep. This is called the fish of Horus in the ritual. The crocodile first denoted the earth as the swallower of the lights before it became the water dragon, and so the manifester, as Horus, Jonah, Tangaroa, or the Christ could be three days in the earth or the great fish previously to his resurrection. Types and stories might be manifold, the fact signified was always the same. Hence the Jonah of the Hebrew version is identical with the Christ, not as type of him, where all is typical. 
and in the Roman catacombs the Jonah of one version is the Christ of the other. Jonah issues from the great fish in the form of the child Christ. Thus the origin of the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, or in the crocodile, is to be found in lunar phenomena. In a later form of the Osirian legend the twins are the double Horus, instead of the Sut Horus of the Typhonian myth. In this we see the little dark child Ilus, Solus, maimed in his lower members, going into Tatu to meet his soul, his other self, his glorified body, the double, like that of Buddha, which was called his diamond body. This other self is designated the soul of the sun, and it is this which revivifies, regenerates, and transforms the child of the mother moon into the virile Horus, the new moon horned and pubescent. There is a tradition preserved by Plutarch that the child Horus, the crippled deity, begotten in the dark, was the result of Osiris having accompanied with Isis after her decease, or with Nephthys her sister, below the horizon. Even this representation is perfectly correct according to the natural phenomena. Isis personates the moon, which dies to be again renewed. The renewal occurs in the underworld, and is out of sight or all in the dark. Osiris, as the sun below the horizon is the renovator of the old, dead orb of the moon, which he causes to relive with his light. Hence the fable of his accompanying with Isis after her demise is in accordance with the mythical mode of representing the phenomena of external nature in human imagery. In one of its phases the moon was portrayed in the character of a thief, which was personated by the jackal, ape, or wolf, who represented Goddess 15. Ishtar is described as ascending and descending the steps of the moon, so many days up and so many days down of these days there would be fifteen altogether, in accordance with her name of Goddess 15. And here the Christian Mary can be identified in this lunar character by means of the apocryphal gospels, that contain legends of the infancy which are of primary importance, hence they have been denounced as spurious, excommunicated as heretical, and kept out of sight by papal commands. In Pseudo-Matthew, ch. 4, we learn that when the Virgin was an infant, just weaned, she ran up the fifteen steps of the temple at full speed, without once looking back. At this age she was regarded as an adult of about thirty years. The story of the fifteen steps is repeated in the Gospel of Mary's Nativity, ch. 6, where the fifteen steps are associated with the fifteen Psalms of Degrees. Further, it was on the fifteenth day of the moon that the dark one of the twins was reborn, as the lessening, waning one of the two. And in the history of Joseph the carpenter, Jesus says that Mary gave him birth in the fifteenth year of her age, by a mystery that no creature can understand except the Trinity. The Trinity being lunar, the subject matter is identical according to the gnosis of numbers, and Mary is also a form of the goddess fifteen, Mary, or Hathamary, in the Egyptian mythos. It is only in lunar phenomena that we can see how the child could be born from the side of its mother, as Sut Horus was, as well as the Buddha, or the Christ. Also, the divine child, as Buddha, was said to be visible whilst in the mother's womb. The womb of the mother being the lunar orb in which the child and embryo can be seen in course of growth, it was represented as being transparent with the child on view. The child Jesus is so portrayed in the Christian pictures of the ancient Virgin Mary, as may be seen in Didron's iconography. The birth of the dark one of the mother moon's two children, depends upon that part of the lunar orb which is turned away from the sun, being dimly seen through the light reflected from our earth. As the light began to lessen, and the orb became opaque, there was an obvious birth of the dark part of the moon. That was the birth of the little, dark one, of the lunar twins. So fine a point of departure from the light half to the dark, and from the dark half to the light, may be likened to a single hair as it was in the Hindu mythos which represents Krishna as being born from a single black hair and Balrama from a single white hair of Vishnu. This is, probably, the mythical meaning of a saying attributed to the Christ in the Gospel of the Hebrews, and straightway, said Jesus, the Holy Spirit, my mother, took me and bore me by one of the hairs of my head. To the great mountain called Thabor. The exact color of the dark orb is slate black, and this has been preserved in India as the complexion of the dark child, Hari, or Krishna. These types of the light and dark twins were certainly continued as the twofold Christ in Rome, one form of whom is the little black bambino of Italy, 
the Christ who was black for the same reason that Sut was black in Egypt. And Krishna was blue-black in India. He was black, because mythical, and not because the word was humanly incarnated as a nigger. He was black because he was the child of the Virgin Mother as the moon. One type of the twins found in the lunar phenomena has been humanized in the story of Jesus and John, these can be traced back to Horus and Sut, who is An or Anup, the Egyptian John. These two appear in the ritual as the precursor, and the one who is preferred to him who was first in coming. Speaking in the twin character, the Osirified deceased says, I am Anup in the day of judgment. I am Horus, the preferred, on the day of rising. Anup presided over the judgment, so John the precursor proclaims the judgment, and calls the world to repentance. Jesus comes as the preferred one on the day of his rising up out of the waters, when John the precursor says of Jesus, After me cometh a man which is become before me. John's was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ye ready the way of the Lord. I make way, says Horus, by what Anup, the precursor, has done for me. The twin lunar characters of John and Jesus can be identified in the Gospel where John says of Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease. So the title of the Akkadian moon god, Sin, as the increaser of light, is Inuzana, the lord of waxing. In the Mithraic mysteries the light one of the twins was designated the bridegroom, and in one passage we meet with the bridegroom and the bride, that is the lunar mother of the twins and Christ as the bridegroom. John Persona tells the Dark One. Like Satanup, he is not the light itself, and only bears witness to the light. The Christ or Horus was consort to the Mother Moon, and the reproducer of himself. John says of him, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. These three, the bride, bridegroom, and John, are a perfect replica of the lunar trinity. John represents the dark half of the moon, the child of the mother only, and he is unmistakably identified by Jesus in or as this mythical character when he says of his forerunner, Among them that are born of woman there is none greater than John. Yet, he that is but little in the kingdom of God is greater than he. That is, among those who are reborn in the likeness of the Father. As Horus was when the solar god rebegot him in his own image as the reflection of his hidden glory reproduced by the new moon the least of these is greater than he who was born of the mother alone. As we have seen, the fox and jackal were both of them Typhonian types of the dark power, the thief of light in the moon, and co-types, therefore, with the dragon that swallowed the moon during an eclipse. Now, the name of Herod in Syriac denotes a red dragon, and the red dragon in Revelation, which stands ready to devour the young child that is about to be born, is the mythical form of the Herod who has been made historical in our Gospels. Here the legendary devourer, the dark half of the lunation. The Germans have a saying that the wolf is eating the candle when there is what is still called a thief in it. So the primitive observers saw the dark encroaching on the light, and they said the wolf, jackal, rat, or other sly animal was eating the moon as the thief of its light. This is why Hermes was represented as the thief. In two different forms of the lunar mythos the jackal and the dog-headed ape were two types of this thief of the light. And in the zodiac of Dendra, just where Horus is on the cross, or at the crossing of the vernal equinox, these two thieves, Satanup and An, are depicted one on either side of the lunisolar god. These two mythical originals have, I think, been continued and humanized as the two thieves in the gospel version of the crucifixion. The character of the thief still clings to the man in the moon. In a North Frisian folktale the man in the moon is fabled to have stolen branches of willow, or the sallow palms, which he has to carry in his hands forever. Here we can identify the palm branch of the man in the moon as Egyptian. The palm branch was a type of time and periodicity. Horapollo tells us it was adopted as the symbol of a month, because it alone produces one additional branch at each renovation of the moon, so that in reckoning the year is completed in twelve branches. A form of this appears as the tree of life in the book of Revelation. The palm branch is carried by Tot, the man in the moon, and scribe of the gods, who reckon time by means of the lunations, and this evidently survives in the Frisian legend. 
He who once reckoned time by means of the shoots on the palm branch became the picker-up or stealer of willow wands or sticks, according to the later folklore. Also, when the moon god was superseded by the sun as the truer reckoner of time, the character of the lunar deity suffered degradation. We find the same contention going on as there was between the number 13 and 12. When the year was reckoned by 13 moons of 28 days each, 13 was then the lucky number, a charm of primroses or a sitting of eggs was 13, but when this was changed for the 12 months of solar time. Then the number 13 became unlucky or accursed. The day of rest being changed from Saturday, the old lunar god was charged with being a Sabbath breaker. He stole sticks, he strewed brambles and thorn bushes on the paths of people who went to church on Sunday, the day of the sun. He did not keep the day of rest, but would go on working, or reckoning time with his palm branch, Sundays as well as weekdays, and so he was doomed to stand in the moon for all eternity as a warning to wicked Sabbath breakers. Tot, or Kunsu, is the Egyptian man in the moon, who in the dark half of the period was represented by the dog-headed ape, and from these came our man in the moon with his dog. The Creek Indians have the same myth. They say the inhabitants of the moon consist of a man and his dog. The ass was another Typhonian type of the moon. In an Egyptian representation, it is by the aid of the ass-headed god Aai that the solar divinity ascends from the underworld where the dark powers have their time of triumph over him by night. The ass is portrayed in the act of hauling up the sun god with a rope from the region below. That is one mode of expressing the fact that the moon here represented by the ass was the helper of the sun by night, in his battle against the powers of darkness gave him a lift up, or, it may be, a ride. Again, in the Persian form of the lunar myth, it is the ass that stands on three legs in the midst of the waters, who is the assistant of Sothis, the dog star, in keeping time. The three legs of the ass are a figure of the moon in its three phases of ten days each, like the three legs of the frog in the Chinese myth. Also, the head of the ass is an Egyptian hieroglyphic sign which has the numeral value of thirty, or a solely lunar month. Thus we find the ass fighting on the side of the sun by night in the Egyptian mythos, and against the waters of the deluge, as a timekeeper in the Persian legend. In the Hebrew version the jawbone of the ass, a type of great strength, becomes the weapon of power with which Samson slays the Philistines, or fights the sun god's battle by night against his enemies that lurk in darkness. The ass, as a lunar type, was also represented as the bearer of the solar messiah, just as the cow carries the sun between her horns as reproducer of his light in the moon. The moon at full was the genetrix under either type. The lessening, waning moon was her cult the foal of an ass. The new moon, as the young lord of light, came riding in his triumph on the ass, as the new moon on the dark orb of the old mother moon. Now, in the apocryphal Gospel of James, called the Protevangelium, the Virgin Mary is described as riding on the ass when Joseph sees her laughing on one side of her face, and crying or being sad on the other. Which corresponds to the light and dark halves of the moon. She is lifted from the ass to give birth to the child of light in the cave. In the Greek myth Hephaestos ascends from the underworld riding on the ass, the wine god having made him drunk before leading him up to heaven. In the Hebrew version the Shiloh is to come, binding his ass to the vine, his eyes red with wine, his garments drenched in the blood of the grape, and he is as obviously drunk as Hephaestos. This imagery was set in the planisphere, ages before our era, as the forefigure and prophecy of that which was to be fulfilled in the Christian history, according to the canonical Gospels. Now it can be seen how the Messiah may be said to come riding on an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass, although it is pitiful enough to give one the heartache. To expose the miserable pretenses under which this mythical messiah has been masked in human form, and made to put on the cast-off clothing of the pagan gods, and play their parts once more. This time to prove the real presence of a god in the world. It was as the mother moon that Ishtar of Akkad was designated Goddess 15, she being named from the full moon in a month of thirty days. The same fact is signified in the Egyptian ritual, ch. 80, when the woman of the moon at full orb exclaims, I have made the eye of Horus, the mirror of light, when it was not coming on the festival of the fifteenth day.
She is the Egyptian form of the the swallower of the moon. Is impersonated as a Jewish ruler who commands all the innocent little ones to be murdered in order that he may include the child Christ reborn for the overthrow of him who can only rule in the kingdom of darkness. Now, if we bear in mind that fox, jackal, wolf, and dragon are equally Typhonian types of the evil one, the destroyer, we may possibly interpret a particular epithet applied to Herod, the destroyer, by the Christ in the Gospel according to Luke. When Jesus is told that Herod would fain kill him, he said unto them, Go and say to that fox, Behold I cast out devils and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I am perfected. The scene is obviously in the underworld, where the moon god descended during the three dark nights before he rose again or was perfected on the third day. It was here that the god as Kunsu, the caster out of demons, or Horus, performed cures and exorcised the evil spirits that infested the departed in their underground passage where the dragon Herod, or the Typhonian reptile Hera, lurked. And sought to kill the healer of the diseased and deliverer of the dead. Having identified Herod, the mythical monster, with the dragon, and as the fox, we may carry the parallel a little farther, and perhaps identify him as the traditional murderer of John. As already shown, in the Christian continuation of the legend, John takes the place of Tadon, the dark one of the lunar twins. John and Jesus are equivalent to On and Horus. In the apocryphal or legendary lore, John is often identified with and identified as the primary Messiah. He is so in the apocryphal Gospel of James. In this, Herod is seeking the life of the divine child, and he sends his servants to kill John. We read that, Herod sought after John, and sent his servant to Zechariah saying, Where hast thou hidden thy son? And Herod said, His son is going to be the king of Israel. Here it is John who is to be the infant Messiah whose life is sought by the destroyer Herod, and the fact, according to the true mythos, is that John represents the first and that one of the lunar twins whom Herod, or the Typhonian devourer, does put an end to, because he personates the dark half of the lunation, the waning, lessening moon, that darkens down and dies. In the zodiac of Dendra we see the figure of Anup portrayed with his head cut off, and I doubt not that the decapitated An or Anup is the prototype of the Gospel John who was beheaded by Herod. In the planisphere Anup stands headless just above the river of the Waterman, the Greek Eridanus, Egyptian Iritana, the Hebrew Jordan. And we are told that the Mandates, who were amongst the followers of John, had a tradition that the river Jordan ran red with the blood which flowed from the headless body of John. As I have previously pointed out, the Christ of the Gospel according to Luke has several features in common with the moon god Kunsu, the healer of lunatics and persons possessed, who was likewise lord over the pig, a type of Typhon. The Evil Power Kunsu followed Tot, as child of the sun and moon, after Tot had been, so to say, divinized into invisibility. Tot Kunsu is the visible representative, who registers the decrees of the hidden deity, Amenare, the god who seeth in secret. He is particularly the god of health and long life. It is said that he gives years to those whom he chooses, solicits the superior powers for an extension of the lease of life, or asks years for whomsoever he likes, and increases life in fullness and in length for those who do his will. Life comes from him, health is in him, Kunsutat, the reckoner of time. This is because he persona Ted that renewal of light and time which was monthly in the moon. Kunsu is the supreme healer amongst the Egyptian gods, more especially as the caster out of demons and exorciser of evil spirits. He is called the driver away of obsessing influences, the great god, chaser of possessors, and is literally the lunar deity who cures what are now termed lunatics. And it is in this character that the Christ of Luke is particularly portrayed. Chief of the suffering and afflicted who came to be healed by the Christ were the Selniak Samsnoi, or those who were lunatic. Curiously enough they came to him on the mountain, where the swine were feeding that is, where the moon god, Kunsu, holds the typical pig in his hand, denoting the casting out of Typhon, the Egyptian devil. For it is on the mount of the moon, or in the moon at full, that Kunsu is depicted as the driver out of demons and expeller of the powers of darkness, the enemy of Sut Typhon, the Egyptian Satan, whose presence is represented by the pig. In the Ute mythology, the hero, as divine teacher of men, 
sits on the summit of a mountain to think. He says repeatedly, I sat on the top of a mountain, and did think. In the Egyptian mythos, preserved by the Gnostics, Hermes is the divine teacher, who not only thinks, but preaches the Sermon on the Mount. The transfiguration of Osiris in the Mount of the Moon occurred upon the sixth day of the new moon. This ascent of the lunar moon after six days is repeated in our Gospels, and can be paralleled in a myth of the Buddha's transfiguration on the Mount. Here, the six glories of the Buddha's head shone out with a radiance that blinded the sight of mortals and opened the spirit vision, so that men could see spirits and spirits could see men. It was on the Mount of the Moon that Satan shewed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and at that height it may not have been necessary for him to have shown them, as was explained by a German critic, in a map. In Buddha's first temptation the dark Mara causes the earth to turn round, like the potter's wheel, for him to see all the kingdoms of the world, and he promises him that he shall rule the whole four quarters. The quarters are lunar. By comparing the various myths with the gospel versions, we find that Sut and Horus equals Satan and Jesus. Anup and Horus equals John and Jesus. The double Horus equals twofold Christ. Kumsu equals Christ. The French retain a tradition that the man in the moon is Judas Iscariot, who was transported there for his treason to the light of the world. But that story is pre-Christian, and was told at least some 6,000 years ago of Osiris and the Egyptian Judas, Sut, who was born twin with him of one mother, and who betrayed him, at the Last Supper, into the hands of the seventy-two Sami, or conspirators. Who put him to death? Although the mythos became solar, it was originally lunar, Osiris and Sut having been twin brothers in the moon. The man in the moon is often charged with bad conduct towards his mother, sister, mother-in-law, or some other near female relation, on account of the natural origin in lunar phenomena. In these the moon was one as the moon, which was twofold in sex, and threefold in character, as mother, child, and adult male. Thus the child of the moon became the consort of his own mother. It could not be helped if there was to be any reproduction. He was compelled to be his own father. These relationships were repudiated by later sociology, and the primitive man in the moon got tabooed. Yet, in its latest, most inexplicable phase, this has become the central doctrine of the grossest superstition the world has seen, for these lunar phenomena and their humanly represented relationships, the incestuous included, are the very foundations of the Christian trinity in unity. Through ignorance of the symbolism, the simple representation of early time has become the most profound religious mystery in modern lineolatry. The Roman Church, without being in any wise ashamed of the proof, portrays the Virgin Mary arrayed with the sun, and the horned moon at her feet, holding the lunar infant in her arms as child and consort of the mother moon. The mother, child, and adult male, are fundamental, and, as Didron shows, God the Father hardly obtains a place in the Christian iconography for nearly 1,200 years. In this way it can be proved that our Christology is mummified mythology, and legendary lore, which have been palmed off upon us in the Old Testament and the New, as divine revelation uttered by the very voice of God. We have the same conversion of myth into history in the New Testament that there is in the Old the one being affected in a supposed fulfillment of the other. Mythos and history have changed places once, and have to change them again before we can understand their right relationship, or real significance. In the various aspects of the Divine Child, born of the Virgin Mother, the child of prophecy that Herod sought to slay, the Christ in conflict with Satan as his natural enemy. The Christ who transforms in the waters, and is transfigured on the mount, the Christ who is the caster out of demons, the Christ who sends the devils into the herd of swine. The Christ who descends into Hades, or the earth, for three days, to come forth, like Jonah, or as Jonah, from the belly of Hades, or the great fish, the dragon of the waters. Who breaks his way through the underworld, as the conqueror of darkness and disease, death and devil, as the savior of souls, and leader into light. In all these, and other mythical phases, the Christ is none other than the solely lunar hero, identical with Kunsu, with Samson, with Horus, with Heracles, with Krishna, with Jonah, or with our own familiar Jack the Giant Killer. 
It is just as easy to prove that an historic Christianity never existed as it is to demonstrate that the mermaid, or the moon calf, the sphinx, or the centaur, never lived. That is, by showing how they were composed as chimeras, and what they were intended for as ideographic types that never did, and never could, have a place, in natural history. For example, Pliny in his Natural History describes the moon calf as a monster that is engendered by a woman only. This chimera of superstition was originally the amorphous child of the mother moon, when represented by the cow that gave birth to the moon calf. This moon calf had the same origin and birth in phenomena as any other child of the virgin mother. And the mythical Christ is equally the monster, or chimera, that is engendered of the woman only. This is acknowledged when certain of the Christian fathers accounted for the virgin motherhood of the historical Jesus, by asserting that certain females, like the vulture, could conceive without the male. For the vulture was the Egyptian type of the virgin mother, Neith, who boasts in the inscription at Sais, that she did bring forth without the male. Horapollo explains that the Egyptians delineated a vulture to signify the mother, because there is no male in this kind of creature, the female being impregnated by the wind the wind that becomes the holy ghost, or gust. When Mary was overshadowed and insufflated. In his Apology, Justin Martyr tells the Romans that by, declaring the Logos, the first begotten of God, our Master Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin mother, without any human mixture, and to be crucified and dead. And to have risen again and ascended into heaven, we say no more than what you say of those whom you style the sons of Jove. That was true. So far as the mythos went the Christians followed and repeated it after the pagans, but being uninitiated agnostics they continued the mythos as a human history. And Justin is in the position of a simpleton who would persuade the learned men of Rome that the man in the moon is a human being, and that the celestial virgin had brought forth time in person. As the child of the Eternal in a cave by the roadside near Bethlehem, by which means the non-existent had become humanly extant. Naturally, the knowers assumed the mental attitude of the right forefinger laid beside the nose. Such are the mythical bases upon which historic Christianity has reared its superstructure and built its babel, with the view of reaching heaven by means of this, the loftiest monument of human folly ever raised on earth. Instead of mythology being a disease of language, it may be truly said that our theology is a disease of mythology. For myself, somehow or other, I have been deeply bitten with the desire to know and get at the very truth itself in these matters, even though it unveiled a face that looked sternly and destroyingly on some of my own dearest dreams. The other side of this desire for truth is a passionate hostility to those who are engaged in imposing this system of false teaching and swindle of salvation upon the ignorant and innocent at the national expense. As Celsa said of the Christian legends, made false to fact by an ignorant literalization of the Gnosis, what nurse would not be ashamed to tell such fables to a child? We also say with him to those who teach these old wives' fables as the word of God if you do not understand these things, be silent and conceal your ignorance. Anyway, we must let go these gods of external phenomena, whether elemental, zootypological, or anthropomorphic, if we would discover the divinity within, the mystical Christ of the Gnostics. And we can be none the poorer for losing that which never was a real possession, but only the shadow which deluded us with its seeming substance. To find the true we must first let go the false, and, to adapt a saying of Goethe's until we let the half-gods go, the whole gods cannot come. Appendix Greek Mythology and the God Apollo If the author of Juventus Mundi could but turn to Egypt, and make a first-hand acquaintanceship with its symbolism. I think it would enlighten him more than any amount of listening round to those deluding Arianists, respecting the origin, derivation and meaning of the Greek mythology. For example, let us take the case of the god Apollo, who is related to the sun, and yet is not the sun itself. The Solarites can shed no light upon the darkness of Mr. Gladstone's difficulty. Writers who talk about mythology being a disease of language, and know nothing of the gods as celestial intelligencers and timekeepers for men chief of which was the sun, when the solar year had been made out. Still earlier, the moon in its various phases can lend us no aid in penetrating the secrets of this ancient science. Solar worship is good enough for them, but it will not explain mythology to us, or to itself. 
The child of the sun, reborn as lord of light in the moon, has never come within the range of their vision. Yet it is the simple fact in natural phenomena, which was represented mythically as the mode of making it known, of teaching it by means of the gnosis or science of knowledge, as one of the mysteries, so soon as the discovery had once been made. And this is one of the most important of all the factors in mythology. I would suggest to Mr. Gladstone that the Greek Apollo is the same solely lunar personification as is Thoth, Tot or Tehuti, and Kunsu, or the solely lunar Horus, this is, the child of the supreme divinity in Egypt, the solar Ra. As his light by night whilst he himself is the god who is hidden from sight in the underworld is vice due of the dark. Apollo is designated luck genes, or light born. He is the image of the solar deity, the reflection of his glory in the lunar disk. Every phase of character in which Apollo appears, especially as represented by Homer, can be identified as pertaining to the male moon god in Egypt. And the common basis of all may be found in those natural phenomena which are indicated in previous pages. In these natural phenomena, there is a common source, or foundation, to which the functions and attributes of Apollo and Tot, or the lunar Horus, can be referred, and by which the characters may be satisfactorily explained. The relationships of Apollo to Zeus, are exactly like those of Tot to Osiris, the supreme being. It is Tot who gives the Makeru, or word of truth, to the sun god himself. As representative of Ra, his lunar logos, his light in the darkness, he is the word whose promise is fulfilled and made truth by the supreme being, the sun that vivifies and verifies forever. By his word, he drives the enemies from the solar horizon, the insurgent powers of darkness which are fighting eternally against Ra. This is the character of Apollo as the defender of heaven against every assault. These powers of darkness, continually in revolt, ever warring with the sun, were called the giants which taught Kunsu, the giant killer, slays by night, or during the lunar eclipse. Apollo also figures as the destroyer of the giants who were at war with heaven. It is said in the Egyptian texts that Ra created this god, Tot, as, a beautiful light to show the name of his evil enemy, i.e. Typhon, the eternal enemy of the sun. He held up the lamp by night that made the darkness visible, showed the name, the face, the personal presence, of his lurking foe. This also is a character of Apollo, as a representative and kind of deputy providence for Zeus. Apollo is god of the bow. Tot carries the bow of the crescent moon upon his head. Now the hero in the folk tales who is always successful in drawing the great bow in the trial where all his competitors fail, is this god of the new moon, who alone can bend the bow, or bring the orb to the full circle of light once more. He can be identified in the Hindu form of the mythos as Krishna with the bow of Hari. The crescent on the head of Tot is the bow prepared and ready to be drawn to the full against the power of night, and every form of evil that dwells in the darkness. Thus the lunar representative of Ra, with the bow of the young moon on his head, who prepares it month after month, and draws it to the full circle night after night, may be called the preparer of bows. And in Egyptian the name Apuru signifies a preparer of bows, it also means the guide and herald. As the U in Egyptian stands for O, and R for L, we have Apuru equals Apollo. The preparer of bows equals the god of the bow as male divinity of the moon, who was the offspring of the sun and moon, the bowman of the solar god. Mr. Gladstone doubts whether the root of Apollo is Greek, and says he would not be surprised to find it Eastern. All the evidence tends to prove it Egyptian by nature and by name. Apollo is the god of knowledge, past, present, and to come. Tot is the deity of knowledge, past, present, and future the founder of science, lord of the divine words, and secretary of the gods. Apollo is the god of poetry and music. So was Tot. He is the psalmist and singer. He is fabled to have torn out the sinews of Sut Typhon to form the lyre the lyre or harp with seven strings being an image of the new moon, like the bow. Apollo was the god of healing. Tot is the supreme physician and healer. He who is the good savior, as it is written on a statue in the Leiden Museum. Apollo was the bringer of death in a form that was serene and beautiful, 
as became the Lunar Lord of Light, and enlarger of the Lunar Light to the full. The character and function being afterwards applied to the light of life that suffered the passing eclipse of death. One name of Tot is Tek, which signifies to be full. Of course the Greeks did not simply take over the Egyptian mythology intact, nor did they preserve the descent quite pure on any single line. In reapplying the legendary lore, derived from Egypt, to the same phenomena in nature, there would be considerable mixture, amalgamation, change of name, and consequent confusion. The blind Horus of Egypt reappears as the blind Orion in the Greek mythos. This is as certain as that the constellation of Orion, the star of Horus, was named Orion after Horus. His lunar relationship is shown by the recovery of his sight on exposing his eyeballs to the rays of the rising sun just as the eye of Horus was restored to him through the return of light at dawn. Horus in his lunar character is one with Tot and Kunsu in the other cults, that is, the lunar child may be Horus as son of Osiris, or Tot as the offspring of Are, or Kunsu as the child of Amen, the myth being one in different religions. It follows that so far as Orion is identical with Horus he is also, or once was, identical in character with the lunar Apollo, and therefore like him of twin birth with Artemis. Links of this lunar relationship remain. He lives and hunts along with Artemis when his sight has been recovered. He was beloved by Artemis and slain by her because he made an attempt upon her chastity which is a common charge brought against the man in the moon mythology. The bringing on of the lunar mythos upon two different lines of descent, Apollo being a continuation of Tot Kunsu, and Orion of Horus. Would account for the later mixture in the relationship of the various personations the fact and nature being represented under different names for the same character in mythology, as it had been previously in Egypt. Man in search of his soul during fifty thousand years, and how he found it. When Giorgione was challenged to paint a figure in a picture so that the spectator could see all round it, he overcame the difficulty by arranging a mirror at the back to reflect the other half of his subject. In like manner, we have to get all round our present subject with the aid of a reflector. This is to be discovered in some of the symbolic customs of the prehistoric races. The records of primitive and archaic men are only to be read in the things they did, and by aid of the signs they made, from before the time of written language and literature. The earliest human sensations, feelings, and thoughts, had to be expressed by actions long before they could be communicated in words. Gesture language and fetish images originated in this primitive mode of representation. And we have now to penetrate the significance of the actions, and interpret the types employed in a font indefinitely earlier than that of letters. The performers cannot tell us directly what they meant when so many mysterious things were done. They can only make signs to us on certain matters, and we have to translate their dumb show as best we can. Sir John Lubbock says the lower forms of religion are almost independent of prayer, but he does not take into account the fact that long before prayer could be uttered verbally, it was performed and acted by means of sign language. Which we have to read in ancient customs and primitive memorials of the fact. For example, when a crooked pin is thrown into the wishing well as an invocation to the invisible powers, the bent pin is a prayer made permanent in a visible figure, which is extant among the Egyptian hieroglyphics, as the Yutin. A twisted piece of metal, signifying an offering. It was as much the sign of prayer as are the clasped hands, or the body crouching down on bended knees, or the supplication in spoken words. We have to read it as we would a gesture sign. It is a sign in gesture language made to the unseen powers whether for good luck or bad. So when the ear was pierced by the worshipper, as a religious rite, it was a primitive mode of appeal to the deity as the hearer or judge, like the god Adam, who was the first hearer in heaven, among the Egyptian gods. Fortunately, the primitive races of the world, such as the blacks in Africa and Australia, still continue the customs, think the thoughts, repeat the rites, employ the signs, erect the memorials, and revere the images that were the fetishes of the human infancy. These are preserved even by those who can give no account of their origin in the past or their significance in the present, but who simply and sacredly repeat them as a matter of following the example and treading in the track of their forefathers. Now Egypt, which I look upon as the living consciousness of Africa, continued to remember, 
and has left a written record of what was meant by these primitive practices and fetish figures. And in one aspect of the subject, that of the burial customs, the Egyptian Bible, or Book of the Dead, becomes a living tongue in the mouth of death itself. Which enables us to interpret the earlier and most ancient typology of the bone caves found in other parts of the world. The Bongo, Bechuana, and other inner African tribes of today, still prepare their dying relatives for the grave whilst the body is warm and flexible, by pressing the head forward upon the knees, which are bent up against the breast. With the legs flexed upon the thighs. The African customs were continued on the American continent, where they are still extant. The ancient Peruvian mummies, or preserved bodies were similarly, but more perfectly prepared for the last abode on earth. The Comanches, the Pimas of Arizona, and other Red Indian tribes, still prepare their dead for burial in this primitive way. Sometimes a net is thrown over the body of the dying, and as the hold on life is gradually relaxed, the net is drawn tighter and tighter until the body is bound up to become rigid in that shape for burial. In this position the most ancient form of the mummy is still made almost alive. And that was the most ancient mode of burial known on earth. It can be traced back in Europe to the time of the Paleolithic or First Stone Age. And there are data extant which carry that age and its customs back, in round numbers, for some 50,000 years. The custom was common amongst the most primitive races of the world, including the blacks of the southern hemisphere, whether they committed the mummy to the earth, or, like the Tasmanians and Maori, concealed it in the hollow bowl of a tree. Next, when we learn that the primary model of the tomb was the mother's womb and this fact is proved by the figures of the cairns, and by the tree, the coffin, and the vase with female breasts, being types of the mythical great mother of life. And when the identity of womb and tomb is indicated, as it is, by many prehistoric names. And further, when we have compared the images interred with the corpse, we learn for certain that in burying the dead in such a fashion, primitive man was preparing the mummy in the likeness of the fetal embryo, or child in utero. In fact, he was burying it for a future birth. We often hear of our Mother Earth, and the uterine formation of certain cairns in Britain can be identified by means of Egyptian hieroglyphics and symbols, which prove that the tomb was a representative image of the maternal birthplace. Therefore, the dead, some 50,000 years ago, were buried with an idea of reproduction for another life. This mother mold of the beginning is also shown by the navel mounds of the red men in America, the Nabiyoni images of the Hindus, and the nave of the church. By the Mamtor, a bosom shaped hill, and the Mamsi, a Scottish tumulus, in which the dead were returned to the Great Mother, accompanied by various types belonging to the symbolism of rebirth. The Egyptian dead were buried in the Mammesi, or Meskin. Both names literally denote the rebirth place of the mummy. The Meskin is also European. The ancient midden, in which the bones of the dead were preserved, was known as the Miskin. Miskin Balak, in Brittany, is also called Cairn Balak, the terms being convertible. We now know that all descent was first traced from the mother alone, who survived as the virgin mother in mythology, whose son was her own consort. And the earliest form of the burial place was simply feminine. Later on the male type of the producer was added, and both sexes are then represented in the place of burial as the place of rebirth. In Egyptian tombs the male emblem is a sign of rising again, or of being re-erected, as they expressed it, from the female place of rebirth. And that emblem has been found in Italy, buried beneath ten feet of slowly accreted stalagmite A register, probably, of fifty thousand years. To this day the Chinese seek for a burial place just where the male and female features of the ground are most perfectly portrayed in a natural configuration and combination of hollow and mount. It has never yet been determined by philologists whether the British word kum means a hollow between two hills, or the hill itself. Many combs are found in valleys, whereas black kum is a mountain. The fact is, the complete type includes both sexes. This teaches us that the cairn was double, and that the hollow below was the feminine feature, and the mound erected above was masculine. This bisexual type of the burial place was continued in Egypt, with its well below and conical heap above, being a colossal stone cairn. 
and the dual type culminates at last in the nave and spire of the church, which perpetuate the same sexual symbols as the Argayoni or the Nabiyoni of those benighted Hindus, who are denounced by our missionaries for their gross idolatry. It was not idolomania, but a primitive kind of symbolism, a natural mode of thinging their thoughts. This doubles the proof that the dead were buried with the idea of being reproduced. And this parental imagery was employed to continue and convey such an idea to the living. It is here, then, at the outset, that we should have to seek for the true origin of those phallic symbols or sexual images which are found scattered the world over. The types of production having been adopted from nature and perpetuated by the primitive builders in all lands as symbols of reproduction for a future life. Such emblems were no more set up at first as objects of worship or provocation to lasciviousness than the earliest races of men went naked on purpose to display their nudity as an incentive to animal desire. Nor was there any abasement of nature in these things, the human status at the time being too primitive even for any fig-leaf kind of consciousness or shame induced by clothing. Neither were these monuments at all directly related to the religious sentiment. That only comes in here with the aspiration for another life and yearning after the second birth. The religious sentiment did not originate in procreation for this life, but in reproduction for the next, and the true sacredness was conferred on the cairns, mounds, navels, and bosom-shaped hills by the burial of the dead. For it is certain that these types of birth whether found in nature or erected by art, are associated in all lands with the places of burial, or they constitute the sepulchre itself, just as the church is still the burial place. Or stands amid the graves of the dead. Hottentot or British cairns, Indian naval mounds, Hindu dagobas, Irish round towers, and Egyptian pyramids and obelisks, with the taba or female ark at the base, were all erected with one meaning. And each according to the same primitive typology of a resurrection. Going to the stones, preceded going to church, and the people went to them because their dead were buried in or around these, the earliest shrines. The memorial stones were sacred to the dead from the first, as the latest gravestone is today. Some of the stones were carried from land to land and called the bringers of immortality. In support of my theory that the phallic imagery was perpetuated for symbolic uses, and not for direct worship, I would point to the umbilicus or navel type, which, for aught we know to the contrary, may be earlier than the phallic or sexual images. Because the navel unites both sexes under one sign. Be this as it may, the primitive mode of sepulture, the formation of the earliest tomb, together with the monuments reared above, are all founded on the natural organs of the reproductive system, and, architecturally. The so-called phallic faith resolves itself into an objective imitation of the parts of the human body which are devoted to rebirth including the boss umbilicus. Rebirth is the ideal demonstrated by the typical use made of these burial stones in passing the bodies of persons through the various holes and apertures in them at the time of initiation into the mysteries or the transformation of the boy into the man. And rebirth being the fact signified, the serpent-shaped mound was also a tomb, and the living tree a coffin, because the tree and serpent were natural emblems of renewal or rebirth. This natural genesis will likewise account for the mythical Great Mother, who was the earliest of all divinities in all lands being portrayed in the image of the reproducer that unites both father and mother in one person. And who survives today as the Mother Church. Moreover, the emblems buried with the dead from the earliest times are ideographic symbols of perpetuation and reproduction for the life to come. The figure of an eye was common in the tombs of Egypt. The name of it, Yuda, signifies salvation. And to be saved was to be preserved as a mummy waiting to be reproduced or transformed for another life. The eye being a mirror that reflects the image, it was adopted as a type of repetition and reproduction. Thus the eye of Horus is the mother of Horus, and the shoot of new life in the potato comes from the eye, as the place of reproduction. One word serves for both eye and seed in the Ute language. The Egyptians fed the eye with oil. And filling the eye of Horus is synonymous with bringing an offering of sacred oil. The eye being the lamp of light to the body, it was supplied with that which would produce and reproduce the light. Thus, by aid of Egypt, we can understand why the primitive race in Britain, and still further north, 
were accustomed to fill the cups and eyes carved on the capstones that covered their buried dead with offerings of fat. They were filling the lamp of light for the gloom of the grave, and feeding the eye as an emblem of repetition or reproduction. The symbolism still survives when candles are placed in the hands of the corpse, or left with the dead in the tomb. And in ancient Egypt the candle was synonymous with reproduction. It is an extant custom, both with the Kafirs and the English, to cut the hair from the tail of a calf when it is being weaned, and stuff it into the ear of its mother. The hair being a symbol of reproduction, the action denotes a desire for plenty of milk or future progeny, whilst stuffing it into the ear signifies a wish that the prayer may be heard. A drink on the morning after being intoxicated is called, a hair of the dog that bit you. This means a repetition of the dose, and as a symbol of reproduction, hair, in one shape or another, was buried with the dead. Of course the primary type of hair is the skin in which the dead were wrapped for preservation, transformation, and rebirth. In the Egyptian ritual the deceased says to his god, Thou makest for me a skin. This god is characterized as the Lord of the numerous transformations of the skin, which had become a type of renewal, on account of its shedding and renewing the hair. The skin is needed because he has to pass the waylayers who cause annihilation to those who are enveloped. The later shoe, following the skin, is also a type of renewal and reproduction. As such it was placed on the feet of the dead, and is still thrown for good luck after the newly married pair good luck meaning plenty of progeny. The horn of the stag or reindeer was likewise a type of renewal, coming of itself, as does the hair of the skin. Hor Apollo tells us the stag's horn was a symbol of permanence, because of its annual self-reproduction. And when the Greenlander has suffered from an exhausting illness, and he recovers his health, he is said to have lost his former soul, and to have had it replaced by that of a young child or a reindeer. In the bone caves of France adult skulls have been discovered which were trepanned in the lifetime of the owners. And into these the bones of young children had been inserted after death these being typical of rejuvenescence and renewal from childhood as we learn from the hieroglyphics of Egypt. In all likelihood the dog was the first animal to come under the dominion of man, his earliest four-footed friend, his primary ally in the work of progress and civilization. He hunted for the men of the kitchen middens. He was the guide and guard of man in the Paleolithic age, and he was sacrificed to become the typical guide of the poor cave dwellers when they got benighted in the dark of death. The bones of the dog have been found buried with the human skeleton in a very ancient cave of the Pyrenees, in Belgium, and in Britain. Showing that at a period most remote the dog was looked upon as a kind of psychopompus, an intelligent shower of the way, like Satanup, the golden dog or jackal of Egypt, and Hermes in Greece. The dog star in the dark of death a guide to show the way. I have provided myself with a dog's head, says the Egyptian deceased in passing through the tenth gate of Elysium. In like manner English bishops used to be buried with a dog at their feet in the coffin. They, too, were provided with a dog's head or a dog to show them the way. Of course the dog would not have been needed as a typical guide to show them the way if it had not been believed or assumed that there was a way through the dark valley of the dead. This conclusion that there was a door on the other side of the grave as proved by the types and customs had been reached by the men of the bone caves in all probability more than fifty thousand years ago. How, then, did primitive or archaic man attain that certainty of foothold in the dark void implied by these burial customs, and this typology of the tomb, which certainly was felt by many of the prehistoric races, including the black man, the Maori, and the red man, who has no doubt about living on in his happy hunting grounds above. Whereas so many of our own race today are still trying mentally to take that step in the dark, and stumble, because they can find neither foothold nor stair. The question is not to be answered by supposing there was any subjective revelation made to primitive man, which showed him once for all that he was an immortal being, formed in the image of God. It has taken me many years of ceaseless research to learn for myself how lowly and limited, but how natural was the revelation made to primitive man, we shall have to grope on our hands and knees at times to read it. Nor can the subject be approached by any supposition that early man began by conceiving the existence of an immortal soul. Modern metaphysicians may talk glibly enough about concepts of the infinite, of the one God, of a soul, or of pure spirit, 
but primitive man was not a metaphysician, nor the victim of an abysmal subjectivity. That disease is comparatively modern, and the modern metaphysician will be the last man to enter into the mind of primitive men. When we have ransacked the myths of the world, and the legends of its earliest races, we can find no such thing anywhere as a beginning with abstract conceptions. But there is absolute proof everywhere that man founded at first upon his observations of objective phenomena. Primitive man was not a theorist or dealer in ideal notions, not the kind of man to whom ideas are realities, but a stubborn positivist, limited as a limpet, and holding on as hard and fast to the hard rock of his facts. The nebulosity of metaphysic is altogether a later product. My contention is that the invisible world first demonstrated its existence to the early cave dwellers of the human mind by becoming visible to them. It did not dawn on them from any sudden illumination within, nor wake into consciousness as a memory of immortality. Conception did not precede the act of begettal. Nor did they evolve the ghost idea without the ghost itself. The pretensions and impostures of modern theology have tended to make these simple naturalists of the past look like impostors too, although they were not. At least they are not in the eyes of those who are acquainted with the abnormal phenomena occurring in our own time, which enable us to understand the same phenomena as a factor of knowledge and religion in the past. I say knowledge, for in his way prehistoric man was a Gnostic, and the Gnostics founded their religion from the first upon knowledge. By means of knowledge they attained their truth. It appears as first sight as if the ancients, having identified the intelligence or nous in man, thought it could be fed forever by the knowledge accumulated in this life. The esoteric Buddhist still expects a perpetuity of existence by means of knowledge, or the gnosis. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead the deceased makes his way from stage to stage of his progress by what he knows. He asserts his right of way by proclaiming, I am the one who knows, I am the Gnostic, I have come, he exclaims, having the writing, the proof. Certain papyri assured a passage, and, prevailing by his papyrus, like Christian with his role, is a title of the deceased. If he knows the first chapter of the ritual in this life the spirit of the deceased can come forth every day as he wishes, and not be turned back, i.e., if he possesses the knowledge of facts, which were demonstrated by the ancient spiritualism. He is shown in the process of creating his eternal soul, by means of the Gnosis, or books of knowledge, those of taught Hermes. He cries, Let me come. Let me spiritualize myself. Let me make myself into a soul. Prevail and prepare myself by the writings of Hermes, or the Gnosis. The immortal nature of the soul having been demonstrated in the mysteries, a knowledge of those mysteries was sufficient to ensure a safe passage through the dark of death, and a sure triumph over all opposing powers. To those who had not the vision. By means of wisdom, says the wise man in the Apocrypha, I shall attain immortality, and to be allied into wisdom is immortality. To know was salvation. Acquiring this wisdom is described in Revelation as eating a little book on purpose to be in the Spirit or be born again in the Spirit, or in the Christ, as Paul has it or to prophesy, or to know how to be entranced and enter spirit world as a spirit, for that is the ultimate fact. Irensis says of the Gnostics, they affirm that the inner and spiritual man is redeemed by means of knowledge, and that they, having acquired the knowledge of all things, stand in need of nothing else, for this is the true redemption. Hence they repudiated the Christian salvation by faith. Irensis, B. I. Chapter 21. 4. The souls which possessed the saving seed of wisdom were considered superior to all others, and the Gnostics held these to be the souls of prophets, kings, and priests, who were consequently endowed with a nature loftily transcendent. They maintain that those who have attained to perfect knowledge must of necessity be regenerated into that power which is above all. For it is otherwise impossible to find entrance within the Pleroma. Irensis, B. I. Chapter 21. 2. In our day such persons are sometimes called mediums or sensitives, in India they are the adepts in the most hidden mysteries. But this gnosis by which the deceased in the ritual prevailed over the destroyers of form, the extinguishers of breath, eclipsers of the astral shade. 
or the stealers of memory for these are among the devourers named this gnosis of redemption and salvation, the gnosis of enduring life, was not merely information or knowledge in our modern sense. It was the gnosis of the mysteries, and all that was therein represented. The ancient wisdom, unlike the modern, included a knowledge of transconditions, from which was derived the Egyptian doctrine of spiritual transformation. This passed on into the Christian doctrine of conversion, and then the fundamental facts were lost sight of, or cast out and done with. The adepts had learned how to transform themselves into spirits, and enter spirit world as spirits among spirits, or as was sometimes said in the totemic transformations, to enter the bodies of beasts a survival of which we have in the werewolf. Hermes describes the abnormal, or transcondition, as a divine silence, and the rest of all the senses. He says, it looseth the soul from the bodily senses and motions, it draweth it from the body, and changeth it wholly into the essence of a god. Then, says Hermes, the soul cometh to the eighth nature, and having its proper power, it can converse, or enter into spiritual intercourse, with the powers that are above the eighth nature. So nirvana becomes a present possession to the esoteric Buddhist, because in trance he can enter the eternal state. This gnosis included that mystery of transformation which was the change spoken of by Paul, when he exclaimed Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not entirely sleep, we shall be transformed. According to the mystery that was revealed to him in the state of trance. This was the transformation which finally established the existence of a spiritual entity that could be detached, more or less, from the bodily conditions for the time being in life, and, as was finally held, forevermore in death. This mystery of regeneration was visibly enacted in life, and taught by the transformers in the early totemic, and later religious, mysteries. Now, in discussing the origin of religious, ideas, writers, as a rule, know nothing whatever of this rootage in the mysteries of abnormal experience. Whereas it is impossible to determine anything fundamental until this dark continent has been explored by those who have adequate knowledge of the facts that were familiar to the primitive races of men and upon which the Gnostic religions were universally founded. Bastian tells us how the African Kazembi, or fetish priest, regards himself as immortal by reason of this power of transformation in trance. The Dakota medicine men can transform themselves, and enter into conscious relationship and alliance with mighty spirits, whose powers they are thus able to make their own. They can also summon spirits, and compel them to appear for others to see. The Egyptian magi, the wise men and pure intelligences, have the phoenix, the bird of transformation in death, for their ideographic sign, which shows that the ultimate nature of their wisdom, as seers or magi, was based on these abnormal conditions of seership. What do you think is the use of telling the adept, whether the Hindu Buddhist, the African seer, or the Finnic magician, who experiences his tula in turn, or superhuman ecstasy, that he must live by faith, or be saved by belief. He will reply that he lives by knowledge, and walks by the open sight, and that another life is thus demonstrated to him in this. As for death, the practical Gnostic will tell you, he sees through it, and death itself is no more for him. Such have no doubt, because they know. The Mosaic and other sacred writings contain no enunciation of a mere doctrine of immortality, and the fact has excited constant wonder amongst the uninstructed. But the subject was not told of old, as matter of written precepts, but as matter of fact, it was a natural reality, not a manufactured idealism. It was not the promise of immortality that was set forth, or needed, when a demonstration was considered attainable in the mysteries of the abnormal human conditions, which were once common enough to be considered a known part of nature. You have got the mosaic writings, but without the older facts that were concealed at their foundations. This is the supreme secret of all secrets in the gnosis of the most hidden mysteries only to be fathomed by those who could enter the abnormal conditions, and be as spirits among spirits, only to be accepted by means of knowledge. In India today the stage of perfect adultship includes, even if it does not absolutely consist in, the power of transformation which occurs in trance, or in the perfect blending of the normal and abnormal faculties, so that, like Swedenborg, the adepts can live and move and have their being in two worlds at once. 
It was by this transformation that our predecessors of thousands of years ago discovered their immortal soul, or link of continuity, through spirit awakenment, produced consciously by various methods of attaining the trance conditions. And in this way the dust of death was first set a sparkle, and the gloom of the grave was brightened, and grew transparent, with the luminous form of what the Egyptians called the Osirified deceased, or the Ka image of the spiritual self. The glorified idolon of man, which was visible to their seers in this life. None but a spiritualist can possibly comprehend the customs, practices, and beliefs of the primitive spiritualists in times past. They were genuine interrogators of nature, however limited their knowledge. But they made much of that which the science of today is inclined to make so little of, or to poo-poo altogether in its ignorance of the value of the prehistoric past of man, and the foundation of religious beliefs. Did you ever read by the light of a glowworm laid on the page of a book? I have so read in the dark. And next morning, by the clearer light of open day, found my tiny lamp had gone out, there was no glow whatever. It was nothing more than a little grey worm. My reading must surely have been hallucination, the merest illusion of the night, in the face of this common daylight fact, to which every person could testify, that the thing did not shine by day. Spiritualism is that little luminous worm, which has shone with its tiny lamp divinely lit through all the darkness of the past. Many of the earlier races learned to read a page or two in the book of nature by the light of it. I have read some curious leaves by means of this little nightlight. Yet the non-spiritualist will take up the glowworm in the broad daylight of our age and show the onlooker that it has no lamp, that it never did shine except as a glamour of deception and illusion in the eyes of superstition. For all that, we know it to be a glowworm still, which goes on shining through the gloom. By the light of this we are, for the first time, able to see through many mysteries of the past, and make out the features of primitive facts, which have been almost effaced or overgrown with fable. Moreover, it has outlived the long night of the past, and weathered all the winds of persecution, it shines on with the enlarging luster of an ever-growing light, and at last our little glowworm is growing luminous by day. It has had a hard struggle for life, more especially during the Christian era, but it would have been strange if that could have been put to death here which puts an end to death itself hereafter. The earliest known form of the priest and the prophet was the medium, or seer. Professor Huxley is quite right in affirming that, although he has little use for the fact in his system of interpretation. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake come, and let us go to the seer, for he that is called a prophet was aforetime called a seer. And the Lord might be consulted cheaply in this way for the small sum of sixpence three farthings. They seem to have paid mediums even worse then than the world does nowadays. Siberian shamanism is a survival of the most primitive kind of spiritualism, based on mediumship and abnormal phenomena. It has no system of religion or ethics, no ritual, precepts, or dogmas, and no definite theology. The shaman can visit spirit world, and the spirits can come to him, speak through him, or become visible at times through his presence. That is its claim, and the sum total of its pretensions. The shaman of the Finns induces the supernormal ecstasy, called the Tula in turn, with the ostensible object of becoming as they phrase it the likeness of the spirit that is in possession of him. We now consider that such transformations do constantly occur, according to a likeness known to the observers, which was previously unknown to the medium. The Tohunga or priest of the Maoris is their medium for spirit intercourse. In Longo, when an adult is about to adopt a new fetish image, the Ganga or priest mesmerizes the postulant to consult him in the trance condition. He listens to the words uttered by the ecstatic, and then the choice is determined by what the somnambule says. The same practice is, or was, extant among the Akajman Indians. One of the Negro methods of treatment, says Bastian, would almost appear to have been plagiarized from our animal magnetisers. In their system it is called dorsal manipulation, and its purpose is to re-isolate the somnambulic subject after contact with the kazembi or magician, and, as they say, for fear that the superabundance of his magical power should otherwise annihilate the victim or the subject, which looks as if they knew more than we do about matters perplexing us today. 
For this practice has the appearance of their being consciously engaged in returning some of the vitality of which the person has been deprived in producing the phenomena of the abnormal state. The West African Indians look to their mediums or magicians for protection against ghosts in general, and pay them to keep the apparitions away. The mediums, wizards, sorcerers, shamans, adepts, and others, who had the power of going out of the body in this life, were feared all the more after death by many tribes. Because they had demonstrated some of the facts which created such fear and terror in the living. And had also been their exorcists and layers of the ghost. I do not suppose that Mr. Herbert Spencer will have included this fact amongst the origins of ecclesiastical institutions. Yet it is a fact that the modern fiction of the ever-living one, in its secondary phase, is founded on mediumship. It is said, the king never dies. The Egyptian king, or Ankh, was the ever-living one on this mystical ground. So was it with the inner African medicine man in a sense which is only to be understood by means of the transformation and transmigration which occurs in trance. We can adduce proof positive that immortality or continuity was originally demonstrated by means of these phenomena, and that in this way prehistoric man first found his enduring soul because it was a common article of faith that only the chiefs, the seers, prophets, and kings of men, could or did obtain immortality that is, the men who demonstrated it. These are the born immortals, the superior souls spoken of by Hermes and by the Gnostics, which possessed the saving seed of wisdom within themselves, and who were of a nature loftily transcendent. There is a class, if not the earliest class, of chiefs or supreme beings amongst men, who were first recognized as the ever-living ones, the immortals, because they were the mediums for spirit intercourse mediators between the two worlds. With the Tungwins today it is only the chiefs who have power to return after death and inspire the mediums, not the souls of the common people who had been without the abnormal power in this life. The Fijians maintain that only the few are immortal spirits. Hence the desire to obtain such a condition, and possess that knowledge of it which was taught in the mysteries. Here, also, we get back to the origin of conditional or potential immortality, as taught by the Gnostics. Whatsoever secret brotherhoods there may be of Hindu Mahatmas or Tibetan adepts, such fraternities are known to be extant in Africa, and they are spiritualistic. In Kabend and Longo there are secret associations of the fetish men or mediums. They constitute a fraternity the brothers and form a society apart in order, whose secrets are only known to the initiated, and whose mysterious faculties are the terrors of the uninitiated. Bastian describes the king of Bamba as dwelling isolated in his banza in an almost inaccessible mountain district. At the head of one of those systems of religious mystery which exercise an overwhelming influence amongst the natives along the west coast of Africa. New members are admitted into these brotherhoods only after a probation of ten years. They must prepare themselves by fasting, by drinking, by inhaling narcotics. They must give proofs of being ecstatic or mediums, by becoming frantic in the sacred dances, and by seeing in the state of trance. These are the secret societies of savage mediumship. The red men also had their brotherhoods of the adepts. The friendly society of the spirit is mentioned by Carver. This was an association of spiritualists who were mediums, magicians, or fetish priests. Carver saw an elderly member of this brotherhood throw a bean at a young man who was a candidate for election into the society, whereupon he instantly fell motionless, as if he had been shot, and remained for a long time in trance. One of three such societies among the American Indians is that of the Meta or Mediums, the chief festival of the order being that of Medawin. At this festival songs are sung, which are only recorded in symbolical pictures that have been preserved from time immemorial, and can only be read by the few who have been made the guardians of this secret language. Anyway, these primitive spiritualists were terribly in earnest in their modes of overleaping the ordinary barriers of life, of forcing open the very door of death, and taking the other world by storm. They exhausted themselves in all manner of ways, by hideous howling, partial strangulation, furious dancing, shuddering ecstasies, cutting, wounding, and bleeding, until they swooned into the coveted state of inner consciousness. Which may be attained in such a variety of ways, the crudest methods having been discovered first. 
An ancient Indian seer, says Mr. Tyler, would fast for seven days, to purge his vision for spiritual seeing. And he makes merry over all this light-headed business. It certainly would be a very roundabout way of going to work on the theory of imposture put forth by the ignorant pretenders to knowledge in our day. And here a curious sidelight may be allowed to glance on this subject. Our missionaries have recorded numerous instances in which native mediums either, supposed practitioners of imposture, have been converted to Christianity. The men who converted them thought they were impostors. But though they were taught to look with horror and loathing on their old practices as damnable, there is no instance of their recanting and denouncing their spirit intercourse as trickery, or of pleading imposture, or even self-deception. Which would have been so acceptable a solution to the missionaries of the mysterious manifestations. On the contrary, they have always solemnly affirmed the genuineness of the phenomena. Close observers, like Mariner, Williams, and Morenhout, strenuously repudiate the theory of imposture. The Zulus say the continually stuffed body cannot see secret things, and the world, in general, has never shown much faith in fat prophets or poets. It evidently believes in thinness and suffering as good for them, and has always done its best to inspire them with sufficient starvation. It believes in purity by purging. Apollonius of Tyana declared that his power of prophecy was not due to magic or stimulation of the soul, but simply to his abstinence from animal food enhancing the receptive conditions. There have been many ways of reaching the other world, however, besides starving. We know the Hindus, the Chaldeans, Assyrians, Egyptians were acquainted with animal magnetism. The Egyptians and Scythians also made use of Indian hemp for their spiritual sleepers. Indian soothsayers still prepare themselves with the sweating bath for their ecstatic condition, in which the spirits make their communications to the bystanders. The Malay retires to the desert to fast and pray, in order that he may attain the abnormal condition. The Zulu doctor fasts, suffers, castigates himself, till he swoons into the state of trance in which he carries on his spirit communication. Aristophanes wittily ridicules spirit communication in representing the cowardly character Pisander as going to a necromancer and asking to be shown his own soul, which had long since departed and left him only a breathing body. We also find that Alien has a gird at the Hindu mode of inducing the sacred sleep. He says the followers of Apis have a better method of getting at the spirit world. Apis is an excellent interpreter of futurity. He does not employ virgins and old women sitting on a tripod, nor require that they should be intoxicated with the sacred potion. In the Persian Bauman Yasht, the god Ahura Mazda throws Zarathustra into the clairvoyant trance by giving him some magnetist water to drink. We have been untruly taught, by those who knew no better, that this was all a delusion of the past. But the fact is that many thousands of years ago our progenitors had become sufficiently familiar with the business they were about. The African priests, says Bastion, are profoundly versed in the science of ghostly apparitions. The spirit seers of America might get from African professors many practical rules for intercourse with spirits. Whereas the travelers and missionaries generally who report on their mysteries are entirely ignorant that spiritual manifestations and clairvoyant vision were natural realities in the past as they are verifiable in the present. For example, the serpent wisdom, or wisdom of the serpent, played an important part in the ancient mysteries. The way of a serpent and the workmanship are amongst the most amazing in universal nature. Without hands it can climb trees and catch the agile ape. Without fins it can outswim the fish. It has no legs, and the human foot cannot match it in fleetness. Death is in its coil for the bird on the wing, which the springing reptile will snatch out of its element. As a type of elemental power it has no equal, hence it was the supreme fetish in Egypt, worn as the forefront of the gods. Wise as the serpent is a saying, but the wisdom of the serpent has to be interpreted. It was not merely the representative of elemental power, but of mind or mental influence in the primitive sense. The serpent is the mesmerist and magician of the animal world. With its magnetic eyes it has the power to fascinate, paralyze, and draw the prey to its deadly mouth. It probably evoked the earliest idea of magical influence, and gave to man his fist lessons in animal magnetism. 
no disk of the hypnotist, or navel of Vishnu, no look of the mesmerist, has any such power as the gaze of the serpent in inducing the comatose condition. I have seen a sensitive person mesmerized by it almost instantaneously. A traveler has described his sensations as he sank deeper and deeper into the somnambulic sleep under its fatally fascinating influence. And when the shot was fired which arrested the serpent's charm and set him free, he felt the blow as if he had been struck by the bullet. In the Avesta the look of the serpent is synonymous with the most paralyzing and deadly opposition. The serpent and charming are synonymous. In the Egyptian ritual a deluding snake named Ruhak is the great charmer, or fascinator that draws the victim to its mouth with the magic power of its eyes. The speaker exclaims, Go back, Ruhak, fascinating, or striking cold with the eyes. The supreme mode of exhibiting mental power is by magic, and that is represented as charming the serpent. These are the gods, it is said in the texts, who charm for Harkuti in the lower world they charm Apap for him. Apap is the giant serpent of darkness, who is the eternal enemy of the sun. They cry, O, oh, impious Apap! Thou art charmed by us through the means of what is in our hands. That is, by a magic wand carried in the hands of the charmers. Primitive man must have had a long, hard wrestle for supremacy before he could have mesmerized and mastered his old subtle enemy, the serpent, or charmed his charmer, as he learned to do at last, when he became the serpent charmer. Which he ultimately did. Africans today will magnetize a serpent with a few passes and make it stiff as a stick. And in this character we find his figure proudly set in heaven, for the first star in Afiyukas is known in Arabic as Ras al Hawa, the head of the serpent charmer. Afiyukas is not merely the serpent holder, he is the serpent charmer. The Egyptian serpent-headed goddess He is called the maker of invisible existences apparent, which seems to characterize the serpent as the revealer of an unseen world this it was, as the magnetiser of man and hence the serpent type of wisdom. He, the Akkadian god of wisdom, is represented by the serpent. It was the serpent that inducted the primal pair into the secrets of the hidden wisdom when they ate of the fruit that was to open their vision and make them wise in keeping with the character here assigned to it. In some ancient drawings the serpent and the goddess of wisdom are portrayed in the act and attitude of offering the fruit of the tree of knowledge to the human being. Sometimes the serpent holds the fruit in its mouth. Africa is the primordial home of the serpent wisdom, and the serpent was there made use of to produce the abnormal condition in sensitives. The Africans tell of women being possessed and made insane by contact with the serpent. That is, the reptile, from the fascination of its look, fear of its touch, and use of its tongue, threw the mediums into the state of trance called the stupor of the serpent, in which they saw clairvoyantly, divined and prophesied. And so became divinely inspired, as the phenomena were interpreted. We are told that Cassandra and Hellenus were prepared for seeing into the future by means of serpents that cleansed the passages of their sense by licking them. In this way the sensitives were tested, and made frantic. Thus the serpent chose its own oracle and mouthpiece and became the revealer of preternatural knowledge. The stupor caused by the serpent's sorcery created a kind of religious awe, and the extraordinary effects produced on the mediums were attributed to the supernatural power of the serpent. Those who were found to be greatly affected by it were chosen to become fetish women, priestesses, and pythonesses. This obi occult still survives wherever the black race has migrated, and the root of the matter, which travelers have found so difficult to get at, is unearthed at last, as a most primitive kind of spiritualism. In which the serpent acted the part of the mesmerist or magnetizer to the natural somnambules. This I personally learned from an initiate in the Buddha mysteries. In various parts of Africa, especially on the Guinea coast, the oracle of the serpent is a common institution. The reptile is kept in a small hut by an old woman, who feeds it, and who gives forth the responses when the serpent oracle is consulted. She is the medium of spirit communication. In Waida the fetish priests are known by a name which signifies the mother of the serpent. In a chant of the Algonkins it is asked, Who is Manitou? Or medicine man and the reply is, He that goeth with the serpent. The witch of Ender is called a woman who was mistress of Ob. 
Ob is also an Assyrian word which means the serpent. In Egyptian the serpent is ap, to be inflated, serpent-like. In short, the witch was a pythoness, a serpent woman inspired with the serpent wisdom of Obia or the Ophite cult. In the Hebrew book of Genesis the serpent beguiles the woman to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and is damned for doing so. But there was a sect of Gnostic Christians who paid the serpent the highest honor because it had done this thing. Being Gnostics, they were acquainted with the serpent wisdom, and knew what the fable signified, which is what the collectors and translators of those ancient fragments never have known, and so we have a creed called Christian. Founded on an impious perversion of ancient knowledge, which teaches that all mankind were likewise damned because the first pair tasted of the tree of knowledge, and all of us are additionally damned who do not accept the story as true. The chief sacred trees of the world, the typical trees of knowledge, have always been those that produce a fruit or juice from which an alcoholic or narcotic drink could be distilled on purpose to induce the somnambulic trance. The Egyptians used the juice of the sycamore fig tree. Human beings transform into immortal spirits by drinking of its juice, which is represented as a liquid of life. In inner Africa the toddy palm supplied the sacred potion already fermented. And what an amazing tree of knowledge that toddy palm must have been. In India the tree of knowledge was the pipula, or sacred fig tree. This fig tree is a meeting place for men and immortals. Under it Yama, king of the departed, and the pitris, the protecting, fatherly spirits, quaffed the divine drink in common with human beings. From the fruit of it a drink was made, so potent that it not only exalted men to the status of immortals, and placed them on a footing of fellowship with the gods, but brought down the gods to meet with men. In other words, intoxication was a mode of spirit communication the mediums being inspired by strong drink to utter their revelations. This is portrayed on Hindu monuments. It was the tree of knowledge, and the drink was divine just because it lapped the senses in Elysium, and opened the inner eyes to see in trance. In the Hindu drawings you see the medium who was intoxicated, and consulted underneath the tree of knowledge, she eats or drinks of the fruit of the tree, that her inner eyes may be opened. In the Rig VDA the gods are represented as obtaining immortality by constantly getting drunk with Amartya Madam, the immortal stimulant. They drink copiously the first thing in the morning, they are drunk by midday, and dead drunk at night. We hear of North American Indians who have the notion that immortality consists in being eternally dead drunk dead drunk being a primitive mode of expressing extreme felicity in a life beyond the present a kind of paradisiacal condition. The worshippers follow the example of their gods, and drink the intoxicating soma juice to attain immortality. In this state they sing. We've quaffed the soma bright. And are immortal grown. We've entered into light. And all the gods have known. Exactly as it is with the first pair of people in the book of Genesis. The serpent informs the woman that if she will eat of the fruit of the tree their eyes shall be opened, and they shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. And when the woman saw that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, she did eat of it. The wise are the seers in this abnormal sense. Prophets, seers, magi and wizards are the wise men. The primal pair have eaten of the tree of knowledge, the Elohim or celestial spirits exclaim, Behold! The man has become as one of us, that is, as a spirit amongst spirits. This opening of the eyes means an unsealing of the interior vision. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, is said of those who had seen the risen Christ. So Balaam, the man who saw in vision, that is, in the trance condition, is described as the man whose eyes were opened, the seer who saw the vision of the Almighty, falling in trance, having his eyes opened. In this aspect, eating of the tree of knowledge was simply partaking of the divine drink, the drink of immortality, the sacred potion or nepenthe, which was made and administered in all the mysteries. For the purpose of producing the abnormal vision in the practice of spirit intercourse. The tree of knowledge had taught them how to enter the spirit life or spirit world that way, by means of wisdom or knowledge. The typical tree had its religious rootage here, not in direct adoration, but in the mystery of fermentation, and attained its sacredness on account of the divine drink. Hence the trees could be very various, but the product was one. 
We may note that Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom, originally signified wine. A prior form of the word in Egyptian, as sepha or kapha, meant distilling in the mystery of fermentation. Alcoholic spirits were very prominent in primitive spiritism, because they produced abnormal effects. Intoxication was also a mode of illustrating the genesis of spirit the alcoholic being a type of the human product. The facts are registered in language. In Sanskrit, Siddhu is distilled spirit, and Siddha means the spiritually perfected, the Siddhas being the perfect spirits. So in Egyptian, Shetha denotes spirits of wine. Shada is the mystery of mysteries, and the Shada was the coffin or sarcophagus in which the dead transformed, or were turned into spirits. In the Bakshik mysteries they also enacted the production of the spirit by means of fermentation. The soul assigned to Seb, who represented the sap of wood in Egypt, or, as we now see, the juice of the tree that ferments and produces the alcoholic spirit the drink that made men wise in the mysteries. In the book of Deuteronomy the Jews are instructed or commanded to spend their savings in drink, as an offering to the deity, which shows that intoxication was also a religious rite with them. It was this crude nature of these primitive practices that chiefly led to the wholesale condemnation of mediums, sorcerers, wizards, witches, and all who had familiar spirits. It was so in Egypt as in India. In the Persian writings as well as the Mosaic. And these denunciations were and still are accepted as the very word of God by those who are ignorant of the phenomena, and who could not distinguish the lower from the higher, saintly from satanic, or black magic from white. Thus, on account of certain early practices, spiritualism was damned altogether, instead of being fathomed and explained. Our customs of drinking strong liquors, snuffing most potent powders, and smoking narcotic herbs, which are now besotting and degrading the race so much so that our protoplasm and protozoa have to come into being half fuddled with nicotine so that our children are doomed by heredity to become smokers and drinkers. Without being allowed the chance of making a fresh start for themselves these very customs have been bequeathed to us as sacred survivals from the times when the trans conditions were induced by such means. Again, the universal customs of transforming, of masking and mumming, are related to the mysteries of ancient spiritism. In Egyptian the word mum, whence the name of mummy, means the dead body. We have the identical word and meaning in English, applied to a beer called, mum beer, which was not taxed because it is non-alcoholic, unfermented, spiritless, or dead beer, i.e., mum bear. This is not so called, as some have suggested, from a man named Mummer, who was once famous for his brew of strong ale. Our mummers used to go about in masks and mum by making sounds with closed lips. The two sexes exchanged dresses with each other, as a part of the transformation that was being enacted by the mummers, who represented the dead come back in disguise to pay a visit to the living. The annual masking still practiced by our children about the time of All Souls Day, is a survival of this primitive pantomime, in which the masks signify the spirits of the dead or the mummies. The institution of All Souls is a most ancient ceremonial festival of the dead. It is celebrated in many lands, and is common to the most diverse races of mankind. On a certain day after the autumn equinox the spirits of all those, all souls, who had died during the year were supposed to gather together at an appointed place in the west to follow their leader, the red sun of autumn. Down through the underworld, or across the horizon of the resurrection. When such mysteries were performed, those who acted the part of spirits did so in masks, and therefore masks still mean the dead, the mummies or spirits. The modern pastime was an earlier religious mystery. In the genuine Christmas pantomime we have an extant illustration of this primitive masking and mumming, which belonged to the drama of the dead, even as we find it in the Egyptian ritual. In those subterranean scenes of the pantomime we are really in the Egyptian mesca, the rebirth place of the dead, where the transformations into the new life were represented. And the mesca is the original mask as place of transformation, mode of transformation, or symbol of transformation. The pivot of the pantomime on which all turns is the principle of transformation. The transformation is from the lower world of the dead, the place of the mummies or masks hence the giants, dwarfs, fairies, gnomes, bad spirits, and other types of the elemental powers. 
that were represented earlier than human spirits to the daylight world of life, light, and liberty, now represented by fun, frolic, and lawlessness. Harlequin is the potent transformer, who wields the wonder-working wand. With his mask down he is invisible, another proof that the masks represent the dead or the spirits. The final transformation scene represents heaven, the upper world of three. The mask, then, is the face of the dead, and the death mask of the Siberian shaman was preserved and hung up in his late residence, just above the place where he used to sit. In New Britain the natives perform a religious ceremony called the Duck Duck, in which a spirit messenger is represented as coming in a mask. The women and children are prohibited from seeing the mask, and they must not say that it conceals any human being. If the performer allows the mask to slip off, they kill and make a ghost of him. Masks in animal forms and fashions represent the nature powers or the totemic and typical ancestors, but the human mask assuredly stands for a human spirit. And the endeavor to represent this can be traced from the rudest beginnings. In some instances the human face has been flayed from the bones, and transferred to form the mask of a fetish image. The aborigines of Bolivia and Brazil used to take off the face and scalp from the skull, and reduce them to a miniature mask of humanity, supposed to possess supernatural properties, and to furnish a most potent medicine. The Maori, amongst others, learned to desiccate the head and preserve it in its own skin, on the way to complete mummifying of the corpse. Before the mummy could be embalmed entirely the skull was sacredly saved, and sometimes the flesh was imitated by coating it with a mask made of reddish matter. We are now for the first time in a position to apprehend the meaning of the mummy image, and to appreciate the motive of the Egyptians, who practiced the art of embalming the dead until it was absolutely perfected. The mummy or corpse was the dead mask which had been let fall from the face of life by the person who had transformed, and this was faithfully preserved, because it was the mortal likeness of the person who had transformed and become a spirit. In the primary stage and rudest conditions of the human race, the returning ghost was naturally an object of terror and dread, the representative of all that was most fearsome in external phenomena. Not in the least likely to evoke, although it helped to ultimately evolve, a feeling of reverence, which led to some kind of worship. And a long road had to be traveled from the earliest period, when the ghost was besought and propitiated not to appear, up to the time when the bones of the dead were kept in the house or chest. And the mask or mummy was sacredly preserved on purpose to secure the presence of the ghost as a protection for the living relatives whence the Laras and Penates, and other forms of the household gods. Doubtless, it took a very long time to utilize the ghost, or fully make out its message to man. But that stage had been traveled by the Egyptians when they first come into view. It is certain that from the earliest monumental period, and, probably, ages before that, the Egyptians represented man to be what is termed an immortal spirit. The text of the 130th chapter of the Book of the Dead is said to have been discovered or rediscovered in the reign of Husapti, the fifth king of the first dynasty, who lived more than 6,000 years ago. At that time certain portions of the sacred books were found as antiquities, of which the very tradition had been lost. And this is the chapter of Vivifying the Soul Forever. The Egyptians were accustomed to set up two different images with the dead body in the tomb. One of these is the Shepti, or duplicative figure. This was one of their types of transformation. It represented the duplication of the mummy for another life, called that of the second breath. The other image was named the Ka, or second self. The 105th chapter of the ritual is entitled the chapter of, Propitiating the Ka of a Person in the Divine Nether World. And, in the pictorial illustration, the person is represented in the act of adoring his own spiritual image, the glorified idolon, to which he relates how he abominates all filthy things, in order that his ka, or higher self, may be propitiated and pleased. The Egyptian title of Kaink meant the living likeness, or the likeness of the immortal, the one that lived on after death. Moreover, this ka was not only the reflex image of the defunct erected in the tomb. It was also portrayed as being born with the mortal into this life. In the scenes at Luxor, in which Amenhep III is represented at the moment of birth, another infant, his exact likeness, is depicted as his ka, his genius, 
himself in a divine effigy. Also, it was a great joy for the spirit of the deceased to be permitted to revisit the dead body and see how carefully it was preserved, which shows us the final crowning motive for making and keeping the mummy. In the chapter, 89. Of the visit of the soul or ka of the deceased to his body, it is said, Thou hast let my eternal soul see my body. He sees his body, and, he is at peace in his mummy. The chief fact with which we are now concerned, is, that the mummy image supplied the supreme type of transformation, and was the Egyptian charist, or Christ. Various symbols of durability and rebirth were buried with the Egyptian dead, when the mummy was deposited in the henanku or chest of the living. A copy of the Book of the Second Breath since informed his pillow, and the leaves of the Book of Life were the lining of his coffin. He was accompanied by his types of protection, of duration, and renewal, the ink cross of life to come. The ankum flower of life, worn at the ear, the tat cross, or buckle of stability, the beetle of transformation, the vulture image of victory, the greenstone, yut, of revivification, the tablet of rosin, a type of preservation. The level or corner sign of a menu, signifying to come our amen. And, with the eyes of the sun and moon to light him through the darkness, the Egyptian entered his tomb, called the Good Dwelling. A number of copies of the Shebti, or Double of the Dead, were ranged in the Serdab to signify manifold repetition, and the climage of his spiritual self was erected in the tomb, as his visible link with his dead form on earth. But, the mummy itself was also preserved as a type, just as the mummified hawks, mice, cats, and other animals, were preserved for their typical significance. Both Herodotus and Plutarch tell us how the Egyptians ended a banquet by carrying round, in a coffin, the image of a dead body. Look on it, they said, and drink, for when you are dead you will be like this. That image was the mummy type of immortality. The sentiment was not that of eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. It was one of rejoicing in the assurance of immortality which the mummy image represented. This mummy image was the Egyptian Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, or spirit which was to be reborn. We have to go a long way back to get at the origin of the types and symbols now called Christian. Not one of these originated at the beginning of our era. The Christ, for instance, is a pre-Christian type, connected with the mask, the mummy, and the mysteries of transformation. The first male type of the Christ was after the flesh, and founded on the transformation of the boy into man the Christ who became the anointed one of puberty. This phallic fetish associated with the rite of circumcision was the one repudiated by Paul for the spiritual Christ not the historical Jesus. In the Gnostic sense the word made s pound rx, or flesh, was this phallic logos founded on the causative seed. The reproductive power which transformed in this life having been made a type of transformation for the future life. In the Gospel according to Thomas, it is said, He who seeks me will find me in children from seven years old. For there concealed I shall, in the fourteenth year, be made manifest, that is, as the pubescent Christ or Horus. In Greek the Christ means the anointed, but the mystical or spiritual sense of the word was preceded by the physical. Chryso and Crestae are also names for dobing over with coloring matter, and it still is a primitive practice amongst the black men and red men to cover the bodies or bones of the dead with red ochre. Human bones buried in the mounds of Caithness have been found coated over with red earth. This was done to preserve and save them. It was also typical of their being refleshed. And the bone, head, mask, or body so saved became the symbol of a salvation and a savior, because it was an image of transformation. This was the mummy figure in Egypt. To, karas, in Egyptian, is to anoint, embalm, or make the mummy. And the type of preservation so made was called the karist or Christ. Such, I maintain, is the Egyptian origin of the Christ called the anointed in Greek. The one who transformed and rose again from the dead, designated the karist or Christ, was represented both by the prepared and preserved mummy, and by the carven image, which was the likeness of a dead man. Moreover, this was the original Christ, whose vesture was without seam. In making the perfect mummy type of continuity or immortality the body had to be bound up in the kedu or woof, a seamless robe, or a bandage without a seam. 
No matter how long this might be and some swathes have been unrolled that were 1,000 yards in length it was woven without a seam. This, I repeat, was the seamless robe of the mystical Christ, which reappears as the coat, coating, or chitin, cf. K2, e.g. Woof, of the Christ according to John. The Assyrians also made use of a mysterious sacred image called the Mummet, or Mamatu. It is celebrated in their hymns as the Mummet. The Mummet. The treasure which passeth not away. It is spoken of as a shape of salvation, descending from the midst of the heavenly abyss, a life-giving image that was placed, as is the cross, in the hands of the dying, to drive away evil spirits. This mummet was the sign, or fetish image, of the one deity who never fails. I have shown elsewhere that this type of eternal life was identical with the corpus domini, the mummy Christ of Egypt. The bit mamity was the house of the mummies. The can mamity was the book of the mummy, and the mummet I hold to have been the image of the resurrection, a type and teacher of the eternal. So, mammoth in Hebrew is a name of the corpse as the image of the dead. We can trace the Charist or Mummy Christ of Egypt a little further. When he transformed in the underworld, spiritualized or obtained a soul in the stars of heaven, he rose on the horizon as or in the constellation Orion that is, the star of Horus, the Charist or Christ. Hence Orion is named the Sahu, or constellation of the mummy who has transformed and ascended into heaven from the mount of the equinox, at the end of forty days, as the starry image of life to come, the typical saviour of men. And Orion must have represented the risen Horus, the Charist or Christ, at least six thousand years ago. This Christ is said to come forth sound, with no limb missing and not a bone broken, because the deceased was reconstituted in accordance with the physical imagery. And by aid of this corporeal Christ of Egypt we can understand why the risen Christ of the Gospels is made to demonstrate that he is not a spirit or bodiless ghost, as the disciples thought. But is in possession of the flesh and bones of the properly preserved corpse. They have omitted the transformation into the spiritual Christ. Thus in that character he is only the Corpus Christi, or Mummy Christ, of Egypt a type transferred and not a reality, either spiritual or physical. There can be no doubt of this, for the child Christ, copied into my book, is actually portrayed on a Christian monument in the Roman catacombs as this very image of the mummy Christ of Egypt, bound up in the seamless swathe of the Charist. Some of the Christian fathers supposed that the Egyptians believed in the physical resurrection of the preserved body, and this false inference is frequently echoed in our own day. But it is a mistake of the ignorant. The doctrine of the resurrection of the body is not Egyptian. There is proof extant that the Egyptians did not make the mummy as their type of a physical resurrection. Being phenomenal and not mere theoretical spiritualists, they had no need of a corporeal resurrection. With them the deathless only was divine, and their dead are spirits divinized by rebirth in the likeness of their gods. I repeat, the doctrine of the physical resurrection of the body is not Egyptian. We find in the Book of the Dead that the promise of all blessedness, the supreme felicity, is for the spirit not to re-enter the earthly body forevermore. In the rubric to chapter 89, we read his soul does not enter, or is not thrust back, into his mummy forever. Their idea of the life hereafter always turned on the transformation, and not on the resurrection, of the body. And their doctrine is that of transformation in the Hades, and not of resurrection from the earth. They left the dogma of a physical resurrection to be carried off as the stolen property of the non-spiritist Christians in Rome, along with so many other dead effigies of things that never lived. Accordingly the early Christians, who were ignorant of Egyptian symbolism, did base their belief in a life hereafter upon a bodily resurrection here, derived from the Charist or Mummy Christ. Their foothold in a future existence as spiritual entities did depend on the repossession of an earthly physique. Without the physical possibility there was no spiritual probability hereafter for them no life without the reconstitution of the old dead dust, which a mere whiff of science scatters forever. And so abolishes their one bit of foothold in all the universe. Modern or ancient spiritualism has no message or meaning for such people, they are corporeally founded, and there they rest and cling to the earth with the rootage of eighteen hundred years. 
This was a natural result of taking over the mummy type of Egypt without a knowledge of the typology, and the ghost idea without the ghost in reality, or the facts upon which it was founded. The doctrines and dogmas of Christian theology are derived from Egypt and its arcanum of mystery, which the modern believers have never yet penetrated we are only just now opening the door. And here it may be said that those Egyptologists, who are orthodox bibliolators, first and foremost, are not going to help us much. Bibliolatry puts out the eyes of scholarship. We have to get at the facts and help ourselves. The pre-Christian religion was founded on a knowledge of natural and verifiable facts, the data being actual, and the method very simply scientific whether you accept my conclusions or not but the Christian cult was founded on ignorant belief. Which swallowed in faith all that was impossible in fact, and unverifiable in phenomena. Current orthodoxy is based upon a deluding idealism derived from literalized legend misinterpreted mythology on the idea that man fell from paradise. And was damned forever before the first child had been born on the idea that the world was consequently lost on the idea that the world is to be saved and man restored by a vicarious atonement on the idea of a miraculous physical resurrection from the dead. And all these ideas are at once non-natural, non-spiritual, unscientific, and utterly false, and year by year, day after day, their props are being knocked away. But the phenomenal spiritualist in all ages has founded on his facts. These facts were common with the prehistoric races, and the phenomena were cultivated more intelligently in the ancient mysteries. But they were utterly abominated and crushed or cast out by the later religion. What has the Christian Church done with the human soul, which was an assured possession of the pre-Christian religions? It was handed over to their keeping and they have lost it. They have acted exactly like the dog in Aesop's fable who, seeing the likeness of the shoulder of mutton reflected in the water, dropped the substance which he held in his mouth, and plunged in to try and seize its shadow. They substituted a phantom of faith for the knowledge of phenomena. Hence their deadly enmity against the Gnostics, the men who knew. They had got hold of a faith that could stand alone independently of fact, if you only made believe hard enough, and killed out all who could not believe. They drew down the blinds of every window that looked forth into the past, and shut out the light of nature from the blinded world in which they sought to live, and compel all other people to live, by a farthing candle of faith alone. They parted company with nature, and cut themselves adrift from the ground of phenomenal fact. They became the murderous enemies of the ancient spiritism which had demonstrated the existence and continuity of the soul and offered evidence of another life on the sole ground of fact to be found in nature. And ever since they have waged a ceaseless warfare against the phenomena and the agents which are as live and active today as they were in any time past. Mediums, prophets, and seers, witches, and wizards the born immortals of the early races have always been done to death by them with horrible tortures and inhuman cruelties. They have fought all along against the most vital and valuable, the profoundest part of the knowledge of nature, the most concealed, occult, and subtle, and been at war all through against the other world. But murder will out, and the innumerable multitude of their victims are only dead against them. They are living on for us, they are working with us. They are fighting for the eternal truth with terrible power, against the worshippers of the gory God, the men of the bloody faith, which has yet to pay for all the massacre and misery that the race has suffered. In order that a delusive fiction might be forced upon the world. The soul was established as a fact, and the future life was demonstrated in the mysteries of ancient spiritism. These were the creators of a sentiment that might be called religious, for the first time, and the Christian teachers today are but trafficking in and beguiling the hereditary sentiment so evolved. By not only trying to do without the original factors in the past, but by seeking to efface them from nature itself. If anything could have put an end to spiritualism, it was the never-ceasing Christian persecution that was directed towards that end. They substituted a physical resurrection from the dead for a spiritual continuity, such as was demonstrated in the mysteries of the men who knew. As if a physical resurrection, that was alleged to have occurred once on a time, could demonstrate the continuity of spiritual existence for us. 
And today you still see their learned doctors of divinity trying to get at the other world by grave digging still fumbling after the spirit of man as though his essence were dust of the earth which they say God has power to put together. Every particle of it, at the last day. And so we shall rise again after all. They oppose, and fear cremation, as Bishop Wordsworth admitted, because it looks as though that would destroy the physical and only foothold of their resurrection. Tombstones, and books, are still dedicated by them to the memory of those who are, no more. The future life for them is, but a desolate, perhaps. The meeting again is only a, maybe. At the mouth of the gaping grave they mumble something about the, hope, of a joyful resurrection. That is the physical resurrection at the last day, on which the failing faith was founded at first. And that, according to John, was all the alleged founder of the faith had to reveal when he is said to have said. Every one that beholdeth the Son, and believeth on him, I will raise him up at the last day. The spiritualism of the Roman Catholic Church, with its doctrine of angels, its purgatorial penance, and efficacy of prayers for the dead, is a survival from paganism. And was not derived from the teachings of the supposed founder of historic Christianity as represented in the canonical Gospels. Hence the rejection of that, and all other such, spiritualism by the Protestants. And some of our friends, who are Christians first and spiritualists afterwards, want to convert Christianity into spiritualism. But it will not, and cannot, be converted. In vain you try to engraft the living shoot upon a dead tree, rotten to the root. The Christians themselves know better than that, and they are far more logical. They apprehend truly enough that their religion did not originate in spiritualism, but as its deadly antagonist. Hence when phenomenal spiritualism is presented in our own day as a basis for immortality, just as it was in the pre-Christian ages and religions of all lands, and in all the mysteries where the genuine gnosis was unfolded. The Christians stop their ears against any such report, or take up arms to defend the faith against the alleged facts. You cannot spiritualize such a creed any more than you can make it scientific, and the reason for this must be sought, and is to be found, in its mythological and non-spiritual origin. It is of necessity at war with all the facts in nature upon which it was not founded. We do not want a closer connection with a superseded system of thought, but rather a repeal of the union and the fullest freedom of complete divorce. It is for spiritualism to join hands with science, enlarge the boundaries of knowledge, found upon the facts in nature, not seek for an impossible alliance with a system that has always been antinatural and at war with scientific facts. Because it was falsely founded, from the first, in fable and in faith versus knowledge. The early Christians having been those who ignorantly believed, as opposed to the Gnostics, or the men who knew. I do not propose to raise a new cry, form another sect, advertise an infallible nostrum, or pose as the founder of any fresh faith, when I say that a new and more comprehensive and inclusive kind of Gnosticism, which shall be quite free and above board and open all round, is one of the crying wants of our age. Spiritualism cannot be made to stand under or buttress the falling faith, but it may help to establish a new Gnosticism which shall found upon the facts first and let the faith follow naturally after.